I want you to think about an animation studio. Anyone, like the first to pop out of your head. Maybe the one in your head now is one of the mainstream masters like Pixar. Maybe it's one of the more interesting ones like DreamWorks. Maybe it's one of the more well-known foreign companies like Studio Ghibli. But maybe it's none of that. Maybe the first you thought of is one of the first, one of the oldest, and one of the most legendary of all time, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Okay, maybe it's because of the title, but there is also another good reason. For around 100 years since the company began, Disney has been, and still is, the leading studio of animation, always revolutionizing, evolving, and innovating with every film they make to push the medium to the next level in order to tell some of the most powerful and timeless stories beloved by generations past, present, and future. But even with dozens of animated features in their library, there is one story that stands out among the rest as the greatest from Disney animation, and that is their own. This look back will be telling this epic story by covering their entire history, along with looking into how they made their movies from Snow White all the way up to the end of the 2010 decade with Frozen 2. It is a story that will be interesting, funny, surprising, emotional, and you might learn a few things about some of your favorite movies. And so, with all that said, it is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that I welcome you here on this day. And now, I invite you to relax, go and pull up a chair, as Animation Look Back proudly presents Walt Disney Animation Studios Plus. Now let's start with Walt's beginnings. Ever since he was a child, Walter Elias Disney always knew that he had a passion for the arts. Born in Chicago, Illinois on December 5, 1901 and raised in Missouri, Walt loved to draw whenever he could and always looked for ways to improve his skills. So much so that he even attended weekends and night courses on cartooning in between school time. In 1920, Disney tried and failed to open his own company with a fellow artist he met at a contemporary art shop named Ub Iwerks. But after the attempt, he discovered a new form of art that would really bring his drawings to life called cell animation, which had a more believable feel to it than the cutout animation that was often used at the time. That was when Walt decided to try running his own studio again by producing a series of animated shorts called Newman's Laughograms, named after the main place where they were shown, the Newman Theater in Kansas City, where they told modern versions of classic fairy tales. In other words, Disney's first cartoons foreshadowed his entire legacy. The Laughograms turned out to be a hit, but not for long. This began a cycle where Walt would have a short-lived successful series, but once the show ran its course, he would start a new one and repeat the process, all while moving to Hollywood in 1923 after the end of the Laughograms, where on October 16th, he and his brother Roy O. Disney opened a new company called the Disney Brothers Studio. The cycle began with Laughograms, then there was the Alice Comedies, which featured a live-action girl in a cartoon world, then four years later came Walt's first cartoon star, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. It was going well with Oswald, but then a year later in 1928, Walt got screwed over by his producer Charles Mintz by taking Oswald, which was owned by its distributor Universal Pictures, and most of his animators away from him after refusing a deal that would get him less pay. So while he was making the last batch of Oswald cartoons, Walt and a small group of devoted artists, including his old friend Ub Iwerks, secretly created a new cartoon character to replace the rabbit, and thus, Mickey Mouse was born. His first couple of cartoons, Playing Crazy and The Galloping Gaucho, didn't get much interest, but it wouldn't be until his third cartoon, Steamboat Willie, which was also Disney's first sound cartoon, where Mickey found a distributor and became a phenomenon on November 18th, 1928. From there, Disney quickly climbed up the ranks to become the top animation studio of the industry with the help of Mickey Mouse and a new series called Silly Symphonies, which allowed the studio to experiment and try new things with the medium, starting with 1929's The Skeleton Dance. However, 
1934, despite already making new achievements in animation and creating more beloved characters like Donald Duck, Goofy, and the Three Little Pigs, Walt wanted to create something bigger, something more ambitious, something that no one in Hollywood had ever attempted before. So he gathered up many of his crew and announced his plans to make his next big cartoon. And when he said big, he meant feature length. This was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the first ever animated feature in America. It's the story of Snow White, a princess whose life is in danger due to the jealousy of the queen because she unknowingly took her place as the fairest of them all. As she runs away in the forest, she discovers a cottage to hide in that belongs to seven mining dwarves. Now as she tries to escape the wrath of the evil queen, Snow White is taking care of the dwarves all while dreaming that someday her prince will come. While Walt Disney was leading the animation business during the early 1930s, he knew that this success wouldn't last long, as he kept testing new things to do with the medium. As it was evolving, the shorts were starting to get more expensive and less profitable. So like some have done before him, the only way to survive Hollywood at that point was to make the transition from shorts to feature films. All the handwriting on the wall early, because of the short subject, was just a filler on any program. I just felt I just had to diversify my business. Now, if I could crack the feature field, I could do things. The reason why he went with the classic Brothers Grimm fairy tale as his story for the movie was because he got inspired when he saw the 1916 silent film adaptation by J. Cyril Dolly back when he was 15 in Kansas City. While it may not have been the first animated feature in history, as there have been a few that preceded it like 1926 The Adventures of Prince Ahmed or 1930's Le Roman de Renard, it is marked as the first animated feature ever to use cells as its medium. But in early 20th century America, the idea of a feature-length cartoon was unheard of, or even one that would last longer than 10 minutes. When word first came out about his plans for an animated movie, it was met with complete ridicule from both the press and the film industry as they infamously referred to it as Disney's folly. However, even with all the doubts surrounding him, it didn't even put a dent on Walt's determination. He knew that he was going to make something amazing and was willing to risk everything to prove it. And you'll see a little later that this is not an exaggeration. One of Walt's biggest goals with the picture is to have the audience believe in the characters. What I mean is that even if what the audience would see is nothing but drawings of cartoons, the mission is to have the viewers connect with the characters emotionally, as if they were real people to care about. Sure, cartoons can make people laugh, but can a cartoon make people feel scared, fall in love, or even something that was once considered impossible? Can a cartoon make people cry? The film originally had a more comedic edge with all of its characters, but Disney wanted it to be more than just funny. It's that sense of realism that Walt wanted to achieve for the movie, and it's what he wanted to make as his next innovation in animation. Realism. If a character is going to feel real, then they would have to look real too. The transition of animating Mickey Mouse cartoons to realistic people was proven to be a tough task for the artist, but Walt still tried his best to get his animators in the best shape they can be to make this movie. As it was such a huge project, the company managed to hire hundreds more artists to work for Disney. And it was a great time to get them too, since this was made during the Great Depression where everyone was looking for a job. To have them set up to the Disney standards, Walt built an entire art school within the studio in 1932, inspired by a group of artists led by Art Babbitt, where they went and took their own courses after work. In order to achieve the major technicalities to animate the film, several silly symphonies were made to test effects, colors, and especially movements to see if they can do it right for Snow White. One was the 1937 cartoon The Old Mill, in which the team tested out their new machine called the Multiplane Camera, which held several pieces of artwork and moved the camera to make the animated shot look like it's moving in a three-dimensional environment. But the big one to experiment was to animate characters realistically. 
To test if they can animate a real innocent and beautiful girl, Disney created the 1934 short The Goddess of Spring. For there lived a maiden, so gentle was she, that all the world alone. As you can tell, they had a long way to go. It wasn't until the studio hired animator Grim Natwick, who is credited as the man that drew Betty Boop as we know her today, where he captured the perfect design of Snow White that Walt was looking for. From there, the realism of the princess and the queen finally began to take shape, but not all efforts came out successful. Originally, the prince was supposed to have a bigger part where he would be trapped by the queen and would escape to rescue Snow White. However, his role was heavily scaled back due to the artist still having a hard time to animate real male humans. But this is not to say that everything had to be real in the movie. The overall style of the film with the painted backgrounds is reminiscent of pictures in those old European storybooks and the only characters who are an exception to the rule of realism are the dwarves. As they are the comic reliefs of the picture, they are allowed to be more animated and caricatured while encouraging the animators to find a good gag with either them or Snow White's animal friends with a system called five bucks a gag. Got a good joke that made it in the movie? You get five bucks. Pretty self-explanatory there. However, while the artists may be more comfortable with animating the dwarves, that doesn't mean they don't come with a big challenge. For many years during production, Walt and his team had a very hard time trying to name the seven dwarves. In total, there were around 50 names that were considered for them. Some of these include... <gasps> Awful, baldy, blappy, burpy, crappy, cranky, deafy, dirty, dizzy, flabby, gappy, goopy, helpful, hicky, hoppy, hungry, jumpy, lazy, nifty, puffy, shorty, sneezy, whizzy, shifty, sniffy, snoopy, soulful, stuffy, swift, tearful, thrifty, tubby, weepy, wheezy, wistful, and big o ego. <sighs> And that's not even all of them. But finally, in less than a year before its release, their names and personalities that would distinguish each of them were finally settled with Doc, Happy, Sneezy, Grumpy, Bashful, Sleepy, and Dopey. But despite all the creative challenges, despite the lengths to achieve realism, and despite the time it took to define the characters, there was one obstacle that was the toughest for Walt to overcome. Money. The movie took so much time and resource that it ended up sucking all the money that was left in the studio. The Disney brothers even went as far as convincing an executive at the Bank of America by showing an unfinished version of the film. But even that wasn't enough to cover the budget. As much as his wife Lillian and his brother and financer of the company Roy tried to tell him to stop, Walt even went as far as going into his own fortune and mortgage his own home. What was originally thought to have cost $250,000 to make, the movie's budget ended up becoming nearly $1.5 million. At that point, it wasn't just the money that was at risk. Walt put his company, his livelihood, and his life's work on the line. After around four years of production, the moment finally came on December 21st, 1937, where the movie premiered at the Carthay Circle Theater. It was a sold out event and some of the biggest stars at the time were all there to witness Disney's first movie. It was one of the most stressful moments of Walt and his crew's lives. And once the film was over, Disney's folly turned into Disney's phenomenon. The audience at the premiere jumped at their feet for a standing ovation after they laughed and cried with the film. Even right at that moment, they knew what they just witnessed was a monumental moment in cinema history, and it even got Walt on the cover of Time magazine. As the film later had a public release on February 4th, 1938, it was beloved by both critics and audiences and broke some major box office records by earning a total of more than $7.8 million, making it the highest grossing sound film of all time before it got quickly dethroned by Gone with the Wind. But the revenue did not just come from the movie itself. Snow White was also credited to be the first movie to have merchandise released on the same day as the film, and even put out the first feature film soundtrack on phonographic records. 
The success of the film was even taken note in Hollywood, where MGM was inspired to pursue their own family-friendly fantasy film that would eventually become the 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz. The movie was also recognized at the Academy Awards, where it got nominated for Best Original Score, but the big win was an honorary award as a significant screen innovation which had charmed millions and pioneered a great new entertainment field. Presented by Shirley Temple, the award was a unique Oscar that had one normal-sized statue and seven little statues. Ah, oh, ain't that cute. Isn't it bright and shiny? Oh, it's beautiful. Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> The movie was Disney's first to be re-released when it came back to the big screen in 1944 and started a new tradition of re-releasing their animated films periodically until it stopped when home media became popular in the 1990s. With the combined total of all the re-releases, the film made a lifetime gross of $418 million. The film would go on to inspire some rides like Snow White's Scary Adventure across several Disney parks and the Seven Dwarves Mine Train at Walt Disney World and Shanghai Disneyland, a reimagining animated series on Disney XD called The 7D that lasted for two seasons from 2014 to 2016, and an official stage musical in 1969 by Jay Blackton and Joe Cook that even performed at the Radio City Music Hall from 1979 to 1980 with over 100 performances. The cultural significance of Snow White got so big that the Library of Congress officially selected the film for preservation in the National Film Registry in 1989, and the American Film Institute put the film on several of their top lists, including number 49 on their top 100 movies list and at number 34 on their updated 10th anniversary list, number 19 on their top 100 songs with Someday My Prince Will Come, number 10 on their top 100 villains with the Queen, and at number one of their top 10 animated films. While it may often be referred to as the greatest animated feature of all time, a more suited title was also given to highlight how it initiated Disney's legacy as the one that started it all. Thanks to the success of Snow White, it allowed Disney to grow his company even bigger than before and move his studio to a much larger facility in Burbank, where they could bring even more artists to produce more cartoons and especially more movies. So now that Walt knew the formula to create animated films, it was time to see if he can make lightning strike twice with his next feature, Pinocchio. The film centers on Pinocchio, a wooden puppet who came to life by the Blue Fairy by granting the wish of his creator, Geppetto. By his side, a cricket named Jiminy was appointed by the fairy to be his conscience so that the wooden kid would stay out of trouble and learn what it means to be a real boy. But because of the puppet's wide-eyed and curious nature of everything around him, the conscious job is not working out well, as Pinocchio often finds himself hanging out with shady characters, going to dangerous places, and even getting swallowed by a whale. The idea of the movie began during the end of production of Snow White back in 1937, when one of Walt's top animators, Norm Ferguson, handed him a book called The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. The book sparked Walt's imagination and got him all excited as it had tons of amazing material to turn this into one of his animated features. But if he were to adapt it into a movie, he had to make some major changes, especially regarding the wooden puppet himself. In the original novel, Pinocchio was cold-hearted, rude, arrogant, and self-centered who had to learn to be a good boy the hard way. In fact, the crew was close to having him stay true to the source material by having his personality emulate the one of Edgar Bergen's ventriloquist dummy, Charlie McCarthy. In other words, Pinocchio was supposed to be a douchebag! Unsurprisingly, Walt did not want that version in his film. Maybe having a good design could help. But turns out that it was easier said than done. Animator Fred Moore, along with the young Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, tried some tests with Pinocchio's design to bring the wooden puppet to life. But there was just something about it that didn't really work for Walt. 
Somehow, the appeal wasn't fully there. It wasn't until another young animator, Milt Call, had to step in because he knew what was the problem with the tests. It wasn't the way he was drawn or how he moved, it was that they were making him a puppet instead of a boy. In order to prove it, Call made an animation test where Pinocchio was going underwater to look for Monstro the whale, and was depicted more as a real boy who just so happened to have some puppet features. When Walt saw it, he knew that he finally found his Pinocchio and made his personality reflect on Milt's design as a kid who is filled with innocence and wonder, but can also be naive. But even if the team had their star, there was still something missing. Something to add some heart and a bit of humor to the picture. Enter Jiminy Cricket, who was originally a minor character in the novel due to the fact that he was, well, how can I put this, um, very short-lived. In the movie, the writers decided to give him a much bigger part where he would follow Pinocchio on his adventures and act as his conscience to tell him what is the right thing to do. Also, Walt decided to assign Ward Kimball to be the supervising animator of the cricket out of sympathy. You see, back in Snow White, Ward spent eight months animating a musical number where the dwarves would eat a bowl of soup, and was very proud of it too. However, Walt decided to cut it out of the film because he viewed the scene as unnecessary. This, of course, crushed Kimball's soul. So as a way of saying sorry, Walt gave him the leading animating job on Jiminy. When it came to designing him, he was originally a lot more of a cricket. But then Walt demanded to have him look cuter, and as more designs were done, Jiminy looked a lot less like a cricket and more like a little man, up to the point that the only reason why he's a cricket is because the movie said so. I'll bet a lot of you folks don't believe that. When casting the voices, Disney made it the first animated movie to hire celebrities to be the voices. These include Cliff Edwards, also known as Ukulele Ike, Evelyn Venable, Walter Cutlet, Frankie Darrow, and child actor Dickie Jones. Some are also a little more notable, like Christian Rubb is not only the voice of Geppetto, but the character was also modeled after him. Charles Judels played both the large and villainous roles of Stromboli and the Coachman, and Gideon was voiced by none other than Mel Blanc. That's right, the legendary voice actor who played countless of Looney Tunes and Hanna-Barbera characters actually did a voice for Disney. Anyways, Gideon was originally going to talk in the feature, and Blank did all of his voiceovers, but it was later decided to make him mute and all of his dialogue got thrown out. The only thing Mel did that survived in the movie was a hiccup. <laughs> On a side note, Pinocchio wasn't the only Disney project that featured Blank's voice. Technically, there was Who Framed Roger Rabbit that featured many of his Looney Tunes characters, but there is one other project where his voice was a lot more prominent than in Pinocchio, and that is the 1964 attraction The Carousel of Progress as Uncle Orville. <laughs> Too bad he's not reading the Help Wanted ads. No privacy, it's all around this place! Sorry, Orville. Back onto Pinocchio, when it was time to do the animation, the artist had one goal in mind. Make it better than Snow White. Now that they knew how to create an animated feature, the next step was to further push the high standards they had already set. One way of doing so was to fill the scenery with as much detail as possible to bring the environment to full life thanks to Swiss artist Albert Herder and Swedish artist Gustav Tengren. Their works were responsible for the living European fairy tale like village, the wild attractions in Pleasure Island, and all the toys and clocks in Geppetto's workshop. In fact, the model department that was responsible for making sculptures of the characters as reference for the animators also made functioning models of Geppetto's cuckoo clocks along with the coachman's carriage and Stromboli's wagon. For the latter, the filmmakers took the working model of the wagon and filmed it rolling along in the shots they wanted, which they then took the frames and made wash-off relief cells so that they can later add the characters and the colors onto the shot resulting the wagon to look highly believable while still feel like it's a part of the same environment as Pinocchio's. But if there was one crowning achievement in the animation, 
one that many to this day still claim is the greatest example of it, it's the effects animation. For over a year, animators worked tirelessly to provide the film as many effects as possible to make them the highlight of their respective scene, and to give the film a stronger impact. From the natural with the weather and smoke, to the mechanical with all of Geppetto's creations, to the fantasy with the blue fairy's magic, to even the aquatic with all the bubbles when Pinocchio's underwater, and all of the waves and foam caused by Monstro splashing around. It was so good that years later, even the animators looked back on the Monstro scene as one of their finest works, where Ollie Johnston stated, I think that was one of the finest sequences the studio has ever turned out, because the water is handled without so much logic in the way the waves work to make it entertaining. As Frank said once, the water is so believable a person could drown in it, and then they do. After the intense work that was put onto the feature, Pinocchio was finally released on February 23rd, 1940, and the critics were amazed by the movie. So much so that they even considered it to be better than Snow White. However, despite the massive praise, there was something unexpected that occurred. It was a box office flop. While many attributed its failure to World War II closing off the European and Asian markets, the biggest factor was how Pinocchio was a lot more expensive to make with a bigger budget than Snow White estimated at nearly $2.3 million, with the film to have reported only making somewhere between $1.4 million and $1.9 million. However, while it may have been bad for Pinocchio on its initial release, its legacy and recognition as a legend went up from there, and had never stopped since. As time moved on, the movie would be recognized by the public as one of Disney's greatest masterpieces. At the Academy Awards, it was Disney's first movie to have won an Oscar, and it even won two, where it earned Best Original Score and Best Original Song for When You Wish Upon a Star. This and Mary Poppins would be his only features to win both music categories at the Oscars during Walt's lifetime. As for When You Wish Upon a Star, its message of hope, dreams, and wish fulfillment resonated as everything Disney stands for, and has since been known as the company's official anthem, using it on numerous of their parades, fireworks shows, the horn in their cruise line, openings to their TV specials, and on their film logos. After World War II, the box office performance would significantly improve with the re-releases and ultimately earned a total of more than $84 million. Pinocchio then made his mark in the theme parks with his own attraction, Pinocchio's Daring Journey, at Disneyland, Tokyo Disneyland, and Disneyland Paris, along with some quick-service restaurants at some of the parks. In 1985, it was the first of Walt's movies to be released on VHS, and its massive success was credited to have initiated Disney's highly successful business in home media, even if the heads at the time thought it would be a huge risk. In 1994, the movie was added to the National Film Registry, and later on, the American Film Institute placed it at number 38 of its Top 100 Cheers list, number 7 on its Top 100 Songs for When You Wish Upon a Star, and at number 2 on its Top 10 Animated Films. While it may not have been an immediate success, Faith stepped in and saw it through. It made a wish upon a star to have the same masterpiece status and cultural importance as Snow White. And if there's one thing that the movie taught us, when you wish upon a star... Now before we jump on to the next movie, let's step back a bit to 1936. It was a simpler and ambitious time at Disney's. They were still the top Hollywood studio making cartoons, and they were on their way to make history with their first feature-length film. However, the only downside to all this was that the popularity of Mickey Mouse was dwindling. While he may had his moment of glory after the release of Steamboat Willie, people were starting to lose interest in the mouse as Disney began bringing out more characters that had a stronger personality than Mickey like Donald Duck. Not to mention that Snow White and the Dwarves were just around the corner to become the next biggest celebrities. Even within the studio, the crew was more interested in making cartoons with the duck than with the mouse. Walt wasn't prepared to let his favorite creation be forgotten. 
So in order to spice up interest in Mickey with his artists and writers, he decided to create a special cartoon. One that would truly mix animation with music. Of course, Disney had done this many times before, especially with the Silly Symphony cartoons where his team experimented with characters, colors, effects, and especially having the visuals pair up with the soundtrack. However, this would be a little more different. The music wouldn't be matched with slapstick comedy, wacky sound effects, and funny voices. The cartoon would feature animation that followed the music, and that's it. Walt even found the perfect story for it, which was the Johann Wolfgang von Gotter poem, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, with the orchestral piece based on the poem by Paul Duca. The story is about an apprentice who wanted to try out the magic of the sorcerer he works for while he was taking a break. But when practicing on a broom, the situation got quickly out of hand when the apprentice doesn't know how to stop the magic. One day, Walt was eating at Chasen's in Hollywood and met famed conductor Leopold Stokowski. The two had a nice chat and Walt brought up his Sorcerer's Apprentice idea, which got Stokowski very intrigued and thus began the collaboration of two entertainment giants. When composing the music, Stokowski got so into it that he spent three hours one night perfecting his score with his orchestra. However, that sense of perfectionism came with a big price. Quite literally, in fact. The budget of the short grew at a frighteningly large rate, so much that it became three times more expensive than the average Mickey cartoon, which started to concern Roy and even Walt that something so expensive might never make its money back. What can they do to balance that out? Well, funny enough, the answer came from Leopold's enthusiasm, who was bursting with energy after scoring The Sorcerer's Apprentice that he wanted to do more which gave Disney the brilliant idea of making shorts similar to the experimental Mickey project, but put them all into one feature. A concert feature, if you will. So in 1938, Disney extended Stokowski's contract and began work on the concert feature. When it was time to select which musical pieces to use and what visuals to match them with, Walt and Leopold didn't just bring in some of Disney's team members for the meeting. They also enlisted the help of composer and music critic Deems Taylor to be an advisor in the selections. He was also brought on board to appear on camera during the film as the Master of Ceremonies, where he would introduce each segment of the feature. What you're going to see are the designs and pictures and stories that music inspired in the minds and imaginations of a group of artists. Once all the music was selected, there was still one thing to do for the picture. The title. I mean, the concert feature is alright, but it's just a little dull and generic, don't you think? So after careful consideration of many different names, the one that ultimately got chosen and expressed the true meaning of what this film is all about was Fantasia. Which its definition is stated as a free, usually instrumental composition, not in strict form. So now that everything was set for Fantasia, it was time for the animators to get to work and bring the music to life. Going in the order of their appearance in the movie, it begins with Tokura and Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach, which starts with live action shots of the orchestra, illuminated to emphasize their colorful shadows, then transition to abstract animation that reflect the music. For the abstract look, it started with the designs of effects animator Cy Young, and then Disney brought in German animator Oscar Fischinger to fully create the overall look. Oscar also helped out in Pinocchio with the Blue Fairy's wand effects. However, against Fischinger's wishes, Walt had to scale back the abstract to make the visuals more appealing to the public. The next number is the Nutcracker Suite by Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky where it depicts the changing of the seasons by bringing nature to life and some fairies are included to help the transitions. This piece was added in order to have the people with less knowledge on classical music to be more engaged with the film with something that they could be familiar with. While they may have taken out the traditional story of the Nutcracker in favor of the seasons, the animation still retains some of its ballet elements. Speaking of which, because of the complex technical demands in the animation of the dancing plants, fish, fairies, and many more, a cell that presented only a 24th of a second took approximately three to four hours to create each. Then it's the segment that originated Fantasia, 
The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Among all the numbers in the movie, The Sorcerer's Apprentice is the only one where its story stays true to the one that's meant to be accompanied to its respective musical piece. Over the years since his first appearance in the late 1920s, the design of Mickey Mouse had significantly evolved. But for Fantasia, where there was no sound or dialogue to help the animation, Mickey had to have a new look so that he could be purely expressive. So with the help of animator Fred Moore, the mouse got a new design where he was given pupils for his eyes. But while it was originally built for Fantasia, the design first appeared in 1939 in cartoons like The Pointer and Mickey's Surprise Party. Also, the wizard that Mickey works for is a caricature of Walt Disney himself, so much so that they gave him Disney's name backwards for his name as Yen Sid. He even shares Walt's famous eyebrow raise. Yeah, before Dwayne Johnson and DreamWorks were doing it, the raised eyebrows was Walt's thing. Next up is The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky that presents the origins of life on Earth from the planet's beginnings to the extinction of the dinosaurs. At the time, it was a pretty taboo subject due to the debate of evolution versus creationism, which was why Walt scaled it back from its original concept of the expanded story that included the dawn of mammals and the first humans. At the start of the segment, the animators had to rely on effects animation to progress the story with the bubbling lava and the smoking and exploding volcanoes. For the dinosaurs, it was a real challenge because at the time, there was no idea regarding how they were alive or how they moved. With the help of many experts, the animators had to mostly rely on their own imagination on how these dinosaurs came to life and how they would fight against one another. Then it's the Pastoral Symphony by Ludwig van Beethoven, which shows a regular day in a world based on Greek and Roman mythology filled with gods, centaurs, pegasus, fauns, and cupids. Originally, the music that would accompany this number was Gabriel Pierny's Cydalis et le Chèvre Pied. But Walt changed it to Beethoven's piece because he felt like it had a stronger sense of mythological power. For the 1969 reissue and all of the re-releases following afterwards, Disney removed two characters named Sunflower and Otica due to their offensive stereotypical depiction of African Americans. And considering how their roles in the film are to be the black centaurette servants to the white centaurettes and Bacchus, yeah, at least for the public releases of the film, they had to go. After that, it's Dance of the Hours by Amilcare Ponchielli, a ballet presented by animals that depicts the different times of the day, from the morning with the ostriches, to the afternoon with the hippos, to the evening with the elephants, to the night with the alligators. As it is the more comical segment of the feature, the point of this number is to be a parody of all those high-class dance numbers that were often found in movies at the time. Even the selection of the music with Dance of the Hours is part of the joke. The biggest challenge in this segment for the animators is getting familiar with the art of ballet. Sure, there was a bit in the Nutcracker Suite, but that was more of an abstract depiction of it. Here, however, they had to not only literally animate ballerina dancers, but also depict them as animals. This was why the animators mainly spent their time on researching and studying ballet dancers and the animals they had to work on. And finally, it's Night on Bald Mountain by Moldes Mussorgsky and Ave Maria by Franz Schubert, where it begins with the giant devil Chernobog summoning spirits all around the mountain, but was stopped by the sound of bells at the crack of dawn, which follows a group of monks with torches walking through the forest and ends with the sun rising for a new day. For the design of both parts, the animators made sure to stay true with the works of book illustrator Kai Nielsen, who helped capture the signature look of the pieces. As for the iconic devil Chernabog, the animation was led by Bill Titla, who had experience with animating a large and threatening character with Stromboli in Pinocchio. It also helped that his Ukrainian origins made him familiar with the folklores behind the tale of Bald Mountain, which the story here is a little more faithful to the one for the music piece than some of the others. When capturing references, Disney hired Dracula actor Bela Lugosi to do the poses for Chernobog, but Tyla didn't like him and instead got the director of the sequence, Wilfred Jackson, to do the poses with his shirt off. 
As for the Ave Maria sequence, very little animation was actually used, and it put the scenic backgrounds and the multiplane camera to the ultimate test. It took nine men six exhausting days and nights to pull off the long single shots of the six minute part. In the original ending, the forest would go through a stained glass window of a cathedral and inside would show a statue of the Madonna. Of course, this ending was a little too religious and maybe a bit too on the nose as well with the whole heaven versus hell motif. In its place to make the ending more universal, through the forest lays a valley where the sun rises from the hills as a symbol of hope. But combining classical music with Disney's top quality animation wasn't enough for Walt. He wanted the audience to experience the music like no other movie could at the time, as if they were standing next to Stokowski while he was orchestrating his music. So Disney's engineering team devised an invention that they called Fantasound, which allowed the movie to have different soundtracks play in the left, center, and right stage of the theater, with additional soundtracks being played in the backside of the room as well, giving the illusion that the sound is traveling everywhere while several people in real time had to control the movements of the audio channels. In modern terms, Fantasound was the prototype of the surround sound system, making Fantasia the first movie to use surround sound. But that wasn't all. As it was a film unlike any other, Walt wanted to treat this not like a movie, but like an event. Since Disney's distributor at the time, RKO Radio Pictures, refused to release it under their company for being way too different for their taste, for the first time, Disney managed the distribution on their own. On its initial release on November 13, 1940, Fantasia became a major roadshow attraction shown in 13 theaters across America, with the first to open at the Broadway Theater in New York City, all of which set up with the Fantasound system. It had trained people to cue the lighting and curtains and take people to their seats when they buy a ticket, theater marquees were set up, program booklets were made and handed out, it was like going to a real concert! However, Despite all the glamour of the roadshow, the technical innovations of Fantasound, and the new levels of art achieved by both Stokowski's music and Disney's animation, the result turned out to be as well as Mickey when he lost control of the brooms. In terms of the reception, it was very split where people either loved it or despised it. There were film critics who praised the movie as another great masterpiece from Disney, but then there were prominent figures in the classical music community that resented the film by either claiming that the animation robbed the integrity of the music, or said that Stokowski butchered the musical pieces. As for the box office, it was an inevitable bomb by only making approximately $1.3 million. Sure, during the screenings, they were a big hit among those who have seen it, but there were too many factors that played in the feature's demise. The budget was as big as Pinocchio's at nearly $2.3 million, the cost to set up Fantasound was $85,000 for each theater, World War II was blocking off some of the international markets, and not to mention the fact of the very limited amount of areas that showed the feature. Originally, Disney wanted Fantasia to be an ever-evolving project, where the film would be re-released every few years, but would feature a brand new segment with every reissue. Some were already in consideration, some had Deems Taylor already recorded his introduction, some that Leopold had conducted the music, and for one of them, Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy, was completely animated. But due to the failure of the film's first run, all those plans were completely cancelled. The Claire de Lune segment was later repurposed and rescored for the Blue Bayou segment in the 1946 film Make Mine Music. By 1941, RKO changed its mind and decided to help Disney with a better release of Fantasia, but under a few conditions. One was to remove the whole Fantasound system and have the movie be in mono to make it easier to distribute, and cut the film's 125 minute running time to 81 minutes, removing the Tokata and Fugue number and a lot of Deems Taylor's introductions. All caught up, its surround sound magic taken away, and ended up as a disaster for Disney that made the studio lost money, Fantasia hit rock bottom. But if there is one good thing to note about that, its future had only one direction to go from there, and that is up. 
1942, the film received two honorary Oscars at the Academy Awards. One was for Fantasound for the crew's outstanding contribution to the achievement of the use of sound in motion pictures through the production of Fantasia, and the other was for Leopold Stokowski and his associates for their unique achievement in the creation of a new form of visualized music in Walt Disney's production Fantasia, thereby widening the scope of the motion picture as entertainment and as an art form. For the 1946 reissue, the movie almost returned back to normal as the Tokoda and Fugue segment returned along with Deems Taylor's introductions, but altered to have them shortened to give the film a new running time of 115 minutes. Fantasound also slightly returned as time passed by as the technology for stereo sound gradually got better. But its recognition by the public as a Disney classic wouldn't truly happen until the 1969 re-release, where the psychedelic imagery really resonated with people during the hippie movement. But throughout its reissues and home media releases, which accumulated a box office total of $76.4 million, it wasn't until in 2000 when the movie was released on DVD as part of the Fantasia Anthology set, where Disney fully restored the feature to have it be as true to the original length as possible, and have it be in 5.1 surround sound, making it the first time since 1940 that people can experience Fantasia just like how it was in the roadshow. The only significant difference was that Deems Taylor's audio was lost in the restoration, so they had to be dubbed by Corey Burton. Ever since its release, Fantasia eventually grew to become a true Disney icon that many can easily recognize, even to the point of having some laughs about it. The movie had often been the subject of parody by the Warner Brothers cartoons, The Simpsons, and there was even an entire feature-length parody of Fantasia with the 1976 Italian animated film Allegro Non Troppo. The image of him in the sorcerer outfit became one of Mickey's most iconic costumes, with Disney often displaying it prominently with the sorcerer's hat and his red robe, especially at the parks. In 2010, the Sorcerer's Apprentice segment was the inspiration for the Jerry Bruckenheimer-produced feature The Sorcerer's Apprentice starring Nicolas Cage and Jay Baruchel, and in 2014, the film spun off a rhythm game by Harmonix for the Xbox One and Xbox 360 called Fantasia Music Evolve, where the player moves in time with the contemporary music. Going back to 1990, the film was added to the National Film Registry, and five years later, the Vatican put the film among its list of 45 great films in honor of cinema's 100th anniversary. Later, the American Film Institute put this film at number 58 of its top 100 movies list and at number 5 on its top 100 animated films. But if you thought the perfect way to watch the film was to see it just like it was during the roadshow, there was one way to top that. A series of concert presentations called Disney's Fantasia Live in Concert had toured around the world to not only present the segments of both the film and its sequel on the big screen, but also feature a live symphony orchestra playing the music with the animation. While it may not have been an immediate success, Fantasia would eventually find its status as a Disney masterpiece and be beloved by critics and audiences as not a movie, but as Disney's most experimental, unique, and one of his greatest works of art. When Walt Disney began his journey into animation, he quickly climbed up the ranks to become the number one cartoon producer in Hollywood. Not only was he able to become very successful in one of America's toughest economic times, 
but he also did so by pushing the medium of animation to heights never reached before. Rather it be with his creation of Mickey Mouse, his experiments with the Silly Symphony cartoons, or by making the first American animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Yes, the 1930s certainly was when Walt was established as an entertainment icon. But once 1940 came in, that's when things really went downhill fast. When he released both Pinocchio and Fantasia during that year, they were both very well received by critics and audiences, and they both would go on to become cinematic masterpieces in their own right. However, when they first came out, there was one massive problem with them. He lost a lot of money on both. So at that point, Walt had to produce something cheap and fast in order to make up for the losses of his previous features. The result? Dumbo. It's the story of a baby elephant named Dumbo, whom upon being delivered by the stork to his mother in the circus, was discovered to have massive ears, even bigger than his whole body. While he may have been ridiculed for his ears by both the circus audience and the other elephants, a mouse named Timothy befriends Dumbo and aids him to turn his humiliation into triumph that can make him fly. Quite literally, in fact. Just like with Pinocchio, the idea came to Walt in late 1939 when one of his employees, this time the head of merchandise licensing, Kay Kamen, showed him a prototype of a toy called Rollobook. It was like a children's book, but instead of flipping the pages, kids would have to roll the wheels to read the story like a scroll. In it was a story called Dumbo by the couple Helen Aberson Mayer and Harold Pearl, and Walt saw the strong potential to adapt it into animation. It was originally just going to be a silly symphony short, but it was then decided to be a feature so that the story could be told better. That, and considering the serious financial troubles caused by the downfall of Pinocchio and Fantasia, the simplicity of the story would help to have this be a low-budget film. Once he settled to have Dumbo be his next movie, Walt gave the writing duties to Joe Grant and Dick Humor, who were not only in charge of adapting the story, but to also add new scenes and change up a few things, like a Red Robin character that would help Dumbo on his journey was replaced by the mouse we know today as Timothy. The way the duo wrote the story for Walt was often noted to be as unique as Dumbo's ears, where instead of just giving him a whole script, they wrote the movie in chapters and only handed them over one by one while ending them off with an emotionally engaging cliffhanger. A weird strategy to keep teasing Walt to have him approve of their draft, but hey, it did work. Among the cast, Dumbo is noted to be the first movie to include a couple of actors that would later become Disney veterans that would provide the voice of many beloved characters in later films. They include Sterling Holloway, the voice of Mr. Stork, and later the voice of Adult Flower, the Cheshire Cat, Winnie the Pooh, Ka, Rockford, and the narrator of several cartoons, and Verna Felton, the voice of the Elephant Matriarch, and later the voice of the Fairy Godmother, the Queen of Hearts, Aunt Sarah, Flora, Queen Leia, and Winifred. On a side note, Sterling was originally considered by Disney to voice Sleepy in Snow White, but the role was ultimately played by the voice of Goofy and Grumpy, Pinto Colving. Unlike the other films, where it was driven by Walt's passion to achieve a high level of art in animation, the biggest goal for Dumbo was to make it as cost-effective as possible. While many of Disney's top animators that also pioneered the modern way of developing the medium were working on the film to ensure it still has that Disney quality, new techniques also had to be invented to ensure that it can save the company money and stay true to the movie's simplicity. That and little to no changes were demanded from the original draft, so the production stayed true to the script since the very beginning. However, some of the same old techniques were still used for the film, like having animal studies and using live action references, where they hired the Jackson Brothers to suggest some dances for the Crow's musical number, When I See an Elephant Fly. So far, things were going well with the making of Dumbo. Costs were kept low, production was running smoothly, nothing seems like it could go wrong. That was until May 29th, 1941, when the animators went on strike. Ever since Disney built the new studio in Burbank, the atmosphere among the artists drastically changed. 
a hierarchy system gradually enveloped in the studio where those at the top like the head writers and lead animators had better services, access to leisurely rooms, and received an amazing salary, while the lower tier people worked in secluded spaces, had to follow strict policies, and received little pay. After the failure of the 1940 films, the system became even worse where the benefits and working conditions became completely unbalanced, on top of several workers getting laid off. One of whom was considered as one of Disney's top animators, Art Babbitt, noticed the unfairness among all the artists and ultimately decided to join the Screen Cartoonist Guild, where he demanded that the Disney studio would get unionized. Walt, however, did not see any issues with the class distinctions and refused to let the studio be a part of any union. This, of course, did not go well with the artists and a war within the company began. Hundreds of animators joined Babbitt's side to become unionized and picketed outside the studio, which even received help from Disney's competitors like Leon Schlesinger of Warner Brothers. What was worse was the tension between Walt and Art as they grew to become arch enemies, and they never had a good relationship to begin with. It even got to the point that an actual brawl occurred while they were picketing. <laughs> As a way to artistically get back at them, the Strikers were satirizing Dumbo as the circus clowns who want to go and hit the big boss for a raise. It wouldn't be until five weeks later when Disney finally signed a union contract, but the damage of the studio was already done. What was once an animation powerhouse that had around 1,200 employees now steadily lost nearly half of them, including some of their best artists and animators like Babbitt, T. He, Bill Melendez, Maurice Noble, Frank Tashlin, Bill Titla, and Tyrus Wong. But the biggest consequence was that the strike left Walt with a permanent psychological scar. It was already enough that he was discouraged by Pinocchio and Fantasia's failure. But now the strike made Walt lose a lot of his trust with his own animators, and that spark for animation was no longer as strong as it was during the days of Mickey Mouse and Snow White. That, and he developed a paranoia-like fear of communism, and claimed that was mainly to blame for the strike. While it did delay a bit of the movie's production, Dumbo was finally complete and released on October 31st, 1941, and it was the success that Disney needed. On a budget of between $850,000 and $950,000, the film made over $1.3 million, giving the company some profit for the first time since Snow White. As for critics and audiences, they loved it as much as Disney's more expensive features, falling in love with the humor, the songs, the animation, and especially the heart. It won an Academy Award for Best Original Score and got nominated for Best Original Song for Baby Mine. Dumbo almost got his chance to be on the cover of Time Magazine and be named Mammal of the Year, but because of the Pearl Harbor attack that occurred that year, his cover spot was taken by Admiral Yamamoto. However, not everything about Dumbo flew high and pretty after its release. The film had often been regarded as a subject of controversy because of the Crow characters. Some accused them of being racist for being depicted as African-American stereotypes, and how the leader of the Crows, played by the white actor and voice of Jiminy Cricket Cliff Edwards, is very awkwardly named Jim Crow. On the other hand, many have also stepped in to deny these claims, stating that while Jim may be voiced by a white guy, the rest of the Crows' voices were black, and the way they are depicted in the film are not as stereotypes, but rather as free spirits and a smart group of birds that know how to give Dumbo the confidence to fly. In 1955, the film became the inspiration of one of Disney's most popular attractions, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, which now can be found at every Disney park, and the train Casey Jr. also appeared in the parks as a ride at Disneyland and Disneyland Paris, and as a float for the Main Street Electrical Parade. In 1985, a live-action puppet series aired on the Disney Channel called Dumbo's Circus, which featured Dumbo running his own circus with his new animal friends that ran for one whole year. In 2017, the movie was added to the National Film Registry, and two years later, 
Disney released a live-action remake, or more of a reimagining, directed by Tim Burton and starring Colin Farrell, Danny DeVito, Eva Green, and Michael Keaton. The result became quite the opposite of the animated feature, where the 1941 film was short, simple, had a small budget, beloved by the public, and was a hit for Disney, the remake was nearly twice as long, overly complicated, got mixed reactions, over budgeted at $170 million, and ended up as a box office flop. While it may be a lot simpler than Disney's previous films, it is also the reason why many to this day state that Dumbo is simply perfect. While Dumbo only took around a year and a half to make thanks to its simplicity, the next movie was artistically the opposite of what the elephant achieved, as it was realistically complex and took the studio several years to produce. That film was Bambi, based on the 1923 novel Bambi, A Life in the Woods by Felix Salton. The movie presents the life of a deer named Bambi from his birth all the way up to his adulthood. During his time in the forest, while he is the next to become the great prince, he spends his time discovering the world around him and playing with his friends like a rabbit named Thumper and a skunk named Flower. However, during his time growing up, he also goes through some hardships, especially when man is in the forest. But no matter how old he is, he always learns from either his mother or friend Owl about life, death, and love. It all began when in 1933, a certain filmmaker got their hands on the book and was inspired to turn it into a feature film. And we all know who this man is, right? It was none other than Sidney Franklin, the producer and director at MGM. He wanted to create a live-action adaptation of Bambi, but after trying some test footage, he realized that the camera could never do justice to tell this story. Then suddenly, he had an idea to make the best out of this novel. Maybe you couldn't film an adaptation, but you could certainly draw it. And at the time, there was no better person who could make better animations than the artists at Disney. So in 1937, Franklin sold the film rights of the book to Walt, and he immediately sprang into action to make Bambi his next animated feature. In fact, he originally wanted Bambi to be his second movie. However, as soon as he got into it, there were several obstacles that even his crew weren't ready to take on. There was the tone of the book being a little too dark compared to the light-hearted standards that Disney was known for, other productions like Pinocchio and Fantasia took bigger priority to make, and the artists were not trained enough to realistically animate forest animals like deer. Sure, they drew some for Snow White, but the focus on capturing realism there was entirely on the humans, while the animals still looked more like cartoons than something believable. It wouldn't be until 1939 when production officially began, but only at a steady pace while the company was handling other projects. Many different characters were proposed for this movie, but a lot of them either had their roles cut down or never appeared in the finished film. There was Thumper's dad who was supposed to appear, along with Thumper's siblings having a role as prominent as his, a chipmunk and a squirrel that were a comedic duo, and some insects like ants, grasshoppers, and bees that would have brought more life to the forest. But eventually, they were all taken out because they didn't give much to the story, or Walt and the writing team wanted to keep the focus onto Bambi, Thumper, and Flower. But even when the film has those light-hearted and charmingly funny moments, there is one scene in particular that the public to this day often first associates with this movie. Originally, the film would have shown Bambi's mother getting shot, but then the writers felt that considering the scene's job was to establish that she died, it would have been emotionally too much. It was already enough that the scene said that she's dead, but actually seeing her dead? I can't stand it any longer! There was also a payback scene by the end where the hunter would have been shown being burned to death by the fire he caused. But that was taken out in favor of not showing the hunter at all and only referring to him as... Man... was in the forest. But even without seeing any bodies, the scene to this day is still regarded as one of the most powerful and heartbreaking moments in cinema. It was even noted to be the inspiration for Beatles member Paul McCartney to have an interest in animal rights. Like with Snow White, 
The biggest goal for the animation was to capture realism, but this time, the artist wanted to bring animals and nature to life in a way that is more down to earth than what they did in Snow White and Fantasia. The animators spent a lot of their time researching and studying animal anatomy and how they move, even bringing a little zoo in the studio to look at the animals firsthand. Once they knew how to draw the anatomy, there was still something that was missing. Yes, they could now draw a real deer, but for Bambi, it is still an animated film. The character still had to talk and convey human emotion if it wanted to connect with audiences, and it had to have a design that could present that convincingly. This was when animator Mark Davis stepped in and drew Bambi's face as if it were expressing the emotions of a human baby, and Mill Call was the one that made the final design that combined the artist's anatomy studies with Mark's faces to create the iconic deer we know today. As for the backgrounds with the forest, that actually had less emphasis on realism. Instead of trying to make it look real, the artist wanted to make it feel real, which was why the environment around Bambi is more reminiscent to Impressionist paintings. The reason for this was because of Tyrus Wong, whose concepts and artworks made him the art director of the feature and was the inspiration for the movie style. While it may have taken Walt six years to make the feature since he first got the film rights, Bambi was finally completed and got released on August 21st, 1942. However, the results did not come out strong, neither financially nor even critically. The film received mixed reviews where critics were put off by the lack of fantasy that Disney was renowned for in his movies and cartoons. It didn't help either that it was receiving complaints from hunters who accused the film of making them look like villains. As for the box office, while not as much of a failure as the 1940 films, it only made $1.64 million with a $1.7 million budget. This time, World War II was a bigger factor to this than ever, not only due to some of the international markets closed off, but also America got involved with the war since the attack on Pearl Harbor. It put the film in the middle of a blazing fire with what was seemingly no way out. But just like in Bambi's case, the fire eventually subsided to breathe new life to the movie. As time moved on, the criticisms gradually turned into praise as critics now call it one of Disney's crowning achievements in animation. And with the re-releases gathering newfound audiences long after the war, the film ended up receiving more than $267 million. There was even a Donald Duck cartoon in 1955 where Bambi and his mother made a cameo. The hunter's natural instinct helps him blaze a trail. Man is in the forest. Let's dig out. After its initial release, Bambi temporarily became an icon for the United States Forest Service and appeared in campaigns for fire prevention. However, Disney only let them have him for a year, which resulted the Forest Service to later create their own fire prevention mascot with Smokey Bear. But it wouldn't be the only time he would collaborate with the USFS, though. In 2006, Bambi reappeared in the public service announcements with clips of the movie and from the direct-to-video sequel released that same year to tell people to not let our forest become a once-upon-a-time. It got selected to be in the National Film Registry in 2011, and the American Film Institute put the movie on a couple of their lists, including number 20 on their top 100 villains with Man, and at number 3 on their top 10 animated films. While it may be commonplace in many lists of the best animated features and best movies, what could arguably be the strangest list that featured Bambi was in 2007, when Time put the film on its top 25 horror movies of all time. A list that includes... Burn. Many may consider it to be one of the greatest coming-of-age stories in movies, but not many people know that the movie itself went through a coming-of-age story that's equally as great. Guess there's a good reason why this is Walt's personal favorite movie he made, huh? With the financial failure of Bambi, the patterns of the studio's recent flops were no longer just a mere coincidence. While part of the blame could be pointed towards going over budget, they all suffered from many of the European and Asian markets shutting their doors due to World War II. And as I said before, 
even America started to get into the action after the events of Pearl Harbor. So now with everyone involved, it wouldn't take too long for the company to find itself in the middle of all this and get drafted. And thus, the Disney Studios went to war. Their first duty actually started in early 1941 during the development of Dumbo, where Walt and 18 of his trusted employees were sent by the United States Department of State to go on a goodwill tour across South America with Disney as their ambassador. It was very beneficial for both the country and the studio. It was good for the United States so that their relations with the Latin American countries remained strong and not have them switch over to the Nazi Germany side, and it was good for Disney because it gave Walt a form of escape from the strike so that it could be resolved by the time he returned. But while they were partly treating it like a three-month vacation, it was also an opportunity for the team to do research and create two animated features that highlight South American culture since those could also play a role in the Goodwill operation and have the government fund them. These include 1942's Saludos Amigos and 1944's The Three Caballeros. After the release of Bambi, the studio quickly converted into a military base, housing over 500 soldiers while some of the artists were sent off becoming soldiers to fight in the war. Also, since the company was restricted by the banks to only produce animated shorts during the war while the features they had in development were all put on hold, almost all the content Disney put out at the time was for the military, including the 1943 film Victory Through Air Power. While it still may give the studio some work during World War II, it didn't really help them that much financially, since at best the animated projects broke even. Once the war was over, it didn't take long to see how the world completely changed because of those events, even in the animation field. Disney was no longer secure at the top of the cartoon industry, as tougher competition began to emerge getting attention away from Mickey Mouse like Warner Brothers and MGM, and what's worse, the Disney Studios was still left low on cash, unable to produce the animated features they wanted to make. While they were still able to create more shorts with Mickey, Goofy, Donald, and more, the company had to look for more cost-effective ways for their bigger projects, including experimenting with non-animated films where Walt began a nature documentary series called True Life Adventures, starting with 1948's Oscar-winning Seal Island. They were still able to produce movies, but they had to be live-action films that featured animated characters in their own cartoon segments or blended in with the real environments, including 1946 Song of the South and 1948 So Dear to My Heart. As for animated features, all Disney could do was projects that share the same template as Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros and produce what is referred to as package films which is a collection of animated shorts packaged together and released them all in one shot as a feature film, including 1946's Make Mine Music and 1948's Melody Time. However, two of these package films would later stand out among the rest and would be viewed as iconic as some of the actual Disney movies. One of them, released in 1947, was Fun and Fancy Free. The film features two different stories, with the first being Bongo. Introduced by Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio and narrated by Dinah Shore, it's about a circus bear named Bongo who breaks out to live free in the forest, which did not turn out to be as great as he thought. That is, until he falls in love with a girl bear named Lulu Bell, where the only thing that's standing in Bongo's way for romance is a giant bear who also has hearts for Lulu Bell named Lumpjaw. The other story of the feature, narrated by Edgar Bergen, is Mickey and the Beanstalk, where in Happy Valley, the town fell into complete turmoil and poverty due to the singing harp being stolen. Three of the residents, Mickey, Goofy, and Donald, traded their cow for magic beans, which at night grew into a giant beanstalk and brought the whole house up to a massive castle, which has the singing harp. Now it's up to the gang to rescue the harp to save their town and escape the wrath of the giant named Willie. Originally, for both stories, they were meant to be their own separate features. Starting off with Bongo, the project was based on a short story found in the Cosmopolitan in 1930 by Sinclair Lewis. When the Disney team had their hands on the project, they had many different ideas of what to do with Bongo that ultimately never came into fruition. 
One of these was to make this a sequel to Dumbo, where some of the characters from the film would have also made an appearance. At the same time, new characters would have aided Bongo on his adventures, including a chimpanzee that was called either Beverly or Chimpy, along with two mischievous bear cubs. However, those plans ultimately never came to be. The characters also had a more realistic design, but was also dropped in favor of a cartoonier look. When bringing back Jiminy Cricket, along with his original voice actor, Cliff Edwards, he also brought with him the song, I'm a Happy-Go-Lucky Fellow, which was originally meant for Pinocchio, but ultimately got cut. Meanwhile, as the animators were performing their circus bear act, another group was developing Mickey's next big adventure. Animators Bill Cottrell and T. Hee thought up of a film adaptation of the classic fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk, but starring Mickey Mouse with Goofy and Donald Duck by his side. The pitch was great and even Walt enjoyed it, but not enough to seriously turn it into a movie. It took some time to talk him into it, but they ultimately convinced Disney to make it and production began on May 2nd, 1940 under the title, The Legend of Happy Valley. Funny enough, it wouldn't be the first time that Mickey had to fight against a giant. He famously took down one in 1938's Brave Little Taylor, and even before that, Mickey starred in a cartoon that was a loose adaptation of Jack and the Beanstalk in 1933's Giant Land. However, while this wasn't Mickey's first encounter with giants, this was one of the last times that Walt provided the voice of Mickey. Disney had been the voice ever since the mouse first had sound in Steamboat Willie. But later on, he had less time and his smoking was weakening his body to the point that he could no longer do the job. So in 1948, after Fun and Fancy Free's release, Walt passed the baton onto the head of sound effects Jimmy McDonald to be Mickey's new voice and continued the legacy until 1977. But there was one instance afterwards when Walt returned as Mickey in the late 1950s for the Mickey Mouse Club. Hi, Mouseketeers. Well, here we go again, so hang on, anything goes. You ready? I don't know about you, but this does a better job than any commercial can to tell me that I should never smoke. Originally, there was supposed to be a scene where the mouse was shown trading the cow for magic beans, and there were a few versions of it, but it ultimately never happened. One idea was to have Honest John and Gideon from Pinocchio con him into trading for the beans, while another that was far into development was Mickey giving the cow to the queen, played by Minnie, where she then rewards him with her family heirloom of magic beans. Unlike Bongo, this project would end up receiving several versions, each with a different narrator telling the story. The original had ventriloquist Edgar Bergen in live-action segments tell the story to child actress Luana Patton at her birthday party, with the assistance of his dummies Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. When the beanstalk grew into television, the second version had narrations by Sterling Holloway in 1955. The third featured Ludwig von Drake alongside Herman the Boodle Beetle in 1963. And finally, the fourth had Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop in 1973 for the TV show The Mouse Factory. By that time, both projects were going well into production, but then at the end of 1941, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, that was when everything was put to a halt. It wouldn't be until after the war when they brought those projects back. But due to the need to cut down costs and that Walt didn't feel like either stories would be strong enough to stand as their own features, he decided to scale them down to bring out both Bongo and The Legend of Happy Valley, now called Mickey and the Beanstalk, together as a package film. When the movie was released on September 27, 1947, the critics felt rather mixed. While generally agreed to be mediocre, at best they said that it was okay, but still nowhere in the leagues of something like Snow White or Pinocchio. As for the box office, it did gather some money with $3.165 million in worldwide rentals. As I've stated before, the two segments would go on to have numerous airings on television, especially Mickey and the Beanstalk and all of its different narrators. In fact, it became one of the most well-known adaptations of the fairy tale, and Willie would go on to appear in several different Disney projects with Mickey. 
His most famous appearance after his theatrical debut was in 1983 where he played as the Ghost of Christmas Present in Mickey's Christmas Carol. While it may just be one of Disney's small package films, it was a little opportunity for the team to just go and make something full of fun and fancy free. The other notable movie during that time was also the last of the package films of the 1940s, known as the 1949 feature, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Both based on classic works of literature, the first story is The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Narrated by Basil Rathbone, it tells the tale of Mr. Toad, whose obsession with fads often get him in a lot of trouble, especially when he quickly developed a mania for motor cars. When one incident left him in prison and lost his deed to Toad Hall, it's up to his friends Ratty, Molly, and Angus McBadger to save him and prove his innocence. The second story is The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Narrated by Bing Crosby, it's about Ichabod Crane, the new schoolmaster of a small town in New York called Sleepy Hollow. During a Halloween party, he learns about the legend of the Headless Horseman, an evil spirit whom every Halloween night returns from the dead in search of a new head to take as his own. But when it's time to head back home, Ichabod discovers firsthand to see if the legends are true. The idea all started way back in 1938, after the release of Snow White, where storyman James Bordrero and animator Campbell Grant pitched to Walt a film adaptation of The Wind in the Willows. Since it's a story that mainly features anthropomorphic animals, the only way one could properly adapt it into a movie at the time was with animation. Disney was skeptical at first, but then got the rights not long after in order to turn it into a feature film. Production was pretty rough by the early 1940s, even when under the directing guide of James Alger. But it did pick up a bit when the team that made Bambi came in to help out as that film was finishing up, and the new project began animation. But like what happened with Fun and Fancy Free, by the end of 1941, the studio was put to a halt and temporarily had to stop its production on feature films. However, there is one thing about it that I have yet to mention. While the studios had to be restricted to making shorts, the only exceptions to this rule are the movies that were far into production so that they could be finished like Bambi. And since The Wind in the Willows already started its animation process, it was allowed to continue during the war. Too bad that it didn't last long though, since Walt decided to scrap the project because he felt like the quality of the picture was far from the standards of his previous films like Snow White or Fantasia. It wouldn't be until years later in 1946 when the project returned. But now with the new mindset of producing package films, Walt demanded that The Wind of the Willows be shortened to just 25 minutes. Meanwhile, later in that same year, Disney began production on a new adaptation, this time with The Legend of Sleepy Hollow with Clyde Geronimi and Jack Kinney as directors. At the time, it was a good subject for the studio to take on not only because of its popularity, but also because it was a short story from Washington Irving's The Sketchbook, making it a perfect choice to add it into one of Disney's package films. Once the cartoons were set up, the only challenge at that point was to know which of them should be put together, especially in the case of the shorts from this film and Fun and Fancy Free. Originally, The Wind of the Willows was meant to be paired up with Mickey and the Beanstalk for a feature called Two Fabulous Characters, but then it was ultimately decided to have Mickey appear with Bongo for their own feature. As for The Wind of the Willows, it eventually paired up with Sleepy Hollow and have the title changed to The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. When it was released on October 5th, 1949, the film received stronger praise than Fun and Fancy Free, saying that they were aware that they're not fully faithful to their respective source material, but still admired the high energy and great narration that showed that Disney still had some magic from before the war. It even managed to win a Golden Globe Award for Best Cinematography in Color. Afterwards, the fabulous characters would split ways to form their own legacy in the world of Disney, airing on television and even returning to theaters as their own shorts before the main feature film would begin. 
In the case of The Wind in the Willows, it was the inspiration for one of Disneyland's opening day attractions, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and some of the characters would later return in new roles in the 1983 short film Mickey's Christmas Carol. As for The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, the cartoon became a staple in many of Disney's Halloween TV specials, while the Headless Horseman himself became a tradition at the Disney parks as he leads the Halloween-themed nighttime parades. Oh, I almost forgot about the box office numbers! While Ichabod and Mr. Toad may have critically surpassed Fun and Fancy Free, it financially only made about half as much with $1.625 million in worldwide rentals, which highlighted a problem not just with this movie, but with the package films in general. Sure, at best, they can be a bit profitable, but economically, it's like if the studio was going nowhere by playing it safe with them and getting a bit of extra cash from the reissues of the older movies. At that point, Walt knew that if he wanted to take back the top spot of the animation industry, he needed another Snow White. He needed to make another full-length animated feature where he and his animation team would give it everything they got, and once again put his entire studio and legacy at risk. He got all of his money, he got all the right people to make a movie, but all he needed was the right story that could perfectly fit the glass slipper. I think it's safe to say that the 1940s was the toughest decade of Walt Disney's career. Not only did it start off with two of his big movies becoming financial flops, but it was then followed by some major events that forever changed both the company and Walt in a way that left them worse than before. There was the 1941 strike that soured Disney's relationship with his team of artists and animators, and World War II led the government to temporarily take over the studio and had them only make content related to the military. These moments cost Disney about half of his crew, most of his spirit for animation, and especially, a lot of money. So much so that after the war, all they could do was just make little cartoons for either their popular characters or their package films while looking into other ventures to get revenue like making live action features and nature documentaries. It was at that point that Walt realized that if he wanted to take his position back as the leader of the animation industry, he'd have to make another Snow White. And I don't mean just make another animated feature based on a fairy tale starring a princess, but rather that he'd have to risk everything on this one movie to get back on top. And that film was Cinderella. It's the story of an orphan girl named Cinderella, who despite her kind-hearted nature, is treated terribly by her stepmother Lady Tremaine and her two stepsisters. When they ruin her chance to go to the ball in the royal palace meant to find the prince a girl to marry, her fairy godmother appears to make her dream come true by using magic to make her stand out among the crowd and later fall in love with the prince. But only until midnight when the spell breaks. When it came to the classic fairy tale by Charles Perrault, Walt always had a personal connection to the story. I mean, as a timeless rags to riches tale, I'm sure that's something he could relate to. But this movie was far from the first time he wanted to adapt the story into animation. In fact, one of his laugh grand cartoons back in 1922 was a modern retelling of Cinderella. Afterwards, through the 1930s and early 1940s, Walt and his team made numerous of attempts to make a bigger and better Cinderella cartoon. The idea started out as a silly symphony short, but as early as 1938, they ultimately decided that a feature-length film would be more suitable to tell the tale. 
Over the years, several storymen tried and failed to make a Cinderella story that Walt would approve of, and production had to be put to a halt by 1945. The concept of a Cinderella movie still loomed over the studio as they tried to keep themselves afloat by producing package films. But it wasn't until in 1947 after the release of Fun and Fancy Free when Walt decided that something must be done to get rid of the company's debt faster and took a gamble on resuming the production of animated features. There were a few that were in development, but Disney had the most confident on Cinderella as his strongest contender to be his next Snow White and greenlit that project first. Now that things were getting serious on making the movie, it was time to bring on board the right people for the job and to seriously input story elements that have been discussed about the years prior, including a cat and mouse subplot where a group of mice ate Cinderella while also avoiding getting caught by the stepmother's cat. However, while Disney returned to producing animated movies, Walt, however, did not entirely. Due to his trauma from the 1941 strike, he became more distant from his own animation productions. In fact, his focus and passion shifted to producing fully live-action features, which his first that he was making at the time was Treasure Island, his hobby of miniature trains, and creating his own theme park. While the sequence directors, Clyde Geronimi, Ham Lusk, and Wilford Jackson were still able to contact Walt from time to time for notes, they were often left on their own devices to determine if some details were good enough for the final film. As for the animation itself, Walt enlisted nine of his most trusted and most skilled animators to become the supervising animators of the department that would continue Disney's animation legacy for many years to come. While ironically in their 30s at the time, Disney named this group after what U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt called the Justices of the Supreme Court, the Nine Old Men. Among them include Eric Larson, Frank Thomas, John Lounsbury, Les Clark, Mark Davis, Milt Call, Ollie Johnston, Ward Kimball, and Wolfgang Reitherman. When animating the movie, in an effort to save money, live-action references became more important to the production. While the use of these references was common when making the past Disney movies, this time, the animators had to become more dependent on them to follow the timing and the actors' movements on what was filmed. So much so that they had to do some rotoscoping by tracing the references frame by frame. Unsurprisingly, the animators hated this process, as they felt like it was too restrictive and they were unable to have their say on how the characters can act. The only times when the references were not needed were for animating the animals like Jacques, Gus, and Lucifer, which was why there might have been a bit of jealousy towards the guys who got those characters like Lounsbury, Kimball, and Ritherman, along with Disney veteran Norm Ferguson. But among all the animations produced at the studio, Walt himself stated that his personal favorite piece was the dress transformation scene when the fairy godmother turned Cinderella's torn up dress into a beautiful gown. <laughs> When it came to creating the music, Disney tried to get their own team to make songs for the feature and even considered recycling a deleted song from Snow White. But none of them ultimately got into the film because they didn't fit the criteria of Walt's new plan. What he wanted is for the songs to become hits of their own. He knew that his movies are capable of bringing out songs that would become popular like with Snow White and Pinocchio. So he hoped that if the songs can become commercial hits, then that can help make the movie become commercial hits too. So for the first time, Disney hired songwriters and composers outside of the studio by contacting the New York City music group Tin Pen Alley and brought on board Al Hoffman, Mac David, and Jerry Livingston. The reason why Walt picked them was because of their 1947 hit Chibaba Chibaba, which he felt like a song of that style would be perfect for the fairy godmother scene. Chibaba, Chibaba, Chihuahua, Angelawa, Kukula, Goomba. Chibaba, Chibaba, Chihuahua, my bambino go to sleep. David and Livingston also brought with them singer Eileen Woods in order to make the demos of the music. However, as she sang, there was an unmistakable sense of sweetness and beauty onto her voice. So after hearing the demos, Walt contacted Eileen to become the voice of Cinderella. 
But getting outside help for the songs is not the only musical first for Disney with this feature. It was also the first time that the score was composed after the animation was finished, and the first to use overdubbing vocals where Cinderella sings in harmony with herself in the song Sing Sweet Nightingale. Ooh, sing sweet nightingale. The two-year production was obviously different from before now that the animation team had become less dependent on Walt's input, but they know that everything was on the line to ensure the movie's success, especially when this had a nearly $3 million budget. In fact, that same tension from the days of Snow White returned when they knew that if this failed, then the studio and Disney's legacy would be entirely over. And so, when it premiered on February 15th, 1950, and later released on March 4th, Walt wished for another Snow White, and he got another Snow White. The film received great praise from critics, stating that the classic fairy tale charm of Disney is back. And the best part? It was also a tremendous success at the box office by earning $8 million, which years later after all the re-releases, the total ultimately became $315 million. Walt also got his wish of the songs to become a success as well, as the album reached number one on the Billboard pop charts. Oh, and there is one more first for the music here I almost forgot. This is the first time that Disney licensed and published the soundtrack under their own label, the Walt Disney Music Company. So the revenue earned from those albums also go directly to Disney and making Cinderella's success more significant for the company. The movie later received a good amount of nominations and awards, including three Oscar nominations for Best Sound, Best Music, and Best Original Song for Bippity Boppity Boo and received the Golden Bear for Music Film along with the Big Bronze Plate at the first Berlin International Film Festival. Decades later, the film ranked at number 9 on AFI's Top 10 Animated Films and was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry in late 2018. At the parks, Cinderella got one of the highest honors of having the castle at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World and later in Tokyo Disneyland be named after her. Cinderella also received two significant directive video sequels, including Cinderella 2 Dreams Come True in 2002, which is often regarded as one of the worst Disney directive video sequels, and Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time in 2007, which is often regarded as one of the best Disney directive video sequels. In 2015, Disney released a live-action remake of the film directed by Kenneth Branagh and starring Lily James, Cate Blanchett, and Helena Bonham Carter, which that also became a hit with solid reviews, an Oscar nomination for Best Costume Design, and earned around $542 million at the box office. No matter how hard he was grieving, Walt kept on believing that he can still enchant the world with his magic, and the movie showed that the dream that he wished came true. Thanks to the great success of Cinderella, Disney could finally move forward to grow his company and produce more animated features. This also gave him the opportunity to bring back to life several ideas for movies he wanted to make ever since the 1930s. Need proof of this? Then take a look at the opening of Pinocchio when Jiminy sings When You Wish Upon a Star. If you look at the top left corner, there are two books that teased a couple of upcoming projects that Walt had in store. Now with his newfound Cinderella money, he could finally open those books to tell these classic stories in the way he knows best starting with the big pink one, Alice in Wonderland. The movie focuses on a little girl named Alice who got highly curious when she saw a white rabbit in a waistcoat panicking that he was late. When following him up to a big rabbit hole, she falls in and finds herself in Wonderland, a world where the strange and unusual is common and those in it must always expect the unexpected. But now that her curiosity puts her in an extraordinary predicament, she discovers how far she'll go to find that white rabbit while encountering many of Wonderland's craziest inhabitants. Throughout his life, Walt Disney always had a fascination with the Lewis Carroll books, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Through the Looking Glass. 
At the start of his career, his first successful series he made in Hollywood was the Alice comedies, starring a live-action girl in her episodic adventures in a cartoon world, with the first also being the last Laugh-A-Gram cartoon in 1923 called Alice's Wonderland. As early as 1933, Walt had the idea to create an entire feature film based on the books with his first concept to be in a similar format to the Alice comedies, where a live-action Alice, considered to be played by Mary Pickford, who finds herself in an animated Wonderland. However, after he saw that Paramount released their Alice in Wonderland film in that same year, he decided to scrap those plans in favor of making Snow White his first movie. But the idea of an Alice in Wonderland adaptation never left Disney's mind. In fact, he had Mickey star in a loose adaptation in 1936 called Through the Mirror. After Snow White's success, Walt decided to fully move forward with an Alice movie, even by buying the film rights of the famous Sir John Tenniel illustrations. From there, he assigned storyboard artist Al Perkins, along with British art director David Hall, to develop an entire story, along with some concept art for the movie. The result came in a 1939 story reel that Walt did not enjoy. What he saw in that reel were nothing but problems, or at least in terms of making his version of the story. While Hall's illustrations were well done, they resembled too much like the drawings of Tenniel's, and that would be way too complicated to animate. And while the script written by Perkins stayed true to the books, it was way too dark and even too grotesque by Disney standards. Fixing this up would require a lot of work. However, as time moved on and the 1940s was giving the company a hard time with the financial flops and World War II, Walt had no choice but to let go of the project. After the war, he slowly brought it back, but again, getting the right story was proven to be difficult. Some versions tried and failed to make something he would approve of. Even when British author Aldous Huxley took a shot, his take was said to be too literal. The search for his wonderland was proven to be an unsuccessful mission. But then everything changed when he noticed the unique artwork of one of his artists. Enter Mary Blair, who began working for Disney in 1940 for films like Fantasia and Dumbo. A year later, she joined Walt and his team to go on the South America Goodwill Tour, and out of all the people who attended, including Walt himself, that trip affected her life the most, and it forever changed her art style. After the tour, her art became more colorful, modern, and a lot more stylized than before. Obviously, this caught the eye of Disney, and he decided to make her art more prominent in his animated films afterwards like Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros, and be the concept artist for other features like Cinderella and Peter Pan. Later on, her art style would become the signature look for one of Disney's most iconic attractions, It's a Small World, and created many murals for the parks, including this massive mosaic at the Contemporary Resort in Walt Disney World. Anyways, back onto Alice, Walt found some of the concept art done by Blair, and he realized how he can truly tell his version of the story. It doesn't have to go by the book or share the same illustrations, it can be a lot more colorful, whimsical, and even a bit more comical. And so, Walt decided to move forward with this new direction and have it be an all-animated Alice movie. As it combines elements from both books, there were plenty of characters that had to be cut out for the movie for the sake of pacing. However, some were close to consideration while in development. There was the whole scene in the Duchess's Manor, an encounter with a very goofy-looking Jabberwock that was replaced by the Walrus and the Carpenter, the White Knight that was replaced with Alice singing Very Good Advice, despite Walt enjoying the scene, and the Mock Turtle and the Griffin. However, the latter duo would later appear in a Jell-O commercial with Alice. Of course I had some schooling, but the extras I just simply couldn't afford. He couldn't afford the cooking course and he's dying to learn how to cook. Otherwise, how can I entertain? Oh, well, I'll teach you how to make Jell-O. How to cook Jell-O? Mm, you don't have to. Just quick as a wink, you have a beautiful dessert. And inexpensive, too. Can I entertain with Jell-O? Mm, there's nothing quite like Jell-O for entertaining. Everybody loves its jolly smile. So when's the Jell-O party? Tomorrow. We, we accept. accept. Yes, when it comes to entertaining, there's nothing quite like Jell-O. As usual, 
live action references were made to help out the animators, but there was one moment that stood out from the rest that ended up in the final film in the most unexpected way. Since many of the voice actors would also lend their hand in the references as their respective characters, vaudevillian actor Ed Wynn was brought on board to play as the Mad Hatter, and he unleashed a performance that had everyone laughing. When Wynn returned to properly record his lines in front of the mic, they all realized that they could never recapture that magic and that comedy from the filming. So for the final cut, they decided to use the audio directly from the live action reference. Butter! Butter, oh thank you, butter. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Tea, oh I never thought of tea, of course. Tea. <laughs> Sugar, two spoons, just a, two spoons, thank you, yes. Mustard? Mustard, yes, but mustard? Don't let be silly. Lemon, that's different. That's Out of all the films made by Disney, Alice in Wonderland holds the record for having the most songs in one movie with 14 of them, even if some only last for about a few seconds. When it was time to promote the film while it was close to finishing, Disney began to have a keen interest in the new entertainment medium called television. Walt and Roy agreed that they could use it as a marketing device to highly present any of their big upcoming projects. And so, on Christmas Day 1950, Disney released his first television special called One Hour in Wonderland, which was sponsored by the Coca-Cola Company and aired on NBC. It presented many cartoons and a sneak peek of the movie, and it featured Walt with Catherine Beaumont, the voice of Alice, along with several other actors who previously worked with Disney as special guests. However, that wouldn't be the movie's only piece of promotion on television. The company also created a 10-minute documentary on the making of the film called Operation Wonderland and had a special segment dedicated to the picture in The Fred Waring Show. After its premiere on July 26, 1951, it was... Yeah, there's no going around this. It sucked. While the critics didn't necessarily pan the movie, they did state that the quality was more in line with Disney's cartoons more than their movies. But when it came to the fans of the books and British critics, they despised the feature and claimed Disney destroyed a classic piece of literature by completely Americanizing it. Even Walt himself wasn't a fan of the film either, stating that it failed because it lacked heart. It didn't help either that it was a box office flop too, as the film only made $2.4 million domestically and lost the company a million dollars. Everything about the film's release was a mess. Disney even went into a lawsuit against another film adaptation of Alice, the 1949 French film by Dallas Bauer, because it was going to be released in America around the same time as theirs. However, once the madness of its initial run subsided, the movie found the time to display its true colors to the world. Despite the criticisms, it did receive an Oscar nomination for Best Scoring of a Musical Picture, and the characters became prominently featured at the parks. In fact, two classic attractions were based on the movie, including a dark ride at Disneyland and the Mad Tea Party, a spinning teacup ride that became a staple in almost every Disney park. Unlike some of the other early Disney features, Alice in Wonderland almost never got a re-release. Instead, the movie would often be aired on television and slowly gathered an audience from there. But very similar to Fantasia, it wasn't until the late 1960s and early 1970s where Alice received newfound fame in the psychedelic age, where people were totally digging on the trippiness. So much so that Disney took notice and finally gave the film its first re-release in 1974, capitalizing on its psychedelic nature. This time, not only did the marketing work and the film became more successful, but both audiences and critics were starting to really warm up to the movie and has since appreciated as a Disney classic. Later on, in 2010, Disney released a loosely inspired live-action adaptation of the books and the 1951 movie directed by Tim Burton. Although critically mixed, it was a smash hit getting over a billion dollars at the box office and winning two Oscars for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design. It also released a sequel in 2016 called Alice Through the Looking Glass, but that film ended up becoming a failure in every way. 
after falling down that rabbit hole, Disney's Alice went through quite a journey from being completely shunned to becoming one of the most well-known and most beloved adaptations of the story. Nowadays, it would seem mad to think that there was a time when this was hated. But then again, most everyone's mad here. Going back to that opening scene from Pinocchio, there was another book that teased an upcoming feature from Disney that was leaning next to the Alice one. It was small, brown, and the title of it was Peter Pan. It's about the darling children, Wendy, John, and Michael, who were visited by a flying boy who never grew up named Peter Pan. After giving them some pixie dust from his fairy comrade Tinkerbell, the kids fly off to Peter Pan's home, Neverland. A place filled with fantasy where they meet up with Peter's crew, the Lost Boys, Natives, and Mermaids, all while avoiding the wrath of Captain Hook and his pirates who want revenge on Pan for having the captain lose his hand to a crocodile. Ever since he was young, Walt Disney was always fascinated by the story of J.M. Barrie and grew up watching several interpretations of the tale. When he was a boy, he saw a touring theatrical production of the story, and in 1924, he watched the silent film directed by Herbert Brennan, where the fantasy and swashbuckling adventure immediately captured Walt's imagination. While the studio was making Snow White, Disney considered other ideas for animated features after his first one, and Peter Pan stood out to be the perfect story for animation, as it allowed the team to do much more than anything that the original stage show could ever present. He originally thought at one point to have this be his second animated feature after Snow White, but it wouldn't be until 1939 when Walt got the animation rights to Pan and went straight into production. Once again, he had David Hall to provide concept art for a story reel, which the plot originally had the dog Nana join in the adventure. But similar to Alice in Wonderland, it shared some of the same issues as before, including the story being much darker by Disney standards and even compared to the play at some points. There was an alternate opening where it starts out in Neverland and then goes to the real world where Peter kidnaps a mother for the Lost Boys, John was left out on going to Neverland for being too practical, Tinkerbell told Captain Hook about the Lost Boys' hideout on her own free will, a scene where the characters find the pirate's treasure in a place that's heavily loaded with traps, and Tink dying from poison to save Peter. At that point, Wald and his team went back and forth regarding many different plot possibilities for the movie. But once again, everything had to stop by the end of 1941 when World War II came into the scene. After that period, production slowly turned back on with consideration on which actors to play the parts, but it wasn't until 1947 when Walt decided to put his foot down on the company's economic situation and fully resume work on animated features. Like I've mentioned before, Cinderella was the first to be approved, then Alice was next in line, and then Peter Pan got the green light in 1949. When it was time to be serious about casting, Disney decided to not go far to find the key actors. When casting the part of Peter Pan himself for the stage play and in some film productions, it was always a tradition to give that part to a woman, which is still often practiced to this day. However, for Disney's version, Walt gave the part to child actor Bobby Driscoll, who previously appeared in Disney films like Song of the South, So Dear to My Heart, and Treasure Island, making him the first ever boy to play the boy who never grew up. In the case of Wendy, the part was given to Catherine Beaumont straight after her job as the lead in Alice in Wonderland, which explains why Wendy looks like the long-lost sister of Alice. As for Captain Hook, he was played by Hans Conried, who was already at Disney by appearing as the magic mirror for their TV programs and specials. Also, in tradition of the original show, he was also the voice of Mr. Darling. For many years, there was an urban legend on the film that they hired Marilyn Monroe to be the live-action reference of Tinkerbell. However, some quick research will prove that this is actually false. Not only her status as a Hollywood icon has yet to happen during the making of the feature, but mainly because the job was actually done by actress Margaret Carey. She was also the model and the voice of the mermaids alongside Connie Hilton and June Foray. 
During the early 1940s, Disney had their classic songwriters and composers create some songs for the picture like Frank Churchill, Charles Walcott, and Elliot Daniel. However, when the new production took shape in the early 1950s, almost all the old songs got rejected in favor of new ones by Sammy Kahn and Sammy Fain. The opening song, The Second Star to the Right, was actually recycled from a deleted song from Alice in Wonderland called Beyond the Laughing Sky, where they took the melody of that song and added new lyrics to fit with the Peter Pan narrative. The second star to the right shines in the night for you. Why does the whispering wind sound like a love? When the movie flew into theaters on February 5th, 1953, the film turned out to be good. Not great, but still did a solid performance. The critics felt mixed with the music and how it doesn't take as much risks as the original source material, but they did highly praise the animation. As for the box office, it had a solid run by earning $7 million domestically which after the re-releases, accumulated to a grand domestic total of $87.4 million. However, while Neverland is a paradise where no one can grow up, there is one element that certainly did not age well. As time moved on, the movie gained some controversy over its stereotypical depiction of the natives, or Indians as they call them here, along with the song What Made the Red Man Red. Yes, there can be arguments regarding on how society viewed racism at the time, and the original J.M. Barry play had this problem as well, so the movie was just staying true to its source material, but even the animators when they looked back admitted that this aspect was quickly outdated. But on the bright side, one of the songs would later have a life of its own and become a renowned children's tune. And believe it or not, it's a semi-deleted song. Well, I say semi-deleted because while none of the characters actually sing it, the instrumental does often play. I say, Captain, do you hear something? No. Created by Frank Churchill and Jack Lawrence, this was the only pre-World War II song that made it to the final film, or partially at least, and the song found its own popularity when Jerry Lewis released his version in the same year as the movie's release. Never smile at a crocodile, no you can't get friendly with a crocodile. A few years later, alongside Disneyland's opening, there was an attraction based on the movie called Peter Pan's Flight that allowed guests to ride the movie, which has since become a staple in almost every Disney park, and has amazed guests every day on how a simple ride can always gather such huge lines! <laughs> In 2002, Disney released in theaters a sequel to the film by Disney Movie Tunes called Return to Neverland, where Peter Pan has to rescue Wendy's daughter Jane and teach her how to believe. The reviews were not great, but it was a box office hit by making $109 million. In 2011, Disney Junior created a spin-off children's series called Jake and the Neverland Pirates that's about a group of pirate kids always outsmarting Captain Hook and Mr. Smee, which had a strong run for four seasons with a total of 114 episodes. But among everything that came out of this picture, there is one character that ended up becoming a Disney icon as big as Mickey Mouse, and that is Tinkerbell. Ever since the movie's release, she was always there to begin Disney's TV shows and specials with her magic, and initiated some of the fireworks shows at the Disney parks by flying across the castle. Not to mention being a merchandise queen. In 2005, Disney created a new franchise dedicated to Tinkerbell called Disney Fairies, which started out with a series of books, but then expanded into a direct-to-video computer-animated film series with seven features made, starting with 2008's Tinkerbell. While it had a long travel to become the movie we know today, all it needed to become a Disney classic was just faith, trust, and a little bit of pixie dust. As you could tell, there is a bit of a theme here of movies that have been in development since the late 1930s, 
but never got completed until Disney got the studio back in shape in the early 1950s. But while Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan were all produced around the same time, there is one more movie that fits in this category, but wouldn't be released until much later in 1955. That film was Lady and the Tramp. It's the story of a cocker spaniel named Lady who lived a very comfortable and pampered life with her owners. But then things take an unexpected turn when a baby enters the scene stealing Lady's attention. After some misunderstandings got Lady in trouble, she gets out and finds help from a street smart mutt named Tramp. And while they may have complete opposite lifestyles, that won't stop the inevitable romance between the two. For Disney fans, they're most likely familiar with the story of Walt Disney giving his wife Lillian a puppy in a hat box as a Christmas present, which was the inspiration for the opening scene of the movie. Some have stated that this was the spark that ignited the idea of Lady and the Tramp. While there could be some truth to Walt's puppy gift, was that the moment that inspired the feature? No! If we're gonna talk about the true origins of the movie, then let's bring in one of Walt's most trusted story artists, Joe Grant. Back in 1937, Joe drew some sketches of his English Springer Spaniel, Lady, whom he admitted was pushed to the side when Joe and his wife had their new baby. When Walt found the drawings, he was highly amused and asked Grant to develop a plot for a movie about this dog. For several years, Joe and many other artists worked timelessly to fully develop this story about a dog's antics around the house, interacting with the other dogs in the neighborhood, and confronting a couple of evil cats owned by a mean mother-in-law and a dangerous rat. But with every version they presented, Walt completely hated every single one mainly because of the main character, Lady. Yeah, she's cute and very pampered, but that's not enough to carry an entire feature film. At that point, the project became hopeless and Disney was ready to scrap it by the time World War II came in. But then it all changed when the solution to his problems came in in the form of a short story in Cosmopolitan. It was called Happy Dan the Cynical Dog by Ward Green which told the tale of a stray mutt who manipulates people in order to get free food. When he read it, Disney realized this was what was missing in Lady. It didn't need more action or scenarios that she had to face, but another dog who's the complete opposite of Lady, but the two end up falling in love. Soon afterwards, Walt bought the film rights to the story and resumed production of the newly named Lady and the... Oh wait, they didn't figure out a name for him yet. Before the team settled on Tramp, there were several names that were experimented to see what would suit best for the new cynical dog, including Rags, Bozo, and even Homer. I want to stay, sit, roll over, and beg. Please, 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 please. By 1949, Grant left the studio to pursue his own artistic business, but the story crew still continued forward to combine elements of both the Ward Green story and Joe's original concept which they finally settled with a final plot by 1953. Unfortunately, Grant did not receive any credit for the story in the final film, as the opening title only mentioned Green. It wouldn't be until many years later through home media bonus features and books where they properly highlighted Joe's important contribution to the picture. Now, you may have noticed something that's significantly different here than from the previously mentioned features. Every time I show a clip from the movie, they are a lot more widescreen than the usual full-frame aspect ratio from before. That's because this is the first ever animated feature to be presented in CinemaScope, which was invented in 1953 to give theaters an easier way to present widescreen movies by just switching the lens on the projector as a way to fight against television that was threatening the movie theater business. The only downside to CinemaScope was for the animators, since they had to face the obstacle of adjusting to the new screen size that gave them more space for the characters to go around and develop more details to the backgrounds. This resulted in less close-ups, characters to be more spread out to fill the frame, and longer takes. However, Disney was aware that not all theaters had CinemaScope and wouldn't be able to present the movie. So to go around this, the studio made two different versions of the feature one in full screen, 
and the other in CinemaScope widescreen, resulting in the artist to adjust some scenes in order to accommodate the full smaller screen ratio. Originally, Mary Blair was supposed to work on the backgrounds of the feature, since she did create some concept art earlier in production. However, since she left in 1953 to work on illustrations for children's books, the position of the film was mainly taken by Ivan Earle. In order to achieve Lady's perspective of inside her home, another background artist, Claude Coates, created 3D models of the interior and took low-angle pictures in order to deliver live-action references of the house in a dog's point of view. Speaking of the environment, the small town that the movie is set in was inspired by Walt's fondly remembered childhood home, Marceline, Missouri, but more in his nostalgic perspective, since the area is depicted as a colorful and almost dreamlike turn-of-the-century American town. As the studio had great experience in the past with this on Bambi, animal studies, specifically on dogs, were heavily utilized in order to capture the movements and mannerisms of canines. There was one sequence meant to establish the romance that was actually close to getting removed from the feature because Wolf thought that it would seem a bit ridiculous and hard to imagine how audiences would take it seriously. However, animator Frank Thomas was determined to prove his boss wrong, so much so that he went and fully animated the scene himself. What was I thinking? When Tess screened to Disney, he ended up being impressed and ultimately decided to keep it in the picture. That part ended up becoming the most famous scene of the movie when Lady and Tramp were eating spaghetti and their love fully bloomed from there. For the music, it was the last time that Oliver Wallace composed the score for a Disney animated feature, which the torch would later be passed on to George Bruns. On the other hand, as Walt still wanted the musical numbers of his pictures to be pop hits, he brought on board Peggy Lee along with Sonny Burke to write the songs. As a music superstar, she was also hired to help promote the feature on television and to be the voice of several characters, including one of Lady's owners, Darling, Cy and Am, and the dog named after her, Peg. You won't believe this, dearie, but no matter how tight a jam he's in, that tramp always finds some way out. When it was released on June 22, 1955, the film turned out to be a great success, not only from the promotional help on television, but also with Ward Green who chipped in by writing a novel of the film two years prior to make audiences familiar with the story. As for the box office, it managed to earn $6.5 million, and as its popularity continuously grew with every re-release, the movie ended up earning a grand total of $187 million. As for how it performed with critics, they actually did not like this one. In fact, to quote Time, they stated that Walt Disney has for so long parlayed gooey sentiments and stark horror into profitable cartoons that most moviegoers are apt to be more surprised than disappointed to discover that the combination somehow does not work this time. However, this resentment did not last long. As time moved on, not only did it gather a large following, but even critics were starting to give it more credit than before so much so that the AFI placed it at number 95 of their list of the top 100 greatest love stories of all time. But with this newfound praise, there was also a little bit of backlash over certain elements. The Siamese Cat song gained more distaste from the public for its stereotypical depiction of Asian culture, and decades after the film's release, Disney got into some legal trouble with Peggy Lee, when on November of 1988, Lee sued the company for breach of contract. Since she was a key player in creating the film, mostly on the music, she also had the rights to transcriptions to the music, meaning that she owned the songs and would get a cut of the revenue on anything that had them. But when Disney turned the movie into the best-selling VHS of its time in 1987, she called them out for not getting her share. After a few years in 1991, she won the legal battle and was awarded $2.3 million. Back onto the movie, the film received a direct-to-video sequel in 2001 called Lady and the Tramp 2 Scamp's Adventure and a live-action remake in 2019 starring Tessa Thompson and Justin Theroux voicing Lady and Tramp respectively that was released with the launch of Disney streaming service Disney+. Plus. It took some time for Disney to find Lady her match, and at first, the connection wasn't strong. 
but it took some time for the crew and critics to warm up to the picture and find the charm that's inside. And now it is highly beloved as a Disney masterpiece and often proclaimed to be one of the most iconic romance films in cinema history. <laughs> Samson? Just like with Snow White, Walt Disney took a major gamble on a fairy tale animated feature to save his studio and legacy, this time being Cinderella. When the film was released in 1950, it was the first time since the 1930s that Walt had a success so big it allowed him to greatly expand his company. Thanks to Cinderella, not only was he capable to produce his own live-action movies, TV shows, and build an entire theme park, but he could also create the animated films that he waited for many years to get them started. He took one of his first successful projects and turned it into Alice in Wonderland, took the J.M. Barry play and expanded with animation on Peter Pan, and turned a story about a dog from the turn of the century into one of cinema's most romantic films with Lady and the Tramp. But throughout all these movies, and even further, the team at Disney were preparing another fairy tale they wanted to tell. One that they have spent most of the 1950s bringing it to life and pushed their artistry even further to elevate the top standards in animation they had already set. First, there was Snow White. Then there was Cinderella, and then there was their next princess, Sleeping Beauty. It's the story of a princess named Aurora, whom as a baby was cursed by the evil fairy Maleficent to die on her 16th birthday when she would prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. The three good fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather, changed the curse so that she would go in an eternal slumber instead and vowed to raise her in a cottage until she was ready to return. Despite their best efforts avoiding it, the curse was still fulfilled. Now it's up to a prince named Philip, who previously met the girl in the forest, to confront Maleficent and awaken Aurora with true love's kiss. While the film was released by the end of the 1950 decade, the production actually started back at the beginning in early 1951, when after the release of Cinderella, Disney decided to continue using the fairy tale formula, since it had given the company great success with Snow White and the already mentioned Cinderella. While it was a challenge to turn the short Charles Perrault fairy tale into an entire feature film, the story team managed to settle on developing a whole script by 1952, and unlike many other productions, the crew ended up keeping true with the original draft. An impressive feat coming from a movie whose production lasted for many years. While the story may feature some similarities to past princess films, Walt Disney knew that he wanted Sleeping Beauty to stand out from the rest. To have the concept art like the ones done by Mary Blair prominently show in the final picture instead of having it be altered by the artists and animators afterwards. When one of his artists, John Hench, who was designing Disneyland at the time, returned to Walt with unicorn tapestries reproduced by the ones found in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, it gave him just the idea he was looking for, to turn the movie into a living tapestry, as if medieval art would come to life with Disney magic. Among his artists, Walt decided to give one man to be in charge of the movie's look, one with a distinct knowledge of the art style the film was going for, and that was Ivan Earl. At the time, he was a relatively new animator who started in 1951 as an assistant background painter for Peter Pan. But after experimenting his experimental sense with backgrounds and color on a couple of shorts, he quickly climbed up the ranks where now he was assigned to lead the movie's art direction, 
which he went with a combination of the Gothic style commonly found during the late medieval period and the contemporary abstract aesthetic that was popular in cartoons during the 1950s, mainly through the works of UPA. When it was time for casting, Disney hired opera singer and actress Mary Costa for the role of Princess Aurora. But while her singing was on point for the role, she had to drop her natural southern accent in exchange for a mix of English and mid-Atlantic. Oh, you darlings, this is the happiest day of my life. Everything's so wonderful. Just wait till you meet him. As for Maleficent, Eleanor oddly returned to be both the voice and the live-action model of the villain, just like she previously did for Lady Tremaine in Cinderella. By 1953, the film's development seemed to be going smoothly. A story reel was done, the actors recorded their lines, and the team was about to start getting into the animation and be ready for it to come out in 1955. However, Walt himself proved to be the movie's biggest obstacle. He wasn't liking some of the creative choices and made his crew rework on some key scenes while also delaying the release. He also decided to drop the original score and songs done by Jack Lawrence and Sammy Fay in favor of George Bruns adapting the music from Tchaikovsky's ballet of Sleeping Beauty. The only song by Lawrence and Fane that managed to get into the movie was Once Upon a Dream. I know you, I walked with you once upon a dream. And if Walt being tough to please wasn't enough, the movie also stumbled on another big hurdle when the director, Wilfred Jackson, suffered a fatal heart attack. This resulted in one of the nine old men, Eric Larson, to step in and take his place. However, his role as director did not last long, as the only scene he worked on was the sequence where Aurora sings to her animal friends in the forest and then meets Philip. It may not seem like much, but that scene in particular was infamous in the studio for taking almost two years to rework on to get it right and went beyond over budget that it ended up becoming more harmful to the film than do good. While he still worked at Disney for many years afterwards and is still regarded as a highly admirable figure in the field of animation, this was the only time that Larson got to direct. After Eric, Clyde Geronimi stepped in to direct while Wolfgang Reitherman and Les Clark helped out as sequence directors. While the nine old men are mostly noted to animate the feature, there were several notable people that worked on the film that would later become prominent figures in animation. Don Bluth and Floyd Norman, Disney's first noteworthy African-American animator, started their careers working on Sleeping Beauty, and once even had Chuck Jones. And yes, I do mean the same legendary Looney Tunes director Chuck Jones. How the fridge did that happen? Well, momentarily, during the mid-1950s, Warner Brothers shut down their animation division in order to produce more 3D films thus resulting Jones to work at Disney for four months. But when the whole 3D thing flopped, Warner Brothers brought animation back and Chuck returned to be back with Bugs. Eh, ain't we a bunch of stinkers? But even with new directors keeping things in check, that doesn't mean this wouldn't be causing any more trouble. In fact, it kind of made things worse. Since Earl was in charge of the art direction, there would always be this constant creative clash with him against Jeronimi and the animators. No matter what, Ivan would have the final say of the visuals, but the animators hate how the backgrounds are so detailed to the point that it would take attention away from the characters they would animate. That, and it was always a struggle to find the right balance of classic Disney traditions and the film's contemporary gothic look that Walt wanted. But it was the animators that helped preserve some of the Disney elements and charm to the feature, including Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston on The Three Good Fairies, John Lounsbury on The Kings, Stefan and Hubert, Milt Call for Prince Philip, and Mark Davis animating both the protagonist and antagonist Aurora and Maleficent. After several delays caused by production troubles and Walt's focus often shifting to his other projects, the feature, which was the first 70mm animated film, was finally complete and released on January 29th, 1959, and its initial run was anything but a beauty. The film received some mixed reactions from critics, stating that the voices were great, but the story felt like it was just copying Snow White, and they were even iffy on the animation. 
As for the box office, it did get $5.3 million, which was okay, but made Disney lose money due to the film being too expensive with a $6 million budget. While the film turned out to be cursed, it would only be fitting that Sleeping Beauty would become a sleeper hit. After it returned to the big screen in 1970, the film received several re-releases and accumulated a new box office total of $51.6 million, making it the second highest grossing film of 1959 behind Ben-Hur. When Walt Disney made Disneyland while the movie was in production, he decided to promote the feature by naming the iconic castle after the film as Sleeping Beauty Castle, and in 1957, Disney added a walkthrough in the castle that presented a diorama telling the story of the movie. Years later, Sleeping Beauty would also have its name given to the castles of Disneyland Paris and the first castle of Hong Kong Disneyland. As time moved on, as the film gained more love from the public and the characters becoming fondly remembered like Aurora and the fairies, it is actually Maleficent that emerged as the most memorable character of the feature so much so that she is often regarded as the greatest Disney villain. In fact, it wasn't just in this movie where she would be the mistress of all evil and turn into a dragon. She was a notable villain in the Kingdom Hearts games, made appearances in the series Once Upon a Time, and even fought against Mickey Mouse in the nighttime show Phantasmic. Her legacy as a villain is so renowned that she even got her own movie in 2014 starring Angelina Jolie. The film was such a big hit by getting $758.5 million at the box office that it even spawned a sequel five years later called Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. However, they are both reimaginings that portray her more as an anti-hero that are not as liked as much as the animated film for both critics and audiences. Oh, oh dear, what an awkward situation. As the film became older, it gradually gained its status as Disney royalty, where it started getting some award recognition by earning a Grammy nomination for Best Soundtrack of a Motion Picture or Television Series, and an Oscar nomination for Best Original Score for a Musical Picture. And on December 2019, the Library of Congress added the film onto the National Film Registry for preservation. Going back a bit on October 2008, Disney released the Platinum Edition of Sleeping Beauty on Blu-ray and DVD, and restored the full negatives for the ratio to become 2.55 to 1, even wider than the original 70mm release, and made it the first time ever that Sleeping Beauty was presented in its full original state almost 50 years later. The movie's fame was in slumber for many years after its first appearance, but it eventually woke to receive complete admiration for its amazing artistry that inspired many artists and beloved characters that are still highly prominent to this day. It may even had to fight for that glory like combating a fire-breathing dragon, but it did manage to earn its happily ever after, just like Sleeping Beauty did once upon a dream. Okay, so maybe the fairy tale formula isn't always a guarantee to result in a successful movie. Uh, how about for the next one, let's switch things up to have a more modern setting and instead of dealing with princesses and spells, it'll be a movie with down-to-earth people and talking animals. They've had some good luck with that before, but hopefully that luck could also help them on 101 Dalmatians based on the children's novel The 101 Dalmatians by Dottie Smith. It's about two Dalmatian dogs who are also a couple named Pongo and Perdita, in which their owners, Roger and Anita, are a couple as well that met because of their dogs. After giving birth to 15 puppies, Anita's old schoolmate, Cruella de Vil, now a cold-hearted and wealthy fur coat collector, unsuccessfully tried to buy the puppies to turn them into a new coat. But since she is a nutcase that's too used to getting what she wants, she had her two henchmen, Horace and Jasper, to steal the puppies. But now that all the dogs are on high alert of the missing pups, it's up to the litter of 15, along with 84 additional Dalmatian puppies and some animal helpers along the way to escape Cruella's wrath before they all become one of her fur coats. 
When Walt Disney first read the original book in 1957, which was relatively new at the time as it was released the year prior, he immediately saw the potential as an animated film and quickly got the rights. But while his attention in those years were less on animation, he assigned the duties of adapting the book onto Bill Peet, and only to Bill Peet, where he both wrote the film by hand and did the entire storyboards, making it the first time for a Disney animated film to be written by only one person instead of an entire team. On a side note, it was also the first Disney animated feature to be set in the time when the film was released, where the characters are doing modern things like watch television. Miraculously, even if Bill was a one-man show, Walt thought it was great stuff. They were so good in fact that even Dottie Smith herself thought that Pete improved what she did in her original book. When it was time to get into the animation, Walt wanted to make sure that the same mistake wouldn't happen twice. Since Sleeping Beauty made the company lose money for being over budget, a key goal for the visuals is to be as cost effective as possible. Oh, Disney found a way to save money alright, but it also ended up revolutionizing the process of producing animation. Enter Walt's good old friend Ub Iwerks, who invented a new animation technique where he modified a Xerox camera so it can directly transfer the lines in a drawing onto an animation cell. My god. Thus saving both time and money by skipping the inking process. Disney, you nonsensical jerk! I no, hate you you it. Hate it. It. Before 101, the studio made a couple of tests to get a good feel of it with a few scenes in Sleeping Beauty and the 1960s short Goliath 2. As a result, the animators fell in love with the Xerox process, since for the first time, they get to see their drawings come to life in the final film without the ink and paint department intervening in the middle. One of them that was so fascinated by the new process was Ken Anderson, who took on the role of art director and planned to have this be the first animated feature completely done by the Xerox process, which also makes Sleeping Beauty the last Disney animated feature to use hand-painted cells. In order to accommodate the character's new look of having fully black outlines instead of colored, Anderson teamed up with color stylist Walt Paragoy to have the backgrounds also reflect on the new Xerox look where Paragoy would use an impressionistic approach to the colors while the lines fill in the details. Fascinatingly, the Xerox doesn't just work on drawings, but with the right technique, it can also work on film footage. For any of the cars like Cruella's or Horace and Jasper's, the team built white models with black outlines and filmed them driving or flipping around depending on what the scene demanded. From there, the shots went through the Xerox process to seemingly blend with the 2D environments while also giving the cars a bonus 3D look. In a way, it's like an updated process of how the team used the models to present the wagons in the animation of Pinocchio. Also, one great benefit of having the Xerox process for this picture is that it makes animating all the spots on the Dalmatians easier. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a crazy task. With the millions of spots that had to be carefully placed on each dog, there was an entire team dedicated to animating just the spots. However, even if this new technique was very beneficial for the production schedule and the budget, one person who was not a fan of this art direction was Walt himself. He hated it so much that he never wanted Ken to be an art director like that afterwards. It wasn't until years later, when Anderson saw Walt for the last time, he might have had a change of heart. Walt came into the studio and I was so grateful and glad to see him. I said, gee, it's good to see you, Walt. He said, Ken, it's sure good to be here. And then he looked at me and uh, penetratingly with the eyes and I knew that he was forgiving me for this, this uh, thing I had done on the Dalmatians. He didn't say anything, but I know I was forgiven. That, uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, it wasn't so bad after all. As a Disney animated film that featured dogs, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that the skills the animators learned from Lady and the Tramp would be used again for this film. But that wouldn't be the only thing from that movie that would also appear in this one. 
During the Twilight Bark scene, several dogs from Lady and the Tramp would make a cameo to participate in the bark, including Jacques, Peg, Bull, and then later both Lady and Tramp appear to help out. Straight after his work on Aurora and Maleficent for Sleeping Beauty, Mark Davis went to animate similar characters with the main human female leads with Anita and Cruella de Vil. Especially for the villain, it was a major contrast from the previous feature to animate, where Maleficent was subtle and subdued, Cruella was outlandish and bombastic. This would ultimately be the grand finale of Mark Davis's career in animation, as he would later move on to Wed Enterprises, now called Walt Disney Imagineering, as a character designer for many of Disney's most beloved attractions. When it was released on January 25th, 1961, it was the exact success they needed to pick themselves up after Sleeping Beauty. On a much lower budget of $3.6 million, the movie received a domestic gross of $14 million. On top of that, the movie was also highly beloved by critics, stating that even if the movie differs from their previous features, they still consider it one of Disney's best films. Following its release, the movie received a BAFTA award for Best Animated Film, and like Maleficent, Cruella would go on to become one of Disney's most iconic villains and even got to number 39 on AFI's Top 100 Greatest Villains. In 1996, many years before they made a habit out of it, Disney created a live-action remake written by John Hughes and starring Glenn Close as Cruella, which went on to also become successful like its animated counterpart where it then got a sequel in 2000 called 102 Dalmatians. Three years later, the animated film also received a sequel called 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure. But the dogs weren't just about the movies. They also had two TV shows with the first release in 1997 where it went on to have two seasons with 65 episodes and another in 2019 called 101 Dalmatian Street. After the numerous of re-releases it had, its box office total would grow exponentially to having $303 million. When the film was released on Blu-ray for the Diamond Edition on February 2015, a new animated short was made as a bonus called The Further Adventures of Thunderbolt, which fully presented the next episode of the show that the dogs were watching on television. As Disney was entering the 1960s, they did so by trying something completely new, both with their storytelling and their animation, and the result put them not at 100%, but one spot higher at 101. With the Xerox process now in their arsenal, the confidence for animation came back to Disney with a fresh new look. So much so that they decided to return to the realm of fantasy and see if they can conjure up some new magic with the Sword in the Stone, based on the novel of the same name by T.H. White. Deep in the core of medieval London, England, lies a sword inside an anvil that proclaims that the one who removes the sword shall be the new king of England. But since no one can pull it out, the land fell into the Dark Ages. Meanwhile, an orphan boy named Arthur, but often referred to as Wart, met an eccentric wizard named Merlin who decided to be his tutor and teach him about life lessons and science by transforming each other into various animals. But during his pursuit for knowledge, both Wart and Merlin have to face some foes that stand in the way of their education like carnivorous animals, Wart's own foster father and brother, and a mad witch named Madame Mim, which if overcome, then Wart will discover that he is meant for greatness beyond his imagination. While the production was mainly done during the early 1960s, this was a project that had been on Walt's shelf for several years. Much like last time, he got the rights to the book in 1939 when the novel came out the previous year and didn't even get the initial storyboards until a whole decade later. It wasn't until after production was done on 101 Dalmatians in 1960 when the real work was being put into it. However, it didn't just start production and go from there. Much like pulling the sword out of the stone, it had to prove its worth and even compete against another potential movie for Walt's approval. 
On one side, a group of some of Walt's top animators, including Ken Anderson, Mark Davis, Milk Call, and Wolfgang Reitherman, developed an idea for a more contemporary adaptation of Chanticleer. Based on the Edmund Rodstad satirical play, it was another project that the Disney team tried since the 1930s to turn it into an animated feature. For several months, the team worked on developing concept art, character sketches, and a whole story reel to present their idea at its highest potential. Meanwhile, for The Sword in the Stone, there was only one man who was left in charge of adapting the whole story. While it may seem like a total disadvantage for one guy to compete against the top animators for Walt's endorsement, keep in mind that it was the same guy that developed the story of 101 Dalmatians all on his own, Bill Pete. When the day came for both to get Disney's approval, it was a tough choice between one with great material to work with that was in production for decades, while the other recently sparked his interest after seeing the Broadway production of Camelot. After making their presentation, and Walt considered the possibilities on both... The winner is... The Sword in the Stone! After expressing that he had issues with the thought of a rooster being an appealing protagonist, Walt ultimately chose The Sword in the Stone to be his next animated movie. The animators were quite salty at first by the decision, but did admit defeat and most went on to work on the feature, like Ken as the art director, Milt as a directing animator and character designer, and Wooly becoming Disney's first solo director. For the voice of Wart, they hired child actor Ricky Sorensen, However, during the middle of his recording, he was hitting puberty and his voice dramatically changed. Could you turn me into a fish? But do you have any imagination? Can you imagine yourself as a fish? Oh, that's easy. I've done that lots of times. I, I, I pulled it out of an anvil that was on a stone in, in a churchyard. <laughs> <laughs> So, to keep the same childlike voice that Ricky had before, Reitherman brought two of his sons, Richard and Robert, to provide the rest of Wart's dialogue needed. Originally, Merlin, whom Bill Pete secretly modeled after Walt since they both share similar personalities and nose, was supposed to be voiced by Julius Matthews, and his owl, Archimedes, was meant to be played by Carl Swenson. The roles didn't quite fit for them well, so the best solution was for them to switch characters and let their magic do the rest. In terms of Disney's first, it's not just that this was their first animated film to have just one director, but this is also their first animated film to have songs written by the Sherman Brothers, Robert and Richard. Beforehand, they began at Disney only a few years prior by doing songs for live-action features like The Absent-Minded Professor and The Parent Trap, and projects starring some of the Mouseketeers like the TV movie The Horse Masters. When it was released on Christmas Day 1963, the reviews weren't so keen to the new king. While critics highly enjoyed the characters, and to this day, the wizard's duel scene is often regarded as some of the best animation done by the Nine Old Men, they felt like there was little substance to get from the feature due to the little amount of plot in the film. As for the box office, it was a much more pleasant sight as it became a hit by earning $4.75 million in theater rentals on a $3 million budget, which later the film received a domestic total of $22.2 million. The film also received an Oscar nomination for Best Score in an Adaptation or Treatment. Later on, both sorcerers would make some prominent appearances in several Disney areas. Madame Mim occasionally appears in the Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck comics by teaming up with the villains, while Merlin would host a ceremony at several Disney parks where one guest can pull the sword out of the stone to become king or queen for the day. He also frequently appeared in the Kingdom Hearts games, whose role is often holding the book that would lead players into the Hundred Acre Woods. While it may not have come out as Disney's greatest or most remembered animated film, it still has an admirability of the way that it had to fight its way to become a reality, and its charming characters and a few key moments are still beloved by audiences to this day. It has its problems, it has its strengths, but it still made a significance that makes the world go round. While The Sword in the Stone was still a financial hit, Walt was bothered by the fact that critics didn't enjoy it as much as some of his other works like 101 Dalmatians. 
he was aware that he wasn't giving as much attention to his animated works as he used to, so he decided to be more involved with his next movie that could deliver some highly interesting characters and could possibly win the critics over. And that was The Jungle Book, based on the anthology novel of the same name by Rudyard Kipling. In the jungles of India, a boy named Mowgli was living with the pack of wolves that raised him since he was a baby. When news broke out that the fearsome tiger Shere Khan returned to the jungle, a friend of the wolves, a black panther named Bagheera, volunteered to bring him to the man village where he could be safe. The biggest problem with that is not the journey of going there, but rather the fact that Mowgli doesn't want to leave the jungle, which results him getting constantly sidetracked where he encounters many other animals that either want to befriend him or want to eat him. After the release of The Sword in the Stone, Bill Pete suggested to Walt a new idea that could be their next potential animated feature. He presented the Kipling book, telling him that there's a lot of opportunities to play with a variety of characters, and Disney gave him the thumbs up, where once again, Pete is left on his own devices to develop an entire story for the feature. In Pete's original draft, it was a lot darker and more serious, while also staying true to the Mowgli stories of the original source material. He also created a new character that would be the King of the Monkeys named Louie that would force Mowgli into showing him how to make fire. Along with Bill, Terry Gilkeyson was hired to write several songs for the feature whose tone stuck close to the book as well. However, as I said before, Walt wanted to be a bit more involved in the production after the critical disappointment of The Sword in the Stone, and that was when trouble really went into full swing. Disney hated the dark approach to the story, which often caused him to be in a big clash with Pete. After several long arguments over the story, Bill Pete ultimately decided to quit on January 1964. What would then go and completely scrap all of Gilkeyson's songs, but the team begged him to keep one that they highly enjoyed, which ended up becoming the most recognizable song of them all. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. In their place, Walt brought on board Larry Clemens to replace Pete, along with three other story men, and brought back the Sherman Brothers to write new songs along with helping out on Walt's new take on the story that had one specific requirement. Well, we were at this meeting and the first thing Walt said, I remember, how many fellas have read the, uh, the original Jungle Book story by Rudyard Kipling? And nobody said anything because nobody had read it. Is good. I don't want you to read the book. Wait, what? Huh. And here I was wondering who the fridge is Ricky Ticky Tavi. Oh well. While most of the original draft was thrown out, other than the Bare Necessity song, one piece that Walt still kept from Bill Pete's ideas was the personality of the characters and wanted to put that in the forefront of the feature above all else. In a rare moment, Disney decided to use recognizable celebrity voices in order to help shape the characters and even have them be a bit of a caricature of their respected actors, starting with Phil Harris as Baloo. At first, it was tough to convince him to be on board, since Harris and even the crew felt like his wise-cracking comedy seemed out of place for a movie based on a Rudyard Kipling novel. But once Phil started improvising and acted more like himself instead of what the script told him to do, he turned out to be a perfect fit for the part. Following afterwards, other famous actors got casted in their suitable roles like Sebastian Cabot as Bagheera, George Sanders as Shere Khan, and Louis Prima as King Louis. But despite the big names at the time, there was one popular group that Walt wasn't able to get for the film, and that was The Beatles. Originally, they were planned to play the part of the Vultures, which explains their mop-top haircut and Liverpool accents, and their song, That's What Friends Are For, was originally a rock ballad. However, since John Lennon refused to lend his voice in an animated film, the crew hired other voice actors instead, and the song was rearranged to become a barbershop quartet to make it more timeless. There was also a nearsighted and dim-winded rhino named Rocky that would hang out with the vultures with the voice of Frank Fontaine, but was cut out because the vultures and monkeys already took a lot of screen time. But not everyone involved in the cast were big names of the 1960s. 
Several veteran Disney voice actors joined the cast as well, like J. Pat O'Malley, Sterling Holloway, and Verna Felton. Originally, child actor David Bailey was supposed to be the voice of Mowgli, but during the middle of production, he hit puberty and his voice no longer fit the part. To make sure the same mistake from The Sword in the Stone wouldn't repeat, director Willie Reitherman brought his third son to take Bailey's place. Robert and Richard already had their turn with Wart, so now it's Bruce's time to shine in the starring role and keep Mowgli's voice consistently young throughout the movie. It wasn't his first role in an animated Disney project though, as he previously just did the voice of Christopher Robin in the 1966 short Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree. As it is a movie where the characters interact with each other more often than in other animated films, the animators had to work closer together and each were assigned to work on segments instead of just one character. In fact, some had to lead the way to present the others on how they had to be drawn. Ken Anderson did the character designs, Mil Call did some preliminary animation to show how they move, while the other animators did the rest to create their animation magic, along with everyone helping each other out. When developing the rest of the songs, the Sherman Brothers' job is to take the dark and mysterious parts of the original source material and flip them upside down in order to make them fun musical numbers. But at the same time, they were also instructed that the song should help advance the plot instead of putting it to a halt to show a random song and dance number, which was why they were heavily involved in the story process. For one of their songs, Robert and Richard took one of their unused songs from Mary Poppins' Land of Sand and turned that slow tempo tune into a hypnotic serenade with Ka's song, Trust In Me. But while Walt and the crew were focusing more on bringing these personalities to life, the hardest part for them was to figure out how to conclude the story and have Mowgli ultimately return to the Man Village, especially when they can't use the book to help them either. The solution that Walt figured out was a girl that would entice him to go with her. While it sounded strange at first, the animators warmed up to it once they figured out the right ideas to pull it off. When the film welcomed audiences to the jungle on October 18, 1967, Walt finally received the praise he was looking for. Critics were well aware that it's nothing like the Rudyard Kipling book, but they still loved how it was a lot of fun and beautifully crafted. The same can be said for audiences, since they helped packed up theaters to make the movie a big hit earning $11.5 million in domestic theater rentals, and later, after the numerous of re-releases, grew its grand total into $378 million. Funny enough, even though most of the songs were from the Sherman Brothers, the one song that got an Oscar nomination was actually Terry Gilkeyson's The Bare Necessities, and it actually got very close to getting nominated for Best Picture, but it never happened. During the 1990s, Disney made two animated series based on Mowgli's animal friends, including Jungle Cubs, where the animals were kids that ran for just two seasons with 21 episodes, and Tailspin, where it stars Baloo and features Louie and Shere Khan, where the bear flies an airplane and runs an air cargo freight business that ran for 65 episodes. Because when you think of Baloo from Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, you think of the big gray sloth bear. Deep in the jungle of India, mentoring the man cub about the laws of the land. And he's also one heck of a bush pilot! You know, just like what old Rudy always intended. But those weren't the only times when Disney tried something new with the Jungle Book during the 90s. In 1994, Disney released a live action remake of the film called Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, which, despite the name, was very loosely based on the book and the animated film, and four years later, they produce a direct-to-video feature called The Jungle Book, Mowgli Story. In 2003, a sequel was released in theaters called The Jungle Book 2, which featured a more modern all-star cast including Haley Joel Osment, John Goodman, Tony Jay, and Phil Collins. While definitely not as liked as its predecessor, it still managed to make some good money at the box office. But that's nothing when compared to the achievements made by the second and even bigger live-action remake of the animated film, the 2016 movie directed by Jon Favreau. 
That movie was highly praised by critics, and it's often considered to be Disney's best live-action remake. Along with earning $966.6 million at the box office and winning an Oscar for Best Visual Effects. Ever since its release, it was often noted to be an inspiration for many, and for millions of people, the fun-loving nature of the film won their hearts to make this Disney film one of their favorites. Now with Walt back getting more hands-on with the process like in the 1930s, the animation team can look forward happily knowing that they got the bare necessities to produce even more classics. Well, come on, let's go and congratulate our friend. Hold it, fellas. Now's not the time for it. Look. This is Beach Rogers in the KFCB newsroom. We have a bulletin from Burbank, which is going to sadden the entire world. Walt Disney, the man who built an entertainment empire on a cartoon character, has died today at the age of 65. Of course, he was the creator of Mickey Mouse, the beloved cartoon characters, and Disneyland. Walt Disney, dead at the age of 65. He didn't say anything, but I know I was forgiven. That uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, it wasn't so bad after all. So it meant, it meant a lot to me. And then I found out, of course, two weeks later he was gone. I'd like to start by apologizing for starting this part on a dark and depressing note. It'll definitely pick up from here, but at this point in our story, it is inevitable to discuss about this moment. By the 1960s, Walt Disney's dreams and ambitions have grown to become far bigger than anyone could ever imagine, especially when he kept on accomplishing major achievements at the time, like participating in the 1964 New York World's Fair and produce one of his most acclaimed feature films, Mary Poppins. In animation, not only did he and his team revolutionize how they made their animated films with the Xerox process, but he also got more personally involved with the production of The Jungle Book, like he used to from Snow White to Bambi. While there may have been a lot of tough moments during production, for the first time in many years, Walt's old spark for animation was finally back, and it looked like the future of Disney's animated films would be brighter than ever with the old master's personal touch. That would have been the case if it wasn't for one unexpected event on December 15th, 1966. A moment that is regarded as the darkest day in the company's history. Walt Disney, the man who made his dreams come true with a mouse, passed away. He died of a circulatory collapse due to lung cancer from nearly a lifetime of heavy smoking. While rumors still circulate to this day that he was cryogenically frozen so that he could be unfreeze once a cure for his illness is found, the truth is actually the opposite. Two days after his passing, he was cremated and his ashes reside in the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. When The Jungle Book was released 10 months later, some have accredited its critical and financial success to the public's response of the loss of Walt, as it was the first animated film released after his death. At the studio, everyone who knew him was devastated of the news. But after some time of mourning, they knew the right thing to do for Walt afterwards was to finish what he left off. He had several passion projects that he unfortunately would never see in their completion. But under the new leadership of his brother Roy, everyone in the company was dedicated to bring Walt's final projects in development to life. Other than The Jungle Book, there was the last live-action feature he was personally involved with, The Happiest Millionaire. The rides of New Orleans Square at Disneyland that became the two most iconic attractions of the Disney parks, Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Haunted Mansion. A ski resort in Mineral King that never came to be. But the proposed audio-animatronic show continued forward to the parks, where it became another popular Disney attraction, Country Bear Jamboree. 
but his most ambitious and biggest project he left off was a large area in Orlando, Florida that would have featured resorts, a more elaborate version of Disneyland, and an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. When Walt was developing it, he dubbed it Project X, but then later gave it an official name, Disney World. After Roy stepped in to make the project the company's top priority, the complex that included a theme park called the Magic Kingdom, along with two resorts nearby, opened on October 1st, 1971, where the name Disney World was changed in honor of Roy's little brother to Walt Disney World. A few months later, Roy was gone too. Back at the animation studio, times were tough, especially when the absence of their leader was heartbreakingly noticeable. But like everyone else at the company, they were determined to finish off whatever was left of Walt's unfinished projects, including the final animated feature that Disney personally approved, the Aristocats. It's the story of a cat named Duchess, along with her kittens, Toulouse, Marie, and Berlioz, who are next in line to receive the fortune of their owner, Madame Adeline Bonfamille, by the time she passes away. Her butler, Edgar, is furious that the cats get a higher priority than him in her will and tries to get them out of the picture by abandoning them in the countryside. Meanwhile, an alley cat named Thomas O'Malley finds the missing cats, which he then gives them a tour around Paris and introduces them to his musical friends. But once Edgar returned to finish the job, it's up to Thomas and many other animals to stop the butler before the cats get shipped to Timbuktu. For many years, people know about the journey of how Duchess and her kids escaped the wrath of the butler. But what few people actually know is the journey of how the feature came to be. Because the original plans were never to make this either a movie, nor even animated. It all started back in 1961, when Walt Disney was looking for animal stories for his wonderful World of Color TV show. The two guys for the job to find that story were directors Tom McGowan and producer Harry Title, where they searched for ideas and then found this one book about a mother cat and her kittens in New York City. It may not sound like much, but it is a good start of something. So after some modifications and developing a whole draft, the two created their animal story that can be served as both a two-parter TV special and a whole feature film to release in theaters by putting the two parts together. The original story was about a butler and a maid, possibly played by Boris Karloff and Françoise Rosé, who continuously failed to kill the cats of their mistress, since the animals were in front of them in line to inherit her fortune. At the same time, the story also goes into the perspective of the cats, where they get to talk whenever humans are not around, and the setting would be in Paris, France, in the veins of how the London location worked out for 101 Dalmatians. The first draft was written by Tom Rowe, an American writer and painter living in Paris, and when Walt received the script through title, he liked it. Somewhat. He did make a few cuts and adjustments that did upset Rowe, but it wasn't like he could do anything about it. But then, after years of rewrites in the summer of 1963, the project went into a completely different direction. When discussing with Walt, Harry suggested the potential idea of having the movie be fully animated instead of live action, since this could open up more gag possibilities and bring back old elements that were originally cut like having musical cats. Disney was intrigued of the proposition, especially when the script did get the approval of Wooly Ritherman, Ken Anderson, the animators, and others close to him. And so, Walt agreed to have it be an animated film, but also had to put it on hold to make more room for developing The Jungle Book. But when there was time to work on the feature, he knew the right people for the job, and some of them were already in the studio for The Jungle Book. Once again, Disney hired Phil Harris to improvise and be the voice of Thomas O'Malley, and the Sherman Brothers returned to write the songs. But then, after the time Walt passed away, that's when production started to get... complicated. The team put their focus more on Aristocats once they were finished with The Jungle Book, but making a movie without Disney was first proven to be quite difficult. Even more changes and cuts had to be made to the story, Elvira the Maid, considered to be voiced by Elsa Lanchester, was taken out so that the butler is on his own. They added other animals like Geese and a mouse named Rockford, voiced by Sterling Holloway. And the songs by the Sherman Brothers were all taken out, except for Scales and Arpeggios, in favor of several others. 
At that point, the Shermans were having a hard time dealing with the new management after Walt's death, and after their work on bed knobs and broomsticks, the two quit the studio. They wouldn't return until about 30 years later to compose the songs for the 2000 Winnie the Pooh film, The Tigger Movie. And what's worse, Tom Rowe came back trying to sue Disney in order to get the rights to the characters. Originally, legendary jazz musician Louis Armstrong was supposed to voice Scat Cat, but because he got ill and backed out, the team acted quickly to get a replacement and ended up with Scatman Crothers to be the new voice. When the cats came out of the bag on Christmas Eve 1970, the film received some positive results. There have been better, but no one said that it was bad. The critics praised it for its animation, voice acting, and charm, but they were aware that it didn't have that bold strength as the other Disney films. As for the box office, it managed to perform very well, earning $11 million domestically and a worldwide total of $28 million. Following the re-releases years later, its total substantially grew to $191 million. While the Aristocats gathered a prominent following, especially Marie being a bit of a merchandise queen herself, there were a couple of attempts to grow the film into a franchise. In 2000, Disney was developing an animated series starring the kittens as teenagers in the modern age, and a direct-to-video sequel was planned in 2005 that would star Marie and could have potentially been in computer animation. However, when the animation division was under new management in 2006, those plans ended up getting shipped off to Timbuktu. Throughout the 1960s, the movie spent a lot of time finding its true identity, and just when things started to look clear on what to do, Walt's passing created several obstacles for the movie. But in the end, it managed to come out on top and still made Disney the cool cats of the big screen. And because Disney knows that the cat's the only cat who knows where it's at, even without Walt, the movie still made everybody wanting to be a cat. While the cats did give the animation team the motivational boost they needed to move forward without Walt, their next feature would accomplish something that the studio tried to do for decades. They had films starring cats, dogs, deer, and even an elephant, but now they could finally make their feature starring a fox with Robin Hood. In the town of Nottingham, there is a vigilante named Robin Hood, along with his friend Little John, who steals from the greedy King of England, Prince John, and gives the money to the townsfolk. But while he goes out of his way to help the poor and takes some time to be with his love, Maid Marian, he teams up with the Nottingham people to seek justice against the corruption of Prince John and take back what is theirs. Ever since the release of Snow White, Walt and his team tried numerous efforts of developing an animated feature that would star a fox. More specifically though, Reynard the Fox from the 12th century folklore. While there were possibilities to develop a strong story, what held back Walt were the concerns if it would be considered too sophisticated for kids, and if the main character himself can even be viewed as a legitimate hero, especially when he's depicted as an animal that's often antagonized in cartoons. Even Disney himself is guilty of doing this on a few occasions, portraying them as either a con artist like Honest John and Pinocchio, or a hungry predator like Br'er Fox in Song of the South. He tried again when developing Treasure Island, where it was originally a Song of the South style film where, on several occasions, Long John Silver would tell the stories of Reynard to Jim Hawkins through animated segments to teach him lessons. However, those plans ended up getting scrapped in favor of having it be Disney's first fully live action feature. The only other time Disney and the animators tried to push the character into one of their films was to make him a villain like many of their other animated foxes and have him be against the protagonist of their proposed Chanticleer movie. But as I've mentioned before, it lost the fight for Walt's pick when it was up against the Sword in the Stone. Fast forwarding to 1970, close to the completion of the Aristocats, Ken Anderson was pitching ideas to the executives, and one of them was an adaptation of Robin Hood, but with a little twist. The cast would be anthropomorphic animals, with the lead being a fox like Reynard, but one who uses his cunning skills for good, and the setting would be in the Deep South, in the similar veins of Song of the South. While the executives really liked the idea, they were a little iffy regarding the Deep South theming especially when comparing it to the controversial Song of the South. 
But after they agreed to keep the setting more true to the English folklore, like the company previously did with their 1952 film The Story of Robin Hood and His Merry Men, the project was greenlit and the writers, including Larry Clemens, began work on the script and storyboards. For the voice of Robin Hood, Disney originally thought of having Tommy Steele, inspired by his performance in The Happiest Millionaire. But since he didn't sound heroic enough for the part, they decided to give the role to Brian Bedford after testing him out. As the animators were on work to develop the movie, they were often faced with several limitations, either because of the schedule, the budget, or the creative clash between Ken Anderson and the director and producer Wolfgang Reitherman. One example for the latter is that Anderson wanted Robin's entire team of merry men to be featured in the movie. But since Reitherman wanted this to be more like a buddy picture in the style of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the Merry Men were just reduced to just Little John, once again played by Phil Harris for his third Disney film in a row. While most of them were removed, some did manage to stay in the film, but have their roles switched like Alan Adale as the narrator and Friar Tuck as one of the townsfolk of Nottingham. As they were spending so much time finding the right actors and creating the world of the picture, they ended up falling behind schedule. In an effort to speed production and save money to keep the budget as low as they can, the animators resorted to recycling animation from their older films. While this was not the first nor the last time Disney reused their own animations for the ones they would work on, this movie is the most prominent example of this technique especially the phony King of England scene where it recycles dance sequences from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, The Jungle Book, and even their previous feature, The Aristocats. When it was released on November 8, 1973, like last time, the critics enjoyed the feature, but up to a certain extent. They liked the strong cast, the great animation, and the charming humor, but it wasn't necessarily a big hit for everyone. But one thing Robin Hood knows what to do best is get the money, and he grabbed himself a lot of riches at the box office with $9.6 million domestically and a worldwide total of $27.5 million, which the additional re-release bumped it up a bit to about $35 million. Robin was even close to stealing himself an Oscar, as the song Love was nominated for Best Original Song. Speaking of that song, Love was played again many years later in another animated film starring a fox and a cast of anthropomorphic animals, the 2009 Wes Anderson stop-motion film Fantastic Mr. Fox. Woohoo! Woo! Whoa! Look at that! This kid's a natural! I'm speechless, Christopherson! Another song from the movie that found popularity from an unexpected source was Whistle Stop, as speeding it up would turn it into one of the first internet viral sensations, the hamster dance. However, if there was one person who was the most upset about Disney's version of Robin Hood, it would probably be Louis Prima. Well, it wasn't that he hated the movie, he was just mad that he didn't get to play a part in the film. As a response, a year after the film's release, Prima made an entire album dedicated to the movie called Let's Hear It for Robin Hood, which he managed to sell it to Disney. Ever since it was released, some have grown to be more critical towards the picture, and even considered it as one of Disney's weakest films. But at the same time, the film also gathered a prominent cult following, where many have even admitted that the fox himself has stolen their hearts. Just like a true vigilante, you can either love him or hate him, but his intentions are undeniably true to do good for those that need him the most. Moving forward to a little over three years, their next animated feature would be more unique than their previous films. While it does technically count as a feature-length movie, it's more like a collection of shorts bundled together as one big film. But unlike Fantasia and the package films of the 1940s, these cartoons were already made and previously released individually, even going back to when Walt was alive. And that was The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, 
based on the classic children's books by A.A. A. Milne. As I've just said, the movie consists of three animated shorts inspired by the stories from the first two Pooh books, Winnie the Pooh and The House at Pooh Corner. Set in the imaginary world of a young boy named Christopher Robin called the Hundred Acre Woods, inhabited by Christopher's childhood toys and animals from his backyard. The first cartoon of the movie is Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, where Pooh's appetite for honey often gets him into sticky situations, no pun intended, like avoiding bees that are guarding their honey and getting stuck in Rabbit's door. When it came to the Disney family, they had always been big fans of the A.A. A. Milne books, even going as far back as the 1930s, Wolf first discovered them when his daughters were reading and giggling at them out loud. Ever since 1938, Wolf was always interested in getting the film rights to Pooh, but would never fully achieve it until 1961. He also went and grabbed the American and Canadian merchandising rights that included Pooh's signature red shirt. Three years later, Wolf was planning with his animation team on developing a Winnie the Pooh movie. But after several discussions, they decided that it would be best to turn the books into a set of cartoons as a way to gradually introduce American audiences to the silly old bear. Some of the changes made from the books to have it be more Americanized include updating the current characters, adding more humor onto the story, and include a new character that Americans could relate to with Gopher. However, at the same time, Walt also wanted his team to be more respectful to the source material just so the same mistakes from Alice in Wonderland wouldn't happen again. For the voices, they enlisted many veteran Disney voice actors to perform in the short, or at least those who had previous experience voicing in Disney films. Sterling Holloway played the role of Pooh, as I've said before, but then there was also Sebastian Cabot, the voice of Sir Ector in The Sword of the Stone and Bagheera in The Jungle Book as the narrator for his final film role, Barbara Luddy, the voice of Lady in Lady and the Tramp and Merryweather in Sleeping Beauty as Kanga, and Julius Matthews, the voice of Archimedes in The Sword in the Stone as Rabbit. While Wolfgang Retherman was hired to direct the feature, the animation job went on to the people who were not busy with working on The Jungle Book, like Eric Larson and John Lounsbury. Disney also brought in the Sherman Brothers to write the songs for the short, but they had a bit of a hard time to find some inspiration for Pooh, even when reading the original books. It wouldn't be until they had a chat with British set and costume designer Tony Walton, who was a big Winnie the Pooh fan, that gave the boys all the inspiration they needed, along with a newfound love for the bear, to write songs that include Up, Down, and Touch the Ground, Rumbly in My Tumbly, Little Black Rain Cloud, Mind Over Matter, and of course, Winnie the Pooh. The short was first released on February 4th, 1966, along with the movie The Ugly Dachshund. Despite being more careful not to fall in the same trap as Alice, it ended up happening anyways with the critical response. British critics despised the new take with the way it tarnished the beloved characters with the Disney brand. However, when it came to American audiences and critics, they loved the short and were immediately charmed to Disney's interpretation. So much so that in the summer of 1967, right when the studio was finishing up The Jungle Book and The Aristocats was well into production, the animation team decided to create a sequel short as their first animated project after Walt Disney's death, and the last to have him credited as a producer. In this one, titled Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, a storm threatens the Hundred Acre Woods and the gang must do whatever they can in order to save their little friend Piglet. Since the animators were free from their Jungle Book duties, even more of the nine old men helped out with the animation of the short, including Milt Call, Frank Thomas, and Ollie Johnston. In an attempt to learn from their past mistakes and to win over the British critics, the goal of the short is to stay more true to the source material than they were with the Honey Tree. This included bringing on board characters from the book that were not featured in the first short like Tigger, Piglet, and Pooh's nightmare of Heffalumps and Woozles. Funny enough, despite not appearing in the first cartoon, Tigger and Piglet were featured in the poster but their design stuck closer to the original style of the books than how they ended up in the shorts. Originally, when plans began to adapt Winnie the Pooh, Walt wanted to have actor and Disneyland performer Wally Bogue to be the voice of Tigger. 
But after Walt passed, the studio felt like his performance was too zany, even for Tigger, and the role ended up going to Paul Winchell. When The Short was released on December 20th, 1968, alongside the horse in the gray flannel suit, the result and reception turned out to be much better. So much so that it even won an Oscar for Best Animated Short, which also makes it Walt's last Academy Award. By the way, you know Walt Disney is the person who won the most Oscars in history when not even death can stop him from receiving another one. As this one also features more beloved songs by the Sherman Brothers, one of them, Heffalumps and Woozles, would often stand out for audiences for its psychedelically eerie nature in the style of Pink Elephants on Parade from Dumbo. This is why the song would often be a staple during Disney's Halloween parties at the parks. Years later, another Pooh short was made called Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, where the story focuses more on Tigger. While Rabbit is sick and tired of him unexpectedly bouncing and pouncing on everyone and failed to get him lost in the forest, it did happen when his bouncing got him in trouble on top of a tall tree while having a fear of heights that's stopping him from getting down. For this one, Wolfgang Reitherman stepped down as the director to give the position to John Lounsbury, but Wooly was still involved as a producer. At this point, it's a good time to mention that the voice of Christopher Robin always changed for every short. In The Honey Tree, he was played by the voice of Mowgli, Bruce Reitherman. In The Blustery Day, it was John Walmsley. And for Tigger 2, Timothy Turner took the part. The latter short also replaced the voice of Rue, who was previously done by the actor of Hottie Jr. in The Jungle Book, Clint Howard, with Dory Whitaker. The short came out exactly six years after its predecessor on December 20th, 1974, with The Island at the Top of the World, and while it did not achieve the same level of success as before, it still did do very well. The cartoon received an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Short, which the winner at the time was Will Vinton's Closed Mondays. However, it did manage to win a Grammy Award for Best Album for Children. By combining all three shorts, each with an estimated running time of 25 minutes each, along with animating new scenes to stitch them all together, they resulted in Pooh's first animated feature, released on March 11th, 1977. And since Pooh already made his mark in pop culture after over a decade and got an Oscar, it is safe to say that the film was very well received. Ever since the movie's release, from the 1980s onward, not only would Pooh and his friends at the Hundred Acre Woods become very prominent members of the Disney family, but the whole franchise became a multi-billion dollar juggernaut. In 1983, not only did Disney create a fourth animated short called Winnie the Pooh and a Day for Eeyore, but they also released their first Winnie the Pooh TV series called Welcome to Pooh Corner, a live action show with animatronic costumes that ran for 120 episodes in three years. After that, another series appeared, this time animated, named The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. The show premiered in 1988 and ran for four seasons and 50 episodes, but what makes this one stand out is the massive praise it received, where critics even went as far as call it the best animated series of its time along with winning two Daytime Emmys and two Humanitas Prizes. During the 2000s, two more shows were made geared towards preschoolers that aired on Playhouse Disney, now called Disney Junior. There was The Book of Pooh, a puppet show that premiered in 2001 that ran for two seasons and 51 episodes, and My Friends Tigger and Pooh, a computer animated series that featured a new human character named Darby and her puppy Buster that started in 2007 and had three seasons with 63 episodes. While Pooh kept inviting TV viewers to the Hundred Acre Woods with his shows and specials, between 1997 and 2010, the franchise released a total of nine direct-to-video features. The first, Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin, is more like a sequel to many adventures, while the rest act more like spin-offs of either the TV shows or previous Pooh works. But if a whole collection of direct-to-video films wasn't enough, Christopher Robin's toys had gotten so big that some of these movies meant for direct-to-video ended up getting a theatrical release, including the Tigger movie in 2000, Piglet's big movie in 2003, and Pooh's Heffalump movie in 2005. 
While they may not have been the strongest source of revenue for Pooh, they did receive some positive reception from the critics who stated that they each still hold on to the charm and wholesomeness of the franchise. At the parks, while Pooh and his friends have been popular meet and greet characters since Walt was alive, he wouldn't officially receive his own attraction until 1999 named after the first movie, which featured iconic scenes from the film that can be found in all the parks with the exception of Paris and Tokyo. The latter instead has its own trackless dark ride named Pooh's Honey Hunt that opened in 2000, and has since become the most popular ride in Fantasyland in Tokyo's Magic Kingdom. But bigger than any of that, more than the TV shows, movies, and rides, the real gold mine of Winnie the Pooh came from the merchandise. Clothes, toys, video games, books, accessories, you name it, it'll have some pieces of Pooh in there. At its peak, Winnie the Pooh was ranked as one of the highest selling franchises of all time and estimated a worth for Disney of up to $6 billion. There is more to tell about the Pooh phenomenon when going into the 2010 decade, but that will be another chapter for another day. For now, let's close the book, knowing that the little bear will always be waiting. After the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, the public didn't have to wait too long for Disney's next animated feature. In fact, their following movie came out just three months after Pooh, and that was The Rescuers, based on the children's novel series by Marjorie Sharp. It's about two mice who are a part of the Rescue Aid Society, an organization of mice from around the world that pledge to help others in need. One is the Hungarian representative named Miss Bianca, and the other is the timid janitor named Bernard. Bianca accepted a mission and have Bernard to be her co-agent to rescue an orphan girl named Penny who is kidnapped by Madame Medusa and Mr. Snoops, who intend to use her to retrieve the world's biggest diamond called the Devil's Eye in a pirate cave. With the help of some friendly animals, Bianca and Bernard must accomplish their mission to save Penny and get her out of harm's way. The idea of a rescuer's movie began back in 1962, when the team developed a story that resembled more like the first book. In the original plans, Miss Bianca and Bernard were meant to rescue a poet that was held captive by a ruthless totalitarian government. However, Walt Disney scrapped the project as the political tones were too much for the kind of movies he usually produced. Fast forwarding to 1970, Miss Bianca would have a second chance at Disney with a team led by one of the rising stars at the studio, Don Bluth. Their plan for the movie would be to adapt the most recent novel of the series at the time called Miss Bianca in the Antarctic, where the mice had to rescue a polar bear who was forced to perform in shows against his will. The film would have been more of a musical, as the polar bear named Louis the Bear, played by Louis Prima, would sing six songs written by Floyd Huddleston. Over time, Louis's design and location would change. But after Prima was diagnosed with a stem brain tumor, by 1975, the plans for the bear had to be let go. Meanwhile, when Robin Hood was complete, Ken Anderson suggested a plan to adapt the Paul Gallico book, Scruffy, about a group of monkeys from Gibraltar who were threatened to be captured by Nazis from the British Empire in World War II. But that project ended up thrown out by the studio in favor of continuing rescuers, thus having the veterans come into the production. The first thing they did when they came in was to scrap the entire Arctic aesthetic and replace it with potential ideas for the villain, which they considered to bring back Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians, now updated so her fashion sense was all about alligators. However, since the animation crew wasn't comfortable yet with the idea of making sequels, Cruella was ditched and they decided to find their villainous source in the book Miss Bianca. The result was a loose adaptation of the bad guys from the book, including Mandrake becoming Mr. Snoops, which the animators modeled after animation historian John Culhane, the Bloodhounds Tyrant and Torment became the alligators Brutus and Nero, and the main antagonist Diamond Duchess turned into Madame Medusa. The villain was the last Disney character to be animated by Milk Call, and he wanted to have her be his grand finale in Disney animation, his magnum opus of his career. So much so that he nearly ended up animating Medusa all by himself. 
However, the villains weren't the only ones that went through some changes before becoming the characters we know them in the final picture. Bianca and Bernard were originally considered to be a married couple, but then decided that not having them married was a more romantic option, as it opens the door to see love bloom along their adventure. Also, Orville was meant to be a pigeon, but Ollie Johnston suggested to make him an albatross, as he remembered in one of Walt's true life adventures of the clumsy ways they take off and land that can have plenty of comedic potential. On a side note, this was one of the very rare moments where Orville's voice actor, Jim Jordan, came out of retirement after the passing of his wife Marion in 1961. This movie is also noted to be Jordan's final film role. And finally, for the other supporting characters at the Bayou, they were meant to be serious home guards that were always marching. But by time, the characters grew into a bunch of volunteers who helped Bianca and Bernard along the way while the dragonfly-powered Swampmobile grew into its own character named Evanrude, which Jimmy McDonald came back from retirement to do his sound effects. The Bayou creatures also had a bullfrog as their leader that was meant to be voiced by Phil Harris, but was eventually removed. Besides, Phil was already in enough Disney films virtually playing the same character anyway, so it wasn't a big loss. When the movie was released on June 22, 1977, the reviews were positively mixed for the mice of the Rescue 8 Society, and by positively mixed, I mean that the critics' reception ranged from calling it a decent feature to praising it as one of Disney's best films since Mary Poppins. Even Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson stated that it was the best movie they made without Walt Disney. At the box office, it was Disney's most successful animated feature of its time earning a worldwide total of $48 million, and its success continued with the re-releases to have its total grow into $169 million, on top of receiving an Oscar nomination for the song Someone's Waiting For You. On its first re-release in 1983, the movie was accompanied with the 26-minute short Mickey's Christmas Carol, which made it the first time in over 30 years since 1953's The Simple Things that Mickey made an appearance on the big screen. While Bianca and Bernard's mission was quite successful without any trouble during its theatrical runs, it wasn't until when its VHS came out in 1999 when controversy came out of nowhere. In the scene where Orville dives down after takeoff with the mice, there were a couple of shots that were discovered that featured a picture of a real topless woman, showing off her breasts, nipples, and all. Nobody knew why or who snuck in that picture onto the film, but ever since that discovery, Disney edited out for all following releases. But even with that little scandalous moment, Miss Bianca and Bernard didn't just rescue Penny, but also the faith of the public where more than ever, people had the confidence in the studio that they could continue their legendary animation legacy without Walt, and that their new animated features still had some of that magic that made them worth watching. However, what they didn't know was that at the company, an inevitable transition began to occur that would change everything. All the old masters that worked with Walt since the beginning were leaving for retirement, and had to pass the torch onto new and young animators that were fresh out of the animation program in the California Institute of the Arts, which one of the founders of the school was Walt Disney himself. Animation remained pretty stable at Disney throughout the 1970s, but that won't mean it would remain that way in the hands of not just the new animators, but also their new leaders. Two Hollywood studio executives have been chosen to run Walt Disney Productions, the first time outsiders have been brought in at the top. The Disney Board of Directors chose Michael Eisner of Paramount Pictures as chairman and Frank Wells of Warner Brothers as chief operating officer. I'm Michael Eisner, and welcome to the Disney Sunday Movie. After Walt Disney's death, times were emotionally tough for the company. 
but they still managed to pull through to keep the legacy alive and turn Walt's final dreams into reality. Even at the animation studio, while the animators certainly miss having their boss around to give his unique magical touch to their features, they were still able to produce some successful animated films. Okay, sure, they weren't as big as back in the old days, but at least they were enough to keep them afloat. However, when the 1980s came along, change became unavoidable. The legendary nine old men were retiring one by one and had no choice but to leave the legacy of Disney animation in the hands of new and young animators eager to create their own magic. But when entering the studio with their pencils ready, what they didn't know was that not only Disney animation was going through a major change, but the entire company was about to get some new leaders that would really shake things up. But before they would meet their new bosses, they must start on their first movie that fully displayed their talents, The Fox and the Hound. It's the story of a red fox named Todd and a hound dog named Copper. As kids, they were good friends and enjoyed each other's company, unaware of the fact that they're meant to be enemies by nature. But that friendship would later be tested as they grow older. Now when the two reunite and have no choice but to fight, the true battle is not between the fox and the hound, but rather their childhood friendship against their natural survival and hunting instincts. The project all began before the new team took over, when Wolfgang Reitherman was inspired to create a film adaptation of the 1967 novel of the same name, and in the summer of 1977, he started production as director alongside animator Art Stevens to help him out. However, right at the start, the two were going along as well as how a real fox and hound would interact. Wooly and Art continuously butted heads and battled over certain scenes, with the latter having the advantage with the support of the animators and then Disney president and Walt's son-in-law, Ron Miller. But Reitherman still persisted and tried as much as he can to stay in charge since he can't fully trust the new artists. One example of a production battle was regarding a change from the source material, since a lot of the dark tones from the book had to be altered to make it more suitable for a family-friendly Disney flick. Originally, Chief, Copper's hunting mentor, was supposed to die when he got hit by the train. But Steven softened the moment by having Chief survive the hit and just come out with a broken leg. While the animators were massively upset because keeping him alive would take away the impact and legitimate motivation for Copper to be against Todd, the change remained intact in the final picture. Another argument was when Wooly wanted a comical musical number called Scooby Dooby Dooby Doo Let Your Body Turn to Goo, sung by two cranes voiced by Charo and Phil Harris, again, meant to liven up the second act. While similarly hated by the crew and Charo already recorded her part for the film, the number, along with the cranes, ended up getting cut out. When it was time for casting, the crew already had a good idea of who they wanted, including Pearl Bailey as Big Mama and Jack Albertson as Amos Slade in their final film roles. However, there were a few backup plans that they had to work with, including Jeanette Nolan replacing Helen Hayes as Widow Tweed and Kurt Russell taking on the role of adult copper when Jackie Cooper was asking for too much money. This would mark as the last time any of the nine old men directly worked on a Disney animated film. Reitherman inevitably quit as director, but did receive producing credits and his position was later taken by Richard Rich and Ted Berman, while Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston contributed to the animation until about the end of 1978. As the old masters were out, the new animators stepped in to fully take over the studio. While some were already working at Disney since the 1970s on projects like The Rescuers and Pete's Dragon, this was their first time that they were in charge of an animated feature without the help of their old mentors. Among them, which will include some surprisingly familiar names, include Glenn Keane, Ron Clements, John Musker, Mark Dindal, Mike Gabriel, Chris Buck, Brad Bird, Henry Selleck, and Tim Burton. But there is one other animator on this list who did work on the feature. However, his contribution was a lot more disruptive than helpful. 
and that was Don Bluth. He began working at Disney on Sleeping Beauty for a couple of years and came back in the early 1970s to quickly rise up the ranks to become an animation director on The Rescuers and Pete's Dragon and the director of the 1978 animated short The Small One. While working on The Fox and the Hound, Bluth became disillusioned with the company and felt that the movies they were making at the time were no longer on the same level as the ones from Walt's days. So on his 42nd birthday on September 13th, 1979, Don and a handful of animators who looked up to him, including Gary Goldman and John Pomeroy, quit Disney in pursuit to create their own animation studio. This was a serious backstab to the production. Not only Ron Miller had to quickly find new animators to fill the gap, but the release date was delayed from Christmas 1980 to July 10th, 1981. When the movie was finally finished and released in theaters, the critics thought that it was good and loved the animation, voice acting, and commentary on prejudice, but felt that it wasn't on par with the classics due to the story playing too safe. However, the box office treated the feature a lot better by earning almost $40 million domestically, and with the addition of its re-release in 1988, the film collected a grand total of $63.5 million. Following its release, the characters appeared in a few comic strip spin-offs and the two friends returned at the end of 2006 for the direct-to-video sequel, The Fox and the Hound 2, where during their childhood, their friendship was put to the test when Copper decided to possibly leave Todd to... join... a band. What? While the movie tells the story of two friends who should be natural enemies, it also represents a moment in Disney history when the old masters have to pass the baton onto the new generation of animators, which can be perfectly symbolized by the old chief inevitably passing on his top position onto the young copper. As time moves on and people grow older to find themselves in a new position in life, just like the animals in the movie, the fox and the hound was both the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. Now that the young team fully established themselves as the people in charge of Disney animation, their next mission after proving their worth on The Fox and the Hound was to finally complete a project that was already in development for many years. But even if it already went through a lot of trouble, what everyone at Disney didn't know was that the madness that the movie would bring was only just beginning. And that was The Black Cauldron, based on the Chronicles of Prydane book series by Lloyd Alexander. Deep in the medieval land of Prydane, the Horn King seeks to find the cauldron that could raise an undead army so that he could command them to do his bidding. But in order to get this black cauldron, he must first retrieve a pig with the power to reveal its location. The only ones who have a chance to stop the king's mission and save the land from his wrath is the pig's keeper, a boy named Tarin, along with some unlikely allies like the princess Elanui, a bar named Fluterflam, and a hairy comic relief named Gurgi. Now, when I said that the development took them many years, I specifically mean that Disney's journey of adapting the Lloyd Alexander books began all the way back in 1971. The idea originated from Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who thought that an animated adaptation of the Chronicles of Prydain books can have some strong potential to be the next big Disney hit. The company agreed to go forward with it by buying the film rights, and the team spent their time to figure out how to take all the materials from those five books and put them in one epic animated feature. This turned out to be anything but an easy task. It was originally meant for a 1980 release date, but considering that the team spent the entire 1970 decade on how to implement and handle all the storylines and over 30 significant characters from the books, Ron Miller had no choice but to delay it to Christmas 1984 and give the original release to The Fox and the Hound instead. It wouldn't be until 1980 when Miller decided to bring on board one man who could finally make the project move forward. Considering his lack of trust on the new animator since Don Bluth's exit messed up production on the last feature, he enlisted longtime layout artist Joe Hale to be the producer. 
Once he got the job, he finally got traction going and made a lot of significant changes in order to have the movie actually come to life. It did come with some sacrifices though, including discarding Tim Burton's character concepts and kicking out story artists Ron Clements and John Musker for creative differences, but it did bring in the Fox and the Hound directors Ted Berman and Richard Rich to reprise their jobs once that movie was over. As for the movie itself, the first major revision was the story, now only loosely adapting the first two books, The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron, while also taking a lot of creative liberties. One of them include taking a minor character and combine several other characters from the books into him in order to become the main villain of the feature, the Horn King. As for the animation, they wanted to achieve a similar art style to Sleeping Beauty, and even managed to convince Mill Call to come out of retirement to make some character designs of the main characters, even recycling elements from designs of older Disney characters to bring Tarin and Ewanwi to life. As Milt was giving the film some of that classic touch, the movie is also noted to include some firsts for Disney animation. One is being the first ever movie to have the animation photo transfer process, a more advanced version of the Xerox process that, well, processes the rough drawings onto a cell and then add the colors onto them automatically. While they started to do so with Xerox, the new process could also make the lines colored. It is also the first Disney animated film to feature CGI with the effects like bubbles and certain objects like a boat and even the cauldron. But while the artists were hard at work to finally turn the books of Lloyd Alexander into animation, one significant event occurred that would forever change the course of Disney animation. In 1984, Roy E. Disney, the son of Walt's brother Roy O. Disney, quit the board of directors in protest of Ron Miller, who was appointed CEO the year prior. The protest was a success, and after Miller was kicked out, Roy brought in two outsiders that he personally knew to be in charge of Disney, a first for the company. One was an old classmate of his back in college who was the vice chairman of Warner Brothers named Frank Wells, who was assigned to be the company's president. As for the CEO and chairman, Frank suggested to Roy a bold English major from New York who was the head of Paramount Pictures and had known Roy for being in the board of Cal Arts. His name was Michael Eisner. When the two became the leaders of Disney, one of the first things Eisner did was to bring on board longtime friend and partner at Paramount, Jeffrey Katzenberg, to be in charge of the company's film division. When Jeffrey started his job and had his first look at what the animators were doing with the Black Cauldron, he was utterly shocked at how dark and violent it was, especially near the end when the Horned King summoned the Cauldron-born army. He knew that this moment would horrify kids and families, so he demanded them to edit out certain moments to calm things down. The crew was reluctant to do so, so Jeffrey brought the movie to the editing bay and edit the film himself. Now, keep in mind that editing has a completely different definition in animation, and this was Jeffrey's first time being involved with an animated feature. So when he said he was going to edit the feature himself, what was actually happening was that Katzenberg was messing up the whole picture without any idea what he was doing. Jeffrey. <laughs> you know what they say. One must become the enemy! Come on now, let's be mature about this. Luckily, he did stop and asked them to just modify some scenes so that they can properly take out the more gratuitous parts. As a result, about 12 minutes was cut from the running time, and the release date was once again pushed back to July 26, 1985. After 14 years in development, the feature was finally ready to be released in theaters as Disney's first 70mm animated film since Sleeping Beauty, their first PG animated film, and their most expensive animated film at the time with a $44 million budget. It was their most ambitious feature, but it also came with their most disastrous results. While the critics didn't notice the ambition and admired the technical achievements, they considered the rest as a great disappointment. 
But while some critics were a bit harsh, they were nothing compared to what happened at the box office, where it didn't even make half of its budget with a domestic gross of only $21.3 million. One infamous fact about its financial failure was that the Care Bears movie, released four months before The Black Cauldron, ended up making nearly $2 million more than the Disney feature. And considering that a dark Disney epic that was also their most expensive animated feature yet did worse than a cutesy commercialized movie meant to sell toys based on greeting card characters at a budget of just two to four million dollars, this has often been considered to be Disney Animation's lowest point. Following afterwards, the company did try to give the movie some recognition like a few home media releases, a game by Sierra in 1986, and the characters would make meet and greet appearances at the parks, along with having its own eatery at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. The most prominent appearance that the movie ever received at the Disney parks was with the Tokyo Disneyland attraction Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour. Open from 1986 to 2006, the ride gave guests a tour underneath the castle where they had to confront some villains, including the Horn King who was the last that guests encountered. Other than that though, Disney doesn't really hide that they're kind of ashamed of the picture and would rather want to keep their distance, giving it little recognition and, as of 2020, never even gave it a Blu-ray release. It's not that it was terrible or hated by the public, it did eventually gain a cult following and was the first to feature some innovations in producing animation. It's just that it reflected a time when the studio spent over a decade and faced numerous of obstacles and sudden changes within the company just to experiment with a new direction with their feature animation, and ultimately, it ended up as a complete waste. The Black Cauldron was a dark moment when Disney lost their magic. But did that mean that this was the end of Disney animation? Actually, almost. After the Black Cauldron bombed, Eisner considered the option of just shutting down the animation division entirely, especially when Disney's other assets like live action productions, theme parks, and television were doing much better. Luckily, Roy convinced him not to, and Michael instead just gave the animation team a downgrade and some help. While Roy brought in Peter Schneider to be senior vice president of Disney Animation and give the team some motivation, the animators had to move from their old building in Burbank to a small decrepit facility in Glendale. At that point, morale was at an all-time low, and the team carried a sense of dread that they might lose their jobs the next day but they still hope that their next feature can find the clue to turn their luck around, and that was The Great Mouse Detective, based on the children's book series Basil of Baker Street by Eve Titus. It's about Olivia Flaversham, a little mouse in London, who calls for the help of legendary detective Basil of Baker Street to find her toy-making father, who was kidnapped by Basil's arch-nemesis, Professor Radigan. With the help of his newfound assistant, Dr. David Q. Dawson, Basil and the gang must follow the trail that could lead them to Radigan before he could overthrow the Queen and be the new ruler of England. Ever since the mid-1970s, there were some interests around the studio to develop a movie with a Sherlock Holmes theme. In fact, during the making of The Rescuers, Joe Hale suggested to make an adaptation of the Basil of Baker Street books, which were a kid's version of Sherlock Holmes with mice. However, considering that they were already producing an animated feature starring mice, the project was shelved. But not forgotten. Several years later, in 1982, one of the young animators who was kicked off of the Black Cauldron, Ron Clements, reopened the idea to Ron Miller, and after seeing how things with Cauldron were not going as well as planned, he approved it as a side project for the animators, which he assigned other story artists and animators not involved with Cauldron like John Musker and Bertie Maddinson as directors, and Dave Michener as co-director. A few years later, now with Eisner and Katzenberg in charge, it was time for the team to pitch the movie. After an intense meeting with storyboards summarizing the whole picture that lasted for hours, both Michael and Jeffrey came out clueless. They were never pitched a movie this way before, and it took so much longer than just reading the script. 
But one thing they agreed on was that they knew they had to pay the animators, regardless if they're making the movie or not. So why not let them make the movie? And so Eisner greenlit the project, but with a big cost. After the failure of the Black Cauldron, the movie was given less money and less time to have it be produced. While it originally had a $24 million budget with a Christmas 1987 release date, the film was only given $10 million and the release was moved to more than a year prior to July 2nd, 1986, giving the team only a year to make the movie. Because of this, a slight change up with the directors had to be made. Bertie Madison stepped down to only be involved as a producer, while Ron Clements was brought in to help John Musker and Dave Michener with directing duties. When finding inspiration for Basil, the crew decided to watch the 1950 comedy Champagne for Caesar to look at Ronald Coleman's performance. But upon watching, their attention went away from Coleman and more towards another actor in the film, horror icon Vincent Price. While not suited for the part of the Baker Street detective, the animators knew he would be perfect to play the villainous role of Radigan, and when offered, Price was more than happy to take the part. In fact, through his nearly 60-year career, Price even stated that Radigan was one of his favorite roles he ever played. Since Basil himself was named after the actor that played Sherlock Holmes during the 1930s and 1940s on film and radio, Basil Rathbone, Rathbone himself has a voice cameo in the feature. Sure, he died nearly two decades before the movie was released, but a clip from the 1966 radio play of the home story The Red-Headed League can be heard when Basil and the gang first sneak into Sherlock's home. I have nothing to do today. My practice is never very absorbing. Then put on your hat and come. I'm going through the city first and we can have some lunch on the way. I observe that there is a good deal of German music on the program. It is introspective, and I want to introspect. But Holmes, that music is so frightfully dull. During the saloon scene, Eisner suggested that it would be a good idea to bring in a pop star to perform a musical number like either Madonna or Michael Jackson. The animators were not comfortable with the plan, but eventually settled on having Melissa Manchester to write and perform the song Let Me Be Good To You. For the final battle on the clock of the Elizabeth Tower, the animators decided to make a stronger use of computers, where it would put Basil, Olivia, and Radigan in the clockworks of the tower that is made entirely out of CGI, with cinematography where the camera turns all around as Basil confronts the wrath of Radigan. This was achieved by creating the background with all the gears with wireframe graphics, which then each frame of the shot got printed so that the animators can draw the characters in the right angle. Originally, the title was supposed to be the same as the books is based on as Basil of Baker Street, but due to the financial disappointment of 1985's Young Sherlock Holmes, the marketing team decided to change it to The Great Mouse Detective. The animators thought the new name was just so unappealingly generic, but don't have the power to influence the higher-ups. So, in retaliation, one artist decided to make a fake memo that stated, inspired by The Great Mouse Detective, all of Disney's animated films will now have a new name. These include Seven Little Men Help a Girl, The Wonderful Elephant Who Could Really Fly, The Girl with the See-Through Shoes, Two Dogs Fall in Love, Puppies taken away, to My Save a Girl, The Evil Bonehead, and of course, Robin Hood. With animals. While the memo was passed off as a joke, it did end up becoming a category in one episode of Jeopardy. In other words, came about as the result of a big foo that occurred at the Disney Studios last year when the employees staged a minor revolt when they changed the title of Basil of Baker Street to The Great Mouse Detective. When Disney put out their latest animated film since embarrassing themselves the year prior, the result was already a massive improvement. It received great reviews from critics where they praised that it had been years since Disney was this good, and even Roger Ebert stated that it looks more fully animated than anything in some 30 years. But better yet, it was proven to be the box office hit they needed after The Black Cauldron, earning $38.7 million domestically and a worldwide total of $50 million, finally putting Disney back at the top of the animation game. If it weren't for another animator. 
During the 1980s, Steven Spielberg began to take interest in developing his own animated features, and during the same year as Detective, his company, Amblin Entertainment, released An American Tale, which grossed much more than Detective with $47 million domestically and a worldwide total of $87 million. But what really caught Disney's attention was the fact that the movie itself was made not by Spielberg, but by their former colleague, Don Bluth. This was their wake-up call that animation now has some serious competition. But regardless of how it compared to other animated films starring mice, the Great Mouse Detective on its own succeeded to pick the animation studio back up after suffering from a crushing defeat. And the best part is that it proved to the bosses like Michael Eisner that the animation division was worth keeping, thus securing the animators to know that their jobs were safe. Basil is often regarded as the Great Mouse Detective for always getting the job done, but his greatest accomplishment was solving the case on how to save Disney animation. Now that the company decided to keep the animators, the heads like Roy, Katzenberg, and Schneider all got together with a new plan to grow the studio and make it bigger and better. They decided to hire more people in order to release the animated features more frequently. In the past, they usually came out with a new movie once every two to four years, but now they want to release a new animated film annually. So with more people and more animated films that are going to be distributed, it was time to take their new ideas and put them to good use. Not long before, Michael and Jeffrey set up what was referred to as a gong show, where anybody at the studio can go and pitch their ideas in the hopes that they could potentially be turned into the next Disney animated film. Some of the ideas that got approved include a rescuer sequel set in Australia, their own adaptation of Beauty and the Beast, The Prince of the Popper featuring Mickey Mouse, and a single picture presenting a possible Pocahontas movie. But the first of these that was turned into a movie and start the new yearly tradition was a modern animated take on Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist named Oliver and Company. It's the story of an orphan kitten named Oliver who meets a cool mutt named Dodger that shows him how to live free in the streets of Manhattan and later joins his gang of dogs, owned by a down-on-his-luck thief with a heart of gold named Fagin. Suddenly, Oliver's luck got a major boost when he got adopted by a rich girl named Jenny. But with the loan shark Sykes around that Fagin owes money, Oliver shouldn't get too comfortable when Sykes is looming over his friends and Jenny to use them for profit. As I've said before, the idea originated from Disney's Gong Show pitch meeting, where story artist Pete Young came in and suggested his idea of making Oliver twist, but with dogs. For Jeffrey Katzenberg, Pete's pitch was a little personal to him, since during his time at Paramount, he always wanted to make his own adaptation of the musical Oliver. But now that his opportunity to produce an Oliver Twist musical feature returned, he immediately approved the project and put Young as the story supervisor while Richard Rich and animator George Scribner were assigned as directors. Originally, the movie had a darker tone and started out by showing Sykes dogs killing Oliver's parents and part of Oliver's motivation throughout the film is to seek revenge on Sykes. Obviously, this would be where changes had to be made. Peter decided to go with his gut by firing Rich because he hated him and keep Scribner because he liked him, making George the sole director and the one in charge to shape the movie to become what it is today. His first big changes were to lighten up the tone, establish what the characters are, and give the movie a theme of New York-style street smarts. These themes of street smarts and New York were key to finding the right actors for the casting. Getting personalities that highlight that like Bette Midler, Cheech Marin, Dom DeLuise, Richard Mulligan, Robert Loggia, Roscoe Lee Brown, Cheryl Lee Ralph, and Billy Joel. Also, since Billy Joel and Bette Midler are also prominent singers, the movie also got other pop musicians of their time to contribute to the songs like Barry Manilow and Huey Lewis. As it is more of a dog-centered animated film, George knew that if he wanted the team to get the animation right, he'd have to look back at what the old masters did with Lady and the Tramp. 
One of the ways to do so was when the animators took to the streets in order to get photographs just 18 inches off the ground in order to give them references of a dog's point of view of the big city. And just like with 101 Dalmatians, some of the dogs from Lady and the Tramp made a cameo during Dodger's musical number, Why Should I Worry, along with 101's Pongo. Also, this is noted to be the first Disney animated film to include real-world advertising like McDonald's, Kodak, Sony, Coca-Cola, USA Today, and more. However, the point of those ads were not for the sake of Hollywood-style product placements, but rather to give realism to the New York City environment. Because, let's be honest, what would Manhattan be without a bunch of ads at every turn? When the film was released on November 18th, 1988, it wasn't alone. On the exact same day as Oliver and Company, Spielberg and Bluth put out their latest animated feature, The Land Before Time. It was a moment when Disney had to finally prove their worth by directly facing their competition. So who came out victorious from this epic animated battle? Well, at the box office, Oliver managed to beat out Littlefoot domestically with $53 million, but The Land Before Time did get the upper hand with the worldwide number, even if Oliver got re-released to boost the total to $74 million. As for which movie critics preferred? Quick, give that jerk over there two thumbs down! His film contains very frightening scenes that would haunt my nightmares! Think of the children! Mother? <laughs> no, wait! <laughs> there was no contest. Yeah, critics did not look at the feature highly, saying that there was some charm and fun to it, but kind of low ranking by Disney standards. But regardless of what critics said or how it compared to The Land Before Time, the movie on its own still counts as a hit for Disney, even earning a couple of nominations like for a Grammy for Best Recording for Children and a Golden Globe for Best Original Song with Why Should I Worry. But while The Great Mouse Detective and Oliver and Company were helping Disney to have their animated features perform progressively better, there were other significant factors that helped make Disney animation become increasingly popular in the mainstream. In 1985, the company released their first classic animated film on video cassette with Pinocchio that allowed people to watch them whenever they want in the comfort of their own home. The result turned out to be a much more profitable solution than just re-releasing them in theaters and allowed Disney to gain a very strong home media market thanks to their past classics, which helped make them popular all over again. Also, during the same year as Oliver, another movie was released that was a collaboration between Disney and Steven Spielberg called Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which went on to become a legendary success thanks to its innovative technique of seamlessly blending animation with live action done by Richard Williams with the help of the Disney animators. Almost everything was in place for Disney to make their biggest comeback. All they needed was just one movie to truly find their voice. When the new young animators stepped in to take over Disney animation and carry the legacy from the old masters, they unexpectedly entered at a very hectic and, well, debatably disastrous time for the studio. Not only was there a major corporate shakeup that resulted the Walt Disney Company to have outsiders in charge like Michael Eisner and Frank Wells, 
but their animated films reached a new low when The Black Cauldron turned out to be an embarrassing box office bomb, and the crew had to move to a rundown facility in Glendale. I think it's safe to say that all the new people were off to a bad start. But soon afterwards, they did gradually improve themselves and their work in order to regain Disney's reputation. Since they were at the bottom, they progressively improved with each movie afterwards, like The Great Mouse Detective and Oliver and Company. At the same time, outside sources were also helping to boost the mainstream popularity of Disney and their animated classics, like The Home Media Market and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It was like everything was set up for Disney Animation to return as the masters of the medium, making it the perfect opportunity for a princess to save Disney when they needed it the most, much like what Snow White and Cinderella did before. And that princess was the Little Mermaid. It's the story of Ariel, one of the daughters of King Triton, who saved and fell in love with a human named Eric, even if she didn't properly introduce herself to him. Since her father disapproved of her new sentiments, she decided to seek the help of the sea witch Ursula to trade her voice for a pair of legs. Now Ariel has to get a kiss of true love from the man of her dreams before time runs out and face the consequences of Ursula's contract. When starting production, some of the people at Disney wondered, why didn't Walt think of doing his own adaptation of the story? I mean, he did define the movie versions of Tales from the Brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault, why not something from Hans Christian Andersen? Actually, he did. It's just that he never made a finished product with one of his stories. After the release of Snow White, Walt considered to make a collaboration with Samuel Goldwyn of MGM in order to make a biopic of Hans Christian Andersen. The plan was to have Goldwyn produce the live-action biographical part of Anderson, while Disney would create animated shorts based on his stories that would be a part of the feature, one of which included The Little Mermaid. However, the plan was ultimately scrapped. Fast-forwarding nearly 50 years later in 1985, Ron Clements got the idea of creating a Disney version of the Hans Christian Andersen story. When he proposed it to Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg's Gong Show pitch meeting, the idea got rejected. Nothing against the story, but one of their more recent big hits at the time was the comedy Splash, and they were thinking about developing a sequel, so they weren't really too keen on having another mermaid feature that's kind of doing the same thing. But, like I said, the story wasn't at fault here. In fact, it was actually quite good. Which was why Katzenberg changed his mind the next day and approved the project. From there, Clements and one of the directors he worked with on The Great Mouse Detective, John Musker, convinced Jeffrey that they were suited to lead the project as directors and writers with a script that even amazed him, which was fueled by their passion to create the grand return of a fairy tale based Disney animated film since Sleeping Beauty an inspiration from their discovery of artwork by Kai Nielsen made for Walt's version of the story. While Ron and John were already in place to be the key players to lead the project, it wouldn't be until one more person came along to not only help find the movie's identity, but also refine the format of the future of Disney's animated films. One of Jeffrey's friends, David Geffen, suggested to bring on board Howard Ashman to work at Disney to give his musical touch onto his pictures. Beforehand, Howard was a director, playwright, and lyricist for both on and off Broadway. Early in his career, he found great success in 1982 with his musical Little Shop of Horrors that resulted in several awards and a film version directed by Frank Oz four years later. However, after the failure of Smile, he wanted to find an escape from stage musicals, and Jeffrey could not have picked a better time to ask for his assistance. When he entered in 1987, he started out by working on the lyrics of Once Upon a Time in New York City and Oliver and Company, but he knew his main job was for The Little Mermaid, and even brought on board his longtime collaborator Alan Menken to work on the score. His purpose was technically to just write the lyrics for the songs, 
But Atchman's contribution to the feature was actually so big that he could have almost been considered one of the directors. Fixing plot points and structuring the story in a similar style to a Broadway production, changing characters to suit the music better like turning an English crab named Clarence into a Jamaican crustacean called Sebastian, and even with the casting by bringing on board the star of the failed show Smile, Jodie Benson, to voice Ariel. When developing Ursula, there was a wide variety of suggestions of what to do with her design, trying out all shapes and sizes, and mixing her with many different sea creatures. They were close to making her part scorpion fish, but it wasn't until Matthew O'Callaghan suggested that an octopus would suit her best. As for Ursula's human side, she was modeled after renowned drag performer Divine, and while several actresses were considered for the part, including B. Arthur as the original idea, they ultimately went with Pat Carroll. Actually, there were many actors that were in consideration for some roles, including Bill Maher and Michael Richards as Scuttle, Jim Carrey as Prince Eric, and Melissa Fawn was thought to play Ariel before Benson stepped in. Speaking of Ariel, there were several debates on what would be her hair color. At the time, the most popular choice for pop culture mermaids was blonde, especially when that was used for Splash, so that had to be crossed off to not copy that film. After some deliberation, the team ultimately went with red because it complements Ariel's green fins quite well. As this movie is mostly set underwater, it was the first time for Disney since Pinocchio and Fantasia that they had to use a heavy amount of special effects, especially with the millions of bubbles and the storm scene that also included waves, dramatic lighting, thunder, and fire. Of course, that set a big challenge for the animators, along with the new direction that they had to push in order to produce the best animated film they can make. But if there was one obstacle that was the biggest throughout the production, it was Jeffrey Katzenberg. Considering that he was still new to the process of animation, one of Jeffrey's faults was that he had no patience, especially if he didn't know if a scene from a storyboard can translate well in the final picture. After one test screening of the unfinished film where children got a little restless during, Katzenberg demanded to cut out the song Part of Your World because of the poor reception it got from kids. The entire crew, including Ron, John, and Howard, begged Jeffrey to keep it in, as it was Ariel's big moment to let her heart out to express what she wanted the most, but he reluctantly refused to listen. <laughs> but then came Glenn Keane one of the supervising animators of Ariel. He advocated the hardest to keep the scene and give it another chance. Somehow, Keen succeeded in convincing Katzenberg, and after another screening, now fully animated and colored, the song ultimately stayed. As the movie was prepared for its big release on November 17, 1989, there was some doubt if all the effort was worth it since the higher-ups did label it as a girls' film and that those have a higher risk of earning less than expected. But when Ariel finally emerged on the big screen, those doubts were washed off in the most spectacular way possible. Critics and audiences praised the movie as a crowning achievement, especially for its characters, animation, and songs. On top of that, it was also an amazing financial success, earning a domestic gross of $84.4 million. With the combination of its international earnings and the extra from the re-release in 1997, The Little Mermaid made a grand total of $233 million. But Ariel's success did not end there, as The Little Mermaid grew into a billion-dollar franchise. Along with the prominent amount of merchandising, Disney also presented many more of Ariel's adventures, including a series in 1992 that ran for three seasons and 31 episodes, a set of cartoons starring Sebastian, two direct-to-video features that include a sequel in 2000 called The Little Mermaid 2 Return to the Sea, and a prequel in 2008 called The Little Mermaid Ariel's Beginning, which the latter was the last direct-to-video follow-up of a Disney animated film made by Disney Toon Studios, and some appearances on The House of Mouse and Kingdom Hearts. 
There were even special adaptations of the movie, like a Broadway musical that ran from the start of 2008 to the summer of 2009, a live concert presentation at the Hollywood Bowl in 2016 and 2019, and a live televised special that showed both the original movie and live actors play out the musical numbers on stage on November of 2019, in honor of the feature's 30th anniversary. The movie is also highly prominent at the park since the release of the feature, often appearing on parades, meet and greets, shows like Voyage of the Little Mermaid, a dark ride based on the movie called The Little Mermaid Ariel's Undersea Adventure, and a whole land at Tokyo Disney Sea called Mermaid Lagoon. However, while Ariel was celebrating the glory of her success, there were a few instances where she did get in trouble for, um, uh, how can I put this? Snooping as usual, I see. One was in the original VHS cover, where one of the towers in the castle stands out for being, uh, rock hard, and another was during the wedding scene, where audiences were wondering if that was his knee or the priest finds either the bride or groom to be really arousing. Either way, both were removed and re-edited for future releases. On the bright side, the movie also got several awards, especially for the music. It won two Grammys, and for both the Oscars and Golden Globes, the film won for Best Original Score and Best Original Song for Under the Sea, along with additional nominations like another one in Best Song for Kiss the Girl in both, and Best Picture in the Comedy or Musical category at the Globes. In terms of the Oscars, this makes it the first time that a fully Disney animated movie got nominated since The Rescuers, and the first to win an award since Dumbo. It even made appearances on lists of the greatest animated movies like Time Magazine's 25 all-time best animated films. While it may seem like Disney was just going back to their roots telling classic fairy tale stories starring a princess, the studio took a great risk by reinventing the meaning of what is a Disney animated musical, allowing the new animators to unleash their full potential and inviting more newcomers to give the feature that Broadway touch in order to put on a show like never before. The new team dreamed of the day that they could make a movie that will forever be among the great classics of the wonderful world of Disney. And with The Little Mermaid, that movie can finally be a part of that world. Now that Disney Animation climbed their way back to the top after years of struggle from the new changes, the confidence at the studio was at an all-time high, which was what they needed to try something with their next feature that the company had never done before a Disney animated sequel with The Rescuers Down Under. At the Rescue Aid Society, Bianca and Bernard were assigned to go to the Australian Outback to rescue a boy named Cody, who was kidnapped by Percival C. McLeach, a poacher hunting a rare giant eagle named Marahute. Along with the Society's Australian representative, Jake, the mice set off to save Cody and stop McLeach from getting his hands on the endangered bird. As one of the approved projects from the Gong Show pitch meeting, the production began back in 1986, where animator Mike Gabriel was asked by Peter Schneider to direct. He was hesitant at first after seeing what George Scribner went through during Oliver and Company, but then a few months later, he took the job and got the supervising animator of Tito and Oliver, Hendel Batoy, to co-direct with him. Their biggest goal with the movie was to fully emphasize the action-adventure genre, to take a break from their usual animated musicals and create an intense thrill ride whose looks take inspiration from filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock, David Lean, and Orson Welles. At the same time, Schneider brought on board staff member of the Mark Taper Forum, Thomas Schumacher, to be a producer for the feature. One of the first things he did for the movie was to get story artist Joe Ramp to be the story supervisor. While beloved by his animation peers, he did cause some trouble by arguing with studio management and executives, including one time where he wanted Cody to be an Aboriginal Australian and even be voiced by one, but the plan got scrapped in favor of having the character be just some white blonde boy that they didn't even bother giving him an Australian accent. Cody? Yeah, Mom? What about your breakfast? 
I've got some sandwiches in my pack. Don't worry, Mom. Speaking of characters, Walt Disney brought back Bob Newhart and Ava Gabor to reprise their roles, making this the last movie to feature the latter, they unfortunately were too late to get Jim Jordan come back as Orville, since he passed away on April 1988. To work around this, Roy E. Disney suggested a new character similar to the clumsy albatross. Considering that Orville shares the same name as one of the Wright brothers, why not give him a brother named Wilbur? He would be about the same as Orville, but now voiced by John Candy. This kid should be free! Free to run wild through the house on Saturday mornings, free to have cookies and milk, and get those little white mustaches, you know what? Nobody's gonna take a kid's freedom away while I'm around, nobody, you hear me? While common for the animation process, the team did some extensive research to develop the feature and its look. This time, however, the amount needed and used was larger than ever. They had to take several trips like in the Australian Outback and at the San Diego Zoo to study the local animals, analyze the actors as they record their lines, along with watching Dr. Strangelove to research George C. Scott to animate McLeach, which Scott is the voice, and Glenn Keane loaned a stuffed American eagle and an eagle skeleton to help him animate Marahute. The animators even got some additional help from a new team of animators established in Orlando, Florida. When Walt Disney World's third theme park, Disney's MGM Studios, opened in 1989, one of the opening attractions was the magic of Disney Animation, a tour that presented guests how animation was created and went even further to show people how it's done by also being a fully functioning animation studio. They started off by producing some Roger Rabbit cartoons, but they were also meant to help speed up production on their feature films by providing an extra hand from the 70 artists there, like for the ink and paint job on The Little Mermaid and about 10 minutes of Down Under. But while The Little Mermaid is often significantly noted to start a new chapter in Disney's history, The Rescuers Down Under is actually a landmark feature in the development of animation. During production, the company invested $10 million on the Computer Animation Production System, or CAPS for short, that was developed at a small studio that experimented with computer animation called Pixar. The system was built to replace the traditional process of making cells by digitally producing the ink and paint on the drawings and to put it all together for the final film. They experimented with it on The Little Mermaid during one of the final shots, but Down Under was the first movie to be fully made with caps, making The Rescuers Down Under the first ever fully digital feature and The Little Mermaid the last Disney animated film that used traditional hand-painted cells. However, transitioning to computer to recreate the magic that was done before with cells and the multiplane camera was certainly no easy task. Along with collaborating with Pixar to include some CGI, the animators worked tirelessly and stressfully with the new system to simultaneously learn how it looks and use those new techniques to make the movie look good without passing the deadline. When the film was released on November 16, 1990, along with the new Mickey Mouse short, The Prince and the Pauper, Bianca and Bernard's second mission was a failure. On its opening weekend, it started off in fourth place with $3.5 million, prompting Jeffrey Katzenberg to pull the plug on all the movie's TV advertising, resulting the film to only get $27.9 million domestically and a worldwide total of $47.4 million. As for how critics felt about the movie, they expressed a lot of mixed feelings. They certainly loved the animation and production value that presented some beautiful action and flight scenes, but the rest, like the story and how Australia was represented, was pretty lacking. Since then, the rescuers received some of the Black Cauldron treatment from Disney, where both movies are mostly being ignored by the company. But to be fair, the case of the rescuers is not as bad as Cauldrons, and even Down Under eventually gathered a bit of its own fanbase, where some even state that the movie is better than its predecessor. I mean, unlike Cauldron, at least they got a Blu-ray release. But for the team that made the feature, the failure was heartbreaking. But as Jeffrey Katzenberg said to Schumacher over the phone about the results, it's okay. We're going to move forward and we'll do something else. We'll start again tomorrow.
The next day, while some were disappointed by the results of Down Under, they knew they still had a job to do to not make that same mistake again with their next feature. They did return to their classic musical formula, but the ambition was higher than ever to create their own adaptation of the tale as old as time, Beauty and the Beast. It's the story of Belle, a girl from a French village who wanted a more exciting life than what she's getting from that small provincial town. When her father went missing, she finds him in a dark castle that is inhabited by a threatening beast and living objects, who are actually people that were cursed that could only be broken if the beast can learn to fall in love and for that other person to love him in return with a rose whose fallen petals act as a timer. As Belle replaces her father as the beast's prisoner in the castle, they must now do whatever they can to have Belle and the beast fall in love before the final petal falls. While this is a story that's been told through many centuries and in many cultures, it's actually one that's not as easy as it seems to tell effectively. In fact, it's a challenge that not even Walt Disney himself could accomplish. During both the 1930s and 1950s, he and his team tried several attempts to make their own animated adaptation of the Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont tale, but all failed to meet Walt's satisfaction. Some even say that he gave up on the whole idea when he thought he could never top the 1946 film by Jean Cocteau. Fast forwarding to 1987, the studio became more open to making fairy tale movies again after greenlighting The Little Mermaid and decided to revive the Beauty and the Beast project to the animation team in London, England, where they were working on Who Framed Roger Rabbit at the time. Originally, they wanted Roger Rabbit's animation director, Richard Williams, to be the director of the feature, but passed on the offer because he'd rather work on his decades-long passion project, The Thief and the Cobbler. However, Williams was kind enough to recommend another prominent English animator, Richard Purdom, to take the project. And so, Purdom and the Disney team at London, which included Glenn Keane, Andreas Dejah, and Tom Cito, began to work on a version of the tale that originally wasn't a musical and was also darker. After six months of development, the crew managed to start off with a story reel of the first 20 minutes of the movie and showed it off to Jeffrey Katzenberg, which he ended up not really liking it. And by not liking it, I mean completely scrap all the work they've done and start all over again. Eventually, a few months later, Perdum knew Disney would never go with his version of the story and ultimately quit the project. It was tough for the executives to find a new director, but they managed to have their answer in the form of two story artists, Kirk Wise and Gary Truesdale. It was quite sudden for them to have them direct their first movie, since they were fresh out of directing the animated scenes for the Epcot attraction, Cranium Command. At the same time, Jeffrey brought in the Little Mermaid's music duo, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, to turn the movie into a musical. As the London team now moved to Fishkill, New York to work closer with Ashman at his home, they all planned how to expand the story so that it wouldn't literally just be Beauty and the Beast. They included objects that came to life that would act like the sidekicks and comic reliefs, and a villain that went from being a high-class pompous dandy to a muscle-bound handsome yet cold-hearted brute named Gaston. However, one fact about Howard that not many people know about is that when he was passionate about something, you didn't want to be in a position to tell him otherwise. The directors had to learn that the hard way when Ashman thought about a tragic opening that showed how the prince was cursed and turned into a beast. For Wise and Truesdale, they cannot take the idea of starting the movie off with an angry little brat turning into a monster seriously. So when they confronted Howard about his idea, the backstory's done! Let's just say that it was the last time anyone ever confronted him on an idea of his. While his opening did end up in the final film, it was told differently through a narrator showing stained glass window images. But Howard wasn't the only person that the crew had to face some tough arguments. In a move that was considered unusual for an animated production, Katzenberg hired outsider Linda Wolverton to write the screenplay. 
Since she was new to the animation process, she didn't understand why the story artist changed many of her words and scenes, which caused a lot of clashes between her and the crew, especially the head of story, Roger Allers. However, when working closer with the crew, she got the hang of it and her relationship with the team significantly improved. But on the bright side, an old familiar face returned during Beauty and the Beast's production to work on Disney's news stories after leaving the company 50 years prior. And that was one of Walt's original character designers and story artist, Joe Grant. When casting Belle, around 500 actresses auditioned, hoping to be the next Disney princess. But the one who ultimately got the part was Paige O'Hara, whose singing was reminiscent to the actress the character was modeled after, Judy Garland, and noted that Ashman was a big fan of her performance in Showboat. During the animation process, the animators were in a bit of a time crunch and only had two years to complete the feature, since they already lost a good amount of their time with Perdum. This was why they needed the help of the Florida team even more to complete some scenes and animate the Be Our Guest number. They even had to resort to recycling animation from Sleeping Beauty for the final shot of the film to buy some time. As the characters went through several different designs before settling with their final look for the movie, the one who went through the most changes and who said to be the toughest to pull off was the Beast. The challenge was to make him look like a threatening monster, but could also be convincing that he has a caring soul on the inside, and that the beauty and the audience would eventually end up falling in love with him. Glenn Keane took on the task, and after experimenting with numerous of animals to fit the character, he found inspiration from his taxidermized buffalo head to mix several animals for his design, containing the mane of a lion, the beard and head of a buffalo, the brow of a gorilla, the tusk of a wild boar, the body of a bear, the legs and tail of a wolf, and most importantly, the eyes of a human to show who he truly is underneath all that fur and rage. Now that the animators got more familiar with Caps after Down Under, they decided to try out some of the new tricks it could do that were once considered impossible with the traditional process. The best example is how it blended CGI with hand-drawn characters to a much stronger effect, which was used in the shot where Belle and the Beast dance in the computer-generated ballroom as the camera moves around them to give the illusion of 3D space. The result turned out to be one of the most memorable shots of the picture, and it even convinced the executives that computer animation can have some strong potential in the future. On the night of the Oscars in 1990, when Ashman and Mencken won for Best Score and Best Song for The Little Mermaid, Howard privately revealed to Alan that he was HIV positive. Of course, word eventually got to the people at Disney, and this was why some of the team moved to Fishkill so that they could directly work with Howard while his health was rapidly deteriorating. Inevitably, on March 14, 1991, Howard Ashman passed away. Before his death, some of the crew, including producer Don Hahn, all visited him at St. Vincent's Hospital and they were sharing how they just came out of a great time with the press and a test screening to show how all their hard work paid off very well. Before saying his final goodbye, Hahn told him that it was going to be a great success. Who would have thought of it? And Howard replied, I would. During the credits of the film, a tribute was placed in his honor that says, To our friend Howard who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul. We will be forever grateful. Near its release, the company decided to make a major gamble by showing an unfinished version of the movie, which then, around 70% of the animation was complete, at the New York Film Festival. At the time, the team thought it was insane, and during the screening, it was one of the most stressful moments of their lives. But when the movie reached the end, the New York crowd burst into a standing ovation, something that no one thought would ever happen for an animated film, let alone one that wasn't even finished. And by the time the film was officially released a few months later on November 22, 1991, it immediately became legendary. It was one of the most critically acclaimed films from Disney, where critics said that it's up in the same leagues as Walt's greatest classics like Snow White, Pinocchio, and Fantasia. 
and at the box office, it made history as the first animated film to cross $100 million in North America and the third highest grossing film domestically of 1991 behind Terminator 2 Judgment Day and Robin Hood Prince of Thieves, resulting in a domestic total of $145.9 million and $331.9 million worldwide. But the rewards don't end there. The pop version of the song Beauty and the Beast, sung by Peebo Bryson and Celine Dion, became a great commercial hit and was credited to launch the international success of Dion. When it was time for award season, the movie was so much of a prominent name that it ended up making history once again, receiving numerous of nominations and wins like earning five Grammys, two Annies, and three Golden Globes, including Best Picture in the Comedy or Musical category. But the movie's biggest award achievement was at the Oscars, where it won two for Best Original Score and Best Original Song for Beauty and the Beast, and got four nominations that include two additional Best Songs for Belle and Be Our Guest, Best Sound, and the biggest of them all, Best Picture. While it lost to Silence of the Lambs, getting that nomination alone was an amazing accomplishment, as it makes Beauty and the Beast the first ever animated film in history to receive an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. But Beauty and the Beast's history-changing impact are not from the movie alone. In 1994, Disney used the movie as their source for their first Broadway stage musical, and while it wasn't as critically cherished as the film, it was a great success by playing almost 5,500 performances in 13 years, making it, as of 2020, the 10th longest running show in Broadway history. Following the footsteps of The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast also helped Disney by growing its own brand of merchandising, attractions at the parks, and several spin-offs and follow-ups, including the live-action series Sing Me a Story with Belle in 1995 that had 26 episodes, and two direct-to-video sequels, which are The Enchanted Christmas in 1997 and Belle's Magical World in 1998. In 2017, Disney released a live-action remake of the film with Bill Condon as the director and an all-star cast that consisted of Emma Watson, Dan Stevens, Luke Evans, Josh Gad, and many more. Similarly to the Broadway show, the film did not receive the same kind of positive reviews from critics. In fact, even audiences grew to detest the remake, but it did become the second highest grossing film of that year making a massive $1.26 billion at the box office, along with getting two Oscar nominations. But no matter how successful that feature was, not even that can overshadow the influence and the power of the original, where it also returned to the big screen with a few different versions. The first was in 2002 with a special edition IMAX version that included a previously deleted song, Human Again, and a 3D version in 2012, growing its box office total to $440 million. Around the same time, Beauty and the Beast continuously appeared on numerous of lists of the best animated films of all time, including several from the American Film Institute, like at number 62 with the song Beauty and the Beast on their top 100 songs, number 34 on their top 100 passions or love stories, number 22 on their top 100 movie musicals, and at number 7 on their top 10 animated films, along with being added to the National Film Registry in 2002. What was once considered to be an impossible task that not even Walt Disney could accomplish is now a monumental milestone created successfully by the new animators. Not only did this become the definitive movie version of the tale as old as time, but it is also acclaimed as one of the greatest and most important animated features in history. With the success of both this film and The Little Mermaid, they confirmed to the public that Disney has entered a new golden era of their animated films, a renaissance where each feature is a major motion picture event, to witness the next unforgettable classic, and that the Disney brand is now associated with producing current cinematic masterpieces. The animators may think it couldn't get better than this, but it wouldn't be too long that they would be the kings of animation.
they did it. The young animators have finally proven that they can make animated classics just like the ones during Walt's time. At this point in our story, beginning with The Little Mermaid, many fans have often referred to this period as the start of the Disney Renaissance, a time when the next generation of animators and business leaders after the Nine Old Men and the Disneys were in charge of creating the next batch of timeless animated masterpieces that would be highly beloved for many years to come. In fact, they were even able to earn some significant milestones that not even Walt was able to accomplish, especially with Beauty and the Beast, where it was the first ever animated feature to be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, and that was just one of the movie's many achievements. However, for the team at Disney, their moment of glory was just the beginning as many of the developing projects at the time would later join the same league as The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, starting with Aladdin. It's the tale of a young thief with a heart of gold named Aladdin, who meets a beautiful girl he falls in love with that turns out to be the Princess Jasmine. When he later entered the Cave of Wonders, he discovers a lamp that contains a genie that could grant him three wishes, which he used one to try to reunite with Jasmine by disguising himself as a prince. However, with the Grand Vizier Jafar secretly plotting to take over the land of Agrabah, Aladdin will have to be very careful what to wish for next if he wants to save both Agrabah and his relationship with the princess. The project all began in the mind of Howard Ashman back in 1988. When working on The Little Mermaid, he made a 40-page treatment, with the help of Alan Menken, of an animated adaptation of Aladdin that would stay true to the original 1001 Nights Tale, but would also be a 1930s-style musical with a genie based on Cab Calloway. However, the company was not a fan of this idea and sent them off to go to work on Beauty and the Beast. But even if Disney didn't like the idea, some of the crew at the studio certainly did, including Linda Wolverton, who made her own version by mixing Ashman's version with the movie The Thief of Baghdad, where elements of that feature ultimately found its way into the Disney project, including an evil Grand Vizier named Jafar, a sultan that likes to play with toys, and a character named Abu. The movie wouldn't officially get started at Disney until directors John Musker and Ron Clements joined in Wolverton's draft and pitched it to Disney as one of their potential movies they could do next, which was selected to get the green light. And so the directing duo wrote down their own draft of Linda's version and with the animation team, they developed a story reel to present to Jeffrey Katzenberg on April 1991. However, for the team at Disney, that day would be known as Black Friday, the darkest moment in the production's history when Katzenberg stated that not only did he completely dislike the story reel, but told them to redo the entire plot without delaying its 1992 release date. That means with the limited amount of time they had, they only had eight days to create a new story for the feature. With the help of writing duo Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, the directors and the crew worked timelessly to make those eight days count and had made a lot of changes and sacrifices along the way, including following Jeffrey's orders to step back from Ashman's version, taking out Aladdin's mother, changing the character of Iago from a pompous British aristocrat to a comedic loudmouth with the voice of Gilbert Gottfried, and making Jasmine more rebellious than previous Disney princesses. And after those rigorous eight days of developing a whole new story for the movie, Jeffrey finally accepted the draft and the film can now bring its characters to life with animation. One of the first animators that came on board was actually a newcomer to the Disney Studios, but already established himself as a master of his craft. Beforehand, he worked for Richard Williams at his studio in London, where he sharpened his skills by animating commercials and movies like Raggedy Ann and Andy, A Musical Adventure, and The Thief and the Cobbler. That man was Eric Goldberg, and he was assigned as the supervising animator of The Genie. As one of the first artists in the project, he suggested that the style should be reminiscent to the works of his longtime hero, legendary caricaturist Al Hirschfeld. We 
which the team found to be a good idea since Hirschfeld's flowing lines fit in with the Arabian style. Of course, since it was his idea, Goldberg took the most inspiration from Hirschfeld when animating the genie, especially when he always impersonates a wide variety of celebrities. When designing the characters, it's usual that they always come with their own set of challenges. However, in Aladdin, there are a few that their obstacles were a lot more unique when crafting them. One of them was the Magic Carpet, who is literally just a living rectangle that can only communicate through pantomime. While that did set a challenge for animator Randy Cartwright, the real task with the carpet was to make him a hybrid of 2D animation and CGI. The hand-drawn elements was used to actually animate the character, while the computers were brought in to put an elaborate design on top of the carpet and use texture mapping for it to follow the carpet's movements. Another one that had its own set of problems was Aladdin himself. Originally, they wanted to avoid making him look like the typical hero prince, since animators often find that they are the most boring characters to animate. So to change things up, they decided to depict him as a young teenager, like a reckless 13-year-old that only his mom can talk sense to him and first discovers love. However, Jeffrey Katzenberg did not like the kid approach of Al, since he didn't believe that a scrawny boy like him would end up winning the heart of the beautiful princess. In his Hollywood mind, it would only make sense if Jasmine falls for a fit and attractive young adult looking stud. I found the character of Jasmine kind of blows him away. I don't understand why she goes with him. I understand why he goes with her. That's easy. She's wonderful. While there were some arguments between Jeffrey and the directors and animators on his design, they settle for something that's right in the middle of what they want a handsome man who's also believable to be the young underdog, which he then was animated by Glenn Keane and his team. But the characters were not the only challenges the animators had to face when developing the visuals. Along with the magic carpet, the use of computers and caps were used to implement more CGI like the entrance to the Cave of Wonders and to carefully select the colors to highlight the mood of the scene and personality of the characters. Considering that this all came from Howard Ashman's idea and had a moment where he put his heart into the project, this obviously gave the songs a big obstacle to face. The fact that Ashman passed away in 1991. When creating his treatment, he also made several musical numbers with Alan Menken. However, when Howard died and Disney had to make all those changes to the story, many of the original songs had to be taken out and only three of Ashman's songs survived in the film, including Arabian Nights, Friend Like Me, and Prince Ali. But Disney wouldn't let Alan work alone for the rest of the production. They had to find a lyricist with the same stage musical reputation that can perfectly fit Ashman's shoes, and they did with Tim Rice, who previously worked with Andrew Lloyd Webber on several of his musicals. When Rice joined Aladdin, while not all of his contributions ended up in the feature, the songs that he added with Mencken that made it in the film are One Jump Ahead, The Reprise of Prince Ali, and A Whole New World. But among all the people that were involved with the movie, there is one name that people first associate with the film. Not only because he was the feature's biggest star, but he was also the actor from the film that got the worst treatment from Disney. So with that said, let's talk about the voice of the genie, Robin Williams. While Katzenberg was thinking of having comedians like Steve Martin or Eddie Murphy to play the part, Ron Clements and John Musker always had Williams in mind. In fact, to pitch the role for him, Eric Goldberg animated the genie performing a skit from one of Robin's comedy albums. But first, before I do the play, I'd like to talk about the very serious subject of schizophrenia. No, he doesn't. Shut up! Let him talk! <laughs> Since he was impressed with the pitch and was grateful after working on Good Morning Vietnam, he agreed to play the part and recorded his lines while he was filming Hook and Toys, while giving Disney a huge amount of material to work with thanks to the heavy amount of ad-libbing. However, when Robin signed on, he made an agreement with the company. Williams was so grateful to join the cast that instead of asking for his price of $8 million, he only asked Disney to pay him the Screen Actors Guild scale pay of $75,000 
But in exchange, he asked that the marketing should not use either his image or name and that the genie can only take up to 25% of any artwork used to promote the film, just so it doesn't interfere with toys, which was scheduled to be released about a month after Aladdin. Despite the agreement, Disney broke their side of the deal and even went as far as going through loopholes to still heavily promote the fact that the film features Robin Williams and have the genie be the star of most of the commercials for tie-in products. Fine, I understand. After all, you've lied to everyone else. Hey, I was beginning to feel left out. For Williams, this was a serious betrayal and became very vocal about how the company screwed him over. They tried to buy their way to make amends with him by sending a painting by Picasso that was worth over a million dollars, but that form of bribery did not work on Robin. It wouldn't be until a few years later when Joe Roth took Katzenberg's place as the chairman of Walt Disney Studios and gave a public apology to Robin Williams. For Robin, that was what he wanted to hear, and not only did he accept the apology, but he also did so by reprising his role for one of the direct-to-video sequels, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. After a massive marketing campaign, the film finally came out on November 25th, 1992, and Disney's wish for its success was granted. Critics were giving a great praise for its lovable songs, beautiful animation, memorable characters, and especially the humor. In fact, one of the renowned Looney Tunes directors, Chuck Jones, called it the funniest feature Disney ever made. And at the box office, not even the Cave of Wonders contained the amount of riches that the movie made, being the first animated feature to earn more than $200 million domestically with $217 million, and the highest grossing film of 1992 with a worldwide total of $504 million. But during the middle of all the celebrations, Al just couldn't help but get himself into trouble, especially with the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. The committee accused the film of a few instances of discrimination, including the portrayal of the characters, where Aladdin and Jasmine are shown as beautiful and anglicized, while Jafar and the others in the kingdom are presented with thick accents and a grotesque and mean caricature, and pointing out how one of the lyrics of Arabian Nights is deemed racist. So much so that even Disney had to change it for all future releases. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Other controversies this movie faced include when Aladdin was at Jasmine's balcony and people mistakenly thought he said, good teenagers, take off your clothes, and having a heated debate in the animation community whether if the Disney movie was a ripoff of Richard Williams' The Thief and the Cobbler, discussing about the many uncanny similarities like with the characters, the art style, the story, and more. Because of all this, Aladdin has often been found on several lists among the most controversial films of all time. But even with its controversies, nothing can stop the film from getting itself a place among the Disney classics and grab some awards along the way, including two Annie Awards for Best Animated Feature and for Eric Goldberg's Animation, and two Golden Globes for Best Original Score and a Special Award for Robin Williams along with three Oscar nominations for Best Song for Friend Like Me, Best Sound, and Best Sound Editing. But the real award magnet from Aladdin was the song A Whole New World, especially the version sung by Peebo Bryson and Regina Bell, where it won an additional Golden Globe, an Oscar, and three Grammys, including Song of the Year, making it, as of 2020, the only Disney song to win that award. Following afterwards, Aladdin would turn into another prominent franchise for Disney, where outside of its huge market of toys and games, the film spun off a series in 1994 that ran for three seasons with 86 episodes, and the first direct-to-video Disney sequel and the first direct-to-video animated film in that same year, The Return of Jafar, which also served as the pilot for the series. While not as liked as the first by critics, it became one of the best-selling VHSs of all time and launched a new business for Disney in the direct-to-home media market. 
Oh, and uh, as I've mentioned before, in 1996, a second direct-to-video sequel was released called Aladdin and the King of Thieves that featured the return of Robin Williams as the genie. In 2011, the film spun off into a stage musical that also appeared in Broadway in 2014, where it got some decently positive reviews and a great success by grossing hundreds of millions of dollars at the new Amsterdam theater alone and got a Tony for James Monroe Englehart's performance as the genie. In 2019, Aladdin got another adaptation, but this time as a live-action remake, and while the reviews were average at best while getting praise for the performance of Will Smith and Naomi Scott, it made about twice as much as the original at the box office with over $1 billion. While it was no easy task to turn this movie into a reality and can often get as much trouble as a street rat, it still managed to pull through to deliver magic that is familiar with the Disney traditions that the world knows and loves, and that is new with its unforgettable cast of characters and an inspiring new twist on the visuals to make Disney animation feel fresh and new. But regardless if it's either the characters, the songs, or its animation, the film is marketed as a highlight in Disney's history for making many generations love, laugh, and get engaged with one of their most thrilling and funniest animated films that brought audiences to a whole new world. <laughs> Made you look. After finishing Aladdin, the crew at Disney were having a party to celebrate another completed project. However, the party served another purpose for the animators, not just for their past achievement, but also to plan for their future. At that time, they had a choice between two movies to work on as their next big feature. The one that was getting the most attention was Pocahontas, since it seemed a lot more appealing by looking more serious, mature, awe-inspiring, and had the potential to be Disney's next best picture contender. The other one that was less interesting was just another Talking Animals movie, often referred to there as Bambi in Africa. While the project was having a hard time gathering animators, some did come on board either because they really wanted to animate animals, or they just wanted their chance to have their first supervising animator job. It may not seem like much at the time, but it was the team the film needed to create what people know today as the Lion King. It's the story of Simba, a lion cub who's the son of the King of the Pride Lands, Mufasa, and is learning how to be the next ruler. However, his uncle Scar, fueled by jealousy, successfully executed his plot to kill Mufasa and get rid of Simba so that he can immediately claim the throne. While out of the Pride Lands, Simba spent most of his time growing up with his new pals Timon and Pumbaa, where they show him how to live an easy life with no worries or responsibilities. But that wouldn't last long though, as Simba inevitably gets a wake-up call to take back his rightful place in the circle of life. The idea originated from a chat with the heads of Disney Animation, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Roy E. Disney, and Peter Schneider. Just brainstorming potential ideas for a movie, and Jeffrey immediately liked one where it was set in Africa. From there, Katzenberg developed plans for a story where it would almost be interpreted as his own biography where it would be a coming-of-age story that features the death of a family member and the struggles during his time in politics. When it was time for Disney to work on it, writers like Thomas Dish and Linda Wolverton worked on their own drafts for the movie that was first titled King of the Jungle, where it was originally a lot darker and grittier, where it focused on an ongoing battle between the lions and the baboons, whom the latter were meant to be the villains. And if you're curious about what it meant for Rafiki, well, he was originally planned to be a cheetah. By 1991, Oliver and Company Helmer, George Scribner, and Beauty and the Beast's head of story, Roger Allers, were brought in as directors, with Brenda Chapman as the film's head of story, all leading the charge to turn those written words into a proper narrative for the movie. Their first job in their position right after Beauty and the Beast was to go on a trip to Hell's Gate National Park in Kenya with several other members of the crew to get a true feeling of the natural African environment, and they gained a new mission for the film to emulate that feeling that they had in Kenya onto the picture. However, while it seemed like everything was in place, 
it turned out to not be as functional as planned, especially with the directors. While usually good friends, Scribner and Allers would often get into heated debates about what the tone of the film should be. George wanted a serious take that would be more like a nature documentary, while Roger wanted something more fun and keep the same tone they've been going on with their past films. But Allers ended up getting the upper hand in this case, as the producers wanted to follow the tradition of their recent films by making this a musical. This was the last straw for Scribner, as it was clear Disney wanted to go further away from his vision. Ultimately, George ended up getting let go and was later replaced by Rob Minkoff. When Don Hahn stepped in to be the producer, he noticed the story still had some issues and asked the team for one more big rewrite so that it could actually have a central theme to focus on, which is the coming of age aspect where Simba has to learn to leave childhood and accept the responsibilities he has to take in life. The writers also took some inspiration from other stories, including the lives of Bible figures like Moses and Joseph and the William Shakespeare play Hamlet. Also, they decided to change the title from King of the Jungle to The Lion King because, well, if you look at the Pride Lands, I wouldn't really call that a jungle. When casting for some of the more comedic roles, Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella, who were together in the 1992 Broadway revival of Guys and Dolls, auditioned out for the role of the hyenas to take advantage of their chemistry. While they gave the directors a real good laugh, they realized that there were two other comic reliefs that would be a better fit for the duo, and that's when they hired Nathan and Ernie to play as Timon and Pumbaa respectfully. Speaking of the hyenas, it was originally planned to be a reunion of Cheech and Chong. While Cheech Marin came on board as Banzai, Tommy Chung, however, wasn't available. So the only way to go around this was to turn the hyena duo into a trio by adding a dumber one who only laughs called Ed, played by Jim Cummings, and the other was turned into a female that acts like the head of the group named Shenzi, played by Whoopi Goldberg. As the movie was often referred to early on as Bambi in Africa, then it would only make sense that they study like if this was Bambi. Not only did the animators go to zoos to study the creatures, but the studio also invited wildlife expert Jim Fowler to bring in lions and other animals of the savannah so that the artists could get a full grasp of their movements and their mannerisms. As it probably had been disheartening early on when most of the Disney crew would rather want to animate on Pocahontas than on Lion King, at least they did receive some additional help outside of the team the film could gather. There was the group in Orlando, Florida that helped animate almost 20 minutes of the picture, including the I Just Can't Wait to Be King number, and computers to help create the hundreds of cell-shaded wildebeest for the stampede sequence. Early on, Tim Rice signed on to be in charge of the music, but while Alan Menken was more busy finishing up Aladdin and moving on to Pocahontas, Tim needed a collaborator to make the songs, and he knew exactly who he wanted. Abba! But they were too busy working on an opera, so they got his plan B, Elton John. At first, the crew thought that the movie was going in a weird territory. I mean, this is a talking animals movie where a lion cub gets framed for murder with songs by Elton John. On paper, that just sounds ridiculous. In fact, the addition of Elton John was what really set off George Scribner to be divided with the crew. But as Rice and John were taking care of the musical numbers, Hans Zimmer was hired to work on the score, and he invited his friend, South African composer Lebo M, to help implement the African traditions to the music. As the movie was getting close to completion, Disney was faced with some unusual obstacles that the team had to work around, like an earthquake that caused the animators to finish their work at home. But there was one that was more unexpected, and even tragic to the point that it would forever change the atmosphere of the company. On Easter 1994, Disney president Frank Wells died in a helicopter crash at the age of 62. While everyone was heartbroken at the loss, Jeffrey Katzenberg also saw this as an opportunity. He always wanted to be Michael Eisner's second in command and have Wells' position. The only problem was that Eisner was always hesitant about the idea. But now that Frank was out of the picture, Jeffrey was ready to do whatever it took to get that president position. And when going on press tours talking about the movie, not only was he promoting the picture, 
but he was also promoting himself to have the press portray him as if he was the next Walt Disney. Now, his relationship with Eisner and Roy E. Disney was already sour at that point, but his promotional stunts with the Lion King were the final straw for them. What were you thinking out there, Jeffrey? I don't understand why you have to push everybody against the wall to get that president job when Frank didn't even die that long ago. Don't you even care that he's gone? You know, I could have made you president if you waited a little longer. But now the last person I want to give this position is to an egotistical, stressful, and greedy individual like you. Now don't ever ask me for the job again, and get back to work. When Michael made it clear that he would never get the job, even if he was promised to in the past, Jeffrey knew that he had no future at Disney, and not long after The Lion King's release, he resigned and sued the company for money he was owed at the time. You haven't seen the last of me! You'll pay for this! You'll all pay! But back onto the movie, the entire crew was really impressed with themselves with what they did with the film's opening that on November of 1993, when only a third of the movie was finished, Disney released the entire Circle of Life number as the film's trailer, which did succeed in building up audiences' anticipation for the feature. And while the pressure was big at the studio and the marketing campaign was even bigger, the film finally came out in theaters and really emphasized the king in The Lion King. During its release on June 24th, 1994, the film received massive acclaim from both critics and audiences and easily became the biggest movie of the year. In fact, the numbers at the box office make that statement true, making an astonishing $312.9 million domestically and earning $768.6 million worldwide. Later on, the film would also get a couple of re-releases, one in IMAX in 2002 that included the deleted song The Morning Report, and another presenting the film in 3D in 2011 growing its earnings to $422.8 million domestically and $968.5 million worldwide, not only making it the highest grossing film of 1994, but also, as of 2020, the highest grossing hand-drawn animated film of all time. However, just like Aladdin, Simba was often found getting himself in trouble. They were mostly minor, like when the flower spelt the abbreviation of special effects and people mistakenly thought the F was an E. But there is one controversy that is still discussed to this day relating to another cartoon lion. You must avenge my death, Kimba. I mean, Simba. Ever since the film was released, many have accused the film of being a complete ripoff of the 1960s Osamu Tezuka anime series, Kimba the White Lion. Despite the strong amount of similarities between Kimba and The Lion King, the directors state that they were unfamiliar with the show when making the film. But some of the animators were aware of what it was, but said that even with that knowledge, they weren't going out of their way to steal elements from the series and whatever parallels were found are just coincidences. Even the voice of adult Simba, Matthew Broderick, thought that this was an American adaptation of Kimba when he signed on. But among Japan's animation community, they were furious at the Disney film. So much so that 488 cartoonists and animators in the country signed a petition to make Disney at least acknowledge that Kimba must have had some influence onto The Lion King. But even if people to this day are still strongly adamant on their position in the argument, no real action had taken place in response to the controversy from either Disney or the owners of Kimba Tezuka Production. Besides, the latter wasn't in the mood to sue because Disney's lawyers are more intimidating than a pack of lions. But no matter how similar it seems to be to Kimba, the controversy doesn't even put a dent onto the king's cultural impact. During award season, the movie earned a significant amount of wins and nominations, including three Annies for Best Story, Best Voice Acting for Jeremy Irons' performance as Scar, and Best Animated Feature with three extra nominations, three Golden Globes for Best Score, Best Song for Can You Feel the Love Tonight, and Best Picture in the Comedy or Musical category, along with an extra Best Song nomination for The Circle of Life, 
three Grammys, and two Oscars for Best Score and Best Song for, again, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, including two more Best Song nominations for The Circle of Life and Hakuna Matata. Later on, the movie was commonly found on many lists of the best animated features, and even for the best movies in general, like Empire's Greatest Films Ever Made and Time's 25 All-Time Best Animated Films. It even got in a couple of lists by the American Film Institute, like at number 99 on their Top 100 Best Songs and Movies with Hakuna Matata, and at number 4 on their Top 10 Animated Films. And in 2016, the film was selected to be in preservation in the National Film Registry. Following its initial run in theaters, The Lion King would go on to be one of the biggest entertainment franchises in history, in which the wide variety of media, especially with all the merchandising that has its name on it, made a combining total profit that has exceeded the 11 digit mark. The feature had two direct-to-video follow-ups, including a sequel called The Lion King 2 Simba's Pride, and a mid-cool spin-off called The Lion King 1 and a Half that focused on Timon and Pumbaa throughout the events of the first film. On television, two shows were developed from the film, like 1995's Timon and Pumbaa, which aired for three seasons with 85 episodes, and 2015's The Lion Guard, which aired on Disney Junior with three seasons with 74 episodes, along with three TV movies. At the parks, the movie has a very prominent presence, but their highlighted moments were special shows like the Festival of the Lion King, a live show with performers, puppets, and visual effects all presenting the songs of the movie. In 2019, Disney released a photorealistic computer animated remake with an all-star cast with James Earl Jones reprising his role as Mufasa and Jon Favreau as the director. While critics and audiences were not as thrilled with this version, especially when many criticize it for being a shot-to-shot -shot copy of the original, it was a true box office king making about $1.66 billion, meaning that it is not only the second highest grossing film of 2019 under Avengers Endgame, but also, as of 2020, the highest grossing animated feature of all time. But if there is one piece of media that can be called the crown jewel of The Lion King, even more than the animated film that started it all, then it has to be the stage musical. Directed by Julie Taymor and made its debut in 1997, this special retelling of the film with elaborate costumes and creative puppets would go on to become one of Broadway's most legendary musicals, winning six Tony Awards, including Best Musical among all the other awards it got, and as of 2020, is the third longest running show on Broadway and the highest grossing stage production in history. In fact, most of the franchise's earnings come from the stage musical alone. As the film's story is about how a lion cub grew to become a mighty king, the Lion King itself also went through the same coming-of-age story. At first, many had their doubts if it was even going to be successful in the first place, passing it off as Disney's B-movie while others were working on something that had more potential. But as the sun rose on the feature's time, no one would ever expect that it would become one of Disney's biggest cultural phenomenons, earning billions of dollars and even dominating the stage as much as it did for the screen. It is one of the very few movies in history that can present the power of animation and storytelling at this level to both amaze and inspire millions all around the world, where generations to come will still remember the beloved characters, singing the timeless songs, and learn how we are all connected in the great circle of life. As the Lion King crew surprised everyone by turning a doubtful concept into one of the most renowned movies of all time, the other team was working hard on a project that could possibly top the achievements of their past films, even The Lion King. In fact, they believed that if Beauty and the Beast was the Best Picture nominee at the Oscars, then this would be a Best Picture winner. And that was Pocahontas. Set in the early 17th century, to be precise, English settlers of the Virginia Company have set foot in the New World, hoping to find gold. One of these settlers, John Smith, 
wanders off to explore the land, and then encounters the free-spirited daughter of the chief of the Powhatan tribe, Pocahontas, who shows John that the people the English refers to as Injuns or savages are more spiritual and down-to-earth than they think. As the two start to grow fond of each other to the point of falling in love, their bond sparks a war between the English settlers and the Powhatan tribe, and it's up to Pocahontas to stop the feud between the two groups and bring peace before any blood would be shed. Going all the way back to the Gong Show pitch meeting by Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, one of the directors of The Rescuers Down Under, Mike Gabriel, proposed an idea using only a poster and a short description of a love story where the girl has to pick between respecting her father's wishes and to love one of the English settlers that her dad considers an enemy. In that conceptual poster depicted a forest where a bunch of woodland creatures were looking so excited at whatever was on the right, as Tiger Lily from Peter Pan stood in the middle with the words Walt Disney's Pocahontas right above her. Considering that Peter Schneider was interested in making an animated film with a Romeo and Juliet style story, the pitch turned out to be a hit and was immediately accepted on the spot. As this is Disney's first animated feature based on a historical figure, they coincidentally started off by choosing a very complicated one. When it comes to Mataoka, who was given the nickname Pocahontas, which some say means little mischief or playful one, historians to this day can never fully seem to agree about what are the stories about her that are considered a myth and which ones are historical facts. That and the elements that are agreed to be true show that Pocahontas had a very harsh and violent life. Not to mention that she met John Smith when she was just 12 and Gaston is a more accurate depiction of who John was in real life. So because of most of the historical accuracies being remained in question and the confirmed facts are too gruesome for a family film, the team at Disney felt like they were left with no choice but to take a lot of creative liberties to both dramatize and romanticize the story, including boosting up Pocahontas' age to a young woman and turn John Smith into an Errol Flynn-style hero. Another real-life figure that they had to modify for the picture was Governor John Radcliffe, who was actually a combination of several early 17th century English captains. But even with all the creative liberties they could use, they were still careful to present the Powhatan and early American culture accurately, consulting with numerous of historians and native experts, visits to historical sites at Jamestown, Virginia, and always working with consultants to help authenticate the life of a pre-colonial Powhatan tribe. Even some of the people among the cast and crew also helped out with the historical aspects of the film, like story supervisor Tom Cito and the voice of Chief Powhatan, Russell Means. After he was done with Aladdin, Eric Goldberg signed on to co-direct with Gabriel, since the Lion King crew was full. He was surprised that the movie was going for a much more serious tone than the previous film he worked on, but he was determined to be a part of the crew for the commentary on race, especially when the subject was pretty big at the time because of the Los Angeles riots. However, while this is one of Disney's more serious animated features, that didn't mean Goldberg wouldn't fully feel at home working on it, since some comedy would be supplied by Disney's own brand of comedic animal sidekicks. Originally, Pocahontas was supposed to have three animals by her side, all thought up by Joe Grant. They were Miko, Flit, and the main comedic star of the picture, Red Feather, a cocky talking turkey who thinks he's a real ladies man. And yes, I said it correctly that he was supposed to talk. More specifically, have the voice of John Candy in interacting with Percy, originally voiced by Richard E. Grant. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that was close. <laughs> I take it you're some sort of bird. That's the understatement of the year. Egad. It speaks. Please don't let me stand in your way. Last thing I yes, want well, to do. Yes, well, I'd love to continue this scintillating conversation, but really, I have to run. However, later in production, the crew agreed that it was best for the animals to be mute to have more realism, and with the addition of John Candy's passing in 1994, the turkey had to go, and Miko took the position of supplying the film's comedy. Speaking of voices, the process to find someone to play as Pocahontas was a little more reverse than how it's usually done. 
They started by hiring Broadway singer and actress Judy Kuhn as the lead singing voice, and then Disney went to look for a Native American actress who sounded like her, which they found with Irene Bedard while she was filming Lakota Woman, Siege at Wounded Knee. Also, Richard White, the voice of Gaston in Beauty and the Beast, was supposed to play as Radcliffe, but since the team was worried that he might end up sounding too much like Gaston, the role was given to the voice of Cogsworth, David Ogden Stiers, who simultaneously voiced both Radcliffe and his assistant, Wiggins. Ever since the beginning of development, Jeffrey Katzenberg had one goal in mind for the movie, to turn this into a Best Picture winner, to achieve what Beauty and the Beast couldn't do, but almost did, and by time, his enthusiasm spread throughout the studio to the point that everyone believed that Pocahontas was going to be their next masterpiece, while The Lion King was going to be the little appetizer before the main course. I'm telling you guys, Pocahontas is a home run. It's basically West Side Story with American Indians. No, it's Romeo and Juliet with American Indians. It's, it's a hit. It's a hit, I tell you. It has hit written all over it. <laughs> Lion King, on the other hand, I want to say it's kind of an experiment. I mean, we don't really know if anybody truly wants to see it. I hate to say it, but don't count your eggs before they hatch, Jeffrey. Also, are we even ready to represent Native Americans again in our animated films? I mean, the last time we've done it, things didn't- Hey, 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 hey! That was a different time! Besides, there's no need to worry. I'm positive that this film will be our next Beauty and the Beast. Only this time, we will win that Oscar! I can see it now. No! I can feel it now. Oh, oh yeah. Mm, oh, oh baby, you're feeling fine. Oh, oh come here, you. <laughs> oh, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. <laughs> should uh, should we stop this? Nah, nah. Let him have his moment just a little bit. Okay, that's our cue. Let's get out of here. Oh yeah, you like that, Lincoln? When it was time for the animators to go to work, the directors made Michael Giammo as the art director after making some concept paintings for the film. Even when keeping the Native American themes, Giammo took inspiration outside of Jamestown for the art style like folk art of Mexico, Africa, and the Caribbean. He also looked at past Disney artists to get inspired like Ivan Earle, Richard Kelsey, and Mary Blair. One notable animator that was involved with the picture was someone who hadn't worked at the company for around 14 years. Beforehand, he was one of the handful of Disney animators who quit during the making of The Fox and the Hound to become one of the most prominent artists working for Don Bluth. And that was John Pomeroy, who returned as the supervising animator of John Smith. When assigned as the supervising animator of the title character, Glenn Keane's first mission was to update her look to fit with what Disney was going for with the movie. The closest thing to an accurate depiction of the real Pocahontas was a portrait done back in 1620. But let's be honest, that is not a face that looks like it can win the heart of the heroically handsome John Smith. So following Katzenberg's demands to make her an idealized attractive woman, Keane took inspiration from several models and Irene Bedard herself. But his main inspiration for Pocahontas' look was when he met two Powhatan descended sisters, Shirley Little Dove and Debbie White Dove Custolo McGowan, where he stated that he first saw Pocahontas' face when he looked at the two together. Going back to Aladdin, one fact I have yet to mention was the collaboration between Alan Menken and Tim Rice after the passing of Howard Ashman. Okay, yes, I mentioned that they worked together, but I have yet to say how they work together. The answer, not really well. Not that there was any bad blood or anything, but it was hard for Mencken to always hop from New York to London or wherever Rice would be so that the two could actually be together to work on the songs. That tough experience was why Tim and Alan had to work on separate films afterwards, where Rice worked on The Lion King with Elton John and Mencken worked on Pocahontas. But again, the composer needed a collaborator to work on the lyrics. So not only Disney got another acclaimed lyricist with great experience in musical theater, 
but also someone who lived close to Allen in New York to save him from the travel troubles. Enter Stefan Schwartz, who already made music for some stage musicals and got nominated for several Tony Awards for them like Godspell and Pippin. Throughout the production, Schwartz proved to be a suitable successor to Ashman, and he shared his close collaboration with the team throughout the production, like working a lot with the writers, and collected tapes of Native American music and Old English sea shanties for inspiration. The first song they worked on was Colors of the Wind, which began as lyrics inspired by a letter to the U.S. Congress by Chief Seattle during the mid-19th century. When the directors got to hear the song, they immediately knew that this would set the heart and soul of the feature. However, as it's often the case, not all their work ended up in the final film. One prominent example was If I Never Knew You, which was meant to be the movie's big love ballad between Pocahontas and John Smith when she reunited with John when he was held prisoner by her tribe on the night before his execution. Because the kids got bored with it quickly during a test screening, the songwriting duo and the team at Disney all agreed that the song had to go, even if the animation was pretty much finished. But it wasn't fully taken off of the film though, as the pop version by Shanice and John Cicada can still be heard during the credits. The movie finally had its release on June 16, 1995, scheduled at the exact same time as Pocahontas' 400th birthday, and already had a lot of build-up behind it. A huge marketing campaign, taking the Colors of the Wind number and use that as its trailer to recreate the same effect as The Lion King, and having the largest movie premiere in history six days before its release at Central Park in New York City, with over 100,000 people who attended. And after all the build-up and anticipation to be Disney's best picture movie, the film was ultimately a hit. And a failure. Technically, yes, the movie was a success at the box office by earning $141.5 million domestically and $346.1 million worldwide. But compared to what Disney's previous animated features achieved, Pocahontas was not able to follow on their footsteps, especially with the critics. They enjoyed a lot of the elements like the animation, the songs, and the voice acting, but many agreed that it was the writing that made this a lot weaker compared to what Disney released before. Not to mention that the cultural and historical accuracies became a subject of controversy, where some indigenous leaders and experts state that Disney got it all wrong and their portrayal of Native Americans in the film was more hurtful than actually informative. With that said, it's no surprise that the movie never even got a nomination for Best Picture. But it still did receive some awards, including four Annies, and the song Colors of the Wind won a Grammy, a Golden Globe, and an Oscar, and got an additional Oscar for Best Score in a musical or comedy. Three years later, the film received a direct-to-video sequel called Pocahontas 2 Journey to a New World, where many deem that while it may not be, well, good, some say that it's slightly more historically accurate than the first. Rue this day you wait and see. What is to be or not to be? Hey, I only said slightly more than the first. I never said that it was. Since then, Pocahontas became the first member of the Disney princesses to be a woman of color who was the lead in her own film. But it was clear that the movie's impact never made it to the same levels as the films that came before her. At the time when Pocahontas was their new movie, the environment at Disney completely changed that would later have some long-term consequences. With the sudden passing of Frank Wells and Jeffrey Katzenberg quit on bad terms, this left Michael Eisner to be in charge of the company alone and bitter from the loss of a friend and the betrayal of another. And with Pocahontas being their first sign that they might have already peaked, They'll have to make the most with what they have left to make their renaissance worthwhile.
1994 was a very significant year in the history of Disney, one that some could say was the time that forever changed the company for better and for worse. Of course, the most notable moment of that year was the release of The Lion King, an animated film that the team was doubtful during production, but later become one of Disney's biggest and most beloved properties they've ever created. It was also the year when they released The Return of Jafar, the first animated direct-to-video feature that opened up a new opportunity for the company to dominate the home media market with low-budgeted direct-to-video sequels to their animated films. But, along with the ups, the year also came with a lot of downs that impacted the company as well. 1994 was also the year that Disney president Frank Wells passed away from a helicopter crash, and Disney Studios head Jeffrey Katzenberg resigned and left on bad terms leaving CEO Michael Eisner as the lone prominently public figure in charge of the company, and became a changed man who lost his closest allies in one way or another. The effect from that one year seemed to be noticeably immediate, as their next highly anticipated animated feature, Pocahontas, didn't turn out to be the mega hit they were expecting. Does this mean the Disney renaissance already peaked with The Lion King? Well, if so then they better make the most out of their next features while they're still at the top, including The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's the story of Quasimodo, the isolated hunchback bell ringer of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, who decided to leave the bell tower for his first time to attend the Feast of Fools, even if it's against the wishes of his master, Judge Claude Frollo. His outing did not go well, but he did get his first taste of kindness from a gypsy named Esmeralda. Frollo also had a first experience from the girl, but this time, it's a feeling of lust that he's trying so hard to fight in fear that his sin would send him straight to hell, resulting him to set all of Paris on fire just to find her. Now it's up to Quasi to save his new friend before Frollo's raft takes her down, along with the rest of the gypsies and possibly the entire city. Back in 1983, Disney executive David Stainton had a spark of an idea for an animated adaptation of the 1831 Victor Hugo novel The Hunchback of Notre Dame after reading the comic version by Classics Illustrated. It was a great idea, but the heads at Disney need to find the right people to lead the project. Meanwhile, after Beauty and the Beast, directors Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale took a break from that kind of responsibility, and their next job after that was just helping out on the story of The Lion King. But following afterwards, they tried developing an Orpheus-style story with whales as a potential animated feature. But it wasn't working as well as they'd hoped, so, Jeffrey Katzenberg called them to say they gotta scrap the Whales movie and work on Hunchback instead, to which they accepted, since they saw a lot more potential with that one to create something great. However, it would also immediately come with its own set of grueling challenges, most namely, adapting the novel into a family-friendly feature. It's no secret that there's a vast difference between the movie and the original novel. That's because the team at Disney had no choice but to make several adjustments in order to stay true to their own brand. These include making Quasimodo the central character, much like he was in the past live-action films, some massive adjustments to the protagonists to make them smarter and at least friendly to each other, and, most importantly, not make everyone dead at the end. But even with these adjustments, that didn't mean Disney stepped away from many of the book's more mature elements, giving the film several milestones for the studio that are the reasons why many state that this is one of Disney's darkest films. For one, this marked as Disney's most religious animated feature, since one of the themes is heavily based around late 15th century Catholic Christianity, including commentary regarding its views and how it can either save or corrupt someone. I mean, after all, the main location of the picture is in a cathedral. That, and it is also stated to be the first animated film to have a legitimate swear. I know that there were a few swears before, like jackass and hell, but I mean like a real hard swear. D. Damnation? E. Eternal damnation. Good. Oh, oh, in the religious context. Oh, I see, that's disappointing. And I thought they'd go all out like Pumbaa. Damn! Hey, watch your language, Pumbaa! But the most notable 
change the crew made from the book to really disney the picture is the addition of the three living gargoyles, Hugo, Victor, and Laverne. While many say that they were an original creation by Disney, especially when their roles are the comedic sidekicks in the same style as the genie from Aladdin and Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King, they did technically originate from the novel. Maybe not directly, but the trio was inspired by one sentence from the book that states, His cathedral was enough for him. It was peopled with marbled figures of kings, saints, and bishops, who at least did not laugh in his face and looked at him with only tranquility and benevolence. The other statues, those of monsters and demons, had no hatred for him. He resembled them too closely for that. It was rather the rest of mankind that they jeered at. The saints were his friends and blessed him. The monsters were his friends and kept watch over him. He would sometimes spend whole hours crouched before one of the statues in solidarity conversation with it. Originally, the Gargoyles were supposed to be named Chaney, Lafton, and Quinn, named after the three classic actors who played Quasimodo in previous Hunchback of Notre Dame films. However, in fear of getting a lawsuit from the actors' estates, they had to quickly make a change. The directors were close to just using the actors' first names instead, like Lon, Charles, and Anthony, but they ultimately went with the author's name for two of them, Victor and Hugo, and the third was called Laverne after one of the Andrews sisters. As for the casting, Sam McMurray and pop singer Cindy Lauper were supposed to voice two of the gargoyles, but after the big name change that also resulted in changes in their personalities, the roles were recasted to Jason Alexander as Hugo after playing Abysmal in The Return of Jafar, and Mary Wicks as Laverne in her final film role. After she passed away on October of 1995, Jane Withers had to step in to record the rest of the lines that needed to be done. For the remaining gargoyle, Victor, Charles Kimbrug needed a bit more persuasion to join in. He wasn't a fan of the idea of an animated adaptation of the novel at first, but then after seeing the amount of research that was already done, he was quite impressed and joined the cast. But it wasn't just the gargoyles that went through some changes with their voices. Quasimodo was supposed to be played by Mandy Paddenkin, but after a disastrous audition with him, they went with Tom Hulse instead, trying out different variations of what he would sound like and end up with a more youthful and natural voice, since the character in the book was about 20 years old anyways. As for Esmeralda, Demi Moore was the ideal choice for the role, but she wasn't all that comfortable with her singing. So much so that she even told the songwriters to find an actual singer for her song, God Help the Outcast, which they went to get Heidi Mollenhauer to fill her in for the number. In 1995, thanks to the great success of their recent features, Disney built an entirely new animation studio in Burbank next to the main lot and have The Hunchback be the first animated movie to be developed in the building. But while most artists were already at work on films like The Lion King and Pocahontas, the team had to get some help from all around the world. Not only hiring new animators from Canada and the UK, but also from a few from their Florida studio and a whole team of about 100 animators in their animation studio in Paris, France, which they contributed to 10 minutes of the picture. While the animation demanded a lot more from the animators for this film, the biggest challenge was to know how to create a convincingly massive crowd, something that not even traditional animation was able to capture without the time and money that is impossibly needed. When looking back at what they did for The Lion King, if computers made it work for Wildebeest, then they could certainly do it for people too. As a result, the CGI department created a new software called Crowds, which was able to create a variety of people who can do numerous of movements and have duplicates in different costumes and sizes be scattered all across the scene, delivering the illusion of a partying and lively crowd covering the streets of Paris during the Feast of Fools. Straight after their work on Pocahontas, Alan Menken and Stefan Schwartz decided to make the songs for Hunchback because of how the themes really resonated with them. Also, it gave them an opportunity to level up their score, even going to London where they were able to include a hundred-year-old organ and a choir from the English National Opera Company to the music. While the film itself does contain a large amount of musical numbers, there were a few that didn't make the cut. 
These included a couple of attempts of a love ballad for Esmeralda and Phoebus called In the Place of Miracles and As Long As There's a Moon, but because the songs took attention away from Quasimodo, it was replaced with The Court of Miracles. There was also Some Day that was supposed to be sung by Esmeralda in the Cathedral, but that ended up being switched to God Help the Outcast to have the mood of the moment be more humble. However, the song itself did not leave the movie entirely. On top of the melody often being used in the score, the end credits feature a pop version of the song made by different artists depending on the region. The North American English film featured R&B group All For One, the British English film had R&B group Eternal, and the Latin American Spanish film got Luis Miguel, which the latter ended up becoming a chart-topping hit. The movie was originally going to be released on Christmas 1995, but due to the departure of Jeffrey Katzenberg that shook things up in the company, it only got slightly delayed to about a half a year on June 21st, 1996. And on that release, Quasimodo's big animated moment in theaters was... Okay. It was certainly no Beauty and the Beast, but at least it wasn't a flop. Then again, it had a pretty cool parade in New Orleans for its premiere, and from there, the movie was introduced with a wide range of reactions from the public. There were critics who praised the film for its darker and more serious themes, the awe-inspiring animation, and the powerful music, even if they might have had issues with the changes from the Victor Hugo novel, and the French especially loved it, since it coincidentally came out not far after the Parisian police invaded St. Bernard de la Chapelle to go after over 200 immigrants looking for refuge, and the movie served as a good reminder of the meaning of Sanctuary. It even got some significant award nominations, like several at the Annie's, and a Golden Globe and an Oscar for Best Score. On the other hand, as much as it has its lovers, it also got a good bunch of haters too. Fans of the original novel despised the feature for simplifying and censoring the book, and many parents felt that it was too dark and scary for children, especially when it goes into more mature subjects like religion and sexual desires. But financially, it did manage to come out fine. Even if it was the first animated film in history to have a budget in the nine-digit mark with $100 million, the film did turn a profit with $100.1 million domestically and $325.3 million worldwide. A modest success, but only pocket change compared to the amount made by the merchandising, since only a year after its release, those managed to give Disney an additional profit of half a billion dollars. Following afterwards, the movie had a bit of a legacy and made a few appearances on other media, but it didn't really last long. It had a few notable moments at the parks, including a live show at Disney's Hollywood Studios from 1997 to 2002, a direct-to-video sequel in 2002 that featured new characters played by Haley Joel Osment, Michael McKean, and Jennifer Love Hewitt, an entire level with some of the characters featured in Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance, and a stage musical that stayed more true to the book that started in Berlin in 1999 and ran for three years, and then reappeared in English for a few months in San Diego and New Jersey between 2014 and 2015. While it didn't achieve the status of some of its predecessors as a prominent masterpiece, its dark themes and artistic strengths in the music and animation is what makes this stand out amongst Disney's lineup of features. To this day, the debate of how it adapted the book still goes on if it was for better or for worse, but it wouldn't take too long for the public to accept the movie as a Disney film to be cherished by generations to come. They probably wish it could have gone better, but for many, they will never forget how Disney powerfully rang the bells of Notre Dame. Going back to what Wise and Trousdale wanted to do before Hunchback, it was quite a coincidence to mention that they wanted to make a movie with a story based on Orpheus, because for their next movie, Disney would be entering into the world of Greek mythology. Maybe not with Orpheus, but with another well-known legend, Hercules. It's about a young lad named, of course, Hercules, who discovers that his real parents are the king and queen of the gods, Zeus and Hera, and the only way to become a god like them is to be a true hero. Even with the training he got from a satyr named Philoctetes, though, he later found that it was easier said than done. 
But with the ruler of the underworld Hades causing Chaos to take him down and plotting to take over Mount Olympus, Herc will have to use his godlike powers to fight against Hades while learning what it takes to be among the gods. Other than Orpheus, the team at Disney tried to develop several ideas to turn a Greek legend into a potential animated feature. One of them in 1992 was The Odyssey by Homer. But after some attempts to make it an animated comedy for modern audiences, they felt like they just couldn't do it and the whole project got scrapped. Soon after that, animator Joe Hadar got a little panicky to make his pitch to Disney, since they might not be in the mood to hear about another Greek myth idea after throwing out Odyssey. His idea was based around the legend of Hercules during the Trojan War, where he learns that his super strength isn't always the answer to solve problems. To his surprise, the pitch was a hit, and Disney was set to go and make a Hercules movie. Meanwhile, after finishing Aladdin, directors John Musker and Ron Clements spent about a year trying to develop their passion project of an animated sci-fi adaptation of Treasure Island with writers Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio. However, no matter how hard they tried, Jeffrey Katzenberg refused to make it happen. But then one day, they decided to make a deal. If Clements and Musker directed one more commercially appealing feature, then Katzenberg would let them make their Treasure Island movie. Well, it's not like they would get any other opportunity for it, so they took it and went searching for their next hit. It took a while to find it, going through ideas with not much weight to them, like The Odyssey, Don Quixote, and Around the World in 80 Days, but then they found the Hercules pitch from the year prior. As comic book fans, this would give them the opportunity to make their own superhero movie, and they agreed to make Hercules their next film. While making a G-rated movie out of Hercules might not sound as accurate to the actual myth, that was kind of the point. Since early on, the directors agreed to go a little further away from the legends to keep it more family friendly and not have to deal with Zeus's problem of being horny for everything he sees. This allows the team to go a bit more of an original route to make the story more like an action-packed screwball comedy, where the leads would act more like Jimmy Stewart and Barbara Stanwyck and have the setting act like it's in modern times, but in ancient Greece. They even got the help of Bob Shaw and Donald McHenry to write some of the comedy. But what was proven to be the Herculean task of making the feature is having the right people for the cast. It often took a lot of persuasion from Disney to get someone, and even vice versa. The latter was the case for Susan Egan, who tried so hard during the 1990s to audition for Disney at every opportunity she could get. The most that she got at the time was playing the role of Belle in the Broadway production of Beauty and the Beast. While Alan Menken was hesitant at first to have her try out a role that's a lot more cynical than sweet, he led her audition anyways, and the filmmakers decided that she was the right fit to play as Megara. As for the part of Phil, John and Ron always wanted to have Danny DeVito play the character, but he was not easy to get on board. At first, Danny refused and led the team at Disney to go through several actors, but they knew that DeVito was the only choice for them. Even Red Buttons told them so after auditioning. So after a little lunch on the set of Matilda, Danny ultimately agreed and signed on for the role. Now that they got most of their actors set up and ready, the film is left with just one more important casting, Hades. Unlike Phil with Danny DeVito, the directors had no idea who they want as the villain. Danny was the first to recommend someone with Jack Nicholson, who was a pretty good choice at first, but they ultimately couldn't get a deal to sign him on and they were way far off from each other. Like, Disney was ready to pay half a million dollars, while Nicholson asked for 10 to 15 million and half of the earnings from the Hades merchandising. Afterwards, it was just a massive hunt to find their right Hades. They were close with John Lithgow, but that ended up not working. It wasn't until James Wood stepped in with a more unique approach acting like a fast-paced conning car salesman, and ultimately landing the role. Early in production, Musker and Clements brought on board cartoonist Gerald Scarf, best known for defining the art style of Pink Floyd's The Wall, to be the film's production designer to introduce a new style that's unlike anything that's been seen in a Disney film. 
In total, Scarf made over 700 different drawings to define the look of the feature and its characters, and the team ended up creating a style that's a mix of Scarf's work, ancient Greek art, and a bit of that Disney touch to translate it all into animation. While the casting was a tough journey for the filmmakers, the animators went through a bit of the same thing when being assigned a character. Andreas Dejia was supposed to animate Hades since he had a lot of experience animating villains like Gaston, Jafar, and Scar, but he wanted to give himself a challenge and instead decided to work on the title character to at least include one protagonist in his portfolio. After that, Eric Goldberg was given the villain, but when he heard Jack Nicholson wasn't voicing him anymore, he lost interest. But then when Danny DeVito joined the cast and Chris Buck stepped out of animating the character, Goldberg took the shot and jumped in to be the supervising animator of Phil, even helping out in the final design to make him a combination of DeVito, Grumpy from Snow White, and Bacchus from Fantasia. As for Hades, who was always passed down from animator to animator, he was ultimately given to Nick Ranieri, who had the challenging task of continuously catching up with James Wood's speed to the point that it would take him two weeks just to animate a single second of the character. As Disney became more and more experimental with CGI technology with every film they make, they decided to step up their game by developing a fully CGI character with the Hydra. And this is not just a simple character to animate either. This is a serpent-like monster who can reproduce multiple heads whenever one of them gets decapitated, and by the climax of the scene, it would have about 30 heads simultaneously going after Herc. Oh, and did I forget to mention that Scarf made a complex design for the creature? While the battle sequence itself only lasted about 4 minutes, it took the technical team almost a year and a half to create the scene. On a side note, the computers were also used to create the morphing effects on the clouds in Mount Olympus. When Alan Menken worked on the music of the film, he was paired up with lyricist Dave Zippel, whom they previously worked together on the musical Diamonds. They wanted to implement a more Greek and classic tone to the music in the style of the operetta Candid, but John Musker suggested to try gospel music instead as a modern equivalent to the songs of ancient Greece along with some traditional Broadway-style tunes like Go the Distance, One Last Hope, and I Won't Say I'm in Love. As the film was getting ready to hit the big screen, Disney hosted some major events to promote the feature, including a Hercules-themed carnival tour that appeared in several different malls across America, and a little taste of Disneyland with the theme of the film in New York City's Times Square that featured the Main Street Electrical Parade, a performance by Susan Egan, and a fireworks show. And by the time the movie went the distance on June 27th, 1997, Herc did have some strength, but not a whole lot. The critics were mixed with the song saying that they were not hitting the notes as high as the previous Disney films, and the animation is said to either be visually intriguing or look like a cheap eyesore. But on the other hand, they did say that it was a fun movie regardless, and gave massive praise to James Woods' performance. Later at the awards, while not prominently featured, it did get nominated at the Oscars and the Golden Globes for the song Go the Distance, and won four Annie Awards. As for the box office, it did get a bit of profit, but it was noticeable that Disney was making progressively less and less with their films, this time only making $99 million domestically and a worldwide total of $252.7 million. Dick Cook, the president of Disney's distribution at the time, theorized that the underperformance of Hercules was due to being released around the same time as competitors that were fighting for the same kind of audience, like Men in Black and Batman and Robin. From then on, Herc and the gang did have a few prominent moments after the movie, including an animated series in 1998 that ran for two seasons and 65 episodes, including one where they did a crossover with Aladdin. Three of the episodes were also packaged together as its own direct-to-video prequel the next year called Hercules Zero to Hero. Outside of television, Hercules was also a prominent level throughout the Kingdom Hearts games, and in 2019, a stage adaptation of the film was played at Central Park in New York City that was a collaboration between Disney and the public theater. In the eyes of Disney, Hercules may not have been the true hero they were hoping for when the first film came out. 
But since then, the public picked up this gift from the gods and turned it into a fan favorite, with many still in love with many of the unforgettable personalities and singing many of the feature's catchy songs. It took a bit of time, even long after the release, but Herc managed to prove that he can go from zero to Disney hero. <laughs> As the team in Burbank continuously kept producing more major animated features with the help of the team from France on both Hunchback and Hercules, the animation crew in the Walt Disney World studio in Florida didn't have much time to assist on whatever those two were working on. They were busy on a much bigger project in the hopes that it can help expand the division to prove that they can do much more than just lend a helping hand and produce shorts. They were developing their own animated feature, and their first was Mulan. During the Han Dynasty, the Huns have invaded China to prove their dominance over the Emperor. In order to fight back, the Emperor himself asked for one man of each family to join the Chinese army, which is a problem for the Fa family since their only man, Fa Zhu, is far from being as strong as he used to be. His daughter, Fa Mulan, however, had different plans to save her father. Since she can't be a good bride, she secretly disguised herself as a man to join the army. Now, with the help of her guardian spirit sent by her ancestors, Mushu, Mulan will do everything she can to fight against the Huns while making sure her true identity remains a secret. Back in 1993, Disney was interested in creating a project that was based around Asian legends, since, as you could tell, they were more open to adapt other stories outside of fairy tales like classic novels and international myths. One of them they were trying out was a short called China Doll, which was about a Chinese girl who falls in love with a British prince. Also, they were talking with children's book author Robert D. Sansusi regarding potential ideas for stories. One of them he had in mind was an adaptation of the Chinese poem, The Ballad of Hua Mulan, which sounded intriguing for the company, and went on to combine Susie's idea and their China Doll project into a possible feature. Meanwhile, during the height of their animated films in the 1990s, Disney was open to let their Florida team to produce their first feature film. When Disney executive Thomas Schumacher asked Barry Cook to meet with him after directing the Roger Rabbit short Trail Mix-Up, he was offered two potential movies to direct, either Mulan or a film set in Scotland that featured a dragon. It took a bit of negotiating, but Cook accepted to do Mulan, but only if the film would include a dragon, since they are prominent in Chinese mythology. Not long after, thanks to a recommendation from Lion King director Rob Minkoff, animator Tony Bancoff joined the crew as well to be a co-director. Originally, when they started crafting the story, they wanted to go in a direction that went further from the original poem. It was more of a rom-com where Mulan joined the army because of the typical wanting more for herself than what she's been offered in her regular life. For the head of story, Chris Sanders, this proved to be a frustrating challenge to make it work, to the point that he asked the filmmakers to stick more to the original source material. The result turned out to be much better, since it also made the title character more selfless now that her choice to go is because she wants to save her sick father. But while it devoted itself more to be faithful to the poem, that didn't stop them from wanting to put some additions to their story. And since this is a Disney movie, the crew had to include some comedic sidekicks. Since the studio wanted another improvising comic relief in the style of the genie from Aladdin, Roy E. Disney thought up of an idea of a little dragon named Mushu, voiced by Eddie Murphy, who went through various concepts before settling on his final look, including having two heads, or even be two separate characters working as a duo. The other sidekick, created by longtime Disney veteran Joe Grant, was a little cricket named Cricky, whom no one actually liked in the studio because the team thought that he was pointless to the story. The only reason why he stayed in the film was because one of the very few that did like him was Michael Eisner, along with Joe and the character's animator, Barry Temple. For the voices of the film, the team knew that they wanted a mostly Asian cast. Originally, the singing voice of Jasmine in Aladdin, Leah Salonga, was supposed to be the voice of Mulan, 
But the directors weren't too convinced that she could fully do the job when her deeper voice when pretending to be a man wasn't good enough. So they went with Ming-Na Wen to play the part after hearing her narration in the Joy Luck Club. However, Solonga wasn't fully out of the role, since she still stayed as Mulan's singing voice. Also, keep in mind before that I said that the film had a mostly Asian cast. There are a few notable non-Asian actors featured as well, like the already mentioned Eddie Murphy as Mushu, Harvey Feinstein as Yao, Donny Osmond as the singing voice of Shang, Miguel Ferrer as Shan Yu, and voice acting legend June Foray as Grandmother Fa, just to name a few. Also, while he did not work on the English version, Jackie Chan provided the voice of Shang in all three Chinese versions of the movie, including Standard Mandarin, Taiwanese Mandarin, and Cantonese, as well as singing I'll Make a Man Out of You. Early in production, the team went on a three-week trip around China for research and took a lot of inspiration from that moment that ended up featured in the movie, including the world building, some plot elements, and even the designs to authenticate the Chinese traditions. Since the Florida studio was initially built small to primarily assist the animators in California, Disney made a massive expansion where they could fit an additional 400 artists in the building making the total of people who worked on the film, along with the story aides in Burbank, around 700 animators. To achieve the look of Mulan, they assigned the help of production designer Hans Bacher to establish the style of Chinese art onto the picture, meaning that the film had to incorporate more watercolors and simpler designs than what Disney was used to with their previous films, along with the colors playing a bigger role. They also brought in character designer Chang Yi Chang to finalize the look of the characters so that they could also feature the simpler aesthetics of Chinese artwork. Just like with the previous films, CGI was brought on board in order to create giant crowds for a few scenes. In this case, it was for when the thousands of Huns were charging at the army on a snowy mountain, capable of creating thousands of combinations of different looks, facial hair, weapons, and animations as they run down the mountain. However, not all the large crowds were 3D rendered. The computers were also able to make crowds out of 2D animated characters, taking individual animations and scattering them across some prominently long shots. Also, for the backgrounds, they created a new software called Faux Plane, which allows the artist to take a flat painting and manipulate it digitally to give it some depth. Think of it like the digital equivalent of the old multiplane camera system from Walt's days. Originally, Stefan Schwartz was supposed to develop the songs for the feature. However, he was called by Jeffrey Katzenberg to work at his new studio DreamWorks to make the songs for an animated adaptation of the Book of Exodus called The Prince of Egypt. As much as the heads at Disney begged him not to go, Schwartz went to DreamWorks anyways, and the songs he did write for the film like China Doll, Written in Stone, and Destiny were inevitably scrapped when the crew made some changes to the story. In his place, they hired Matthew Wilder and brought back David Zippel to create five songs for the movie. There was a sixth one called Keep Em Guessing that was meant to be sung by Mushu and was a favorite amongst the filmmakers, but had to be dropped when Eddie Murphy was brought on board. Because of the disappointing box office results of their recent animated features, Disney had to scale back on the promotion of Mulan. It didn't have any major events or lavish parades outside of the parks or crazy mall tours. Instead, the most that it got was a special premiere at the Hollywood Bowl and a promotional campaign with McDonald's where they sold Szechuan sauce with its Chicken McNuggets. The sauce would return for a limited time in 2017 thanks to being referenced in the Adult Swim show Rick and Morty. And it was a complete disaster. When the movie was released on June 19th, 1998, it was actually a step up from before. At least, it slightly did. It managed to collect $120 million domestically and $304 million worldwide. And the critics were genuinely impressed with the feature, like for its animation, story, and title character. Maybe not all of them felt the same way, but it had been a while since they received a good amount of praise like this. 
especially with the awards when it got nominations like an Oscar for Best Score, two at the Golden Globes for Best Score and Best Song with Reflection, and won 10 Annie Awards, including Best Animated Feature. Speaking of Reflection, the pop version of the song is credited to be the debut single of Christina Aguilera, who was only 17 when the film came out. After its theatrical run, Mulan had a few little appearances across the world of Disney, like in the parks, including when Mushu co-hosted a special show that talked about the process of animation, the Kingdom Hearts games, and on television like The House of Mouse and Once Upon a Time. The most significant moments she had after the feature were a couple of other movies like a direct-to-video sequel called Mulan 2 in 2004 and a live-action remake directed by Nikki Caro. Many may say that it is a strange fact that this is an animated film made at Walt Disney World, but it did prove to Disney that the Florida team was also capable of crafting features that would resonate with the public as much as the ones made in California. To this day, people still connect with this movie, as they consider Mulan as one of the strongest of the Disney princesses and use I'll Make a Man Out of You as their motivational anthem. As the Emperor himself said it best, You don't meet a girl like that every dynasty. Meanwhile, back at the studios in Burbank and Paris, the animators were hard at work on their next project that took a break from International Legends. Instead, their next movie would take a similar route to Hunchback and adapt a classic novel to the big screen, taking the pages of Edgar Rice Burroughs and turn them into Tarzan. It's the life of a man named Tarzan, who was raised by gorillas after his real parents were killed by the leopard Sabor. Upon his adulthood, now fully adapted to his jungle environment, he encounters for the first time people that are just like him, including a hunter named Clayton, a professor named Porter, and his daughter Jane. Clayton may have a hidden agenda to bag some gorillas, but Tarzan's a bit occupied with having some feelings he never felt before towards Jane, putting the ape man in a difficult spot to either stay and protect his gorilla family or live a new life of his own kind. For Disney, making an animated adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan seemed like a no-brainer. There have been plenty of Tarzan adaptations before, but never a legitimate one in animation, since it seemed like the perfect medium to do so in order to fully present Tarzan's skills to glide through the jungle and his relationship with the animals like with Kala. So in 1995, Michael Eisner contacted the director of a goofy movie, Kevin Lima, to take on the project as his next helming job, which he accepted and later convinced his friend, animator Chris Buck, to join in as co-director. After studying the first book for two months, the first idea he had for the movie was when Tarzan and Jane had their hands together, marking a symbolic moment that would be the key in finding the heart of the story to present Tarzan's search for his own identity. Originally, when writer Tab Murphy did the first script, the movie was supposed to end with Tarzan leaving the jungle to move to England with Jane like in the novel. However, the directors were not fond of the idea since it doesn't go well with the feature's theme of family and doesn't give as much intensity that there's much danger going on. So to fix up the issue and to keep Tarzan in the jungle, the team at Disney created a new villain, Clayton, where he would join Porter and Jane's exposition in the African jungle as a guide with a secret plan to poach gorillas. Technically, there is a Clayton in the book series, but the only similarities they have is that they both share the same name. As for the original villain of the book, Kerchak, his role got switched to emphasize that he is the responsible leader of the group while refusing to accept Tarzan as his own son. Later on, the studio also brought in Dave Reynolds, Noni White, and Bob Sudeker to add some comedy in order to lighten up the mood of the story and its emotional themes. For the role of Tarzan as an adult, they got Tony Goldwyn after he landed the audition thanks to his strong voice and ability to imitate animals. However, he wasn't able to do the signature Tarzan yell. That had to be done by the voice of Clayton, Brian Blessed. But the ones that proved to be the toughest to cast was actually Tarzan's comedic buddies. Turk was originally going to be a male gorilla, but decided to slightly alter the character as a tomboy female when Rosie O'Donnell got the part. 
As for Tantor, Woody Allen was supposed to voice him, but Jeffrey Katzenberg once again swiped him away from Disney after making a deal for DreamWorks to distribute his next pictures and be the voice of the lead in their animated film, Ants. Ultimately, the elephant was voiced by Wayne Knight. Absolutely, I'd love to voice the funny cartoon elephant for your film. No need to fear, as this is a job for... THE WHITE KNIGHT! Unlike the previous productions, where there would be one main studio working on the film with the others helping out, Tarzan was a full collaboration between the team at Burbank and the team in Paris, especially when Glenn Keane had to be the supervising animator of the title character in the latter. The Florida crew also came into production once they were finished with Mulan. While Tarzan may seem like a simple character to animate, since he's just a guy acting like an animal who only wears a piece of loincloth, those attributes were what made Tarzan actually more challenging to draw. Because he's almost naked, Tarzan had to feature a realistically muscular anatomy and limited to moving like a real person when behaving like an animal. This is why the team hired a professor of anatomy to give the animators a full understanding of how Tarzan's body works, resulting in him being the first Disney character to show working muscles. Another challenge with the Ape Man was to animate how he would go from tree to tree. There were some ideas taken from how monkeys swing through vines, but Glenn Keane's main source of inspiration was from surfing style actions like skateboarding and snowboarding, based on his son's interest in extreme sports. Speaking of him surfing and swinging through the trees, the team wanted to develop a special 3D background that could blend with the traditional look of the film, but also allow the camera to be swinging around with Tarzan in one big elaborate shot. This is why they have developed a new software called Deep Canvas, which let the animators create the environment in CGI and paint the digital models in the same style as the actually painted backgrounds, resulting in the 2D Tarzan to move around this 3D world while still looking like it was all handmade. A few years later, Deep Canvas earned the Technical Achievement Award at the Oscars. While Disney was on a roll with making musicals at the time, Lima and Buck decided not to have their characters sing because it would just seem a bit awkward if this half-naked guy would suddenly burst into song in the middle of the jungle. However, the film still required to produce some hit songs, and since this is a feature that wanted to emphasize the percussions to match with the African theming, Disney brought on board Phil Collins to work on the soundtrack where the songs he made are meant to reflect on the thoughts of the characters like Tarzan and Kala during their respective scenes. Since the movie was translated in the most languages for Disney at the time with 35, Collins recorded his songs in five of those languages like in English, French, Spanish, Italian, and German. When the film was released on June 12, 1999, it was the first major motion picture in history to be produced, mastered, and projected digitally, and it came out as the theatrical king of the jungle. It was a great hit at the box office by making $171 million domestically and $448 million worldwide, and the critics admired the work put into the feature like the thoughtfully heartfelt story, the Phil Collins music, and the state-of-the-art animation. The movie even received a few awards like an Annie for Technical Achievement with Deep Canvas, a Grammy for Best Soundtrack Album, and an Oscar and a Golden Globe for Best Song with You'll Be In My Heart. For the remaining time that Disney had the rights to Tarzan, they made the most out of it by turning the movie into its own franchise, including a sequel series called The Legend of Tarzan in 2001 that ran for two seasons and 35 episodes, which three of them that were unaired were packaged in the direct-to-video film Tarzan and Jane in 2002, a level in the first Kingdom Hearts game, a midquel direct-to-video feature in 2005 called Tarzan 2, and a stage musical that ran for over a year on Broadway between 2006 and 2007. 
There are also a couple of notable mentions at the parks like Tarzan's Treehouse in Disneyland and Hong Kong Disneyland, and Tarzan Rocks, a musical show in Disney's Animal Kingdom in Walt Disney World that ran for seven years until it was replaced by Finding Nemo the Musical in 2006. As Tarzan swung Disney into a better position with their animated features both critically and financially, nothing could prepare them for what was to come. Right around the corner was a brand new millennium, which signified a new age in modern culture with plenty of changes and technical achievements in store. But with the beginning of a new era, it would come at the cost of concluding the old one, meaning that Disney's renaissance with their animated features was over. You know, Fantasia was meant to be a perpetual work in progress. Every time you went to see it, you'd experience some new pieces along with some old familiar favorites. But that idea fell by the wayside until now. I'd like to take this moment to talk about a key player of the Disney Renaissance. One of the top people accredited to save Disney animation when they were at their lowest point and even saving the entire company by bringing on board Michael Eisner and Frank Wells as their leaders. I am of course talking about Roy E. Disney, the son of Roy O. Disney, and the nephew of Walt Disney. Throughout the late 1980s and 1990s, as chairman of Disney's animation department, Roy always knew that animation is the backbone of the Walt Disney Company, and did everything he could to make sure that every animated film he helped out on turned out to be the best they could be. And judging by how things were going during Disney's renaissance, I think it's safe to say that he did his job very well. However, throughout the 1990s, Roy also was working on a passion project, something that he always wanted to do for many years that would bring back one of Disney's classics. Maybe not a uh, sequel per se, but rather a continuation of the legacy of one of Walt's most ambitious works. In short, Roy's big project was to make another Fantasia. To quickly recap what I said before, the original plan for Fantasia was to be continuously re-released in theaters, but for each time, Disney would include a new segment to make each release a different experience. However, due to the film initially getting a mixed reception from both critics and audiences and bombing at the box office, largely due to expensive equipment that was needed to fully present the film at the time, the plan was ultimately scrapped. It wouldn't be until several decades later when the idea of another Fantasia emerged at the studio with a project called Musicana. Developed by Mel Shaw and Wooly Reitherman in the late 1970s, it was a spiritual successor to Fantasia that would have the same format of the feature, but presented stories and music from all around the world. Unfortunately, the studio didn't feel ready at the time to make another Fantasia-style film, and the project was thrown out in favor of making Mickey's Christmas Carol. A few years later, after Roy brought Michael Eisner and Frank Wells to be the CEO and the president of the company respectively, he suggested to Eisner an idea to make another Fantasia. At first, the heads at Disney were a little hesitant. Some didn't care much for it, others were open to the option, but also had a hard time finding a composer. It wasn't until the early 1990s when the original Fantasia had a bit of a mainstream comeback. The 1990 re-release was a hit by earning $25 million at the domestic box office, and a year later, it became one of the best-selling VHSs with over 14 million copies sold. For the first time, the company saw the potential of expanding Fantasia and how it can be commercially viable thanks to the newfound interest in the classic Disney film. 
And so in 1991, Eisner greenlit the project titled Fantasia Continued and put Roy in charge as an executive producer, using the earnings from the Fantasia VHSs to fund the film. Disney also brought in Donald W. Ernst to help him out as producer, and Rescuers Down Under director Hendel Batoy as the movie's supervising director. The first order of business for the new crew was to find the right conductor for the project, since the first Fantasia was a collaboration between Walt Disney and Leopold Stokowski, so they couldn't just grab any conductor. They needed someone who had the same legendary status as Stokowski and open to manipulate classical pieces of music for the feature. Their search led them at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City, where its conductor, James Levine, was enthusiastic to join the team, and throughout production, he was said to be like a kid in a candy store with all the potential music he could play with. Roy also wanted to have the interstitials like in the first film to be like a palate cleanser after every segment. While he got Don Hahn to direct them, they had a hard time figuring out who would be the new master of ceremonies like Deems Taylor was before. Ultimately, the studio decided to go with not one, but several celebrities, including, in the order of their appearance, Steve Martin, Istok Perlman, Quincy Jones, Bette Midler, James Earl Jones, Penn and Teller, James Levine with Mickey Mouse, and Angela Lansbury. Originally, to keep the spirit of Walt's original vision for Fantasia alive, Roy wanted to include half of the original film and put in about three to four new segments. Realizing that the idea sounded better in his head than out loud, he cut the old parts down to just three with The Sorcerer's Apprentice, The Nutcracker Suite, and Dance of the Hours. But by time, even that did not last long. Dance of the Hours was eventually scrapped, and The Nutcracker Suite ended up getting replaced by a new segment, leaving The Sorcerer's Apprentice as the only segment from the predecessor to remain as an homage to Walt's idea of an ever-evolving concert feature. So with all that said, and the movie itself got the orchestra ready, let's start the music and get into the segments. The first piece of the feature is Symphony No. 5 by Ludwig van Beethoven. Similarly to the Tokata and Fugue number in the first, it is more of an abstract segment that presents colors, shapes, and lights, but this time, it also features a narrative of the battle of light and darkness with colorful butterflies and black bats. The choice for this piece was because of the familiarity, as the first four notes are the most famous composition in all of classical music. This is also why it's the first segment to immediately give audiences something they already know to make it easier for them to get into the movie right off the bat. For two years, starting in 1997, director Pichot Hunt used his time to figure out which parts of the music that should feature either more of the vibrant colors or the dark tones, along with blending the handcrafted work of the animators with CGI and caps. The artist started with the pastel backgrounds and hand-drawn character animation for the shapes that had more personality, and the computers later added the effects, the giant horde of the good and evil shapes, and for the CG models to recreate the movements done in hand-drawn. Next up is Pines of Rome by Ottorino Respighi, which presents humpback whales flying in the sky. Why flying whales? Why not flying whales? This was the first piece the team selected to be a part of the feature back in 1993. They didn't really know what to do at first, but from the sound of the music, they knew that flying would be an essential theme. When one artist was doodling clouds during a meeting, Hendel Batoy noticed that one of them was shaped like a whale, and the idea of flying whales stuck ever since. At the time, computer graphic imagery was a brand new piece of technology that Disney still had a lot to learn how to properly use it, but they knew that they needed it to make the part. The whale started out as traditionally animated, but their weight and movement didn't feel believable enough and resorted to animating them with CGI, even using the same systems for the wildebeest in The Lion King so that the pod of whales don't end up randomly bumping into each other when they all appear. However, they also quickly learned that even early computer animation had its limits, which was why the eyes had to be hand-drawn to give the whales a better look. 
Then comes Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin that shows four people in 1930s New York City who wanted a better life for themselves and get their wish through their adventures that coincidentally connect with each other. Originally, it was intended to be its own short after Eric Goldberg and his wife Susan, straight out of Aladdin, wanted to make a cartoon set to Gershwin's music presented in the style of Aladdin's artistic inspiration, Al Hirschfeld, which Hirschfeld himself agreed to collaborate as an animation consultant. After having a storyboard screening with some of the Disney heads, Roy was so impressed with it that he knew the short had to be in the movie, and switched the old Nutcracker segment with Rhapsody. That, and they were coincidentally looking for a piece made by an American composer, so it was a perfect fit for the next Fantasia. As it is also a tribute to the works of Hirschfeld, the Goldbergs added in a wide variety of easter eggs throughout the piece that ranged from nods to the team making the film, including the Goldbergs themselves, and one of the characters was modeled after animation historian John Colhane, cameos of caricatures done by Hirschfeld like one of Gershwin himself, and even having Hirschfeld's signature mark of sneaking in his daughter's name Nina into each of his work. Also, with the exception of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, this is the only segment not conducted by Levine at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Instead, it was done by Bruce Broden with the Philharmonia Orchestra. Levine later conducted the piece for the film's soundtrack. After that, it's Piano Concerto No. 2 Allegro Op. 102 by Dmitry Shostakovich that tells the story of the steadfast tin soldier by Hans Christian Andersen, where a broken toy soldier has to save a toy ballerina that he's in love with from an evil jack-in-the-box. Originally, all the way back in the 1930s, Walt Disney wanted to make an animated adaptation of the story as part of the scrap collaboration with MGM to make a Hans Christian Andersen biopic, the same project where Disney first tried to animate The Little Mermaid. After Roy thought about having Piano Concerto No. 2 in the picture, Batoy discovered that the Tin Soldier story was a perfect fit for the music thanks to a 1991 Disney book that told the story with images of artwork made for the Cancel project. While the soldier and the ballerina stayed mostly true to the original designs back in the 1930s, the Jack in the Box went through numerous of changes in order to make him easier to animate. As it was one of the first segments in production, this was also one of the first projects at Disney that featured the main characters entirely animated in CGI. In fact, Disney was making computer animated living toys before Pixar released Toy Story. Speaking of Pixar, they were supposed to produce the animation for the segment, but the studio told them that they were confident that Disney could do it on their own. The ending was supposed to stay more true to the source material where the soldier and the ballerina melted in the fire, but they had to make it a happier ending, not really because it's Disney, but the music itself ended on a more upbeat note, and they had to change the narrative to fit the piece. Next up is Carnival of the Animals Finale by Camille Saint-Saëns that features a flamingo that rather wants to play with his yo-yo instead of following the others. The idea first came when Disney veteran Joe Grant thought about a sequel to the original Stance of the Hour segment, where one of the ostriches was given a yo-yo. While most of the concept stayed, the ostriches were turned into flamingos to both avoid the familiarity of its predecessor and give the segment more color. Just like Rhapsody in Blue, the segment was led by Eric and Susan Goldberg, who aimed for a quick comedic moment for the picture. Inspired by Eric's directing partner in Pocahontas, Mike Gabriel, who often played with his yo-yo during his break. Following The Sorcerer's Apprentice after Carnival is Pomp and Circumstances, Marches 1, 2, 3, and 4 by Edward Elgar, which tells the story of Donald Duck as Noah's assistant when bringing all the animals into the ark, and momentarily thought that he lost Daisy along the way. The one who first thought about the piece was actually not from any of the filmmaking team, but rather, it was Michael Eisner, who got the idea after attending his son's graduation, since the piece is known by many as a staple for those ceremonies. As for what would be represented visually, Eisner thought about presenting a large wedding featuring all the Disney princesses with their lovers, each carrying their future children as they say their I do's. For the animators, this was absolutely horrifying. 
Because not only would it look like the characters were a part of some freaky religious cult ritual, but also, if Disney presented all the princesses pregnant next to their true loves, then it would lead the audience to think about the process of how they were, um, uh, well, uh, how can I put this? Getting knocked up. We did more than just kiss. It's clear he didn't miss. Also, just a reminder, most of the Disney princesses are below the age of 18. Ultimately, Michael agreed to scrap it, but still really wanted them to use the piece. Oh my! Uh, Ariel? Yeah, it's too late from our end, unfortunately. Coming soon to own on video and Disney DVD. Good luck with this one, parents. It took a while for the animation team to think of a story that would fit the music, but director Francis Glebus eventually came up with Noah having a hard time to get all the animals in the ark. Later on, Glebus added Donald Duck to be Noah's assistant with an extra narrative of trying to find Daisy. And finally, to conclude the picture, it's the Firebird Suite 1919 version by Igor Stravinsky, where a tree nymph-like sprite accidentally awakens a giant firebird and he destroys the forest they inhabit, to which the sprite must then go and bring her home back to life. For the finale, Roy knew that he wanted to cap the film off with something that had the same emotional power as the original's Nine on Ball Mountain and Ave Maria segments. Finding the right piece to end the movie was a bit of a challenge, but then they discovered that they already had the rights to Firebird when Stravinsky himself gave Walt the license to some of his music for the original Fantasia like Rite of Spring. The story of natural destruction and renewal came to Roy when he remembered going on a trip to Mount St. Helens and saw the devastation it caused not long after it erupted in 1980. He wondered what it would look like if there was a transition shot that spanned for a few hundred years to see the destruction being completely covered by nature reviving itself in the area, and thus came the premise of the segment, where it was given to the team in France led by Paul and Gaetan Brizzi. Originally, the movie was meant to be released in 1997, but then it had to be pushed back by a few years in the year 2000. But not just in that year, but also directly when it would start on January 1st, 2000, making it the first ever feature film to be publicly released in the new millennium, along with giving the movie a new title from Fantasia Continued to Fantasia 2000. But a few weeks beforehand, on December 17th, 1999, Disney started a tour where they premiered the movie before its public release that featured the film with a live orchestra, conducted by James Levine with the Philharmonia Orchestra in a few renowned venues like Carnegie Hall in New York City, the Royal Albert Hall in London, the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, the Orchard Hall in Tokyo, and the Pasadena Civic Auditorium in California. Also, on its 2000 release, Disney decided to first put it out exclusively in IMAX to take advantage of the enhanced cinematic experience it offered and, for marketing purposes, to present it like a legitimate motion picture event, which also makes Fantasia 2000 the first ever animated feature presented in the IMAX format. However, as Disney was setting up the sequel just like the first film by presenting it as a great musical event and showing it in specifically made theaters, it also met the same fate as the original. The critics generally gave the film positive reviews, but in comparison to the first Fantasia, which was already accepted as one of Walt Disney's greatest masterpieces, 2000 felt like the inferior version. There were some segments that were agreed to be powerful with its blend of animation and choice of song, while others received a lot of mixed reactions, especially regarding some of its CGI and choice of narratives. Even with some of the criticisms though, it did receive three Annie Awards later on. But with its decision of heavily limiting the amount of screenings of the movie, it ended up costing the film massively at the box office, becoming Disney's first animated financial failure since The Rescuers Down Under. 
Sure, it broke some records in terms of IMAX films and did get a wide release a few months later on June 16th, but it only ended up making a total of just $60.7 million domestically and a worldwide total of $90.9 million on an $80 million budget. Following afterwards, there was a moment at Disney when they wanted to make another attempt of a Fantasia movie called Fantasia 2006. As work began in 2002, it would have been more similar to the Musicana concept, where the segments would tell stories from all around the world with music that could openly consider using those that also have lyrics to them. Among those segments that began production at the time were One by One, a deleted song from The Lion King written by Lebo M, directed by Peshot Hunt that presented children in South Africa getting together to fly kites. Then there was String Quartet No. 2 in D minor by Alexander Borodin that told the story of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Match Girl, directed by Roger Allers. Then after that was Lorenzo, based on an old concept done by Joe Grant in 1949 that was revived by Mike Gabriel that showed a cat's tail having a mind of its own set to the music of Bordonio E900. And finally, there was Destino, another revived project that was originally conceived in the 1940s as a collaboration between Walt Disney and famed surreal artist Salvador Dali, brought back decades later at Disney's French studio led by Dominique Montferri and put to the music of an original piece by Armando Dominguez and sung by Dora Luz. Ultimately, Fantasia 2006 was cancelled in 2004, and the segments that were in development for the project ended up becoming their own independent shorts, released individually at festivals and across several DVDs and Blu-rays of various Disney animated films. With the exception of One by One, each of the shorts earned a nomination at the Academy Awards. As a continuation of Fantasia, it is unfortunately appropriate that it initially got the same results as Fantasia, leaving Roy feeling exactly like Walt did 60 years prior. However, for that moment, it did succeed in fulfilling its artistic purpose, to keep the Fantasia legacy alive, using new technology in order to tell more timeless stories set to renowned classical music. It may generally be considered weaker than its predecessor, but it did help expand its legendary experiment with new segments, new music, and new ways to experience animation in a way that only Disney could conduct so beautifully. Even if Fantasia 2000 was a failure, it was possibly the most prominent proof that Disney was experimenting with animation throughout the 1990s and always pushed the medium to the next level in order to continuously enhance their storytelling, especially with CGI. However, there was one film in development that took their experimentations even further than any other feature they were making at the time. In fact, Disney was creating their first fully computer animated feature or at least mostly computer animated, with Dinosaur. The film presents Aladar, an iguanodon raised by lemurs whose home got entirely destroyed by a meteor shower. Soon afterwards, they come across a whole herd of dinosaurs that are migrating to a place called the Nesting Ground, where they could harmoniously live with all the food and water they need. Now as Aladar tries to blend in with the crowd, he and his lemur family do whatever they can to help those in need, survive from being hunted by two Carnotaurus, and have everyone make it to the nesting ground. It all started way back in 1986, when director Paul Verhoeven and visual effects supervisor Phil Tippett developed an idea to make a dinosaur movie while they were working on Robocop. Soon after creating a script, along with some storyboards and a planned budget of $45 million, they pitched it to Disney to Jeffrey Katzenberg, to which he was ready to give a budget of $25 million. It was a hefty price to pay, but at least it was something that they could work with. And so in 1988, production began on their dinosaur project that would have been made like a Ray Harryhausen-style feature with stop-motion puppets and scaled models to present the time when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Walt Disney Pictures presents... Dinosaurs! Dinosaurs! 
In Verhoeven and Tippett's original version, the story had a darker tone and told in the style of a nature documentary, where a styracosaurus named Woot and his little lemur friend named Suri try to survive and escape the wrath of a Tyrannosaurus Rex named Grozny. Uh, Arrgh, it's feeding time. Prepare to die. Arrgh! At the end, the two big dinos fight with Woot being the winner, but it didn't really matter because the big asteroid came by anyways and made all the dinosaurs extinct. Wait, what? Boom! Leaving Suri and all the other lemurs as the only survivors. After Paul and Phil ultimately left by 1990, the project went a bit in development hell. Some directors came and went, like Thomas G. Smith and David W. Allen tried their hands on the project and wanted to include a real lemur for the role of Suri. But the real downfall was when Jurassic Park came to the big screen and was a revolutionary success, leaving Disney to reevaluate what they were doing with their dino picture and put it on hold until they could try something similar to Jurassic and make their dinosaurs digitally. By 1994, Disney's animation division took their CG technology in order to try their hands on the project. For about two years, they experimented with the idea of making a fully computer animated dinosaur feature, but with the CG backgrounds, it did not look as good as they'd hoped. But then, the team thought up of a crazy idea to solve their problems. Instead of fully making the backgrounds themselves, they would take live-action footage and put their CG dinosaurs in the scenery. When they pitched it to Michael Eisner, it seemed like a big risk, especially when they had no idea how much it would cost. But Eisner trusted that they could get the job done and gave his approval to fully start the project. But on one condition. He demanded that most of the dinosaurs and the lemurs could talk in the movie. After some revisions, the updated version starred an iguanodon named Nola, who had the ability to see into the future and saw the asteroid that would make all the dinosaurs extinct. And it was up to him to save his herd alongside his grandparents and his lemur buddy Adam while facing two hungry Carnotaurus and a rival iguanodon named Kane. Later on, the story had to go through a few final changes to replace the names and remove the grandparents and the lead's future seeing powers. Also, in order to accommodate Eisner's wish while having the dinosaurs look like they could believably speak, the iguanodons had to have their beaks replaced with lips. As for the directors, Disney hired Oliver and Company helmer George Scribner and storyboard artist Ralph Zondag. But not long after, George quit the project to work at Walt Disney Imagineering and was replaced by Eric Layton. To fully prepare to create their first major computer animated film, Disney bought the entire visual effects studio Dream Quest Images and blended it with their computer graphics unit into The Secret Lab. On a side note, The Secret Lab also served as its own visual effects studio and worked on several films like Armageddon and The Princess Diaries. However, the studio did not last long, and Disney shut its doors in 2001 for being too expensive to operate, and the last films they worked on were Reign of Fire and Kangaroo Jack. But back onto the movie, in order to achieve the blend of live-action environments with the computer-animated dinosaurs, the film crew first scouted at several locations like Venezuela, Australia, Hawaii, Florida, Western Samoa, Jordan, and Southern California, and took pictures of ideal spots to film. Then the animators created visual backgrounds in order to make their preliminary animation to establish their shots in the movie. Once that was done, the team went back to those locations to film the backgrounds and carrying the animations with them for reference as a 3D textbook so that the shots can match the visuals, along with doing some practical effects and create some photography techniques like the dino cam, where they put the camera on a cable between two towers in order to capture the perspective of a large roaming dinosaur. The shots were then returned to the animators where they finalized the animation and add some additional digital effects on top of blending the live action footage to make the scenery look bigger. At the same time, there were some elements that they had to cheat their way to capture the effect they wanted, 
like the grass is actually the same texture of the fur from the lemurs, but painted green so that the computers can believably register when the dinosaurs interact with their environment. But out of all the scenes the crew had to work on, the hardest to technically pull off was the destruction of Lemur Island. On top of establishing some fast-moving action shots, the visual effects team had to think outside the box in order to replicate the meteor showers and make lots of explosions both digitally and on camera. They even had to create a small replica of Lemur Island so they could blow it up to present the grand scale of the devastation. For the music, on top of the score done by James Newton Howard, Lebo M returned to give the soundtrack some lyrics in the same way he did for The Lion King. And speaking of The Lion King, Disney decided to give the film a similar marketing technique by taking the opening scene and use it as its teaser trailer. Disney also decided to promote the picture in one of their parks by changing the name of the ride Countdown to Extinction in Disney's Animal Kingdom in Walt Disney World to Dinosaur, since it coincidentally also featured an Iguanodon and a Carnotaurus as their leading dinos. And when the dinosaurs roamed the big screen on May 19th, 2000, it was as big of a hit as the giant lizards themselves. At least with the audience. The critics were not fans of the plot, calling it generic and too similar to Don Bluth's The Land Before Time, but still found that it was worth watching for the awe-inspiring visuals. But its success was most accredited at the box office, where it earned $137 million domestically and $348.8 million worldwide, making it the fifth highest grossing feature of the year. A few years later in 2006, Disney made Dinosaur one of their first features to be released on Blu-ray discs, which also makes it the first animated film to be released on the format. More than most others, Disney took the opportunity with this film to be the most experimental they ever could be with their animation. So experimental that to this day, many still often forget that this counts in the official Disney animation lineup. For some of its flaws that it carried, it still had some tremendous power with its animation and score to inspire audiences and bring them back millions of years ago to a whole new world. Something they never did since the original Fantasia. Its moment in the spotlight may have been short, but there was a moment when Dinosaur ruled the Earth. In terms of release animated features, the year 2000 turned out to be Disney's busiest. Since they started the year off with Fantasia 2000, then it would only be fitting that they'd end the year off as well with another animated film, The Emperor's New Groove. It's about Cusco, the emperor of an Incan empire, who only cared about one thing and one thing only. Me. What's his name? After firing his advisor Yzma, she and her assistant Kronk plot to murder Cusco to be the new emperor. But that didn't work out because a mix-up resulted Cusco to turn into a llama instead. Now paired up with a kind-hearted villager named Pacha, Cusco must get back to his kingdom to reclaim his throne and maybe learn along the way that not everything has to be about himself. When developing a movie, especially an animated feature, it's common to see that the final picture turned out to be dissimilar to the original concept. However, in the case of The Emperor's New Groove, it is one of the most famous examples of starting out as an entirely different film. Back in 1994, after he was done directing The Lion King, Roger Allers had an idea to make an epic feature based around ink and culture, and when he first pitched it to Michael Eisner, the CEO was more than happy to let him have full control to make the film thanks to his recent success with his last feature. The movie he envisioned was called Kingdom of the Sun, a Prince and the Pauper style story where a kind-hearted peasant named Pacha and a selfish emperor named Monko, whom both look identical, decided to swap places. But when the evil sorceress Yzma heard about the switch, she turned Monko into a llama and forces Pacha to do her bidding or else she would reveal his secret, since she plots to destroy the sun to regain her youth and beauty. But as the two fall in love with a girl in their respective new area, 
They now have to do whatever it takes to stop Yzma and turn Monko back into a human. Early on, Ellers had almost everything ready to produce his next feature. He had a full story outlined, an Incan theme for the film's aesthetic and art style, a whole research trip in Machu Picchu, Randy Fulmer as the producer, Mark Dindal as a co-director, who was hired straight after directing Warner Brothers' Cat's Own Dance, a cast that included David Spade as Manco, Owen Wilson as Pacha, Eartha Kitt as Yzma, Laura Preppen and Carla Gugino as the love interest, Mata and Nina respectively, and Harvey Firestein as Yzma's stone assistant, Hukua, and Sting to create several songs for the feature. Everything seemed like the team had everything in place to move forward with their next big animated musical, and for about four years, they managed to get a good amount finished like Sting gave them some songs ready to go, and around a quarter of the animation was done. But there was just one problem. Uh-oh. Don't tell me. The executives hated almost everything about it. Yep. Gonna have to start back at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. They may have gotten all the materials necessary to produce a potentially solid Disney film, but the heads at the studio found that what they had created was completely unengaging and unlikable with only very few elements that they actually enjoyed. And what was worse, now that the progress they've done was mostly all for naught, the team became heavily behind in their schedule, since the release was only a few years away. Allers thought that it would be an easy solution and asked to just delay the deadline so that they could fix all the story problems. However, Disney refused to move the release date and knowing that his vision of the movie would never come to life, he ultimately quit the project. Meanwhile, Randy Fulmer and Mark Dindal, now the only director of the picture, were given a last chance to save the film by stopping the production for six months to create a better narrative and the animators who were involved with Kingdom of the Sun moved to work on the Rhapsody in Blue segment for Fantasia 2000. Thanks to the help of storyboard artist Chris Williams and comedy writer David Reynolds, they managed to create a brand new story that is unlike anything what it originally started. There were a few elements that remained intact, like the Emperor turning into a llama and learning not to be selfish, the Incan theming, and David Spade and Eartha Kitt were still among the cast, but the film is now a buddy comedy in the style of a Chuck Jones cartoon that focused more on the Emperor than the Peasant, and the title was later changed to The Emperor's New Groove. They also made significant changes to some of the characters, like Pacha is now a larger middle-aged man voiced by John Goodman, Yzma's assistant Hokua turned into a muscle-bound yet dim-witted guy named Kronk voiced by Patrick Warburton, and Monko's name was switched to Cusco because they discovered that, in Japan, Monko would have been a fitting name for the character, but not really appropriate in front of the kids. But the biggest change from the revision was making the film a non-musical, meaning that they had to drop all the songs that Sting wrote for the picture. He was furious at first and wasn't a big fan of the new comedic edge the film was taking, but then cooled down a bit and stayed in the project making a deal with Disney that three of the deleted songs would go in the movie's soundtrack, including Walk the Llama Llama, One Day She'll Love Me, and Snuff Out the Light. However, because he was working on a new album, he didn't have a lot of time to supply new songs and could only make two for the beginning and end, which are Perfect World, sung by Tom Jones, and My Funny Friend and Me. He was close to bailing out on the film entirely when he saw the ending where Cusco built his Cusco Topia theme park next to Pacha's home and invited the villagers' family to join in the fun. But the crew quickly switched it after getting Sting's letter regarding the issue and decided to finish off the film where now Cusco is spending his vacation in a shack next to Pacha's house. But with the new changes to the feature, there were some sacrifices along the way, including Andreas Dejia, who was originally animating Yzma, ended up losing interest after the new comedic take came in, and decided to move to the Florida studio to work on the feature that they were developing, and was replaced by Dale L. Bayer. As their time was limited and a lot of the budget was wasted on the previous version, Dindel's goal with the animation was to give it a simpler approach that emphasized less on presenting grand and complicated cinematic shots and crazy CG visual effects, and more on character animation to highlight their emotions and the comedy. 
They also received additional help to speed up production from the team in Florida and France. Originally, the film had been set for a long time to be released in the summer of 2000, but due to the time needed to completely rewrite the whole story, that release was given to Dinosaur and was moved several months later to December 15th. However, with that new release, it also came with a lot of trouble from an old former ally. Around the same time, Jeffrey Katzenberg had his own Mesoamerican themed animated comedy under his DreamWorks animation studio called The Road to El Dorado, and he was rushing his way to get his feature release before Disney's, and managed to do so by putting out his feature in March of that year. And this wasn't the first time that this happened either. There was a similar situation two years prior when DreamWorks and Pixar were feuding over Ants and A Bug's Life. But Disney wasn't in the mood of playing Jeffrey's rivalry games and still persisted with their December release, which only had a decent groove in theaters. The critics thought, while certainly not Disney's most ambitious or revolutionary work, it did provide some solid entertainment with its great cartoon-style comedy. But at the box office, Cusco didn't receive a lot of riches, only making $89.3 million domestically and a global total of $169.3 million. The reason why the film wasn't so hot in theaters was due to the tough competition at the time like Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas and Disney put their marketing focus a lot more on 102 Dalmatians. In a way, New Groove wasn't much of a hit, in fact it was closer to a flop, but on the bright side, it still did better than El Dorado. However, little did Disney knew that the groove would only get bigger and stronger as time moved on. When the film came out on home media, it was much more successful than when it was on the big screen, even becoming the highest selling home media release of 2001, and had its name appear during award season like winning three Annies and a nomination for an Oscar, a Golden Globe, and a Grammy for Best Song with My Funny Friend and Me. In 2005, Cusco's Kingdom grew bigger and became a franchise with a direct-to-video sequel called Kronk's New Groove and an animated series called The Emperor's New School that ran for two seasons and 52 episodes. And even if the show wasn't highly well received, it did get a few awards of its own thanks to Eartha Kitt's performance as Yzma. And while it didn't have a ride to call its own, it was the visual inspiration for the Tokyo Disney Sea roller coaster Raging Spirits. Earlier in 2002, a documentary about the entire making of the feature was released at the Toronto International Film Festival called The Sweatbox, made by Sting's wife, Trudy Styler, which was part of the deal for Sting to be involved with the project in the first place. After screening at the festival, Disney never gave it any other release, nor was it shown to the public with the exception of a few leaks online. They never fully explain why they're hiding this one deep in the Disney vault, but if I have to take a guess, it's probably because the language might not be suitable for all audiences. It's the feel of the music. Why you f***ing say that in the first place? Oh, that's too easy. While some films find their success instantly, The Emperor's New Groove was one of those cases that it had to gradually find its audience. Nowadays, the movie is considered to be one of Disney's biggest fan favorites, with many still making memes out of the memorable scenes and quoting the variety of lines found in the film. While it certainly wasn't the first, nor will it be the last to have this happen, New Groove is one of the most prominent examples of how the final product and its legacy can be entirely unexpected and nothing like how the idea started. Throughout 2000, it was the year where Disney decided to take an entirely different direction than their previous works. They tried their version on Walt's most experimental project he ever put on film, they blended computer animated dinosaurs with live action backgrounds, and scaled down to produce a straightforward fun filled comedy. This theme of trying something new with their features continued in the following years, but in terms of their reception, let's just say that the worst was yet to come. Speaking of which...
After more than a decade of releasing successful musicals that used their timeless storytelling formula, the year 2000 was when Disney decided to say, let's try something new. They wanted to step aside from repeating the same process of adapting either a fairy tale, a famous novel, or an international legend, and add some funny sidekicks and musical numbers, and instead, experiment with new forms of storytelling and animation. They tried their take on Walt's most ambitious movie with Fantasia 2000. They blended computer-animated dinosaurs with live-action backgrounds with Dinosaur, and they made a straightforward, fun-filled comedy with The Emperor's New Groove, all released in that one year. The result of them ended up becoming very mixed, both critically, where some were admired and others not so much, and financially, where some made some good money and others were box office flops. This new experimental attitude continued on at the studio in the following years with their next features but their outcomes would become a lot more extreme than the ones from 2000. Like, there were times when Disney won, but when they lost, they are some of the biggest losses in the company's history. But either way, they were willing to take the risk to try something new, including Atlantis, The Lost Empire. It's the story of Milo Thatch, who was left off of the Smithsonian after presenting that all the research he was working on was just to find the fabled city of Atlantis. But his luck would quickly change when an eccentric millionaire, Preston B. Whitmore, gave him a legendary book discovered by Milo's grandfather called The Shepherd's Journal, which is the key to finding the location of Atlantis. Now with an entire expedition team by his side and going through a dangerous quest just to get there, Milo will soon discover that there is a lot more to the secret of Atlantis than just the city itself. When the team completed the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Kirk Wise, Gary Trousdale, Don Hahn, and Tab Murphy all agreed at a restaurant to work on another animated feature with the exact same team. However, they also wanted to do something completely different. For several years at that point, all they've been doing was fantasy musicals, and they wanted to take a break from that formula. In a Disneyland-style metaphor, they said that after doing several Fantasyland films, they wanted to try their hands on an Adventureland picture, since Walt Disney himself had a legacy of action-packed adventures like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. When suggesting it to the animation crew, they were more than happy to be on board with this new direction, knowing that this meant that there would be less songs and a lot more explosions. In other words, instead of getting songwriters... Oh, eh, kind of powder, nitroglycerin, notepads, fuses, wigs, glue, and paper clips, big ones. As they started work on an Atlantis movie, since they began by thinking about doing something inspired by the works of Jules Verne, the first step was developing the world and myths of Atlantis itself. And they didn't want to do it the easy way either. In fact, they were banned from taking any form of inspiration from Greek aesthetics. Instead, they looked elsewhere around the world to create the architecture of Atlantis that the public was not fully familiar with and would find it more otherworldly, including Cambodia, India, Malaysian culture, and Tibet. This was only one part of the extensive research the team had to do in order to create the environment of the film where it took them to museums, early 20th century army installations, the Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico, and going through the internet to collect as much information as they can on the subject and created their version of Atlantis by combining several theories made by people like Plato and Edgar Case. The team also went as far as hiring the maker of the Klingon language in Star Trek, Mark Ockrand, to create the entire Atlantean language, while John Emerson helped design the Atlantean alphabet, further pursuing to achieve that believability that Atlantis is an entirely functioning culture that is similar, yet completely different from our own. After Tab Murphy finished the initial script, the team realized that there were too many ideas and characters included that resulted the draft to be way too big. And when I say big, I mean that if they were to adapt the original script in full, then the movie would have been around two and a half hours long. 
Knowing that they'd have to reduce that time between 90 to 100 minutes, the team had to make some extensive sacrifices like cutting out some minor characters and less important scenes. The biggest example of the cuts that were made was the journey to get to Atlantis, where Milo and the gang originally had to escape a parade of monsters like a leviathan, squid bats, lava whales, and a massive bug-like land beast. Ultimately, the creatures, except for the Leviathan, were cut and the journey was mostly reduced to a comedic montage to get to Atlantis quicker. Originally, the movie was supposed to start with a prologue of Vikings centuries ago trying to find Atlantis with the Shepherd's Journal, but the Leviathan ended up taking down their ship. It was the first sequence the team animated for the film, and by the time when the scene was already finished and the production was close to completion, story supervisor John Sanford risked his job to say that the prologue just doesn't work. Mainly because there was nothing that gave audiences a reason to care about the Atlanteans by the time the expedition team discovered the place. As crazy as it sounded to throw out an entire scene that the team completely animated and spent their money on, they knew that he was right. The opening was later replaced with why Atlantis had to be sunk under the sea through the perspective of Kida as a little girl. For the voice of Milo, the directors knew that Michael J. Fox was the perfect fit for his eccentrically geeky personality. When he was casted, Fox, the studio, also stepped in to offer him a part for their sci-fi animated flick, Titan A.E. But Michael decided to let his son to pick which role he should take, and the kid said that he wanted to see his dad in the Disney film. Gary Trousdale went further on that and said the 8-year-old saw the coolness of their movie. That, or maybe he just got a look at the Titan A.E. script. <laughs> On a side note, one of the members of the expedition crew, Dr. Joshua Sweet, is noted to be the first black character in a Disney animated film. That is not offensive. Sadly, this was the final film to feature Jim Varney, who played the role of the chef Cookie. While the crew were disheartened that he never got to see the whole feature in its completion, they were at least proud that Jim really loved the work in progress they were able to show him. After Varney passed, Stephen Barr was hired to finish Cookie's remaining lines. Inspired by the works of David Lean and Akira Kurosawa, Kirk and Gary decided that the film should be filmed in the 35mm anamorphic format so that it could be more reminiscent to the action-adventure films they remember growing up with like Raiders of the Lost Ark. At first, the team was scared a bit, fearing that it would mean to animate in ridiculously wide papers like back when making Lady and the Tramp. But they later found an easy solution by taking the same animation paper they've always been using, but draw in a smaller frame so that the animators could work within the widescreen aspect ratio. For the design of the feature, Disney hired several renowned artists outside of animation to help contribute as production designers to different elements in the picture. There was Matt Codd, who created the look of the Leviathan and the Ulysses submarine, Jim Martin, who did many of the vehicles and the functions inside them, Ricardo Delgado, who did the environment of Atlantis, and the biggest artistic inspiration, the creator of Hellboy, Mike Mignola, who helped out the movie's main art style and contribute to some ideas to the story. The art director of the film, Dave Getz, had to take all of these designs and fit them all together to make them look like they all belong in one same world. More than any other Disney animated film at the time, this movie took their computer animation to the ultimate test by creating hundreds of shots that blended their traditional animation with CGI and digitally create some complex designs like the Ulysses, the Leviathan, some extras, some effects, the vehicles, and the stone giants. But among all the scenes in the movie, the most complicated to pull off was the final shot where the camera pulls out from Milo and Kida on top of one of the stone giants to an extreme wide shot of the whole city of Atlantis. The team tried to pull off a similar scene for the end of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but it didn't come out as well as they'd wanted. But thanks to the upgraded technology they had at their disposal and improvements to their CGI skills, they were able to pull it off as they envisioned it thanks to careful screen planning and advanced use of digital multiplaning. When it was time to create the music, 
James Newton Howard was brought in again to be the composer. This time, the directors wanted him to approach this similarly to a live-action picture, and sometimes had the responsibility of carrying the emotion of the scene. Howard also had to make two distinct styles for the music, where the explorers have a more militant and American approach, while the Atlanteans have gamelan, which is traditional Indonesian music that features chimes, gongs, xylophones, and more to allow mainstream audiences to be immersed in a world that they are unfamiliar with. Just like how they used it to conduct their research, this is the first Disney animated film to use the internet as a prominent tool to advertise the movie. And when it was time to uncover the Lost Empire on June 15, 2001, Disney discovered an unpleasant surprise. The box office reception wasn't kind to the picture, especially when it came in when there was some serious competition like Lara Croft Tomb Raider and DreamWorks Shrek where the Disney film only made $84 million domestically and $186 million worldwide, and with a hefty budget of around $100 million, Atlantis was a flop. The reviews from critics didn't fully help either, stating that the action and adventure is awesome and the animation is beautiful, but the story and its characters were what made this film feel for them like one of Disney's weakest features. And if that wasn't enough, the movie also received some Lion King-style backlash because some people pointed out that the film contains too many elements that are very similar to the Japanese animated series Nadia The Secret of Blue Water, where even those who worked on that show wanted to call Disney out for plagiarism. What was unfortunate about the failure of Atlantis was that Disney ended up abandoning their plans to turn the movie into its own prominent franchise. There was a series in the works based on the film called Team Atlantis, but that potential project completely sank, and the three episodes that were completed got packaged together in the form of a direct-to-video sequel called Atlantis Milo's Return. Also, Disney considered to bring back their old submarine voyage ride at Disneyland with an entire Atlantis theme, but again, the failure scrapped the idea. A few years later, Submarine Voyage did reopen in 2007, but themed to Finding Nemo instead. As ambitious as they were to get out of their musical comfort zone to try something that was a lot more action-packed, the payoff turned out to be a true disappointment. But that was when they learned the hard way of the true meaning of being experimental. Sometimes they work and can revolutionize the process of their craft, and sometimes they can blow up in their faces and leave them with less than what they had started with. Nowadays, the artwork done for the film is highly admired by many and the movie does have its own little cult following, but at the time, the results were not as epic as they hoped for, yet the team will still have the memories of the grand adventure to the Lost Empire. As Atlantis turned out to possibly be a little too ambitious for Disney, the company was hoping that the studio in Orlando, Florida could help pick up the slack with their potential animated feature. It may not have been as adventurous as Atlantis, but the team made sure that it had the heart of a Disney film. One that could touch audiences with its charm and hope that they could walk out with a soft spot for Lilo and Stitch. It's about a six-year-old girl in Hawaii named Lilo who lived with her sister Nani after their parents died and is on the verge of being taken away due to concerns if she is being properly taken care of. So, to help the situation out, Nani lets Lilo adopt a dog of her choice and later calls him Stitch. But as it turns out, she picked the one that just so happens to be an illegal and dangerous alien experiment that is completely fueled by chaos and is hunted by his mad scientist creator and an intergalactic expert on Earth sent by the Galactic Federation. As Stitch tries to hide from being captured, he eventually grows a bond with Lilo and now has to learn to replace his destructive tendencies with the meaning of Ohana. It all began during the height of their renaissance in the middle of the 1990s, when Michael Eisner started to notice that, while they ended up successful, the films they were making at the time were starting to get real expensive. And I mean the budget was averaging at around a hundred million dollars. So, in order to balance that out, he wanted a movie that would be similar to Dumbo, a film with a smaller budget, but could still deliver a lot of heart. 
When newly appointed Disney Animation President Thomas Schumacher was in charge of looking for that potential project, he first asked story artist and story supervisor of Mulan, Chris Sanders. And at that moment, he knew that he kept this one idea for years that would be perfect for this occasion. Back in 1994, Sanders had a failed children's book pitch about this alien named Stitch. And while it didn't work for a book, he figured that maybe it could work as a movie. In Sanders' original pitch to Schumacher, it was originally just about Stitch, where he tries to figure out who he truly is while living in a forest on Earth. It was something, but it obviously needed a bit more. By time, a few extra elements were added or switched to give the idea more layers, including a little kid for Stitch to interact with, and changed the forest setting to a small rural town in Kansas. But the story didn't fully start to take shape until Sanders thought of a unique idea for the location that had never been fully done in an animated feature. Instead of taking place in Kansas, why not have the movie set in Hawaii? And so, after Chris brought his head of story partner from Mulan, Dean DeBlois, to be his co-writer and co-director, the new Disney team first set off to the island of Kauai, where they researched the aesthetics and lifestyle of the area, along with learning the meaning of Ohana, which later became an important theme to the feature. Ohana means family. Family means nobody, nobody gets, gets left, left behind. Or... Or forgotten. They also made a vow after that trip to stay authentically true to the state's culture, making sure that parts like the music and the hula dances were as accurate to how they were performed in real life. Originally, Stitch was supposed to be a fully mute character, only able to communicate through pantomime. However, they knew that he would need a voice and make sounds to communicate to properly present how he went from a mischievous maniac to a member of a loving family. Sanders recorded Stitch's lines as a temporary track, using a funny little voice he used at work for the role, but the team was so used to it throughout the production that Chris ended up becoming the official voice of the character. Also, Stitch was meant to be the leader of an intergalactic gang, and Jumba was one of his crew members that got caught, now sent by the council to catch his former boss in exchange for his freedom. After a test screening where the audience wasn't fond of having a crime boss as the lead of a family film, the team decided to switch up Stitch and Jumba's relationship to Creator and Creation, where Stitch was invented by Jumba by the name of Experiment 626, made with great intelligence and great strength for the purpose to destroy anything on sight. One of the biggest goals for the movie since the beginning was not only to make the feature cost-effective, but to also make it stay true to the vision of one artist, which in this case was Chris Sanders. He may not have noticed before making this movie, but Chris had a very unique style when it comes to his drawings, often described as a lot more round and friendly looking with no points or sharp edges featured. So the biggest challenge for the animation team in Florida was instead of going with the usual Disney design, they had to go through an additional learning curve by drawing exactly like Chris's style. Another major change in the animation was dumping the gouache to paint the backgrounds and replace it with the more complex watercolors. Sure, Disney used to paint with watercolors for their backgrounds, but that technique hadn't been done since back when they used to commonly make cartoons and their first films, with maybe the exception of Mulan. The reason for the use of watercolors is to capture that same heartfelt storybook style that was found in Dumbo and to have the colors prominently pop out similarly to a stained glass window. While the movie went through several changes throughout production, the biggest change occurred to the climax, where Stitch, Nani, Jumba, and Pleakley hijack a Boeing 747 to fly through downtown Honolulu in order to stop Gontu and save Lilo. The scene itself was already fully animated and got some praise from the team, hyping it up as the great grand finale of the picture. However, the scene ultimately did not stay for long. After the attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, they all knew that they needed to change the climax immediately. It didn't technically go through a complex do-over, but the CGI models on the plane was altered to turn it into Jumba's ship and the buildings of downtown Honolulu were changed to the mountains of Kauai. 
For the music, on top of hiring Alan Silvestri to be the composer, the directors also brought in Hawaiian chanter Mark Kelai Ho'omalu to add that authentic Hawaiian feeling to the music. The soundtrack may mostly consist of Elvis Presley songs that Disney had to continuously ask permission to use a lot of his likeness in the film, but they did create two new Hawaiian style songs for the movie. Hawaiian Roller Coaster Ride and He Mele No Lilo, sung by Mark and the Kamehameha School's Children's Chorus. To introduce audiences to Stitch as the crazy rebel of the Disney family, the team created a set of trailers that parody some iconic Disney moments like in The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King, where Stitch would come in to crash the party, sometimes literally. They even brought in some of the original voice actors to reprise their roles. I was singing here. Get your own movie. Hey! How'd you get your own movie? Hey, that's not Simba. <laughs> when Stitch Crash landed in theaters on June 21st, 2002, Disney was hoping they could get another Dumbo, and they got another Dumbo. While it may have been a bit pricier than they hoped with a budget of $80 million, it did turn out to be a box office hit with a domestic earning of $145.8 million and a worldwide total of $273.1 million. As for the critics, they consider this one of Disney's most charming stories with a strong theme of family and some enjoyable humor and characters. On top of getting several nominations at the Annie Awards, including winning one for DeVay Chase's performance as Lilo, and being one of the first films from Disney Animation nominated for Best Animated Feature at the Oscars. Following afterwards, Stitch would become far bigger than what he was intended for the first movie, and his presence would go beyond his time on the big screen. A year later, Disney released the direct-to-video feature Stitch the Movie, which is meant to be the pilot for the series that later went on for two seasons and 65 episodes. Some of those episodes included some crossovers with other Disney Channel animated series like American Dragon, Jake Long, The Proud Family, Kim Possible, and Recess. The series concluded in 2006 with the TV movie Leroy and Stitch. The year prior, Disney released a more official direct-to-video sequel not related to the series and made by Disney Toon Studios called Lilo and Stitch 2 Stitch Got a Glitch. But that was only regarding his time he spent with Lilo. After those follow-ups, Stitch was also hanging out with other people in Asia with a few additional spin-offs, including Stitch, a 2008 Japanese anime series where he's paired up with a girl named Yuna in an island near Okinawa that lasted for three seasons, 83 episodes, and five TV specials, Stitch and I, a 2017 Chinese series where he's with another little girl named Ai in the Huangshan Mountains that went on for 13 episodes, and Tono and Stitch, a 2020 manga where Stitch finds himself in feudal Japan and teams up with a warlord. Niga Nala Krista! Quite a contrast to the little girls he usually hangs out with, but whatever satisfies his chaotic urges. And yet, that is only the tip of the iceberg of Stitch's world domination, as he quickly became a highly prominent Disney franchise with tons of merchandising, video games, and several attractions at the parks, including Stitch's Great Escape, a round theater at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World that features Stitch causing chaos for Gontu and the seated guests that ran from 2004 to 2018, Stitch Encounter, an interactive show where Stitch talks to guests that is featured at every Disney park except for the American ones, and a special version of the Enchanted Tiki Room that opened in 2008 at Tokyo Disneyland called Stitch Presents Aloha e Como Mai, where Stitch crashes in the Tiki Room featuring songs from the original attraction, the first movie, and the series. While it may not have been as entirely cost-effective as Dumbo, it did manage to help the studio at their time of need exactly like the 1941 film. When their animated films began to be less popular and started to lose money, Stitch came in to not only give them a critically and financially well-received film, 
but to also deliver a new prominent franchise that resulted in Stitch to become one of Disney's biggest characters, possibly next to Tinkerbell and even Mickey Mouse. He may be a bit uncontrollable and even quite rebellious, but there's always that one in every family that they can't help but love and include them in their ohana. Meanwhile, back in Burbank, another team wanted to try their shot at an out-of-this-world epic adventure similar to Atlantis. However, for the directors of this film, it was their passion project that they've waited for many years to make, and finally got their opportunity to bring their vision to life with Treasure Planet. The movie is about Jim Hawkins, a troublemaking teenager who got his hands on a holographic map that points to the location of Treasure Planet, a planet that is completely filled with treasure left by Captain Nathaniel Flint. Accompanied by family friend and astrologer Dr. Delbert Doppler, Jim joins the RLS Legacy, run by Captain Amelia, to find the planet and hangs out with the cook John Silver. But as soon as Hawkins discovers that Silver and the crew are actually pirates plotting to take over the ship to get the treasure for themselves, Jim, Doppler, and Amelia now have to make sure they can get to Treasure Planet before the pirates get their hands on it. Going all the way back to 1985, during Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg's Gong Show pitch meeting, directors John Musker and Ron Clements had another concept they wanted to propose alongside their version of The Little Mermaid. Their other idea was an adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, but with a sci-fi twist where it would have been set in space. But just like The Little Mermaid, the plan was initially denied, mainly because Eisner knew that Paramount was making a similar movie at the time that was a Treasure Island-themed Star Trek sequel, which, by the way, ultimately never happened. Following afterwards, for several years, Ron and John tried and tried and tried to get Disney to greenlight their sci-fi Treasure Island movie, but one way or another, the studio just refused. It wouldn't be until 1995 when the two got some extra help from Roy E. Disney and made a deal with Michael. If they agreed to direct Hercules, then they can afterwards go and work on the movie they've wanted to create for so long which they decided to call it Treasure Planet. For Rob Edwards, who helped Musker and Clements on the writing, he stated that it was quite a challenge to blend the sci-fi elements with Treasure Island and use that to make the Robert Louis Stevenson story feel fresh and new to modern audiences. Of course, with that kind of twist to the story and coming from a studio like Disney, they had to make some adjustments to the characters and their relationships to one another, like aging up Jim Hawkins a bit to be a more troublesome teenager, combining Dr. Livesey and Squire Trelawney into Doppler, and putting more emphasis on Jim and John Silver's father and son style relationship. As Disney had to audition for many of the different roles in the film, there were two in particular that the directors always had in mind. There was David Hyde Pierce as Doppler and Emma Thompson as Captain Amelia, whom both were excited to take on their respective roles. When it was time to visually bring the universe of Treasure Planet to life, Ron Clements gave the crew a rule that they had to follow in order to successfully achieve the feature style called the 70-30 law. This meant that 70% of the film should be traditionally depicted, with hand-drawn as its main medium, especially to present the characters, have the architecture, costumes, and visual aesthetics stay true to the book's 18th century setting, and have the designs be inspired by the Brandywine School to have that pirate-themed classic storybook illustrated look, almost like if the movie brought the pages written by Stevenson to life. As for the other 30%, that is the amount of sci-fi elements needed to incorporate in the film, like the intergalactic space atmosphere, aliens and robots living among the people, the otherworldly organisms and advanced technology that became the norm, and the use of computer animation for both the environments for the camera to freely move around in some shots, and for certain characters like Ben. The 7030 law also applied for both the sound effects and music which the latter was provided by James Newton Howard on his third Disney animated feature in a row. While the animation managed to get the hang of that law, what was a bigger challenge for them was to blend the hand-drawn and CG elements even further than what they did before. 
The team may have already had experience on some of that, and bringing back those techniques onto this film, like the deep canvas tool to give the 3D environments that painted style to match with the movie's design, but the one element that really emphasized the blend of both mediums was the character of John Silver. Mixing traditional animation supervised by Glenn Keane and CGI for his cyborg parts. To test if it could even be possible to give a hand-drawn character a computer-animated robotic limb, the animators took some old animation of Captain Hook from Peter Pan and give him a new cyborg arm to see if it could not only match the old movements, but if it could seamlessly look like the Disney classic was suddenly given a steampunk twist. You will go ashore, pick up Tinkerbell, and bring her to me. After many years of trying to get this adventure off the ground and more to actually tell the story, Ron and John's long-awaited passion project finally set sail on November 27, 2002. And it was Disney's biggest journey at the time as well, with a budget of $140 million, making it, as of 2020, the most expensive traditionally animated feature. However, as Disney was hoping that the film would be a map to untold treasures... All right, Black Dog, here's your cursed treasure map. This is a bomb. That's right. I didn't ask you for a bomb, Billy. As it was Disney's most expensive animated film at the time, it also played a major factor in how it became one of Disney's biggest box office bombs. Despite its $140 million cost, it only collected $38.1 million domestically and $109.5 million worldwide. Consequentially, Disney ended up losing $74 million from this film alone. But not necessarily everything was a disaster for Treasure Planet. The critics thought that the film was okay, saying that they highly enjoyed the animation and the fast-paced action despite the lackluster story and characters. Also, along with Lilo and Stitch, it received several nominations at the Annie Awards and, again, was one of Disney Animation's first nominations at the Academy Awards for Best Animated Feature. However, both Stitch and Treasure Planet lost to Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Just like with Atlantis, the company was considering to have this be an entire film franchise with a possible TV series and even a direct-to-video sequel that would feature a love interest for Jim and a new villain named Ironbeard that would have been voiced by Willem Dafoe. However, when they saw the movie's failure at the box office, those plans were ultimately left buried. For Disney, and especially the directors, Treasure Planet served as a dark lesson that great passion doesn't always mean great success. Just like with the Atlantis team, they wanted to try something new and go beyond the musical formula to create something that was more action-packed and pushed animation to a whole new level. Unfortunately, all that effort came with rewards so little that Disney lost more than they gained even to the point that its failure has become as or even more known than the movie itself. By time, the movie did gain a bit of a cult following, proving that there is an audience for this movie out there that can see its creative achievements. But even when things for the movie itself seem grim and leave a darker reputation than the other Disney films, in the words of John Silver himself, You got the makings of greatness in you but you gotta take the helm and chart your own course. Stick to it, no matter the squalls. And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there, catching some of the light coming off you that day. Just like what happened with Atlantis and Lilo and Stitch, as the movie made in Burbank flopped hard, it was up to the studio in Florida to make another feature that could help recoup some of the losses. So after Treasure Planet became Disney's biggest animated box office bomb, the Walt Disney World team would have to put some extra care on their next feature in order to win back audiences with Brother Bear. It's the story of Kenai, who got revenge for the death of one of his brothers by killing the bear that killed him. The spirits, however, were not cool with the extreme action, 
and as punishment, transformed him into a bear. Now with his new bear body and ability to actually communicate with nature, Kenai tags along with a young cub named Koda and learns about the true meaning of brotherhood and how to look from another person's or animal's perspective. After The Lion King became a major hit, Michael Eisner demanded for Disney to make another animated feature starring animals mainly being animals, but this time, he also wanted it to be set in a North American forest and that the star animal of the picture would be a bear. In fact, the original plan was to make it very similar to The Lion King by giving it a Shakespeare-inspired plot. Based on King Lear, the story would have featured an old blind bear with his three daughters. But the movie's true nature wouldn't fully take shape until in 1997, animation veteran Aaron Blaze saw this as his opportunity to put his skills in great use, since his specialty in art is drawing nature and animating animals like bears, and joined the project as director along with fellow animator Robert Walker as his co-director and producer Chuck Williams. In their first version, the story centers around a father and a son where the son was turned into a bear and decided to stay that way in the end. For Thomas Schumacher, he knew that this movie was a real winner, especially with the transformation being a key theme that would hold this entire feature together and brought on board Tab Murphy to write the script. As time moved on, the plot would also go through a transformation where the father-son dynamic got switched to Kenai learning the life of nature from a bear named Grizz, voiced by Michael Clark Duncan. But during the writing process, the team found that there was something missing, like it didn't have enough charm to really capture the heart of the picture. As a result, they ultimately scrapped Grizz and replaced him with a young cub named Coda, voiced by Jeremy Juarez after hearing his audition for Finding Nemo. However, the directors loved their time with Duncan so much that they couldn't just throw him out of the picture. So, as a compromise, they created a new character for him to voice called Tug, the head of the bears at the Salmon Run. Also, to give the feature more comedy, they reunited Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis to play the roles of the moose, Rut and Took, in the same style of their cult favorite SCTV characters, Bob and Doug McKenzie. To get the team immersed in the environment of the picture, they started by going on several research trips across America to visit several national parks and natural areas, many of which in Alaska like the Denali National Park, the Kenai Fjords National Park, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, and the Kodiak Islands, and then later at the Grand Teton National Park and Jackson Hole in Wyoming, the Sequoia National Park in Nevada, Yosemite in California, and the Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. These research trips were essential for the crew like the background artists in order to capture the natural realism and the beauty of the forest and its colors when painting their landscapes. While this is far from the first Disney animated film to be presented in either widescreen or cinemascope, this is the first to have its aspect ratio transition from one to another. The film begins with a regular 1.85 out of 1, but then after Kenai first wakes up as a bear, the movie becomes much wider at 2.35 out of 1, where not only is there a lot more to see, but also the colors become richer and the sounds are a lot fuller to present how Kenai's world has completely changed now that he has become one with nature. After his work on Tarzan, Phil Collins was more than happy to return to provide the music of Brother Bear. However, he also wanted to give himself an extra challenge by not only making new songs, but also work on the score with Mark Mancina. It got a bit difficult at first with Collins going through a big learning curve with the music, especially now that he was working on an original feature instead of an adaptation, but he eventually got the hang of it. The only catch was that the team demanded for Phil to step back from singing all of the songs to give the soundtrack more diversity in voices. He did get to sing Look Through My Eyes, No Way Out, and On My Way, but in his place, Collins and Mancina brought in several singers like Tina Turner for Great Spirits, the Blind Boys of Alabama to join Phil for Welcome, and the Bulgarian Women's Choir for Transformation. Originally, the movie was supposed to come out in the spring of 2004, but then later Disney decided to move it up to the fall of 2003. 
Some thought that it was due to production troubles with their next animated film they were producing, but it was actually because it made more sense to promote Brother Bear on the DVD Platinum Edition of The Lion King. And when the bears went on their way to the big screen on November 1st, 2003, people's point of view of the picture was not so great, especially from the critics. There were a few things they did enjoy, like the animation can be pretty nice and that aspect ratio change was cool, but other than that, it just felt like the same dull animated kids film with the same dull story and the same dull characters, which coming from Disney made that additionally disappointing. It did manage to get some nominations during award season like some Annie Awards and an Oscar for Best Animated Feature, but lost the latter to Pixar's Finding Nemo. As for the box office, that actually went a lot better this time, especially with a significantly lower budget of $46 million, making $85.3 million domestically and $250.4 million worldwide. Sure, the level of success was nowhere near the same as Lilo and Stitches, but it still paid for some of the losses on Treasure Planet. Soon afterwards, the film tried to have a bit of a time to shine as a member of the Disney family with a direct-to-video sequel in 2006 and little moments at the parks like a themed area at the Redwood Creek Challenge Trial at Disney's California Adventure, but their time to shine there did not last long and later got their theme overshadowed by more popular Disney films. Just like Kenai when the spirits transformed him into a bear, the animation industry was going through an entire transformation as well. At the start of the decade, rival studios started to emerge and were more competitive than ever now that they started to release their own fully computer animated features. It was fine when it was only Pixar doing it, but then companies like DreamWorks and Blue Sky Studios crashed into the scene with their movies like Shrek and Ice Age and were able to dazzle people more than Disney ever could at the time. But most importantly, these computer animated films were a lot more financially successful, highlighting a harsh reality that they were in a new age of animation. Long gone were the days when Disney was dominating with 2D characters doing song and dance numbers. Now they have entered a new period where animated features were a lot more comedy driven and added a new dimension with CG to bring audiences to amazing worlds in a way they had never seen before. With computer animation taking over, Disney was viewed as old fashioned. And not only were they failing to impress audiences, but it was starting to literally cost them as well. <laughs> And if they ever hoped to survive in this new fully digital world, they would have to learn to adapt and start making their own fully computer animated features, meaning that they would have to make a lot of sacrifices along the way, including hand-drawn animation. Oh, hand-drawn, you will be gone. You're clearly outdated. Read my lips and come to grips with the reality. We must let go of the past since pencils are not meant to last. Say hello to the future with CG! So hand-drawn tends to pass on all of our profits. But stay calm, we will move on. Take it from me. We'll make the next CG star. We won't even need Pixar. Computers will make our films a real trip. They'll no longer take a terminal dip. Their assets golden. It has been chosen. Disney will be in 3D. Whoopee! So long. No more hand drawn. <laughs>
let's be honest, at some point in our lives, we have to change in order to adapt to our current times. As technology evolves and becomes more advanced, the best we can do is follow it so that we can keep ourselves up to date in order to have the best lifestyle for ourselves. This doesn't just apply to people, of course, but industries have to do the same in order to survive against the competition. In the animation field during the early 2000s, new technology was the biggest appeal for audiences as more computer animated features were being developed and dominating the box office. Pixar already made a strong first impression with Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., and Finding Nemo, but then other studios started to come out with their own CG films like Shrek, Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, and Ice Age, all of which came out as winners both critically and financially. Meanwhile, as Disney decided to be more adventurous, so to speak, with their animated features instead of their usual musicals, audiences started to lose interest in what they had to offer even to the point where their films were losing a significant amount of money, including a $74 million loss on Treasure Planet alone. They had times when they brought out something successful like Lilo and Stitch, but those times were very rare, and usually they end up getting easily overshadowed by the latest CG hit or by other major competitors. This was a wake-up call for Disney that they were no longer at the top of the industry and must adapt if they hoped to stay in the competition. As difficult of a decision it must have been, they had to sacrifice traditional hand-drawn animation in favor of producing their own computer animated features. And if it wasn't Atlantis or Treasure Planet that convinced them to do so, then the only movie that could to abandon hand-drawn was Home on the Range. Set in the humble dairy farm called Patch of Heaven, a new cow joins the family called Maggie, a former show cow coming in making a first big impression with an even bigger personality. But the patch found itself in danger when the farmer Pearl only has three days to pay the bank, or else they're going to take her farm away and sell it to the highest bidder. So after discovering that there is a cattle rustler named Alameda Slim with a bounty that is worth exactly the same amount as what Pearl owes the bank, it is up to Maggie and two other cows from the farm, Miss Calloway and Grace, to stop Slim from committing his cow crimes and capture him to take the bounty and save the farm. Straight after Pocahontas, director Mike Gabriel proposed an idea to the executives of a western-style movie called Sweating Bullets. In his original plan, it was like a western version of Captain Courageous where a timid cowboy enters a ghost town and confronts the spirit of an evil cattle rustler. Even with a simple concept like that, it was enough to impress then feature animation president Peter Schneider and the project headed immediately into production, where he went back in the director's chair with Mike Giamo as his co-director. Over the years, however, the story had to go through numerous of changes, especially regarding the lead who went from a kid, to a little bull named Bullets who wants to be more like a horse, to three cows on a bounty hunting mission to save their farm. The only element that remained in the final cut since the very beginning is the villainous cattle wrestler Slim, or more specifically, Alameda Slim. During that time, they were preparing themselves to immerse into the Western world, including doing a cattle drive in Wyoming for research and providing concept art that was more of an homage to some of the Disney cartoons of the 1940s and 1950s that would emphasize more the shapes and the colors of the characters and backgrounds. But then in 2000, the story was proven to be a little more problematic than they expected, and the only solution they had at that point was to change leadership, resulting in Gabriel and Giamo to leave the project. Shortly after, their jobs were filled by the Road to El Dorado director, Will Finn, who was supposed to be the supervising animator of Maggie, and John Sanford. After finishing his work on Hercules, Alan Menken signed on to the project to compose the music and have Glenn Slater to write the lyrics for the songs, who was brought in during the time that he was getting some prestigious awards like the Kleben Award for Lyrics and the ASCAP Richard Rogers New Horizons Award. Since then, they managed to create six new songs for the feature, with the first being Little Patch of Heaven written back in 1999. But of course, after the big switch of the story and the directors, they also had to change up the songs to fit the new narrative, including putting in Will the Sun Ever Shine Again that was written as a response to the attacks on September 11th, 2001. 
Initially, Maggie was meant to be an original member of the farm no different from Miss Calloway and Grace, but that was making the plot a bit tedious at times, so the executives miraculously let them update the character to become an outsider that is the newest member of Patch of Heaven. I say miraculously because they let them do the change when they were only one year left in production and they already had the first act almost fully animated. In fact, a keen eye could spot some scenes at the start of the film where Maggie was supposed to be before they turned her into a newcomer. While it was set to be released in 2003, Disney decided to switch its release with Brother Bear where it moved to April 2nd, 2004, mainly because, as I said before, the Bears were a better fit to promote on the Platinum Edition of the Lion King DVD. And when the herd headed its way to theaters, it was... not good. In fact, almost nothing went right for the three cows. While they didn't think it was the worst animated film out there, the critics thought that the movie was just weak. They believed maybe kids would enjoy it and the songs were nice, but everything else like the story and especially the comedy was some of Disney's worst. And speaking of Disney's worst, it was also one of their worst box office bombs by only making $50 million domestically and a worldwide total of $145.4 million. And considering that this was a pretty expensive feature to make with a budget of $110 million, it was guaranteed that the company had to make a write-off that was said to be up to $70 million. The only time Home on the Range ever appeared after it came out in theaters was a three-minute animated short release on the movie's DVD called A Dairy Tale, where Miss Calloway and the other animals on the farm tell the story of the three little pigs. Since then, the movie gained a reputation of being among the worst of Disney animation, mainly due to its quality being considered subpar compared to the other features the studio made over the years. In a way, it met a very unfortunate fate. It had the chance to stand out as a very rare breed of animated film that can be found in the Western genre, and regardless of what you may think of the picture, there was some heart put into it like from the animators who brought these characters and scenes to life, and from Mencken and Slater when making the songs. People may not be too wild about this Disney Western, but for the team that made it, it was a little moment they wouldn't forget in that little patch of heaven. <laughs> Like I said before, Disney had to eventually adapt to the new standards in the animation industry by producing their own computer animated features. They've had plenty of experience with CGI before to enhance their effects, backgrounds, and even putting it in the forefront by making CG dinosaurs and place them in live action environments, but it was time that they made an animated film that is 100% pure computer graphics with Chicken Little. It's about the title character Chicken Little an outcast hated by his town by making everyone panic for nothing because he believed that the sky was falling. But suddenly, one night after regaining his reputation by winning a baseball game, his worst fear finally happened when a piece of the sky did fall and crashed in his house. So with the help of his friends, Abby Millard, Runt of the Litter, and Fish Out of Water, they seek out to solve the mystery of this piece of sky and make an out-of-this-world discovery that will lead the kids to try to save their town. Back in 2001, the Emperor's New Groove director, Mark Dindal, had an idea to make a movie version of the classic folktale of the same name. While this wasn't the company's first time to tell the tale, since they did so by turning it into a World War II propaganda cartoon back in 1943, Dindal's version was completely different. His original idea was about a little girl who wanted to go to summer camp to ease her overreactions and save her relationship with her father, but later has to stop her evil camp counselor, planned to be voiced by Penn Gillette, in order to save her hometown. When proposed to Michael Eisner, he liked the idea, but it just needed one little change. Instead of a girl, Eisner wanted Chicken Little to be a boy because he argued that you're most likely to get picked on for being short if you're a boy. However, in early 2003, when David Staten came in as the new feature animation president, he wanted an even bigger change by redoing the whole story altogether. As a result, 
Dindal and several writers and crew members all spent about two and a half years to create a brand new plotline with new characters and more focus on the emotional aspects like the father-son relationship that included one new integral component, aliens. More specifically, the plot is now about Chicken Little trying to save his town from an alien invasion. Speaking of the chicken himself, he went through a whole list of celebrities to find the right voice that would convincingly sound like a teenager. When he was a girl, the directors thought about having Holly Hunter to be the voice. But after the sex change, they considered maybe Matthew Broderick, Michael J. Fox, or have Mark work with David Spade again. But ultimately, Zach Braff was proven to be the right choice. The same thing also happened to Abby, where Sean Hayes was considered when she was originally a boy. But then, after becoming a girl, they threw around many other potential voices like Jamie Lee Curtis, Jodie Foster, Gina Davis, Sarah Jessica Parker, Madonna, or still bring in Holly Hunter, but to be Abby instead. But at the end, the role was given to Joan Cusack. For their first full attempt to produce computer animation in an entire feature film, they aim to capture a cartoony style that is more reminiscent to the Disney cartoons like Goofy's from the 1940s and 1950s, where it features a good balance of fluidity and comedic slapstick with a strong use of squash and stretch. However, the CGI team they had was too small to work on a whole feature on their own. That's why half of the new team consisted of their 2D animators who had to take an 18-month crash course on animating with CG and using the software Maya. In a way, a good amount of the team had to relearn how to animate with these new tools and develop some new software in order to achieve the look that they were going for. Some of that software included the appropriately named Chicken Wire, which can manipulate the shape of the characters to get the right poses and facial expressions, Shelf Control, a program in Maya that helped the animators to have easier control of the CG models, Lumiere to give the lighting a boost and help refine the shadows, and a new software they made called XGen to create the textures for the animals, their clothes, and on nature like the leaves and grass. Originally set for a release of July 1st, 2005, Disney had to delay the movie by a few months to November 4th. The reason was because the movie that was meant to be released at that time, Pixar's Cars, had to be pushed back to June 9th, 2006 because analysts speculated that the animation studio there was bracing themselves for the uncertain future of their collaboration with Disney. More on that a little later. But back on to Chicken Little, on its release, it was the first movie to also come out in Disney Digital 3D, presented in around 84 enhanced theaters, which also makes this the first feature film in history to be presented in Digital 3D. And when Chicken Little showed up on the big screen, the movie turned out to be just like its title character during the opening. A complete embarrassment. <laughs> A movie. A movie. They're making a movie. When, when will everybody forget your big mistake? The critics did not hold back on their distaste for this movie. Some might have seen some of the appeal and the effort put into the feature, like with its animation and voice acting, but the rest, like the unorganized story, stale humor, the dysfunctional emotional core, and its attempts to be like other animated films at the time by implementing pop culture references and pop songs resulted in the feature to feel unpleasantly weak. However, when Chicken Little looks at how he did financially, all he could do is just look at those reviews and say, Who are we talking about? Despite receiving some of Disney Animation's worst reviews, it was also their biggest hit since Lilo and Stitch, making an impressive $135.4 million domestically and $314 million worldwide. It was also proven to be a home run on home media as well, where the movie sold 2.7 million DVD copies and grossed $142.6 million, with $48 million earned on its first week alone. It even managed to get some recognition at the Annie Awards by earning four nominations, but all those trophies went to Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Much like Home on the Range, it has gained a reputation of being the runt of Disney Animation's litter, with many fans deeming it as among their worst. 
but unlike Home on the Range, it was the financial success they needed to justify that they were still in the animation competition and that they too could provide some computer animated hits, which later on even helped Disney in more ways than just financially. In a time when Disney felt like the sky was falling for their animation division, it only took a little chicken to give Disney their biggest animated win in years. Definitely not a critical win, but still a win by making money fall from the sky. No, 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 no. Soon after the release of Chicken Little, the animation studio went through some significant changes that would completely reshape Disney animation. In fact, it would mark as a new chapter to help them recover after the set of box office bombs they've endured. However, this didn't just happen because of one quick executive decision, but rather, it's the result of one of the biggest shakeups in the history of the Walt Disney Company. Going back to the end of 2003, just after the release of Brother Bear, Roy E. Disney announced that he resigned from the company, and that he and Stanley Gold are reviving the Save Disney campaign to kick out Michael Eisner the same campaign that got rid of Ron Miller back in 1984. Roy argued that Eisner was spiraling out of control and is consequentially destroying the company from within. Sure, he had a few wins during the early 2000s, like with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, but everything else he did in almost every division was just a complete disaster. ABC was on the brink of collapsing in itself, the theme parks became a joke after the embarrassing opening of Disney's California Adventure and the never-ending failures of Disneyland Paris, and his mismanagement has caused the company to turn into a rapacious and soulless conglomerate. But possibly his worst offense for Roy was his poor handling of the animation division. As you could tell, their feature animation studio was bringing out more failures than successes and were consequentially losing a significant amount of money for the company. By 2004, after Brother Bear and Home on the Range, Disney decided to let go of hand-drawn animation due to the evolving landscape of the animation industry at the time and convert their studio to only produce computer animated films, taking their old traditional equipment and selling them away. Even just before that announcement, they also decided to drop their Florida studio, since they were in the process of shutting down their overseas studios like the one in France to have their Burbank studio be their only studio. As for their relationship with Pixar during that same year, a clash between Eisner and then Pixar CEO Steve Jobs resulted in the acclaimed animation house to not renew their deal and look elsewhere for distribution once their contract was over after the release of Cars. Disney, in response, opened up a new animation studio called Circle 7 Animation, which would have specialized in making sequels to the Pixar films like Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., and Finding Nemo. Under Eisner, it was becoming clear that he was bringing the company towards a downward spiral with relationships broken, earnings disappearing, and the brand name tarnished. But then, a year later, Roy's Save Disney campaign finally paid off. On March 13, 2005, after shareholders openly expressing their discontent with the CEO, Michael Eisner announced that he would resign on September 30th of that year. While Roy and Gold finished their campaign and returned to the company's board, Michael already had in mind one person to take his place. The former president of ABC that became Eisner's second-in-command and the president and chief operating officer at Disney, Robert Iger. When stepping in as the new CEO, one of the first things Bob noticed was how much of a mess the animation division had become and knew that one of his first major operations was bringing Pixar back to the Disney family. And so, on January 24, 2006, after long negotiations with Steve Jobs and thanks to the help of the financial success of Chicken Little, not only did Pixar return to Disney, but the company completely bought the studio for $7.4 billion, even closing down the short-lived Circle 7 as a symbol of their trust rekindled. As for Disney feature animation, Bob's solution was to get new leadership for the studio in the hopes that it would give it a boost. Since Pixar already had some renown and strong heads, Iger decided to have them lead both Pixar and Disney animation in their respective roles. There was Ed Catmull as the president, 
and John Lasseter as the chief creative officer. Together, they were determined to put Disney Animation back on its feet with the same attention and care that they were giving to Pixar, giving more creative control to the filmmakers instead of the executives, bringing back some of the big-name animators of the Disney Renaissance, creating a brain trust similar to Pixar's for the top creative heads to help with the development of their films, and rebooting morale at the studio along the way. It was almost like Ed and John made an entirely new studio at Disney, in fact, shortly afterwards, Lasseter renamed the place to mark the occasion from Walt Disney Feature Animation to Walt Disney Animation Studios. Lasseter also updated Disney Toon Studios to stop producing direct-to-video animated sequels and focus on creating more original content, resulting in the sequels of Pinocchio, The Aristocats, and Chicken Little to be cancelled. The ones that were far ahead in production, like Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time and The Little Mermaid Ariel's Beginning, were the final sequels the studio released. Oh, and uh, by the way, when I said that they would focus more on producing original content, I mean that they would literally just make spin-offs of Disney's existing properties like the Tinkerbell movies and the Planes films. Well, at least they're not sequels, I guess. But while all the changes were happening, the studio was still at work on another computer animated film, one that would initiate Disney Animation's new beginning and their new motivation to keep moving forward, Meet the Robinsons. It's about Lewis, an orphan who invented a memory scanner for the sake of seeing who his birth mother was and to know the reason why she left him at the orphanage. At the science fair, it turned out to be a complete failure, but it was actually sabotaged by a mysterious bowler hat guy. Soon afterwards, another kid named Wilbur appears in need of Lewis's help, since he and the bowler hat guy are actually from the future, and the guy is time traveling in order to take down Lewis. So after agreeing to go to the future with him, Lewis has to stick around with Wilbur's eccentric family, the Robinsons, in the meantime, while also uncovering the truth about the family and the bowler hat guy. The project all began when Disney bought the film rights to the book A Day with Wilbur Robinson by William Joyce, which he wrote it as a fictionalized biography that features over-the-top versions of Joyce's family members he grew up with. They planned this to be a live-action feature, but by 2004, the project ultimately got in the hands of the animation studio. As for the director, story supervisor and animator Steven Anderson knew that this movie had to be his directorial debut, since he felt a strong connection with Lewis as they were both adopted and both learned about moving forward with the family they have now instead of searching in the past to know who their birth parents were. Steven also took on the additional task of voicing the bowler hat guy. Pass off attention as my own. Check. Oh, I love checklists. When the project transitioned to animation, the new team didn't just get to it and start making a movie. They had to prove their worth that they could do it. So in a risky and experimental move, the crew not only had to write the script, but also storyboard the entire movie and present it to the executives to determine if the movie should be greenlit. Obviously, it did get approved, but that didn't mean that the movie they had would remain. Once Catmull and Lasseter became in charge of Disney Animation, John had an issue with the bowler hat guy where he found that, while funny, he wasn't really threatening as a villain. As a result, the team took 10 months to change more than half of the entire feature, including giving the film a new ending, adding a T-Rex to go after Lewis, and most importantly, give the guy an evil robot henchman that's also his bowler hat named Doris. Originally, the animation style was supposed to stay true to Joyce's illustrations in the book. However, Blue Sky Studios beat Disney to the punch in 2005 when they released Robots, where the author worked as a producer and production designer. And considering that the Robinsons have a Joyce-style robot of their own with Carl, it would not be a good look if Disney seemed like they were copying from another animation house. As a result, the animators could only take a bit of inspiration from his style, keeping that retro Technicolor theme, but also look elsewhere for their sources, including the Disney classics like Alice in Wonderland and Steve Jobs' other company, Apple. 
One major challenge for Disney with this film is that this is their first fully computer animated film that features humans, which requires a completely different set of animation skills than what they had for Chicken Little and Dinosaur. To help know how to get through it, they looked for inspiration with another animated feature and how they went through the task of making their first CG movie that mainly features humans, and that was Pixar's 2004 film, The Incredibles. When the movie was released on March 23, 2007, it also came out in digital 3D, which that version also featured the 1953 Donald Duck and Chip and Dale short that was already made in 3D, working for Peanuts. Between the original release and the Robinsons, the short was also presented at Disneyland and at Walt Disney World when accompanied with another 3D film, Magic Journeys. But back on to Meet the Robinsons, Lewis and Wilbur's time-traveling tale turned out to be... okay, I guess? Its release wasn't great, but I suppose they didn't count this as one of their big failures of the decade. Financially, it did decently well with a domestic gross of $97.8 million and a worldwide total of $169.3 million. Then again, it's rumored to have a seriously huge budget, so maybe the numbers are not a good thing. As for the reviews it got, they generally went alright with the critics. Some had a blast with it, others teared it to shreds, but usually they stated that they liked it enough to give it a pass. There was supposed to be a direct-to-video sequel to the film called Meet the Robinsons 2 First Date that was in the works even before the original came out, but after Lasseter stepped in and demanded that big update for Disney Toon Studios, the project was scrapped along with the other rejected sequels. For Disney, this is a movie that… exists. It did its job when it came out in theaters, but far from enough to make an impact like their classics, which is why they barely acknowledge its existence nowadays. But symbolically, this was the movie that represented Disney's new ideology. They stopped looking at the past to solve their problems and focus on moving ahead to explore new opportunities and endless possibilities. In the movie, they keep repeating the phrase, That was taken from a quote from Walt Disney himself, which is highlighted before the credits when it states, Around here, however, we don't look backwards for very long. We keep moving forward, opening up new doors and doing new things, because we're curious, and curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. <laughs> While the result did not turn out to be as stellar as the other Disney pictures, at least Meet the Robinsons production did go smoothly, even during one of Disney's biggest transitions. The same, however, cannot be said for the next film, as it went through a more hectic time making it, along with some creative clashes. But in the end, they still managed to deliver a movie with Bolt. It's the story of a dog named Bolt, who has an arsenal of superpowers that he uses to help his owner Penny take down the evil Dr. Calico. However, that is not the plot of this movie. That's what happens in the TV show that Bolt stars in. And yet, he doesn't even know that. He actually believes that literally everything that happens around him is real. When they made an episode where it ends with Penny getting kidnapped, Bolt runs off and accidentally ships himself from the studios of Hollywood to the streets of New York City. So once reality hits him that his powers are, uh, television exclusive, you could say, Bolt teams up with a sarcastic cat named Mittens and a hamster named Rhino that's also his biggest fan to travel across the country to go back to Hollywood and discover that who he is in the show may not actually be inaccurate. Before Bolt would call himself Bolt and being taken care of by a couple of new directors, he was just a simple American dog. In fact, the project began as a movie called American Dog that was written and directed by Lilo & Stitch creator Chris Sanders. In his original version, it was about a dog who has his own TV show named Henry, and regardless if he's on or off camera, he believes that everything that happens around him is real. 
But one day, he finds himself in the Nevada desert, and now has to team up with a one-eyed cat and a large radioactive bunny to find his way home. The production was going pretty well, but then came the new leads at Disney, and they had a few more words to give towards Sanders' film than they did for Meet the Robinsons. After a couple of screenings, John Lasseter and several other directors from both Disney and Pixar gave Chris a few notes in order to improve the feature. According to John, Sanders did not take the criticisms well, resulting him to clash with his critics in order to keep his ideas intact. Ultimately, when it was clear the movie would not go his way, Chris quit the studio and moved on to work at DreamWorks Animation. In his place, Lasseter put in two Disney veterans to make their directorial debut, writer Chris Williams and animator Byron Howard. Together, while still keeping the same concept, they made several altercations to improve the story, including making the starting point of the dog's journey from Nevada to New York have the one-eyed cat become a snarky alley cat, change the bunny into a hamster in a ball, voiced by story artist Mark Walton, and turn Henry into an American white shepherd named Bolt. The reason for that choice of breed was because their long years that generally point up make it easier for the animators to play around with so that the character can be more expressive. However, while the duo was set to make their movie, there was one major catch that would intensify the production. They only had 18 months to produce the feature, so they had to act quickly. On a side note, this was the last film to feature inside the actor's studio host James Lipton, who played the voice of the director. But even with that limited time, that wouldn't stop them from being more experimental with their animation. To bring some of the Disney traditions to CG, art director Paul Felix got the idea of giving the environments a more painterly look, as if the 3D characters are in front of a handmade painted background. It took them several tests to get the look right, and the team developed a new software that is similar to Deep Canvas where they could add brush strokes to 3D models like on the buildings, resulting in a style that they were quite satisfied with where the areas around Bolt are reminiscent to the works of American painters, rather it be to present the large busy streets of New York or the natural areas of Ohio. They also developed a software to animate the leash that kept Bolt and Mittens together, which proved to be quite a challenge for the animators. When Bolt began his journey to the big screen on November 21st, 2008, it had been years since Disney made quite an impactful bark like this, receiving some of their best reviews in a long time where critics felt like even with a not-so-original story, it more than makes up for it with its great animation, strong characters, and memorable moments of action, comedy, and heart. Also, later on, Bolt helped Disney Animation to prominently return as a competitor during award season, where it received several nominations like an Oscar, a Golden Globe, an Annie, three Visual Effects Society awards, and more, mainly for Best Animated Feature and an extra Golden Globe nomination for Best Original Song with I Thought I Lost You. But the movie didn't win any of them, losing mostly to Pixar's WALL-E. At the box office, while it had some tough competition like Twilight and Quantum of Solace, it did do well for itself, earning $114.1 million domestically and $310 million worldwide. The movie also had a major financial boost from home media sales, which also included the exclusive spin-off short Super Rhino, where in 2009, Bold managed to sell more than 4.6 million copies. With the reception the movie received, was both the moment that Disney Animation finally made a comeback? Not really. Bolt did perform well when it was in theaters, but it did not make the same cultural impact as the more notable Disney features. However, the movie is often noted to be the step in the right direction for what was to come. Under the new leadership at both the company and the animation studio, Disney was all set to rebuild their animation division to become bigger and better, armed with new technology to tell stories that only they know how to do them best with their traditional formula and bringing audiences to worlds they've never seen before to meet unforgettable characters they've yet to meet. Did Bolt start a new age of Disney animation? No, but they were almost there.
There are very few moments in Disney's history that are considered the definitive point that started a new era for the company that would forever change the way they manage their business. One of the most recent examples was back near the end of 2005, when Michael Eisner stepped down as CEO and gave his leadership position to his then second-in-command, Bob Iger. When he became in charge, the first issue Iger noticed that needed to be resolved was the company's animation division. Their main studio's movies were losing a lot of money like Treasure Planet and Home on the Range. They had to close down all their other studios outside of California to just focus on producing computer animated features. And Pixar was ready to leave Disney after failing to make a good deal with Eisner. However, there was a solution that could fix most of Disney's animation problems. Not only did Bob completely bought out Pixar for $7.4 billion, but he made the heads at Pixar be also the heads at Disney Animation as well. Or should I now say, Walt Disney Animation Studios. The plan was to hopefully bring that same creative expertise and high morale that was in Pixar onto Disney, so that they could get back to making acclaimed animated movies. While the results were not immediate, it did start to show that it was working after the success of Bolt. But for how long could this plan work? Yes, you could get a few wins here and there, but would this be enough to surely put Disney back on top of the animation competition? Well, the only way to find out was to bring the studio back to its roots, back to adapting a classic fairy tale and giving that beloved Disney touch with traditional animation, which was exactly what they did by turning the Frog Prince into the Princess and the Frog. It's the story of Tiana, a waitress working in New Orleans nonstop to make her dream come true of opening her own restaurant. But just when those dreams seem to be dashed, a talking frog, who is actually the carefree Prince Naveen of Maldonia, asked Tiana to give him a kiss in the hopes to turn back into a human. Not only did it not work, but it completely backfired where now Tiana is a frog as well. So with the help of some new friends they meet along their journey, like a trumpet-playing alligator named Louis, Ray the Firefly, and a voodoo witch named Mama Odie, Tiana and Naveen go around the bayou to find out the secret of how to turn back into a human while avoiding the shadow man that turned Naveen into a frog in the first place, Dr. Facilier. When Ed Catmull and John Lasseter came in to lead Disney Animation as president and chief creative officer respectively, the first thing they wanted to fix was to reverse that decision of ending hand-drawn animation from a few years prior. In fact, they brought back many of the leading animators from Disney's Renaissance era to return to the studio like Andreas Dejia, Eric Goldberg, Bruce W. Smith, and the directing duo John Musker and Ron Clements. For those two, Lasseter wanted them to direct another feature with the story and medium of their choosing, and they knew that what Disney needed the most at the time was another traditionally animated Broadway-style fairy tale musical. The plan was to take two similar projects that both Disney and Pixar were making and combine them together in order to have their own interpretation of the Brothers Grimm's The Frog Prince. But of course, they would make this a little more different than the fairy tale people knew, including changing the setting from the usual Europe to New Orleans, and for the first time ever, feature a black Disney princess. And so Disney officially revealed their project as the Frog Princess during their shareholders meeting in 2007, revealing some early concepts of what this film could potentially be and people reacted the same way as they would to an alligator crashing a party on a riverboat. It didn't end well. Of course, there's nothing wrong with making an animated fairy tale movie starring African Americans, but the problem 
problem was how those African Americans would have been displayed in the movie. Here's the thing. They wanted to make an adaptation of the Frog Prince where the leading people of color turn into frogs. Not to mention that the title of The Frog Princess could count as a slur to the French. Speaking of which, the princess of the story was a chambermaid named Maddie, and her prince wasn't even black, while the villain is an evil witch doctor that uses voodoo. That, and the fact that they announced that it would be set in New Orleans not long after Hurricane Katrina, which resulted in most of the city's black residents to abandon their homes. Yeah, this concept needed some revisions. While not all of the criticisms were addressed and updated, Disney did change some of the more problematic elements a few months later, including turning the chambermaid Maddie into a waitress named Tiana and giving the movie a new title as The Princess and the Frog. They also brought in Oprah Winfrey to be a consultant of the film and be the voice of Tiana's mother, Eudora. He used to go on and on about this old sugar mill too. Baby Cakes, I'm sure this place is going to be just wonderful, but it's a shame you're working so hard. While faithfully adapting a fairy tale was never much of a concern for Disney, the team's goal with the movie was to take the well-known fable and make enough significant changes to make it feel like a brand new American story, yet still have the classic elements to feel like a fairy tale. The Kingdom takes the form of early 20th century New Orleans to keep that sense of magic while having this feel more like an American story and giving the movie a central theme. The Handsome Prince is what the filmmakers described as a knuckle-headed playboy. There's a fairy godmother who's actually the nearly 200-year-old voodoo queen of the bayou. The evil sorcerer is a witch doctor that also uses voodoo. The leading princess is a hard-working independent woman that was inspired by her voice actress Anika Noni Rose and renowned New Orleans restaurateur Leah Chase, and the love angle was given a deeper message of the perfect balance of finding someone to help discover what they truly need in order to find what they want in life. When the directors decided to go back to hand-drawn, the team at Disney were committed to bring it back in a way that really emphasized that the classic Disney style has finally returned. And when I say the classic style, I mean the ones that were heavily influenced by the craftsmanship of movies like Bambi, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, and 101 Dalmatians, where the artists and animators were not looking for realism, but instead to create a stylized look that could capture the feeling of what they wanted to present. This also applied to the designs of the characters and their movements, even bringing back the strong use of live-action references for the eccentric dancing sequences choreographed by Betsy Beidos. A good example of style over realism is with the frog forms of the leads, where they originally looked more like real frogs. Since frogs aren't necessarily the most attractive-looking creatures... That's what you think, buddy. Oh yeah, work it frog, work it! Strike that pose, oh yeah! They had to resort to a similar tactic used when the old animators had to design Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio, where they only used minor aesthetics of the animal, like the shapes, so that audiences would believe that they are frogs mainly because they say so. Considering that it had been a while since they actually used the software, they couldn't just dust off the old cap system to animate with that again. Instead, they had to get a more modern version of Caps called Toon Boom Harmony, which the animators first tested out by creating the 2007 Goofy short How to Hook Up Your Home Theater. The only time Toon Boom wasn't used in the movie was for the Almost There number, where the Art Deco style was achieved using the Adobe software Photoshop and After Effects. Photoshop was also used in order to develop the backgrounds along with Maya to make 3D models of the buildings as references for the artists. For the music, John Lasseter knew exactly the man that would be perfect to bring that essential component of New Orleans onto the feature. The man who was raised in that city and the longtime Pixar composer, Randy Newman where he mixed genres that define the music of the city like jazz, gospel, zydeco, and have singer Dr. John sing the opening number down in New Orleans. As Disney was preparing to hype up the movie at the parks, they were ready to release the feature on Christmas Day 2009. 
However, they had to move that earlier to December 11th in order to avoid direct competition with Alvin and the Chipmunks the Squeakquel. And as audiences dug a little deeper to see Disney's hand-drawn comeback for themselves, the return was a success. Uh, kind of. Well, at least with the critics it was. They found that it did brought back the classic Disney that everyone knows and loves, even if it might not be up to the same standards as some of the legends from the 1990s. But at the box office, that was where it performed only decently, making just $104.4 million domestically and $267 million worldwide. Definitely more than the recent failures they had, and Disney did consider it a success, but for the amount of hype they built up for this, it could have done much better, and there are two theories that explain why its performance was weaker than expected. One was because of the heavy amount of competition it had to face at the time, especially when it was up against the box office behemoth James Cameron's Avatar. And two was because of the title itself, specifically that it has the word princess on it, making the public believe that this movie's target audience would primarily be for little girls, despite the feature actually having an appeal for people of all ages and genders. As a result, most of Disney's animated films that follow contain a simple title that's gender neutral. However, despite the unimpressive results of its initial release, Tiana's impact with her movie turned out to be far greater than most Disney animated films released during that time. While not prominent in theaters, it definitely made a big name for itself during award season, collecting numerous of nominations and wins, including a Grammy nomination for Best Song Written for Visual Media with Down in New Orleans, a Golden Globe nomination for Best Animated Feature, three Oscar nominations for Best Animated Feature, and two for Best Song with Almost There and Down in New Orleans, and eight Annie nominations three of which won for Best Animated Effects, Best Character Animation for Eric Goldberg's work on Lewis, and Best Voice Acting for Jennifer Cody's performance as Charlotte. And as time moved on, the movie's popularity gradually climbed up to where the status is now ranked among the Disney classics, where Tiana is often considered as one of the most inspirational and strongest of the Disney princesses, and even Dr. Facilia is considered as one of the most memorable Disney villains. But most importantly, the reason why The Princess and the Frog grew into a beloved Disney favorite is because it offers something that is still considered very rare to find in an animated film. Black representation. Sure, Disney had people of color before, like Middle Easterns, Native Americans, and Asians, but for the first time, black audiences can watch an animated film and see for themselves that Disney magic can happen to them too. It is still a very well-crafted movie that anyone can enjoy, but especially for the black community, this feature has a special place in their hearts, and that it is their proof that dreams do come true in New Orleans. As Disney returned to bringing to life old fairy tales after more than a decade thanks to the new leadership, this opened the door to other features that were once abandoned, but now could earn a second chance to come out of its drawing board tower and present to the public its true potential. Which was exactly the case with a passion project that turned the story of Rapunzel into Disney's 50th animated feature, Tangled. It's about a young girl named Rapunzel, a princess who was kidnapped when she was a baby by Mother Gothel, who has ridiculously long hair with the power to heal and make people young again. On the eve of her 18th birthday, she managed to capture a thief in her tower called Flynn Rider, real name Eugene Fitzherbert, to which she made a deal with. She will accept to let him go and give him back the crown he stole from the kingdom, but only if he helps her live her dream by leaving the tower and see the sky lanterns up close that light up every year on her birthday. So now Flynn and Rapunzel head out to the kingdom to live her dream, all while Mother Gothel secretly knows that she's breaking her rules and do what she can to keep her royal identity remain hidden. The idea for this feature started all the way back in 1996, when animator Glenn Keane had an idea to adapt the story of Rapunzel while he was working on Tarzan. 
Five years later, he finally pitched it to then-CEO Michael Eisner, and he was happy to approve it. But on one condition. It had to be entirely computer animated. Keen wasn't sure if it would be possible to pull off his idea in CG, but he was up to the task. Which then was put on production as Rapunzel Unbraided, set for a release in the summer of 2007. However, just as it was prepared to get things started, it was already setting off some creative clashes. On one hand, Glenn wanted to stay true to the source material in order to bring out the heart of the story. Michael, on the other hand, wanted a more Shrek-style movie where a girl from modern-day San Francisco gets transported into the fairy tale world. To Keen's credit, he did try to create Eisner's version, but he just couldn't make it work. And in early 2006, the project was scrapped. But as luck would have it, the new heads came to Disney just a week later and quickly put the project back in production. At that point, due to the previous issues, the movie was delayed to 2009, and the year after it got picked up again, story artist Dean Wellens joined Glenn as the director. However, on October of 2008, there had to be a switch. The directors agreed to step down due to their own reasons. Wellens committed to work on other projects, while Keen needed time to heal after having a heart attack during that year. In his place, Keen brought on board Byron Howard and Nathan Gretto straight after they finished their work on Bolt as director and storyboard director respectively. However, that didn't necessarily mean that Glenn was out of the project for good. He still wanted to be involved, especially on the visuals, which was why Keen still worked on the Rapunzel movie as an executive producer and as an animation supervisor. But even if he was no longer the director, he still had to take charge in one of the movie's most difficult tasks. Originally planned to be a 2D animated film, it took time for Keen and his team to debate and weigh in on both the pros and cons of hand-drawn and computer since the latter was the only way for the executives to let them make this. And ultimately, they agreed on a plan to make the most with 3D while still keeping the core elements of Disney animation. Their goal was to implement the philosophies and aesthetics of the medium explained in Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston's book, The Illusion of Life, while giving the feature a style that is reminiscent to the 18th century Jean-Honoré Fragorin oil painting, The Swing. But before they could even open their computers and start animating, they had to settle on a good design for their characters first. As each was their own challenge to find the look that would suit them best, the most difficult of them all to find their perfect design was Flynn Rider. And no, it's not for the reason you may think. They just can't get my nose right. In order to establish Flynn's look, Around 30 female employees at the studio all got together in what was known as the Hot Man Meeting, where they discussed, analyzed, and judged to what could possibly be the most attractive male lead to ever appear in a Disney film. After going through hundreds of drawings, celebrity comparisons, and breaking the spirits of their male co-workers by indirectly saying that some of their physical features are not attractive, they finally settled with the one design that ultimately became Eugene. As they adapted the Disney traditions of animation onto computer graphics, they also faced some unique challenges, especially with Rapunzel's signature hair. As it turned out, handling her 70-foot-long blonde hair that features over 100,000 individual strands was actually as difficult as handling a real head of 70-foot-long hair. This was why they brought in the help of software engineer Kelly Ward to help the animators understand the properties of hair like how it moves and how it reflects on the light, along with assisting on the development of new software that helped give artists more control over Rapunzel's hair. The movie also tested the limits of the technology Disney had by maximizing the amount of elements they could feature in one scene, including having 45,000 lanterns for the I See the Light sequence and breaking the Hunchback of Notre Dame's record for the biggest crowd in a Disney animated film with over 3,000 people in the village. For the music, Alan Menken was reunited with Glenn Slater to create the songs that tried to blend folk rock from the 1960s and medieval music. 
Some of the numbers were completely different from what they became in the final film, including When Will My Life Begin going through five to six different versions with one that was called What More Could I Ever Needed and a love song called You Are My Forever that was meant to be sung by Mother Gothel and later by Eugene in a reprise changed and was split into two with Mother Knows Best and I See the Light. After the lukewarm financial reception of The Princess and the Frog, Disney wanted to make sure that the title mistake would never happen again. So in the case of Rapunzel Unbraided, later titled to just Rapunzel, the studio took a step back from highlighting the princess of the feature, switching the title from Rapunzel to the more gender-neutral Tangled. The result caused quite a backlash, with many accusing Disney of sexism for hiding its female star. However, Disney, the directors, and the heads of animation defended this decision, stating that the movie was not just about Rapunzel. Removing the gender orientation in the title was meant to highlight that it's both Rapunzel and Flynn Rider's movie. With its ambitious technological achievement and long years of development, as of 2020, the movie holds the record for being the most expensive animated feature to make, with an estimated budget of a jaw-dropping $260 million! And when Rapunzel's movie life began on November 24th, 2010, all those years, all that money, all the drama with the name change, and all that hair really paid off. It was Disney's biggest animated hit since The Lion King, performing amazingly at the box office with $200.8 million domestically and a worldwide total of $592.5 million, where it even broke some records in several countries along the way. As for the critics, they were giving it some great praise, especially with how Disney's signature strong storytelling and beautifully crafted animation has returned with full force and brought into the realm of computer graphics. Maybe they didn't like everything about the movie, like the songs were not among Menken's best, but they still had a lot of fun with the film nonetheless. In fact, Time loved it so much that they even put it among their list of the 25 greatest animated films. Tangled even received several nominations, mostly for Best Animated Feature and for the song I See the Light, including an Oscar, two Annies, two Golden Globes, and two Grammys, winning one of them in the latter for Best Song Written for Visual Media with I See the Light. While it never received a legitimate feature-length sequel, even if the executives were really desperate for one, the movie did turn into a prominent franchise with several new stories and adaptations that expand the world of Tangled. There was a short called Tangled Ever After that appeared before the 3D screening of Beauty and the Beast, which presents how Maximus and Pascal go all around the kingdom to retrieve the ring for Rapunzel and Eugene's wedding, a stage adaptation at the Disney Cruise Line with three new songs, a level entirely themed to the movie in Kingdom Hearts 3, and an animated series called Rapunzel's Tangled Adventures, or just Tangled the Series when it was on its first season. What started with the TV movie Tangled Before Ever After, it grew into a five-time Daytime Emmy award-winning show with three seasons and 60 episodes, featuring some of the cast from the movie reprising their roles like Mandy Moore and Zachary Levi, along with Alan Menken and Glenn Slater providing new songs and music. One of them, Waiting in the Wings, received the Emmy Alan needed to achieve his EGOT status. After numerous of attempts in the past, Tangled was the movie that truly brought Disney into the realm of computer animation. While the technology made to craft the feature was fresh, new, and often innovative, the movie's core remained true to the classic Disney traditions with a story filled with great action, humor, and romance, unforgettable songs, and characters that millions of people around the world can connect with. It was the movie that set a new standard for the studio as it entered the 2010 decade, where in the era that CG was dominating the industry, Disney was capable of making both critically and financially successful pictures that could be considered among the top standards of animated entertainment. In other words, Disney at last saw the light. The next year, Disney decided to not just go back to hand-drawn, 
but also to return to a beloved place the studio created 45 years prior. Considering that the company could no longer make any more of those direct-to-home media sequels, it was up to the team at Walt Disney Animation Studios to continue the legacy of Winnie the Pooh. The movie presents three different stories that are simultaneously happening and crossing over each other in the Hundred Acre Woods. The first presents Pooh being very hungry, looking everywhere to find honey. The second is about Eeyore who lost his tail. Since nobody knows where it went, Christopher Robin holds a contest for the best replacement for Eeyore's tail, with the winner receiving a pot of honey. And finally, the gang discovers a note from Christopher saying that he went out to school and that he will be back soon. Considering that nobody in the woods knows how to read, Owl misinterpreted the letter that Christopher Robin was kidnapped by an evil monster called the Baxin, and they all get together and prepare to catch it and rescue their dear friend. It all started back at the end of 2008, when John Lasseter wanted the studio to make a new movie that would be released in theaters featuring the beloved A.A. Milne characters. Technically, the franchise had no shortage of theatrically released Pooh movies at the time, but since Lasseter ordered Disney Toon Studios to stop producing any sequels and just focus on spin-offs like Tinkerbell, the only option Pooh had left for more movies was to go to the main studio. With Meet the Robinsons director Steven Anderson and story artist Don Hall taking the helm, they used all the help they could get to have a true understanding of what makes the stories and the characters so timeless and charming, including a research trip to the real Hundred Acre Woods in Ashdown Forest, watching all the Pooh content Disney produced, and even brought in one of the key animators of Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, Bernie Madison, to be the lead storyboard artist and have him convince the executives to make the project a feature film instead of a short. Originally, the movie would have featured more stories from the A.A. Milne books with five going on at the same time. However, the team had to ultimately cut it down to three. One of them that almost got in the final cut would have involved Rabbit's friends and family. As the team tried to stay true to the heart of the source material and the iconic Disney brand, including bringing back prolific voice actor Jim Cummings to reprise his roles of Pooh and Tigger and Travis Oates returning as Piglet, they also wanted to give the movie a fresh twist with the help of some notable actors that helped give some comedy that was new to the franchise while keeping the integrity of the characters they played. These include John Cleese as the narrator, Craig Ferguson as Owl, Tom Kenny as Rabbit, and animation veteran Bud Lucky as Eeyore. Even for the animators, the characters were supervised by Disney's most elite traditional animators, like Mark Henn worked on Pooh and Christopher Robin, Andreas Deja did Tigger, Bruce W. Smith drew Piglet, Kanga, and Rue, Randy Haycock did Eeyore, Dale Bayer worked on Owl, and Eric Goldberg was in charge of Rabbit and the Baxin. One task that the directors knew was going to be tough was to find the right songwriters that could create something that would be in the leg of what the Sherman Brothers did in the original featurettes. It took a bit of a search, but after hearing their demo, they knew that there was something special in Robert and Kristen Anderson Lopez, the songwriting couple that previously worked with Disney on the songs for the Animal Kingdom stage musical adaptation of Finding Nemo. Funny enough, they were able to create the seven songs for the feature when they were at their worst state, mainly due to the fact that they could never have sleep because of their then newborn daughter Annie, along with trying to work while they were on a vacation from hell on Fire Island. This even helped out when writing the lyrics for the Baxen song. They break your crayons. They spill you. They wake up babies at one and three. This moment is also very fitting because Kristen also provided the voice of Kanga. At the same time, Zoe Deschanel also helped out with the music, writing the end credits song So Long and performed a cover of the original Winnie the Pooh song with her music partner M. Ward. On its release of July 15, 2011, it was accompanied by an original animated short called The Ballad of Nessie. However, in some countries, instead of Nessie, they had the episode Cubby's Goldfish from Jake and the Neverland Pirates. But when it came to Pooh's return to Disney's main animation studio, the critics had a great time with it. 
In fact, they were loving almost everything about it from the writing, to the voice acting, to the animation, to the musical numbers, stating that it was a very nice and heartfelt contrast to the usual energetic computer animated films and effects filled blockbusters that were common at the time. The only thing that they complained about was that it was too short with a running time of just under 70 minutes. It even received a few nominations later on, including 8 Annie nominations and winning one of them for Best Storyboarding. At the box office on the other hand, there was no amount of honey that could help make this even close to being considered a success. Despite having a relatively low budget of $30 million, it was only able to collect $26.7 million domestically and $50.1 million worldwide. And this was mainly, or debatably, all because it was released at the same time as Harry Potter. But not just against any Harry Potter film, it was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, the last movie of the series, giving the public the most difficult decision of their movie-going lives. In the summer of 2011, they had to pick either the grand finale of the 10-year saga, where the boy wizard and his fellow students at Hogwarts face off against Lord Voldemort and his Legion of Death Eaters in the ultimate battle of good and evil wizardry. Or they could watch Pooh and Fred's fight yours too! Come on, everybody! Let's see what funny things we can put on Eeyore's butt to make it seem like a tail. And who knows, maybe Pooh might find some honey along the way. Oh, let me tell ya, that summer was filled with tough decisions like this. But in all seriousness, the fact that this movie made over 10 times less than the last film was just downright embarrassing. Disney's original plan was to release a 2D animated feature once every two years. But partly due to Pooh's failure, the idea, while admirable, was ultimately scrapped. However, that wouldn't stop Disney from continuing the Winnie the Pooh legacy. In 2018, they released a live-action feature based on the classic characters called Christopher Robin, where Ewan McGregor played an adult version of the title character that focuses on his job a lot more than his family who suddenly reunites with his old friends and return to the Hundred Acre Woods to reconnect with his inner child and remind him about what matters most. And just like before, the movie brought back Jim Cummings to voice Pooh and Tigger. The result actually turned out to be pleasant for Disney, and much better than the 2011 film by receiving some good reviews, $197.7 million at the box office, and an Oscar nomination for Best Visual Effects. In a way, Pooh's return to the studio that made him an animation icon was both for the best and for the worst. It unfortunately played a significant role in Disney quitting their attempt to maintaining hand-drawn animation in the mainstream and made a fool out of themselves thinking that Winnie the Pooh could even compete against the last Harry Potter movie. But at the end of the day, they still created a charming feature that stayed true to the heart of the franchise and given a lot of love from their best artists and animators, along with making new friends that would later help them create bigger magic than anyone could ever imagine. And, at least for our story here, it is time to close the book on Winnie the Pooh, where one day, Disney will open it up again for a new generation to tell more stories with that silly old bear. While Disney Animation returned to becoming the studio that the public knew and loved by producing their own version of classic fairy tales and bringing back beloved characters like Winnie the Pooh, they never let go of their experimental side to bring their storytelling and animation skills to new levels that they've never tested before. In the case of their next feature, they would enter a realm that would seem like the opposite of their traditional timeless fantasy in the world of contemporary video games with Wreck-It Ralph. It's the story of Wreck-It Ralph, the bad guy of the classic arcade game Fix-It Felix Jr., who is tired of being viewed as the villain that everyone resents both in and out of his own game. So to prove them wrong and show that he deserves to be treated with respect, 
he sneaks out to a more modern game called Hero's Duty to grab a medal, which in his game is a symbol rewarded to those who did a good deed like beating level. He may have gotten the medal, but it didn't go as well as planned, since he then lost it at a racing game called Sugar Rush. Now with the help of a glitched out character named Vanellope Von Schweetz, Ralph helps her get into the race so that he could get his medal back before he indirectly wrecks Sugar Rush and his own game. For a while, Disney always wanted to try to create a movie themed to video games. In fact, it had been since the late 1990s that they had developed concept for a movie called either High Score or Joe Jump. But it never got off the ground because executives believed that there was something missing with its main character. Something that would make audiences invested to join them on their big adventure. It wouldn't be until years later when John Lasseter was interested in developing a video game movie. One that wouldn't need to be chained to the Disney style and focus more on having its own identity. And John knew the perfect outsider to help bring this movie to life. For the director, he hired television animation veteran Rich Moore, who previously directed some acclaimed episodes which Lasseter highly admired from shows like The Critic, Futurama, and The Simpsons. After teaming up with writers Jennifer Lee, Jim Reardon, and Phil Johnston, they all created the plot of a video game character leaving his game to find a greater purpose. But there were still a few things that they needed to change in order for the story to be better. One was to find a new lead. It originally starred Fix-It Felix Jr., who didn't want to be a part of the fixing family business and leave his game to find a place where he can feel like he can belong. However, when they started to create the villain called Wreck-It Ralph that was this garbage-throwing beast-like brute, they realized that there was a lot more potential with him than on Felix, and decided to change up the script so that it would be more about Ralph. Another update they had to make was removing a scene that was set in a game called Extreme Easy Living 2, a social media game in the style of The Sims and Grand Theft Auto. While the scene was mapped out and storyboarded, they had a hard time to figure out how they could fit that game in the arcade world, so they ultimately had to scrap it, even if removing it was a tough decision for them. However, while they had the basics settled, there was another component they had to add that would be another star element of the film. The cameos. Just like how Who Framed Roger Rabbit was for cartoons and how Toy Story was for toys, they wanted to fill the world of the feature with recognizable video game characters in order to help make the gaming world feel more believable. These games where their characters appear in Wreck-It Ralph include Street Fighter, Sonic the Hedgehog, Altered Beast, Pac-Man, Mortal Kombat, sort of, but not really, Dance Dance Revolution, Burger Time, Tapper, Paperboy, Pong, Dig Dug, Frogger, Kix, Hubert, and that doesn't even count all the little references. But even with the large quantity of familiar faces, not everyone they wanted to get ended up in the final film. According to some screenshots, Dr. Wily from Mega Man was supposed to be a part of the Bad Anon meeting, but ended up getting cut. And there were rumors suggesting that Mario and Luigi didn't make it because Nintendo was charging too much for their license, which was why they could only include Bowser. In actuality, Disney did have the chance to have Mario in, but they decided not to because they couldn't find a way to include him in a scene where his appearance wouldn't take the attention away from the story, and ended up only mentioning him by name. Oh, I'll bet that's Mario. Fashionably late, per the norm. I'm sure many gamers are disappointed to hear about that, but hey, look on the bright side. At least the movie got Skrillex. He's not a gaming character, but he's there for some reason. But not all the characters were made to be video game oriented. In the case of King Candy, his voice and animation style were inspired by the performance of Ed Wynn as the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. Of course not! <laughs> this is an unbirthday party! Ah, you wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? <laughs> You hit a guy with glasses, that's, that's well played. <gasps> when creating the world of the individual games, the animators were given a specific shape to focus on in order to help make them. On Fix-It Felix Jr., as a retro 8-bit game, 
There is a big theme of squares while keeping the design simple. Also, with the exception of Ralph and Felix, the characters can only move on a grid to maintain that 8-bit style motion, meaning that never once could they make a diagonal pose. For Hero's Duty, the point is to make the area an unpleasant Halo-style place that's highly dangerous, and even wearing some massive armor could only barely get you out alive if you're lucky. Which was why the animators focus on triangles to make everything seem sharp and nowhere can be considered safe. And finally, for Sugar Rush, as it is a candy-themed racing game, Circles were the way to go to make the environment look pleasant, welcoming, and vibrantly colorful, even taking inspiration from the architecture of Antoni Gaudi. Also, to additionally help them create the backgrounds of Sugar Rush, visual development artist Brittany Lee created a model of the world made out of candy and cookies, along with the team studying a lot of candy to understand how they can work in the world. They even created new software for the light to correctly reflect upon the many different types of candy in the environment. As Disney was marketing the feature in a similar style of a game like promoting it at E3, they were ready to press start on November 2nd, 2012, where it was accompanied with the animated short Paper Man. And that film alone gathered massive praise and even won the Oscar and the Annie for Best Animated Short making it Disney's first Academy Award for that category since 1969. And best of all, some of that praise even went to Wreck-It Ralph. The critics were highly enjoying the feature, saying that while the recognizable cameos are fun, it was the originality of Ralph's adventure that made the movie awesome for everyone. It was also a solid hit at the box office, earning a domestic gross of $189.4 million and a worldwide total of $471.2 million. Ralph was also a smash during award season, where it got several wins and nominations along the way like an Oscar and a Golden Globe nomination for Best Animated Feature, 10 Annie nominations, winning half of them for Best Music, Best Voice Acting for Alan Tudyk's performance as King Candy, Best Writing, Best Directing, and Best Animated Feature. And it even got some recognition on IGN's Best of 2012 awards, where it got five nominations and winning two of them for Best Animated Feature and People's Choice for Best Animated Feature. But of course, as a video game inspired movie, Ralph also got himself in several video games, and I don't just mean his own tie-in game. Disney made a playable version of Fix-It Felix Jr., including actual arcade cabinets like in the movie, online and mobile video games, and being a playable character in Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, Disney Infinity, and Disney Crossroads. They even made a mockumentary-style parody of The King of Kong called Garland Hulse Where Potentials Live in order to promote the home media release. After already establishing that they have returned with their traditional timeless formula and proving that they were still capable of creating movies that could be among the ranks of their classics, Wreck-It Ralph presented that Disney finally got their experimental side right, where they could explore more contemporary concepts and earn great results that make them a worthy addition to Disney's animation collection. Disney was off to a great start in the 2010 decade, but little did they know that the best was yet to come. Queen Elsa of Arendelle. At long last, the Disney animation that 
everyone knew and loved from either the days of Walt or from the 1990s finally came back. The result of Bob Iger's plan of having the leaders of Pixar also lead Disney's animation studio started to fully pay off, where not only were the movies themselves receiving more praise from critics and audiences as it brought back Disney's traditional formula, but they were also becoming financially successful, where for the first time in years, Disney animation went back to the top at the box office. Sure, it took some time for The Princess and the Frog to be considered a Disney classic, but once Tangled made its debut, that was when they finally got the perfect recipe of combining their timeless storytelling with new CG technology capable of making fresh classics for the modern era. Oh, and on top of that, Disney also cracked the code with their more experimental side, as they created a more contemporary non-musical feature with Wreck-It Ralph, and that turned out to be another great hit. But when it comes to their next film, Nobody, not even the people at Disney, would ever expect the cultural impact it would make. This wouldn't just be another animated movie to add in their collection, but rather a global phenomenon that could even surpass the achievements of the Lion King. And who better to overthrow the king than a queen? A queen who unleashed her unforgettable ice powers in Frozen. It's the story of the two princesses of Arendelle, Anna and Elsa, who had to be secluded from one another due to the latter's ice powers that she didn't fully know how to control. After their parents tragically died when they became adults, this left Elsa to become the new queen of the kingdom, opening its gates for the first time in years to the public to witness her coronation. However, after a bad confrontation with her sister, her ice powers get exposed and Elsa runs away from her own kingdom, resulting in Arendelle to be in a snowstorm during the middle of summer. Now Anna heads off and teams up with an ice harvester named Kristoff with his reindeer Sven and a talking snowman named Olaf to find Elsa and stop the storm so she could come back home. Out of all the movies made by Walt Disney Animation Studios, this was the one that took them the longest to bring to life after numerous of failed attempts over the course of more than 70 years. If you've been following the story of Disney Animation's history, then you may remember when Walt wanted to develop a biography of Hans Christian Andersen during the late 1930s and early 1940s, where he planned to collaborate with MGM where Disney would provide a set of cartoons based on Andersen's fairy tales, including the Snow Queen. While there was some debate if Walt and the gang could pull off turning that story into an animated short, the entire Hans Christian Andersen project had to be shelved due to the company placing all of its focus on making World War II films. On a side note, a few decades later in the late 1970s, the company once attempted to turn the Snow Queen into a theme park ride. While it never got past the drawing board, one of Walt's nine old men, Mark Davis, drew concept art for a potential attraction called the Enchanted Snow Palace, where guests enter into a literal winter wonderland where they encounter penguins, polar bears, seals, snowball men, and more having fun on the ice and even get to meet the Snow Queen herself. Later on, in the 1990s, Anderson became relevant at the studio again where the animators were more committed to bringing his stories to life and using those scrap concepts from Walt's abandoned project as inspiration. They already made a Little Mermaid movie and they were in the process of turning the steadfast tin soldier into a segment of Fantasia 2000. But when it came to the Snow Queen, as much as they tried to make that their next potential feature, they just never found a way to properly pull it off. Many ideas were suggested to alter the tale in order to create a better story for modern audiences, like using different curses or change motives that would lead the male protagonist to find himself with the Snow Queen, switching some roles where the Queen became a good lover for the male lead instead of the friend who seeks out to look for him, and adding a variety of comedic sidekicks that would tag along the journey. Many have tried and many have proposed several ideas, but all of them failed leaving the studio to shelve the Snow Queen again in 2002. Six years later, after Disney Animation and the whole company was under new management, one of the new heads, John Lasseter, convinced one of the Tarzan directors, Chris Buck, to return to the studio, since he was at Sony Pictures Animation and finished directing the Oscar-nominated Surf's Up. 
When back at Disney, Chris proposed several ideas on what to make as a potential movie, but one that stood out for John was a concept for a musical adaptation of The Snow Queen, one whose plot would deliver a new definition to true love. And so, Disney took another shot at the tale to turn it into a possible new animated feature, which the story was originally closer to the source material. However, once again, the team was confronted with one problem, and it was the same one that plagued the previous attempts that led to their downfall. The title character. The original tale alone was tough to adapt due to its dark nature, but the real challenge was to make the Snow Queen herself a likable character that audiences could connect with. Sure, she's always been the villain of the story, but that's not enough for her as a prominent character in a movie. She needed proper motives, human qualities, a backstory, something that could develop her into a more believable and complex character. One solution they came up with was to turn the protagonist next to the evil queen, now called Elsa, into her younger sister, Anna, giving the movie a new family dynamic that could add some layers to both the story and to the girls and become less dependent on the Hans Christian Andersen story. By that point, in the start of 2012, one of Wreck-It Ralph's screenwriters, Jennifer Lee, was brought on board to help with the writing and the team was already ahead by having more creative freedom and established several ideas for the picture. When she came in, her contribution was fully establishing who Anna is in the story, making sacrifices of concepts that she both loved and hated in order to give her a coming-of-age story where her view on love would change over the course of the feature along with taking inspiration from her own relationship with her older sister to develop the bond of Anna and Elsa. She also made a massive change to the comedic snowman Olaf, where he went from being Elsa's obnoxious sidekick that Jen wished him dead for how mean-spirited he was, to Anna's naive and innocent helper who aids him along her journey. A few months later, because of the large amount of contribution she provided, Leigh was promoted to a co-director with Buck. While several characters were established like Anna, Olaf, the male hero Kristoff, and later the backstabbing Prince Hans, there was only one significant character left to fully establish. The Snow Queen herself, Elsa. For years, she had been the movie's villain that would have tried to rule the kingdom with her army of snowmen, but there was still something that didn't really work about her. Something that would have audiences end up genuinely liking her and understand her position of what she went through by the end of the movie. The solution came not from either the directors or the writers or even the animators, but from the songwriters Robert and Kristen Anderson Lopez, who came on board after Disney was delighted by the work they've done in 2011's Winnie the Pooh. In total, the duo wrote 25 unique songs for the picture, but only 8 ended up in the final cut and seven of those that didn't make it found their way in the deluxe edition of the soundtrack. As they worked on the musical number for Elsa, instead of just making a straightforward villain song, they decided to try out something that would present her as someone more sympathetic and vulnerable. That she was constantly controlled by her own fear due to not being able to control her powers, but finally free to be herself now that she is alone. And that song turned out to be what everybody knows today as Let it go, let it go. At that moment, Disney finally found the Snow Queen that they had been searching for decades. The team had to completely rewrite the first act in order to properly fit the song onto the movie, sure, but the extra work was worth it now that they have finalized Elsa. Originally, the movie was planned to be animated and hand-drawn. However, due to the complexities of the winter effects and Elsa's ice powers, along with the financial failure of 2011's Winnie the Pooh, they switched those plans to have it be entirely computer animated. When the team prepared to capture the look of the picture, they went to three key research trips to fully understand how they could create Arendelle, led by the movie's art director, Mike Giamo. There was Jackson Hole, Wyoming to understand the physics of going through mounts of snow, Quebec City in Canada to visit the Ice Hotel to know how the lighting works in Elsa's Ice Palace, and the biggest trip of them all, Norway. Specifically, in Brygen, the Akashis Fortress, the Nadaro Cathedral, and more to indulge and study Scandinavian culture, its architecture, natural environments like the fjords, and legends. 
Unlike other computer animated films, where the animators usually animate scene by scene that often feature multiple characters in them, the team at Disney decided to approach the characters in a similar fashion to hand-drawn, where some are assigned as supervising animators to just one character in order for them to fully understand who they're animating and their personalities to believably bring them to life. Some of these include Becky Breezy for Anna, Hiram Osman for Olaf, and Wayne Unten for Elsa. Some of them even looked at their kids for inspiration of the characters' mannerisms. By the way, speaking of kids, the voice of young Anna during the song Do You Wanna Build a Snowman was sung by one of the Lopez's daughters, Katie, and Jennifer Lee's daughter, Agatha. In order to fully capture the immersive backgrounds of the snowy mountains and the fjords, along with their great scale, Giamo decided to present the picture in Cinemascope widescreen, inspired by the cinematography of Black Narcissus and The Sound of Music. Speaking of snowy mountains, that also proved to be a big challenge to believably develop onto computer and to have the characters look like they're in the middle of a blizzard, since snow is a complicated property that is between being a solid and a liquid. So after the Wyoming trip and having a few lectures on the science of snow, the team created some new software specifically to develop credible snow like Matterhorn and a snowflake generator that could create 2,000 different snowflakes that each have a unique pattern. They also used the software Spaces specifically for Olaf to allow him to deconstruct and rebuild himself at will. As for the costumes, like the snow, the animators knew that they were dealing with something far greater that was never achieved in an animated film. Yes, clothing and CGI can be complicated in itself, but the 19th century fashion in Frozen takes it to a whole new level with layers of rose mulling detail that feature intricate patterns and noticeable use of fabric, stitching, and more. Not only was character designer Jean Gilmore hired to act as the costume designer of the movie, but she and Mike Giamo had to go to the Disney Parks costume division to bring in some samples for the texture artist to simulate how those materials can work in the animation. At the start of 2013, just several months away from the movie's release, the team realized that there was still some work to be done with the story. Even if they already got a whole bunch of the animation complete and Christopher Beck signed on to score the movie after providing the music for Paper Man. Along the way towards the finish line, they had to redo songs and plot lines, take out some more unnecessary characters, but just like with Let It Go, it had to take another song from the Lopez's to solve their problems. This time, with For the First Time in Forever, setting the core of the movie's heart and the contrasting personalities of Anna and Elsa. And quite similarly to that song, after Disney spent that summer heavily promoting the feature, especially at the parks, Elsa told the guards to open up the gates and release the film on November 22, 2013, accompanied by the first Mickey Mouse cartoon since 1995's Runaway Brain called Get a Horse, and it immediately took the world by storm. Critics were praising the movie, stating that it is in the same league as some of the greats in Disney's renaissance, especially when it provided some awe-inspiring technical achievements in the animation, the unforgettable characters that got help from some great voice acting, and the songs that are on par with the works of Howard Ashman. Later on, the acclaim would turn into trophies as Frozen became a prominent name during awards season, winning several awards, especially for Best Animated Feature and Best Song for Let It Go, like two Grammys, two Golden Globes, five Annies, and two Oscars. For the latter, this makes it the first time that Disney Animation won an Oscar since Tarzan, and the first time they earned more than one since Pocahontas. But as great as the reviews were, those were minor compared to how Elsa became the box office queen even far surpassing the expectations of analysts. At first, it stayed behind the shadows of the Hunger Games catching fire, but eventually, the movie reigned supreme for months in theaters and ended up earning $401 million domestically and a worldwide total of $1.28 billion, making this Disney Animation's first movie to earn more than $1 billion and the second animated feature to ever do so with the first being Pixar's Toy Story 3 in 2010. 
And with that number at hand, it even held the title of the highest grossing film of 2013 and the highest grossing animated feature of all time for nearly six years until the 2019 remake of The Lion King took its place. Following afterwards, Frozen became one of the biggest phenomena of the decade, where even the songs, especially Let It Go, were some of the biggest hits of its time, leaving society to be categorized by two different kinds of people. There were those who couldn't get enough of Frozen and never stopped singing the songs, and those who couldn't stand hearing them over and over and over to the point that they were ready to declare war on Arendelle. That's it! I can't take it anymore! That queen's going down! Who's with me? I am! Count me in. We'll show her who's boss! Let's get her! <laughs> Yes, I like to purchase one, two, three, four, five. Five plane tickets to Norway, please. There she is! Let's get her! Relax for one day without having to deal with this nonsense? That's the 14th angry mob within the past few hours. Make that 15. But like I said, those who loved Frozen just couldn't get enough of it, and it was what fueled the movie to become one of the biggest film franchises of the decade, with merchandising flying off the shelves and Disney earning millions upon millions in return. Disney created some small follow-ups like the animated short Frozen Fever that's about Elsa surprising Anna on her birthday while the Queen has a cold, which was presented just before Disney's 2015 remake of Cinderella, and a holiday special called Olaf's Frozen Adventure, where Olaf tries to learn about the true meaning of the holidays that showed before Pixar's 2017 film Coco. Between 2014 and 2015, the story arc of the fourth season of Once Upon a Time was dedicated to a crossover with the movie, and for the stage, Disney made two different types of musicals based on Frozen. One was for the Hyperion Theater at Disney California Adventure, and the other was on Broadway that had a decent run from 2018 to 2020. In 2016, they rethemed the Epcot attraction Maelstrom and turned it into Frozen Ever After, where guests enter the realm of Arendelle where they meet the characters and encounter Elsa at her ice palace. And in early 2019, Arendelle became a level in Kingdom Hearts 3 where some of the voices from the feature like Idina Menzel, Kristen Bell, Jonathan Groff, and Josh Gad return to reprise their roles. Throughout Disney's history, there have only been a few tasks that were as truly challenging as adapting Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen into a beloved animated musical, a challenge in which not even some of the masters of the industry were able to pull off. However, after several decades and failed attempts to bring that ice palace to life, Disney finally found the perfect recipe to turn the story into one of the most iconic animated films ever made. And it was all thanks to the combining forces of the entire cast and crew at Disney Animation. If Tangled didn't prove it yet, then Frozen was the definitive film that presented to everyone that Disney was still able to create animated masterpieces, just like the ones that Walt used to make. They started with the tale of a queen with ice powers, and since then, they let the storm rage on. As Walt Disney Animation Studios returned to the top of the industry thanks to Frozen, the anticipation for their next features were at an all-time high, where their animated films were once again considered major motion picture events. While it would be next to impossible to outperform Elsa's magic, at least Disney Animation set their standards to where audiences could expect something great when they come out with a new movie, including their contribution to Marvel, Big Hero 6. It's about Hiro Hamada, a 14-year-old super genius who gets the help from his brother Tadashi to figure out a good use for his brain to help him in life. So he brings him to his university's laboratory and introduces him to his friends Gogo, Honey Lemon, Wasabi, and Fred. But just when things were looking great for Hiro's future, 
a fire broke out of the university and ended up killing Tadashi, leaving Hiro alone with a healthcare robot his brother invented named Baymax. But when he discovers that the fire might have been caused by foul play and got attacked by a mysterious masked man, Hiro and Baymax team up with Tadashi's friends to use their scientific expertise to turn them into a group of superheroes called Big Hero 6. When growing up, there were two passions that Don Hall had in his life, the animated films of Disney and the superhero comics of Marvel. He already followed one passion by working at Disney Animation and climbing up the ranks to the point of becoming a director with 2011's Winnie the Pooh, but the other would coincidentally fall into place where Don could achieve his ultimate dream that he never thought would be possible. Back in 2009, the Walt Disney Company acquired Marvel Entertainment, along with its roster of 5,000 characters for an estimate $4 billion, where the CEO Bob Iger encouraged the divisions at his company to find a way to integrate something from Marvel in some of their projects. For Hall, this was his golden opportunity to combine his two great loves and turn a Marvel story into a Disney animated film. While working on Pooh, he was going through those comics to see which story would translate best into animation. But then he stumbled upon something different, something that he had never heard of compared to Marvel's more popular heroes like Spider-Man and the Avengers. It was a small comic series that started in 1998 called Big Hero 6 that was made by the group Man of Action, the same team that created the Ben 10 series. As he pitched it to John Lasseter, they both saw that there was some strong potential to create a solid and emotional story and decided to greenlight the project. The idea also impressed Bolt director Chris Williams where he also signed on the project to direct it with Don. Now with a new comic book movie at hand, their first challenge was to figure out how to take two contrasting brands and seamlessly fuse them together into one animated film. Let's be honest, it's not like they could treat this like Frozen and turn this comic into a fairy tale style musical. They had to find a way to fuse Disney's emotional core onto Marvel's superhero format. After some big discussions with the people at Disney and some big heads at Marvel like its chief creative officer Joe Quesada and the executive vice president of Marvel Television Jeff Loeb, they all agreed that Disney's Big Hero 6 should primarily be its own entity. Marvel wouldn't plan on either making comic tie-ins for the film or include it to its Marvel Cinematic Universe, but they did lend a helping hand with the creative process of the feature, including changing some concepts established in the comics to better suit the film and giving them full creative freedom to do whatever they want with the story. One of them, suggested by Joe Quesada himself, was to replace Hiro's dad as the creator of Baymax with a new character that is his brother, Tadashi. However, unlike most of the other Disney films, they knew that they couldn't just get away with explaining the extraordinary in the film with magic. <laughs> Considering that this is a more robotic-oriented superhero story, the team had to use science to explain the logic of the movie, and it had to be accurate to real life. This is especially the case with its star robot, Baymax. In the original comic, Baymax was more like Hero's mechanical bodyguard that could shapeshift either into a big mecha, a dragon-like beast, or a large man. In the movie, however, they decided to completely change his appearance in order to be more, uh, huggable, as they call it. But how can you make a movie robot look like something that can be easily approachable and soft to the touch when they're usually depicted being made out of metal? Well, that answer can be found at Carnegie Mellon University's Robotic Institute, where Don and a group of designers went on a research trip and discovered their latest invention of soft robotics. When they were there, they interacted with a robotic arm that has an inflatable vinyl shell covering its mechanical skeleton that was made in the hopes to be used in the medical field as an assistant to doctors and nurses, and that's when they knew what Baymax was going to be made of and was later brought to life with the help of anime mecha designer Shigeto Koyama, along with giving him a minimal face with a design inspired by the pattern on Japanese Shinto bells. Speaking of Japanese, since the comic had a prominent theme of Japan, the team took great influence from the country to establish the movie's aesthetic, even looking into anime series, Hayao Miyazaki movies, and Shogun Warrior toys as sources for inspiration. And while the movie may not be set in Japan, they did create a Japanese-like area called San Francisco, 
a combination of the geographical map of San Francisco and the culture of Tokyo. The reason for this mix is not only because San Francisco was never a prominent location in a Marvel story before, but it also made sense in a historical context since Japanese immigrants helped rebuild San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. However, just like those two cities, the animators wanted to depict San Francisco as a highly populated and always busy city, using software like Denizen and Bonsai to fit in over 700 people and a quarter of a million trees. The team also created a new software called Hyperion that was made to advance their lighting technology in their animated features, including how the light reflects on Baymax's vinyl body. A few months before the release, after the crew went to watch Marvel's latest feature at the time, Guardians of the Galaxy, they realized that they forgot to add in one important element as a Marvel movie. A Stan Lee cameo. Yes, this was meant to be its own thing with no relation to the other MCU pictures, but animated or not, an appearance from the legendary comic creator himself had been a tradition in almost every Marvel movie up until Avengers Endgame after his death in late 2018. So to make sure they don't disappoint the Marvel fans, one of the last scenes they made was the post-credit where Fred gets a visit from his dad, who is actually Stan Lee. When The Six set out to theaters on November 7th, 2014, it was paired with the animated short Feast, which later won an Oscar and an Annie for Best Animated Short. And while Big Hero 6 was not part of the MCU, it turned out to be as good as some of their better ones. Critics generally had a fun time with the film, saying that it is as heartwarmingly touching as it is excitingly action-packed. It also later collected a good number of nominations at the awards, and won a few like Best Animated Effects at the Annie Awards and Best Animated Feature at the Oscars. And at the box office, while it could only make around half of what Frozen collected, it still came out as a massive hit with $222.5 million domestically and $657.8 million worldwide. While Disney and Marvel agreed at the start to not push it to have the Marvel treatment after the movie came out, it did have a little legacy that can be similar. It had no official Marvel comic, but it did have a manga, a whole set of action figures, appearing in video games like Disney Infinity and Kingdom Hearts 3, and an animated series in 2017 that was made by the creators of Kim Possible, Bob Schooley and Mark McCorkle, and had most of the cast return to reprise their roles. The show ran for three seasons with 56 episodes, and it even spun off into a comic series by IDW Publishing. As Disney was completely out of their element with this and had to make the drastic jump in one year, going from a traditional fairy tale musical to a comic based superhero movie, they succeeded in their tough task of blending Disney with Marvel, taking the superhero action packed format and mixing it with the heart and pure emotions with the theme of family. Not only did the team try something new, but they did so in a way that was fun and touching that took an obscure Marvel story and turned it into one of Disney's most exhilarating franchises that made everyone satisfied with their care. Two years later, Disney's next feature allowed the team to try out something that was both old and new. They may have a long history of producing cartoons that feature anthropomorphic animals, but the way they modernized this one and added some unique commentary turned it into something unlike any other Disney animated film. Just like before, they headed towards another completely different direction as they moved cities from San Francisco to Zootopia. All her life, Judy Hopps dreamed of being a police officer in Zootopia, an urban city where a variety of mammals, big and small, live harmoniously in one major metropolis. She managed to make it happen through her own determination, but soon discovers that the opportunities she's been given are quite limited. But her luck suddenly flipped when she decided to prove herself that she is a worthy addition to her superiors by cracking a major case where several predator animals had gone missing after reportedly going savage. So with the help of a con artist fox named Nick Wilde, Judy goes all around the city to solve the mystery of the savage predators and might even discover that Zootopia may not be the perfectly unified city she always thought it was. 
The idea all started when Byron Howard wanted to make a movie in the style of a Disney film that he felt nostalgic for. Robin Hood, where all the characters are anthropomorphic animals that could walk and talk like humans. Some time after directing Tangled, he pitched to John Lasseter several ideas that all featured that same theme. He may not have picked a specific one to approve, but he was totally on board with an anthropomorphic animal picture, since it had been a long time that Disney had ever done one of those for a film, and Lasseter had fond memories growing up of watching the Wind in the Willow segment in The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Not to mention that it would give the animators a new challenge of making a movie where they not only have to animate several different talking animals, but those who can stand up on two legs and wear clothing over their fur. And so, Howard and screenwriter Jared Bush went to work on an idea called Savage Seas, an all-animal 1960s-style spy flick. As they pitched to Disney's story trust, the result of their work turned out to be… fine, I guess? The spy stuff is cool and all, but everyone at the trust were all fixated over one part of the feature. The first act. In the original plans, the movie would have started off in a city that was made for animals, by animals, and the creative heads at Disney really got into that idea in particular. As a result, Byron and Jared ultimately decided to scrap the 1960s and spy angle to make it all about the city and replace those elements with a contemporary crime scene. Later on, Byron would be promoted to a co-director, and Record Ralph's Rich Moore joined to direct alongside Howard. However, even if they got their core concept in place, they still have to take many steps until finalizing what would be the movie's story. Early on, they knew that they wanted to include a social commentary on prejudice, and how that can not only ruin lives, but also completely corrupt society. Inspired by the documentary The Eye of the Storm, their idea to present this in the film was with Tame Callers, where despite the city's population is only 10% predators, the prey rule the law for their safety that the predators have to wear this shock collar-like device that only activate when either their hunting instincts kick in or when their emotions get the best of them. For a while throughout production, the plan was going pretty well, including getting some animation done on some scenes and getting help from Dr. Shakti Butler on the discussion of bias. But there was just something in them that didn't entirely work, specifically with the callers. They didn't want to pin the blame entirely on that though, so they tried ways to alter the scenes to see if there could be any improvement. But it wasn't until they screened what they had planned to Pixar when they had to come in and tell them the cold hard truth. They saw the potential in the movie, and as much as they want to enjoy and get immersed in this animal city, they just couldn't help but hate it because of those callers, and how there was this blatant unfairness that's corrupting the place without anyone doing something about it for the longest time. It certainly wasn't an easy pill to swallow, but deep down, even before their talk with Pixar, they knew that was the problem all along and ultimately decided to throw out the tame callers altogether and replace them with stereotypical prejudice. Another major change they had to make to the story was regarding the lead. The movie originally starred Nick Wilde, where he wanted to open a business in Zootopia, despite the odds and bigotry that's against him. Again, they knew they had something with this idea, but the more they tried to develop Nick and explain more his backstory, the less the plan felt like it was working. There had been several debates if Nick was even the right fit to be the protagonist of the story. But during those times, there was one other name that kept popping up that sounded more and more appealing to take the lead in the film. It was a bunny who was a cop in Zootopia that tags along Nick's adventure through the city, and also discovers the prejudice that lies within. Her name was Judy Hopps, and when they started experimenting with focusing more on her side of the story, that's when they knew that the movie was finally coming together. As the story team was getting to work on fixing up the plot, the animation crew prepared themselves to visually bring Zootopia to life, especially with creating all the citizens that inhabit there. They started by taking several research trips to look at animals either up close or in their natural habitat like in the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, Las Vegas, New York, Disney's Animal Kingdom, and in Kenya. 
where they learn about the different textures of each animal's fur and how they live in the wildlife. Speaking of fur, like I said before, the team knew that the biggest challenge for this film was not dealing with fur in general, but studying how one animal's fur is different from the others, how they reflect on the light, how long or short they can be, how they interact with a variety of environments, and how they fit in clothing. This proved to be a real task for them, since the last time they had to work on prominent animal characters with fur was Bolt, and back then, they were having a hard time dealing with him wearing just a leash. So to upgrade their technology, the team invented a new software called iGroom, which gave the animators full control of the fur and shaped them however they wanted to make them look different from one another. There was also the task of rendering all the individual strands of hair on their body. At that point, Disney was only used to animating computer animated humans, where Elsa, for example, would have 400,000 strands on her head. But when they had to deal with animal characters in Zootopia, some like Nick and Judy would have around 2.5 million strands on them each, and the bigger they are, the more hairs they have, including the average giraffe having a total of 9 million. While the inhabitants of Zootopia are a big puzzle on their own, there was also another they had to face, Zootopia itself. As they did get inspired by major cities to build the area, including making buildings that come from a variety of times like some that are more contemporary and others that are a few generations old, the real challenge was convincingly have all these animals with different sizes like an elephant and a mouse and that come from different environments live in one metropolis. Their solution around this was to build different sectors in the city that specialize either in a specific climate like Tundra Town and the Rainforest District, or made for special sized animals like Little Rodentia, along with the main downtown hub, Savannah Central, that would have all of them mingled together like one big watering hole. This also helped the animators with the use of color, architectural style, and effects to use for each area. Just like the city itself, there are places where the movie can be a little more different than others. One significant variant was with the title. There are many places where it stayed as Zootopia, but in some countries in Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, and in the UK, they called the movie Zootropolis instead due to copyright laws where others already called dibs on Zootopia. And in Germany, not even that could work, so they had to call it Zoomania. As for China, they decided to go more straightforward and just call it Crazy Animal City. Another regional difference with the film is the news anchor and their voice, which are done by real news anchors. While the standard version next to the Snow Leopard is a moose, where he's voiced by Peter Mansbridge in North America and by Vassos Alexander in the UK, Brazil had a jaguar voiced by Ricardo Bocha, Australia and New Zealand had a koala voiced by David Campbell, Japan got a tanuki voiced by Kazumasa Kora, and China had a giant panda. When Judy traveled to the big screen on March 4, 2016, the movie was also released in IMAX theaters, making it the first time for a Disney animated film to do so since Treasure Planet, and its success turned out to be larger than Zootopia itself. At the box office, the movie was breaking records along its way in order to achieve $341.3 million domestically and $1.024 billion worldwide, making it the fourth animated feature to cross the billion dollar mark, with the third being Illumination's 2015 film Minions. And with the critics, many have stated that this was Disney's best movie they released since The Lion King where the grand and amazing animation brings to life inspiring characters, enjoyable humor, and a powerful message that speaks against bigotry and discrimination like racism and xenophobia right on time when problematic politicians would use that in order to fuel their base. Later on, Zootopia became another of those animated films that collected a prominent number of awards and nominations, especially for the Best Animated Feature category, including winning a Golden Globe, six Annie Awards for Best Storyboarding, Best Character Design, Best Voice Acting for Jason Bateman's performance as Nick Wilde, Best Writing, Best Directing, and Best Animated Feature, an Oscar, and it was named one of the top 10 films of 2016 by the American Film Institute. While Zootopia would become a prominent contemporary Disney classic, 
There was at one point where the movie did get in a bit of trouble the same way that Nick would. A year after its release, Esplanade Productions, which is the company of Total Recall co-screenwriter Gary L. Goldman, filed a lawsuit against Disney claiming that Zootopia ripped off their old idea they pitched at Disney both in 2000 and 2009 called Looney. They stated that not only were some of the characters eerily similar, but the movie also heavily took a lot from its themes, the location, and even the Zootopia name itself. After going at it for months in court, the judge ultimately dismissed the case, stating that the similarities like the themes are not enough to go after someone for copyright infringement. As it is a tradition for Disney animated features to include emotional messages to convey tough discussions with its audience, never was there one that is as powerful as the one from Zootopia, whose themes of prejudice and corruption make a strong statement about the problems with our modern society. Something that is almost unheard of to be proudly displayed in a highly entertaining mainstream animated family film. And thanks to Zootopia's success, Disney has once again placed themselves in a new height in their legacy, where they made it to the point that not only were their movies have returned to being award-winning beloved hits, but they also gained the ability to become one of the very few studios that could produce billion-dollar blockbusters. They may have been considered to be at the top of their game since the Renaissance, but for the rest of the 2010 decade, they would soon know how far they would go. Try everything. until the Mother Island emerged. Just when you think that things couldn't get better, life can often find a way to surpass your expectations. In the case of Disney Animation during the mid-2010s, they already regained their reputation as the most renowned animation studio in the industry that makes beloved classics thanks to the success of films like Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph. But then when Frozen came in, not only was it a great phenomenon in the levels of The Lion King with worldwide acclaim and collecting numerous of awards, but it also achieved what was once considered impossible by making over a billion dollars at the box office and held the title of the highest grossing animated feature of all time for six years. Of course, this success continued on to Disney's other animated films, even if they were more contemporary instead of incorporating their timeless fairy tale musical formula. There was Big Hero 6, their first step in the realm of superheroes based on a Marvel comic, and Zootopia, a modern take on the anthropomorphic animals movie with a powerful social commentary that also became a billion dollar hit. It was almost as if people were experiencing their renaissance all over again. But speaking of their renaissance, not long after Zootopia, a beloved directing duo from that era decided to try their own take at giving computer animation that Disney touch. It may not be based on a classic fairy tale, but they did everything they could to make it feel like one with Moana. It's the story of Moana, the daughter of the chief of a Polynesian island called Motunui, who will eventually take his position to lead her people. But unlike her dad, she always has a fascination of exploring what's outside her home. Suddenly, things were looking bleak for the island as the vegetation began to die out and the fish were becoming harder to catch. According to Moana's grandmother, Tala, this was the work of the demon Teka, and the only way to stop her is by finding the demigod Maui and make him return the heart of the goddess Tefiti that he stole a millennia ago. 
And once Tala passed away, Moana sets off to meet the egotistical demigod and overcome some powerful enemies to return the heart and bring life back to her island. After they finish their work on The Princess and the Frog, directors John Musker and Ron Clements immediately went to find an idea for their next picture. Their first plan was to make an adaptation of the 1987 Terry Prechette novel Mort, which tells the story of a teenager who works as an apprentice of death. However, since Disney couldn't get the rights to the book, they felt like it was best to move on to another plan. It wasn't until later when the two started to get interested in Polynesian mythology, but more specifically, the ones about the demigod Maui. After they proposed to turn those stories into an animated feature, John Lasseter only accepted under one condition. They had to take a serious research trip across the South Pacific. And so, starting in 2011, the directors and a small crew jump from island to island to fully indulge themselves in Polynesian culture and meet the people that live there, including Fiji, Samoa, Tahiti, Wahini, Mooria, and New Zealand. While the team found inspiration everywhere they went, the most memorable discovery they made was how the Polynesian people were pioneers in exploration long before the Europeans went voyaging. How they traveled long distances to find new islands and managed to find their way back home using only the stars as their guide and their relationship with the sea and the environment. They were crossing oceans ever since 300 AD, but suddenly stopped and never sailed again until about a thousand years later. This piece of history turned out to be so fascinating that the team decided that they wanted the story to be based around that, switching the narrative to put Maui on the side and give the leading role to a rebellious teenager that is the daughter of a chief and gave her the name Moana, which is Maori for ocean. However, Memories and inspiration were not the only things the Disney crew brought back with them from the South Pacific. From across their travels, they recruited several experts they met during that time and came together to form the Oceanic Story Trust, who throughout production worked as the consultants to make sure the movie stayed as accurate and respectable as possible to Polynesian culture. At the start of production, Taika Waititi wrote the first screenplay of the film. But since he couldn't stay too long, he left in 2012 to work on his mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows and taking care of his newborn daughter. In the original script, Moana's family was much more different than in the final film. She had around five or six brothers, and her father, Tui, was eager to go back to voyaging outside his island. But in order to keep the focus more on the protagonist, the brothers were taken out and the dad's viewpoint on voyaging completely flipped. However, in order to still have someone to encourage Moana to set off on her adventure, one of the writers, Pamela Ribbon, came up with the idea of Tala, Moana's grandmother who helps her reconnect with her ancestor's sense of exploring and give her the heart of Tefiti. During production, the team did face several story problems to the point that they had some emergencies. So to resolve those issues, they hired the Hawaiian screenwriting brothers, Aaron and Jordan Condell, to include new scenes and develop the bond between Moana and Maui. They also brought in Don Hall and Chris Williams to work as co-directors to help out Musker and Clemens straight after finishing their directing duties on Big Hero 6. For the voice of Moana, Ron and John knew that they wanted a teenage girl from the South Pacific region to portray the character. For several days, weeks even, they auditioned hundreds of girls to play the part, but none of them seemed to have what they were looking for. It wasn't until the last day of searching when they found the audition of a Hawaiian high school freshman named Auli Cravalo, whose strong personality when reading her lines and solid singing skills made her the perfect fit for the Moana they were looking for. But it's not just the lead that the team wanted to be Polynesian. Almost every one of the cast is of Hawaiian, Samoan, and of Maori descent. In fact, some of them also dubbed their roles in their native languages, including Cravalo and Nicole Scherzinger, who voiced Moana's mom, Sina, also voice in the Hawaiian language, and Rachel House, the voice of Tala, Temuera Morrison, the voice of Tui, and Jermaine Clement, the voice of Tamatoa, also did the Maori language dub. 
The only non-Polynesian voice of the film is Alan Tudyk, who was given the prestigious role of Hey Hey the Rooster. I, I went to Julia. As it is their first computer animated film, it was quite a challenge for Ron and John. But with the ideas they had planned for this movie, it was a true animation challenge for everyone at Disney. Possibly the biggest reason being that 80% of all the shots required a large number of visual effects, especially with the ocean where it plays such a big role in the film that it is even a character itself. So in order for the animators to gain more control of the water, they developed a new software called Splash, which allowed them to control the water even in more extraordinary ways, similarly to how they use Matterhorn to control the snow in Frozen. They tested what they could do with the software by creating a scene where a toddler Moana plays with the living seas and shows her the wonders of the ocean. The result turned out to be so good that the team later made some adjustments to the script in order to include the test in the final film. The team also created the software called Quicksilver that helped the animators to create the hair of the characters so it could be as authentic as real Polynesian hair. Even looking at Ali Cravalho and one of the members of the Oceanic Story Trust, Fiona Collins, for reference to understand the physics of the hair. Another technical task was putting 2D animation on a 3D model, specifically using hand-drawn animation to create Minnie Maui, the living tattoo who hops around Maui's computer-generated body. This was achieved by the animators collaborating with Eric Goldberg, who animated Minnie Maui by separating Maui's tattoos into their own individual quadrants. That way, it helped him know where the character could stand and jump from one part of the body to the next. For the music, Disney decided to hire the Broadway playwright Lin-Manuel Miranda, the Hollywood composer Mark Mancina, and the South Pacific songwriter Opatai Fowai. At first, it seemed kind of daunting to put these three songwriters and composers from entirely different backgrounds in one room and expect them to make something that could fit all their contrasting styles at once. But together, they managed to mix their own sensibilities in order to create the musical soundtrack of Moana, featuring Mancina's Hollywood-style orchestration for the score, Miranda's Broadway approach to the songs, and Fawai's cultural heritage to stay true to the film's location. The first song they collaborated to set the standards of combining their efforts was We Know The Way, which was sung by Opatai and Lin. They even received additional help from their own groups during the process, including Fawai's music team Tavaka and some of the cast from Miranda's Broadway shows in The Heights and Hamilton to record the demos of the musical numbers. The only song that is an exception to the mix of their talent is China, which was created late in production as a tribute to David Bowie, who passed away in early 2016. In fact, the whole character of Tamatoa is like a tribute to David Bowie, since Jermaine Clement based his voice on him and his group, Flight of the Concords, did have a history of both satirizing and paying homage to his music. When Moana set sail to the big screen on November 23rd, 2016, there were a few places in Europe where her name had to be changed to either Vajana or even Oceana either due to copyright reasons or to not have it share its name with a late Italian porn actress. You know, the typical reasons to change a movie's title. Did not see that coming. On its release, it was accompanied by an animated short called Inner Workings, and as that film got some good reviews, it was even better for the movie that followed it. Critics adored the feature, calling it another new Disney classic whose gorgeous animation can only be outshined by great songs and admirable characters. This praise was later repeated during award season where it got mainly recognized for best animated feature and best song with How Far I'll Go, including two Golden Globe nominations, two Oscar nominations, winning a Grammy for best song for visual media, and being nominated for six Annie Awards, winning two of them for Best Voice Acting for Ali Cravalho and Best Animated Effects. The movie also became a powerful force at the box office, earning $248.7 million domestically 
and globally collected $690.8 million. And because of its well-recognized success, Disney made Moana a member of the Disney princesses soon after the movie's release. As Disney brought people to many magical and far-off places for decades, Moana takes it to a whole new level with a movie that fully captures South Pacific culture, highlighting not just its mythologies, but also its philosophies on the environment and its community. Since Polynesians are often overlooked as a group of people, this gives them a one-of-a-kind opportunity where they could see themselves in a Disney animated film and that they can have their own pop culture icons to look up to like Moana and Maui. But if there is one achievement it received that is more honorable than any award or any box office number, it's making the dream of one Tahiti elder come true. Among everything in their travels, the team's most impactful moment was when they met Papa Mape, who told them something that would be the biggest influence of the feature. He said, For years, we've been swallowed by your culture. One time, can you be swallowed by our culture? Two years after one of Disney Animation's most successful years, they decided to try something that they very rarely do in the studio's entire history. Revisiting old characters and set them off on new adventures. Sure, there have been a handful of times that they've made sequels before, like The Rescuers Down Under, Fantasia 2000, and technically The Three Caballeros and Winnie the Pooh, but this was their first time where they immediately went to work on a follow-up straight after its predecessor, which was exactly what they did by plugging themselves back in the digital world with Ralph Breaks the Internet. Six years after taking down Turbo, Ralph and Vanellope remained the best of friends in the whole arcade. When Ralph tried to surprise Vanellope by making a secret level, it messed up Sugar Rush so much that it resulted in the wheel of the cabinet to be completely broken and the game to be later unplugged. Fearing that she might have lost her home forever, especially when the company that made Sugar Rush no longer exists, there is only one place where they could save her game and find a new wheel. The internet. So now that Ralph and Vanellope entered the realm of the World Wide Web, the duo must go web surfing to get the money they need to buy a new wheel and save Sugar Rush, all while their friendship gets put to the test when Vanellope discovers that she might enjoy the internet life more than the arcade. Back in 2013, not long after the release of Wrecked Ralph, director Rich Moore and the team at Disney were open to the idea of making a sequel. Considering that the movie is set in the world of video games, they knew that they only scratched the surface with that concept. There were several ideas of where else they could bring Ralph and Vanellope, like home consoles and even online gaming, but the latter opened the door to something far bigger than gaming itself that seemed like the perfect challenge for them to bring to life. The Internet. So in 2014, with Moore back in the director's chair with writer Phil Johnston joining his side, now that they have stepped back from video games and entered the web, what would the duo story be about? Well, that ended up becoming as complicated as adapting the internet for the picture. One idea was to have Vanellope become an online sensation and gradually care a lot more about her own popularity, while Ralph got thrown in jail and teams up with a search engine named Nosemore to break out and rescue Vanellope to snap her out of her famous mindset and have her back to her former self. Another suggestion was to give Ralph the internet fame while avoiding an antivirus cop named Bev. However, even if some of these concepts did end up appearing in the final film, the writers realized that in order to make the story work, the focus shouldn't be on the internet, but rather on Ralph and Vanellope's relationship, which was inspired by the final line of the first movie that revealed that he still had some insecurities to take care of. Because if that little kid likes me, how bad can I be? It's not about where they are, but how they feel when they are in those places, and how that affects their bond throughout the feature and ultimately change their friendship, even adding in the complex dynamic of Ralph being against that change and how that can lead to a toxic and dangerous path. Speaking of toxicity, 
As much as the movie tries to highlight what's great about the internet, the team also wanted to present its dark side. The elements that are more harmful to people and modern culture like the dark web, viruses that can corrupt the system, and the worst of them all, the comment section. These moments were inspired by Moore's previous film he directed, Zootopia, but more specifically, how that approached the subject of bigotry and systemic discrimination. Just like in that film, while they knew that those issues are too big to realistically resolve, even for Ralph, the team still believed that it is important to bring up those problems and how they can personally affect an individual. Originally, they wanted to take the idea of the cloud and use that to present the internet as a place that is literally set in the clouds. However, the tech team weren't on board with taking the cloud metaphor seriously and they all agreed to do some proper research instead. So in order to find inspiration for a better depiction of the internet, some of the team looked around one Windshire, one of the biggest telecommunication centers that powers the internet of the whole west coast along with opening up old computers to look inside its parts like with the motherboard. Based on all the circuitry and wiring that all follow a coordinated path, the result is a high-tech city that is similar to Rome where the newer buildings are made on top of older and defunct websites and memes. Also, to stay true to its predecessor where the world features already existing IPs like Street Fighter and Sonic the Hedgehog, the internet features appearances from real-life websites like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, eBay, Google, and more. But also like in the first, the locations are focused more on original sites made for the movie like BuzzTube and the game Slaughter Race. For the latter, the animators went to the Willow Springs International Raceway to drive around and pull some crazy stunts with some cars to get a better understanding on how to pull off the car chase scenes and how the drivers think when pulling off those maneuvers at the last second. The team also decided to take a background character in the game called Shank and give her a bigger and more prominent role where she acts as a newfound mentor for Vanellope to help her figure out what she truly wants in life. But even while they were working on it, the team knew that there was one scene that would completely steal the show. Where the first film had all those video game cameos, Ralph Breaks the Internet had the Oh My Disney scene. Originally conceived as an abandoned Disney Infinity website, screenwriter Pamela Ribbon developed the idea when she was thinking about Vanellope and how she technically is a princess, but not a part of the official Disney princess lineup. So, taking some inspiration from Disney's official fan site and a BuzzFeed quiz that asked which Disney princess are you, Ribbon wrote the entire scene where Vanellope meets all the princesses in one room as they all make fun of themselves and some of the cliches that Disney's guilty of over the years. It was a stressful pitch to present to the company the scene was making fun of, but it turned out to be a hit with the crew, and they became committed to do everything they could to make the scene a highlight of the feature. Their biggest accomplishment in doing so is by bringing back almost all the voices of the original princesses to reprise their roles, including Jody Benson, Paige O'Hara, Linda Larkin, Irene Bedard, Ming-Na Wen, Anika Noni Rose, Mandy Moore, Kelly McDonald, Kristen Bell, Adina Menzel, and Ali Cravalho. The only ones who haven't returned are the ones for the princesses of Walt's days, who were either retired or no longer living. Pamela Ribbon, Jennifer Hale, and Kate Higgins took on the role of Snow White, Cinderella, and Aurora respectively. The actresses were also consultants, along with cast members who played the princesses in the parks and by watching the movies themselves to help the team have more of an understanding of their personalities. Even with the animators, Mark Henn was brought in to help them adapt these princesses onto CGI, since he was the supervising animator of almost half of them in their original features. Henn also provided some additional hand-drawn animation for the scene like with Sorcerer Mickey. However, they didn't get a few of them correct in their first try, especially when it came to Tiana. After the trailer was publicly released, Disney faced backlash over the way she looked more European with lighter skin than being prominently black. Immediately afterwards, 
The studio talked with Anika Noni Rose and the group Color of Change in order to make sure that her design stayed true to how she looked in the original movie, along with giving the same update to Pocahontas. But of course, the scene wasn't just about highlighting the princesses. Just like with the first film with video games, the scene is covered with cameos and references from all across Disney's legacy from their animated films, including from Pixar, to Star Wars like when Vanellope was chased by stormtroopers, to Marvel where she crosses paths with Groot and Stan Lee. The only cameos they regretted to not include in the picture, but were close to do so, were the Golden Girls. Maybe it would have been cool, but still too random and out of place for Ralph. While it was a challenge to create the massive scale of the internet, especially with the giant Ralph made out of thousands of smaller Ralphs at the film's climax, the animators also had to face the same task as its predecessor of developing a variety of styles for the character animation, depending on who they were working on. Some, like the avatars, are more robotic, some have a cartoonier aesthetic like the netizens, some are more realistic like the people in the real world, some have to run around with video game logic like the extras in Slaughter Race, and even Knows More is an homage to the Disney cartoons of the 1950s, who was voiced by the same guy who did King Candy in the first, Alan Tudyk. It is true that the movie may not be a musical, but the film does have a heavy use of noteworthy songs, and I'm not just referring to Imagine Dragon Zero. During the climax, when the princesses have to rescue Ralph, the scene also featured nods to their musical numbers from their respective films, and for Vanellope's original number, A Place Called Slaughter Race, they brought back Disney veteran Alan Menken to work with Phil Johnston and writer Tom McDonald. But as it is a movie about the internet, there was one timeless meme that the directors knew they needed to put in. They had the idea for a while, but they never got to work on it until the end of production, where they decided to add it in as a post credit scene and get John C. Riley to record the songs during his vacation. Ralph and Vanellope were ready to be online for March 9th, 2018, but to make room for A Wrinkle in Time, it had to be pushed back to November 21st, and Ralph's second viral fame was as solid as before. Maybe its success was not as spectacular as the previous Disney films, but it was still considered a worthy follow-up. It still collected a good amount of money at the box office that could buy many Sugar Rush wheels with $201.1 million domestically and $529.3 million worldwide and the critics had a good time watching it, admiring the animation, the humor, and the bond of the leading characters that deliver some memorably heartfelt moments. During award season, Ralph did show up plenty of times for the Best Animated Feature category, including the Golden Globes, the Oscars, and getting 10 Annie nominations, but the film nearly always ended up getting overshadowed by Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, with the only notable award it won was an Annie for Best Animated Effects. Since then, Ralph and Vanellope did go back in the realm of video games, with a VR arcade game called Wreck-It Ralph, Ralph Breaks VR, and even Ralph himself appeared as a Link in Kingdom Hearts 3. Like I said before, it is very rare when Disney Animation would revisit old characters for a new feature film. But if they do, it would have to be for a very special reason. And in this case, it was not what many may think it was. It wasn't to bring the world of the internet to life, it wasn't for all the princesses to come together, and it wasn't for Ralph to wreck more things. It was to present the evolving relationship of two best friends where one wants to look for something new in their life and the other wants to keep things the same. How change can be one of the toughest yet most necessary things to happen in friendship. Sure, it's not really Disney's greatest sequel they've made, but it is their most heartfelt that still has a lot of effort and a lot of love put into it. And that reason was enough to have Ralph come back and break the internet. Following the sequel's release, Disney pulled an industry-changing move that would begin a new chapter for the entire company. However, even before Ralph broke the internet, 
the animation studio had to confront its own serious problems and make some emergency changes. On November 2017, the hashtag MeToo movement was just about a month old and was already making a major impact in modern culture. Women from not just the entertainment industry, but from all around the world were calling out powerful men whom for years, decades even, sexually took advantage of them while being too big to face any consequences. This resulted in the downfall of some of the most powerful names in the industry like Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Brett Radner, and more. In the case of Disney, or even the entire animation field, none could ever be a bigger target than John Lasseter. Shortly after the takedown of Weinstein, many animators and people who worked at either Disney or Pixar spoke out about a list of John Lasseter's entire history of sexual misconduct, including unwarranted kisses on the lips and his infamous hugs that can be too close for comfort. Immediately after the scandal was out of the bag, Lasseter stated that he would take a six-month leave of absence, admitting to what he referred to as missteps. However, after months of discussion, Disney ultimately decided to let him go on June of 2018, and that his role as a consultant would expire by the end of that year. Not long after, on an unrelated note, Ed Catmull announced that he would retire as president of both animation studios by July of 2019. But the biggest change came after these announcements, when the Walt Disney Company made their biggest acquisition when they fully bought out 21st Century Fox for an estimate $71.3 billion on March 20th, 2019. A few months later, new leadership roles were assigned at all the animation studios under Disney's umbrella. Producer Clark Spencer became the new president at Disney Animation, while Andrew Milstein, who was co-president with Catmull at Disney Animation, moved to Blue Sky Studios to work alongside Roger Baird, which unfortunately did not last long. Jim Morris, who was the co-president at Pixar, became the full president after Catmull left. But then there were John Lasseter's replacements as chief creative officer. For Pixar, they assigned director Pete Docter to take charge, and at Walt Disney Animation Studios, they gave the position to Jennifer Lee, which for her was a lot more stressful to receive than expected. Not only because it was a major position to take on itself, but it was also an additional responsibility for her at Disney, since at the time, she already had her hands full with being a single mother and being the director of a highly anticipated sequel, Frozen 2. Three years after Elsa's coronation, the Queen of Arendelle started to hear a mysterious voice. But at the same time, elemental forces began to threaten the kingdom, and the only way to figure out what is going on is by entering an enchanted forest that Anna and Elsa only know about from childhood stories that they were told by their mother and father. Now the royal sisters, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf have to meet up with the Northuldra tribe to find out what's been causing the forces to become destructive upon the land, all while Elsa keeps following the voice to find out who it belongs to and might even hold the answer to the origins of her ice powers. Believe it or not, Despite the legendary success of the first film where it even held the title of the highest grossing animated film of all time, Disney was not in a rush to produce a sequel. In fact, not long after the original's release, the company didn't think much of the idea, putting more of their frozen focus at the time on turning the movie into a Broadway musical. The only immediate result that came from the movie within Disney Animation was the directors Jennifer Lee and Chris Buck, along with producer Peter Del Vecchio, wanted to collaborate together again on a new project. As they were trying to think of what their next big picture could be, it wasn't until the fall of 2014 when the trio started to take the consideration of a follow-up seriously. Del Vecchio talked with hundreds of fans who had a lot of questions that the movie did not answer, and while working on the short Frozen Fever, Lee and Buck realized that they already missed working with these characters. And so on November of 2014, 
The three had the first discussions about a sequel to Frozen, with the first thing they wanted to establish was actually the end. It took some time to figure out a good ending for Anna and Elsa, but they ultimately came to the conclusion that no matter what the movie would be about, it has to end with Anna becoming the new Queen of Arendelle and Elsa finally being free. And so on March of 2015, during their annual shareholders meeting, Disney made the announcement that they are officially making a Frozen 2, and that the team had an incredible new idea of how they are bringing audiences back to Arendelle. However, there was just one problem with that statement. They didn't. Yes, the crew did take some trips around Scandinavia, talked with indigenous Sami experts to create the Northuldra tribe, and established some concepts, but it took them years to figure out how to take all these ideas and put them together into one cohesive story. In fact, by 2017, despite confirming that some of the original cast would return like Adina Menzel, Kristen Bell, Jonathan Groff, and Josh Gad, they all stated at the time that they had yet to start recording their lines or even received a script. It wasn't until after John Lasseter was kicked out of Disney when the sequel finally started to take shape, where one of Lee's first actions as chief creative officer was to hire Alison Schroeder to help her with the script. As time got closer to the film's release, the team still had a significant amount of work to do and some of them were quite the challenge in themselves. This was especially the case with the elemental spirits, each with their own unique traits and abilities. There's the fire spirit that's a little salamander that the animators gave an adorable look when calm and playful, but can be quick and dangerously spread massive fires. The reason for it to be a salamander is based on the origin of the mythology where they come out of logs that were thrown in the fire. There are the Earth Spirits that they carefully try to find the right balance of abstract rocks that form a giant and a little bit of the features from the Rock Trolls, almost as if they're distant relatives. Then there is the Water Spirit that is a knock and is the hardest for Elsa to connect with. Unlike the ocean from Moana, the task that came with the creature was to convincingly show that it's made of water and that the seas is the spirit's domain but keep the physical form stable to look like a horse. This turned out to be a big collaboration between the artists and technicians from several departments so that the animation can still stay solid, but the effects highlight that it is still made out of liquid. And finally, possibly the most challenging of the four, the Wind Spirit, to which Olaf named Gale. The reason for this addition is the key role that wind spirits play in Scandinavian folklore, and to answer what is the wind when Elsa states in Let It Go, I am one with the wind and sky. Similarly to the ocean from Moana, what made it so tough to animate was the fact that it's only an element with no face or body. Basically, Gale is literally just a gust of wind, but has personality. Like with the knock, a handful of departments had to coordinate to animate the character, even inventing the software Swoop to help them out. But the true effect of Gale was not to animate wind, but rather to animate what flows around it and what it carries along its path, including leaves and twigs, playing around the character's clothing, and even flurries of snow. Once again, Robert and Kristen Anderson Lopez came back to create new songs for the movie making Frozen 2 Disney Animation's first ever musical sequel. While they had some prepared during production, like the one that Disney heavily advertised as the next Let It Go, Into the Unknown, there were others that were more challenging and only able to get them done closer to the release, like Kristoff's parody of 1980s ballads Lost in the Woods and Anna's heartbreaking and powerful solo The Next Right Thing, which that song was partly inspired by writer Buck. Chris's son, who unfortunately died in a car crash just before the release of the first film. And yes, the character in the movie was named after him. I'm sorry, it's just, uh, some of us were born in here. We've never even seen a clear sky. I get it. Name's Ryder. Kristoff. But among all the songs they had to work on, the toughest for the entire team to figure out was Show Yourself. It wasn't really because of the song itself, but rather to answer the movie's biggest question, 
Who is that voice that Elsa keeps following? For most of the production, the team knew that there was a voice that would help guide Elsa, but never truly knew who the voice belonged to. By close to the end of production, it was especially difficult to figure that out, all while the animators were too busy to create new comedic scenes based on reception they got after a test screening. Originally, they thought they nailed the sequence, revealing that the voice would actually be who Elsa becomes. But after giving it some thought, they felt like it would be too confusing and the point of discovering the voice didn't feel right for Show Yourself. It wasn't until they agreed that the voice turned out to be Anna and Elsa's mother, Queen Aduna, and the hook is that Elsa finally came to the home where she belonged, taking the lengthy and problematic 6 minute and a half song and cut it to 4 minutes and 20 seconds with a grand finale that marked it as the last major scene that the team completed. And it was just at the right time for the group at Arendelle to make their theatrical comeback on November 22nd, 2019. At first, critics and audiences heavily debated if the movie's magic was either stronger or weaker than its predecessor, but generally, it was agreed to be a good film. Maybe the writing was a bit of a fixer-upper, but the animation, the new songs, and the evolution of the well-known characters made the feature worth going back to Arendelle. As for the box office, the sequel did not match the numbers of the original. It exceeded them. Regardless of what people thought of the film, The Snow Queen's Return was a major motion picture event, earning $477.4 million domestically and a worldwide total of $1.45 billion, making this one of Disney's seven movies that grossed more than a billion dollars in that year alone and the third highest grossing film of 2019. The year after, Frozen returned to compete during award season, where it won some and got many nominations, especially with Into the Unknown, including an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song, two Golden Globe nominations for Best Animated Feature and Best Song, and eight Annie nominations, winning two of them for Best Animated Effects and Best Voice Acting for Josh Gad as Olaf. Following afterwards, the magic of Frozen continued to flourish onto several different platforms. They released a virtual reality animated short called Myth, A Frozen Tale, which tells the story of the elemental spirits in the enchanted forest, and on social media, they released a set of quick cartoons called At Home with Olaf as a way to entertain families during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. On Disney+, Plus, they made a prequel short called Once Upon a Snowman that tells the origins of Olaf from his creation during Let It Go to the moment he met Anna, Kristoff, and Sven. And they also released the acclaimed six-part documentary series called Into the Unknown, Making Frozen 2, which chronicles the difficult final year the crew had to endure when producing the feature from December of 2018 up to the movie's successful release. Even if they already released a sequel, this was still a new risky territory to make a follow-up of a movie that used Disney's classic fairy tale musical formula. And while it was a very rough path to take on, which they were being honest about by showing what they went through with that documentary series, it still paid off very well at the end. And I don't just mean that literally with the box office and merchandising sales. I mean that even after more than 80 years, the team at Disney is still capable of making beloved animated features that amaze millions of people and later can be named some of the greatest of all time that are cherished and fondly remembered by generations. Ever since Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the studio always innovated to heighten the standards of animation, to continuously tell more captivating and timeless stories featuring unforgettably inspiring characters, and singing the songs that are considered all-time favorites, even decades after their time. It is a tradition that fuels Disney to remain as the most popular and the most renowned animation studio for many decades, and it is a tradition that they will continue to uphold for many years to come as they excitedly head forward into the
And now it is time for the honorable mentions. For Walt Disney Animation Studios, I decided to dedicate this moment to a special technique that they didn't often use, but have proven to be one of the best at the craft. Mixing hand-drawn animation with live-action footage. Of course, this hybrid is as old as animation itself. Even Walt Disney himself was one of the pioneers at the start of his career when he and his team made the Alice comedies. Since then, Disney always looked for ways to revolutionize and refine the technique as both filmmaking and animation grew more advanced over time. Some notable examples of upgraded versions of the art include movies like The Three Caballeros, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, and Pete's Dragon, as well as Walt's TV shows like Disneyland and The Wonderful World of Color. But among all the moments they've created that blended live action with animation, none could ever be more iconic than the scene where a magical nanny, her lovably crazy jack-of-all-trades friend, and two kids jump into a chalk drawing and enter a delightful cartoon world. Sure, that is technically the only live-action animation hybrid scene of the movie, but it still must be noted, as the film is a very significant moment in Disney history. To this day, not only is it considered Walt Disney's greatest live-action movie, but it is also one of the greatest achievements of his lifetime, right up there with Mickey Mouse, Snow White, and Disneyland. Now, let's go back to 1964, when Disney released their supercalifragilisticexpialidocious feature, Mary Poppins. It's the story of the Banks family during the start of the 20th century, who are in desperate need to find a nanny for the two children, Jane and Michael. Since Mrs. Banks is busy advocating for women's right to vote, and Mr. Banks is way too preoccupied with his job as a banker. Many have tried and failed, but it wasn't until a practically perfect nanny named Mary Poppins came out of the clouds to take the job as a response to a letter she got that was written by the Banks children themselves. Now with their new nanny, along with her eccentric friend Bert, Jane and Michael's lives have been filled with magic, wonder, and lots of surprises both in their home and around London, as Mary also tries to fix the problem that's within the Banks family. And let's just say that it's not the kids that are in need of help. Back in the late 1930s, Walt Disney's daughters, Diane and Sharon, enjoyed reading the Mary Poppins book. Eventually, Diane showed it to her curious father, and after going through page after page, Walt found himself loving it as much as his girls do. So much so that he even felt that it was good enough to be turned into a feature film. But while he was determined to make his Mary Poppins movie, especially for his little girls, he had to face one of the biggest obstacles of his career that kept him away from making his dream a reality for several years. It's not money this time, but rather Pamela Lyndon Travers, the original author of the Mary Poppins books. After she refused the first time, Walt thought that it was probably because he was known as a cartoon man with no actual experience with making live action features. But then he later found out that Travers was just a really hard egg to crack who never liked the way Hollywood adapted books into movies. For more than 20 years, no matter who tried to convince her, rather it be Walt himself, his brother Roy, Disney representatives, or even another studio wanting to adapt the book, she always stood her ground and refused them all. It wasn't until 1961 when Travers ultimately caved in and sold the film rights to Disney, but only on the condition that she works on the film as a consultant. At first, Walt was cool with it, even invited her to the studio to work on the writing with writer Bill Walsh, story artist Don DeGrady, and songwriters Robert and Richard Sherman. However, if they thought it was tough just to get the film rights from her, they would later discover that it was only going to get worse from there. For the Disney team, they thought that they were making something great, taking the narratives of some of the chapters in the books and stitch them together into somewhat of a cohesive story, while also altering some elements to make them more charming. But for Travers, anything that wasn't exactly like how she wrote it in the books was terrible and did not hold back on her criticisms towards any of their creative decisions. Now we come to my notes here, my typewritten notes. 
It is integral to the book and to the story in whatever form is presented that Mary Poppins should never be impolite to anybody. Not a change of heart, because he's always been sweet, but worried with the cares of life. We get the comedy out of this grey, quiet, polite person through which all the strange magic happens. No, 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 don't make it like that. Rather it be their depiction of Mary Poppins using the Sherman's whimsical original musical numbers instead of her preferred popular Edwardian songs, or especially the animation, it was almost as if everything they were doing to make a Mary Poppins movie was wrong. However, regardless of how she may have felt of their choices, it was ultimately Walt Disney who had the final say, and thus many of the team's creative decisions ended up in the final cut. It was a battle between creative heads that was so heated at the time that it would later be known as one of the most popular feuds about making a Hollywood movie. One that would be transcribed in the 2005 P.L. Travers biography, Mary Poppins She Wrote by Valerie Lawson. The historical moment was also turned into several films, including the documentaries The Real Mary Poppins and The Shadow of Mary Poppins, and a 2013 movie called Saving Mr. Banks, featuring Emma Thompson as Travers and Tom Hanks as Walt Disney. Once they finally settled with a script, they were ready to go and find their actors to help bring the pages to life. There were some obvious choices like David Tomlinson as George Banks and the voice of Poppins' umbrella, Glynis Johns as Winifred Banks, Ed Wynn as Uncle Albert, and Karen Doctress and Matthew Garber as the children Jane and Michael, respectively, which the kids previously worked together on their movie debut in the 1963 Disney film, The Three Lives of Tom and Cena. But then came the choice of Mary Poppins, where the team had to do some searching in order to find who would be practically perfect for the role. Disney had plenty of considerations for the right actress like Betty Davis, Mary Martin, Haley Mills, and Angela Lansbury, but the Mary Poppins he was looking for was actually found on Broadway. In 1962, Walt went to New York and watched a production of Camelot, where he discovered an actress that stood out from the rest that played the role of Queen Guinevere, Julie Andrews. At the time, she was becoming a noteworthy actress of the stage with breakthrough performances like her Tony-nominated role of Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady and the lead in Rodgers and Hammerstein's television musical adaptation of Cinderella. In the early 1960s, when Warner Brothers was starting to make their film version of My Fair Lady, Jack Warner decided to go against casting Andrews as Eliza. Nothing against her personally, it was just that she wasn't a popular name that could make the feature a guaranteed success, which was why Warner hired the more famous Audrey Hepburn to play the lead. But despite not being a household name, her performance in Camelot not only won over Walt, but also the crew who got to see a part of it through the Ed Sullivan Show. So when Disney went backstage and offered her the role of Mary Poppins, she was hesitant at first, since she was pregnant with her first child. But Walt assured her that he could wait, and once she had her baby a few months later, she was ready to make her feature debut as the Magical Nanny, to which she fit the role so well that it resulted in the very rare moment of Travers actually approving of a decision made by Disney. Walt also hired Andrew's then-husband, Tony Walton, to design the costumes and sets. As for the role of Bert, Walt decided to give it to a man that he immediately connected with after meeting him for the first time, Dick Van Dyke. Dyke also wanted to play the part of Mr. Dawes Sr., which Disney was hesitant at first, but managed to convince him after a test screening. While Bert would later be considered one of Dick's most memorable and beloved performances, his accent... Oh, what, ladies and gents? Comical poem, suitable for the occasion, extemporized and thought up before your very eyes. Is anything but. Although it's all in good-hearted fun, it is unanimously agreed that the worst thing to ever come out of the movie is Dyke's botched-up attempt of a Cockney accent. Some even consider it to be one of the worst accents in film history. Luckily though, Dick did get his chance to apologize, and the British still love him all the same. For one thing, I'm assuming 
But after 60 years of bad jokes, I'm off the hook for excoriating the uh, Cockney dialect, huh? Because, oh, thank you. On a side note, Dick was also the one who recommended to Walt to bring on board Mark Bro and Dee Dee Wood to be the choreographers. In order to bring the magic of Mary Poppins to life, the movie used a wide variety of visual effects and camera tricks like wiring, stop motion, and audio animatronics. Among Walt's movies during his lifetime, this was one of, if not the most effects he ever put in a single film, since he wanted to include all the tricks he knew to make this one stand out. But from all these effects, the crowning visual achievement of this movie is the sodium vapor process, a predecessor of the green screen that was created by Walt Disney's longtime collaborator, Ub Iwerks. This also allowed the cast to make them look like they're either flying on the sets of Albert's house, standing in front of the wide shots of London that are actually painted backgrounds by Peter Ellenshaw, and most memorably, jumping into the animated world of one of Bert's drawings. As the actors were doing what they can to imagine themselves in an animated jolly holiday on their carousel horses, and Dick Van Dyke unleashing his miming skills, the animation team, led by Ham Lusk, went to work on crafting the scenes and working around the actors to add them in their shots and for the characters to seamlessly interact with them. One animator who is often noted for his work in the scene is Frank Thomas, who had the extra challenge of animating the penguins and have them dance with Dick Van Dyke. Ever since Walt got the approval to make the movie, Robert and Richard Sherman were immediately on board to provide the songs for the feature. Since the brothers and Disney were all in sync with which chapters in the book they believe could work for the picture. While tough to get through Travers and her harsh distaste for their style, the brothers found inspiration in their personal lives, the turn of the century vaudeville style, and in the book for songs like Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, I Love to Laugh, Let's Go Fly a Kite, and even Step in Time was based on the old English song Knees Up Mother Brown. And then there was Feed the Birds, a song that Mary Poppins sing to the children about an old woman on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral who sells bags of breadcrumbs meant to feed the birds, which was the final performance of actress Jane Darwell. Walt Disney may have never said it himself, but the brothers knew that it was his favorite song they had ever written. For the rest of his life, at least once a week, he would ask them to come to his office just to play Feed the Birds on the piano. Throughout production, over 30 songs were written for the feature. But of course, many of them had to be taken out because they were either not good enough or to cut down the movie's running time. Some of them, however, would be recycled for another project, including the right side for the series Welcome to Pooh Corner, the beautiful Briny for Bedknobs and Broomsticks, and Land of Sand changed its lyrics to become Trust in Me for The Jungle Book. After keeping his promise to his girls for nearly 25 years, Disney finally created the Mary Poppins movie he always wanted and had a glamorous premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater on August 27, 1964. And saying that the result was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious would not be enough to describe its success. Critics were giving the movie some of the biggest praise they've ever given to a Disney movie, calling it a true triumph of cinema with some of the best examples of visual effects, acting, production design, choreography, and music combined together to create more than two hours of pure joy. At the box office, it was a spectacular hit, turning its $4 to $6 million budget into the highest grossing movie of 1964 with a profit of $28.5 million. After its re-release in 1973 and 1980, the film earned a domestic total of $102 million. The revenue was later used to buy the land in Central Florida that eventually became Walt Disney World and to build the workshop that made the audio animatronics at the Disney parks for several years, even naming the shop after the movie as Maypo. A few months later, Mary Poppins received the most nominations ever given to a Disney movie, appearing in 13 categories, including giving Walt Disney his only Best Picture nomination. It was also nominated for Best Director for Robert Stevenson, Best Adapted Screenplay, 
Best Art Direction in Color, Best Cinematography in Color, Best Costume Design in Color, Best Musical Score, and Best Sound. But at the same time, it also won five Oscars for Best Visual Effects, along with winning a Special Technical Achievement Award for the Sodium Vapor Process, Best Original Score, Best Song for Chim Chim Cheri, Best Editing, and Best Actress for Julie Andrews, which she also won a Golden Globe and a BAFTA. The movie also got three additional Golden Globe nominations, won two Grammys, and was later put on several lists of the greatest movies and movie moments, including the American Film Institute's Top 100 Best Songs with Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious at number 36, and at number 6 on their Top 100 Best Musicals, along with being added to the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress in 2013. As for P.L. Travers, she never got an invitation to the premiere and had to go as far as embarrass an executive to the point of making them have her over. After watching the feature, while everyone else was giving it high praise, no surprise, she did not like what she saw. She even tried to talk to Disney regarding some changes she wanted to make to the film, like getting rid of the animation, but the only thing Walt said to her was, Pamela, that ship has sailed. From then on, for the rest of her life, she always had a grudge against the feature, mainly for the ways the Disney team ignored her demands so they could make their own version. Years later, she even wrote in her last will and testament that if a stage adaptation of Mary Poppins would ever happen, then no one who worked on the movie should be allowed to be a part of it, especially the Sherman brothers. However, despite whatever feelings she may had over her experience with making the movie or how it is compared to the books, Travers never really thought that the movie was bad. In fact, years after the movie's release, she admitted that the feature itself was actually pretty good. Well, it's still being shown all over the world. Yes, so they tell me. I've seen it once or twice and I've learned to live with it. Mm. It's glamorous and it's a good film on its own level, but I don't think it's very like my books. Following afterwards, Mary Poppins became a proud and prominent member of the Disney family, often featured at the Disney parks like in the parades and a segment in the Great Movie Ride, and released The Cat That Looked at a King, an animated short made for the film's 40th anniversary DVD that featured Julie Andrews reprising her beloved role. Around the same time as the short, Disney and theater producer Cameron McIntosh teamed up to create a stage musical version that combined elements from the original books and the Disney movie, which opened on the West End at the end of 2004 and came to Broadway two years later. The show ended up receiving a taste of the film's success, where it received some decent reviews, but a lot of love for the technical effects, along with winning two Laurence Olivier Awards and a Tony for Best Scenic Design, and had a successful long run on both sides where the original West End production at the Prince Edward Theatre stayed for more than three years, while the Broadway version was at the New Amsterdam Theatre for more than six years until it was replaced with the stage version of Aladdin. Over the years, the studio wanted to develop a sequel to Mary Poppins, but with every attempt, it was always shot down either because of casting problems or P.L. Travers was still being as difficult and strict as ever. It wasn't until in late 2018 when Disney finally made that sequel they always wanted called Mary Poppins Returns, where the beloved nanny, well, returns to Jane and Michael, now grown up, to help them in their time of need after the passing of Michael's wife. Like the stage musical, the sequel was a moderate success, earning $349.5 million at the box office, and the critics felt that, while it borrowed a little too heavily from the original, it is still a well-crafted feature that captured the spirit of the first film, and Emily Blunt proved to be a worthy successor to Julie Andrews for the role of Poppins. The sequel was also highly recognized during awards season where it was nominated for a Grammy, four Golden Globes, four Oscars, and five Annies, winning two of them for Best Character Animation in a Live Action Production and Best Animated Special Production. They say that Walt Disney's greatest accomplishments are the projects that he was the most committed to bring to life and that he was the most involved with. Mary Poppins is one of the best examples to that testament, 
spending over 20 years trying to make it happen. And once he got the permission that he was looking for, he and his team let out everything they know to make the feature an unforgettably magical experience. So much so that it is still considered to this day as one of the best Disney movies ever made and resulted in a major cultural impact that became a positive influence to Hollywood, especially when it started the movie career of a legendary actress. But if nothing else, Mary Poppins will be known for generations as a delightful cinematic classic where the performances, the choreography, the effects, the designs, the animation, and the songs all come together to give audiences of all ages a sense of fun and happiness throughout its over two hour running time. Disney may have made many great features over the years, but Mary Poppins is the only one that is practically perfect in every way. However, going back to the mix of live action and animation, Mary Poppins only had that one scene that featured the mixed mediums. Back then, it was almost unheard of for an entire movie to use this hybrid technique, where every scene featured a live actor interacting with a hand-drawn cartoon character. It wouldn't be until 24 years after Mary Poppins, where one of the most technically and creatively ambitious features was released, and forever revolutionized the art of visual effects, animation, and the way we pay homage to the golden age of Hollywood. Not to mention that many have credited this for bringing the popularity of animation back to the mainstream for the first time since the days of Walt Disney. And who knew that all it took to crack that case was a disgruntled washed up detective and a cartoon rabbit trying to prove his innocence. Yes, 1988 was a milestone year for animation, thanks to the release of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Down in 1947 Hollywood, where humans and cartoon characters worked together, one of Toontown's biggest stars, Roger Rabbit, was accused of murdering the owner of Acme Corporation, Marvin Acme, since it was discovered that Acme had a private night with Roger's wife Jessica playing patty cake. Literally. The only person whom Roger can rely on to prove that he didn't do it is Eddie Valiant, a private investigator who used to be recognized for saving tunes, but now resents them and became an alcoholic due to the death of his brother. It took some time to convince him, but after finding some curious clues that could indicate the rabbit's innocence, he reluctantly agreed. Now the two team up to find Marvin Acme's real killer and escape the wrath of Judge Doom and his Tomb Patrol so that Roger doesn't die from the dip. Back in 1981, Disney bought the film rights to a newly released book called Who Censored Roger Rabbit by Gary K. Wolf, a murder mystery where humans and comic strip characters coexist that tells the story of Roger's temporary clone teaming up with Valiant to find out who killed the original Roger. They knew they had to alter a good amount of the source material, like switching the comic characters with ones from cartoons, but then CEO Ron Miller saw the opportunity of turning the book into the company's next big hit. As Disney hired a whole crew to test out what they could do for the feature, including Jeffrey Price and Peter S. Seaman writing two drafts for the script, and an animation team led by Daryl Van Siders to test the hybrid technique, Robert Zemeckis wanted to come in and be the director. However, Disney told him no because he was a relatively new and unknown filmmaker at the time who so far only directed box office bombs. After that though, the project never really went anywhere since the early 1980s was a very troubling time for the company. It wasn't until in 1985 when the new CEO that replaced Miller, Michael Eisner, reignited the Roger Rabbit idea with Amblin Entertainment, led by Steven Spielberg, Kathleen Kennedy, and Frank Marshall. The discussion started out tough about who gets the profits and having a hefty $50 million budget, but they all agreed to reduce that to $30 million, but Spielberg got to have the majority of creative control and the box office earnings, while Disney could have all the merchandising rights. Originally, Terry Gilliam was asked to be the director, but after he passed on the offer because it seemed too technically challenging for him, they returned to Zemeckis to finally give him the job, 
since he then proved himself worthy of being a Hollywood director after working on big hits like Romancing the Stone and Back to the Future. When they brought back Price and Seaman to work on the script, they took some inspiration from real life to help shape the story and its components. The Ink and Paint Club was noted to be compared to New York's Cotton Club, Judge Doom's goal to getting rid of all the tunes shared similarities to Hitler's final solution, and the motive of taking down Toontown to build a freeway was based on both the 1974 film Chinatown and the downfall of the Pacific Electric Railway during the 1940s. Before getting into the technical job, one of the toughest tasks for this picture was to find the live-action leads, the hero Eddie Valiant and the villain Judge Doom, each with their own list of notable actors that were in consideration, but didn't get in for a variety of reasons. In the case of Valiant, there was Harrison Ford who was too expensive, Chevy Chase and Eddie Murphy said no, and Bill Murray lost his chance to accept the part. But in the end, the role went to Bob Hoskins. Tunes gets them every time. As for Judge Doom, it was all about finding the right amount of scary and lovably evil to make him a formidable enemy for Eddie and Roger. As Christopher Lee turned it down, some like Tim Curry ended up feeling too scary, while John Cleese was not scary enough. It wasn't until Zemeckis brought in Christopher Lloyd soon after playing Doc Brown in Back to the Future to take on the villainous role. I'll catch the rabbit, Mr. Valiant, then I'll try him, convict him, and execute him. And with almost everyone in place, there was just one more key member to get in order to make the feature. The animation director. Sure, they could have just stuck with Daryl Van Siders from the early tests, but they wanted someone better. Someone who is not afraid of breaking the animation rules to take the medium to a whole new level, and capable of making hand-drawn characters move in 3D environments while the camera moves around. And within the industry, there was one guy who was quite well known for doing just that. At first, it wasn't easy to get animator Richard Williams to be a part of the team, especially when he had a massive distaste for what he referred to as Disney's bureaucracy and did not want to set foot in Los Angeles. So to compromise, the animation team, mainly comprised of the artists from Disney Animation, were split into two where one group was working at Williams Studio in London, while the other stayed at Disney's in Los Angeles with animator Dale Bear in charge. The producers and Disney also agreed that, after the film, they would help the distribution for his longtime passion project that he was working on for more than 20 years by that time, The Thief and the Cobbler. Ultimately though, that deal never happened and Williams later signed on with Warner Brothers to finish that job. I could go on about what happened to that film, but believe me when I say that it's a long story. Anyways, back on to Roger Rabbit. On top of their technical mission they wanted to pull off with a mix of live action and animation, Spielberg wanted to fill the screen with not just any cartoons, but instead, with the most popular animated characters of the golden era. Disney was already secured, but Steven also managed to bring on board the characters of Warner Brothers, Universal, Fleischer, Felix the Cat, and MGM. In the case of Warner Brothers though, they were a little more cautious and agreed to let him use their characters on the condition that their biggest characters share equal amount of screen time as Disney's. The solution the team figured out was to have these characters appear at the same time to guarantee their equal share, including the piano duel featuring Donald and Daffy, and the fall from the skies of Toontown with Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny. Seriously, that scene is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's like a moment that's worth hanging on your wall. It's just so perfect that you never want to forget it. Speaking of bugs, voice acting legend Mel Blanc signed on to reprise his roles as the Looney Tunes characters, with the exception of Yosemite Sam, making this one of the last times he voiced them before his death in 1989, and May Questel return for her final performance as Betty Boop. However, Spielberg did not get all the cartoons he wanted. There were several that he wasn't able to secure the rights to, like Tom and Jerry, Casper, Little Lulu, the Terry Toons characters, and Popeye, which was part of the reason why they had to take out the scene of Marvin Acme's funeral where many of those characters were featured. 
What made the movie a massive risk to make was that nobody in the production had any idea what the final product would end up looking like, with the live action crew just working on their aspect, while the animators were focusing on bringing their characters to life, and both had no computers to help them out. With the live action crew, the actors, especially Bob Hoskins, started by going through some rigorous mind training so that they could act with imaginary characters, knowing how to look at tunes like Roger in the Eyes and feel their weight as they carry them. Then they did a first take with rubber dummies to practice the staging and framing the shots. And once it was time for the real take, the dummies were taken out and the actors put their miming skills to work, while the voice of Roger, Charles Fleischer, was behind the camera saying his lines and even dressed up in a rabbit costume to help get him more in character. And yes, he even wore the bunny ears. Well, I have just approached this like I'd approach any role. I don't consider this to be a voiceover. If anything, it had to be categorized. It's off-camera acting. I'm just there doing it. I prepare in the same way I would prepare for any role. I learn my lines. Just a minute, please. I'm doing an interview. Also, the engineers use their specially crafted props to make it look like the cartoons are interacting with them, along with robotic rigs to have the characters fully use the props, like Baby Herman holding his cigar, Smartass pointing his gun towards Eddie, and Roger breaking plates on his head. They also had puppeteers to freely move the objects around without any rigs supporting them. But among all the scenes, the two most difficult to technically pull off were the Ink and Paint Club, which is a combination of all the visual techniques working together in a massive set with penguin waiters, Jessica playing around with some of the audience, and Donald and Daffy's piano duel, and the chase scene with Benny the Cab, where Hoskins and a stunt driver have to look like Eddie and Roger are driving for their lives on a cartoon car. As for the animation itself, Zemeckis' goal with that was to combine the best parts of each cartoon studio from the 1940s, featuring the visual standards of Disney, the clever characters of the Looney Tunes, and the wild humor of Tex Avery. Some of the original characters were designed to reflect upon the popular trends of the 1940s. Roger himself is like a Frankenstein of cartoon features like Droopy's patch of red hair, the nut-shaped head that's commonly found in the works of Tex Avery, Bugs Bunny's cheeks and ears, Porky Pig's bow tie, Mickey Mouse's yellow gloves like in his posters, Goofy's overalls, and an American color scheme of red, white, and blue. As for Jessica, she is meant to be the ultimate femme fatale from the height of the classic film noir movies, with proportions purposely exaggerated to emphasize that only a cartoon could have that kind of body. Once the animators completed their job, they sent their animations to Industrial Lights and Magic so that they combined them with the live action shots and give the cartoon some visual depth, including highlights, tone mats, shadows, and extra effects when needed like Jessica's sparkling dress. While the deal for the budget was agreed for $30 million, it's no surprise that the scale of what the team wanted to accomplish ended up going beyond that. Where the movie's price tag ultimately went up to around $50 to $70 million. As much as he believed in the film, Michael Eisner was ready to shut down the whole thing before it ended up costing too much money. But after a heated debate, then head of Walt Disney Pictures, Jeffrey Katzenberg, managed to convince him to keep the film alive, mainly because of how it would be worth it for Disney to have this big collaboration project with Steven Spielberg. You are one lucky rabbit. I would say that title belongs to Oswald, but when's the last time anyone talked about him? <laughs> Then again, Michael, Jeffrey, and Roy E. Disney all agreed that the movie was pushing the envelope a little too far to have it be considered a Disney feature. Yet they couldn't do anything about it because the filmmakers were given the final say on the creative choices, and Zemeckis refused to change anything from the picture. As a result, they agreed to release the movie under their more adult-oriented banner, Touchstone Pictures, and they were ready to bring Toontown to theaters on June 22, 1988, which was accompanied by the National Film Board of Canada animated short, The Cat Came Back, which was later nominated for an Oscar. And while Roger Rabbit was portrayed as Hollywood's biggest star in the movie, 
it turned out to be a case of life imitating art. Critics were calling it one of the most groundbreaking feature in years, a true cinematic marvel to behold with its innovative technique of mixing live action with animation, accompanied by an engaging story filled with enjoyable characters played by noticeably talented actors. As for their issue with the budget, it didn't matter how much it cost because it was a massive success at the box office, earning $156.5 million domestically and a worldwide total of $329.8 million. The movie then went on to grab some trophies for its tremendous work, including three Oscar nominations for Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, and Best Sound, and winning three Oscars for Best Sound Editing, Best Film Editing, and Best Visual Effects, on top of a Special Achievement Award for Richard Williams. And in 2016, the movie was chosen to be in the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. Despite giving it the touchstone label on its release, Disney wasted no time to embrace the rabbit as their own, and immediately displayed it as one of their greatest achievements and their next biggest franchise. Soon after the movie, Disney's Florida animation team started out by working on three Roger Rabbit shorts that were released in theaters with a feature film. These include Tummy Trouble in 1989, Roller Coaster Rabbit in 1990, and Trail Mix-Up in 1993. There was a fourth animated short called Hair in My Soup where Roger works as a waiter for a fancy restaurant, but was ultimately scrapped after Disney and Amblin split. In 1991, not only did the author of the source material, Gary K. Wolf, made a sequel novel that was more connected to the movie called Who Plugged Roger Rabbit, but Disney also created an entire land based on the movie called Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland and Tokyo Disneyland, where they even have a Roger Rabbit dark ride called Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin. There was a Toontown that was at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, but that had to close down in 2011 to make room for the expansion of Fantasyland. But as expected from Roger, even when he was the most celebrated rabbit in Hollywood, <laughs> he always found a way to get in trouble. When the movie was released on Laserdisc in 1994, there was one quick scene where, if paused at the correct spot, it revealed that Jessica was not wearing any underwear. And since that discovery, Disney was quick to cut out that shot for any future releases. Also, in 2001, Gary K. Wolf sued Disney claiming that they still owed him royalties for Roger Rabbit's success. It took Wolf years and several trials to make the company pay, but he ultimately won four years later, yet only received around $180,000 to $400 grand in damages instead of getting the $7 million he said that he was owed. With a major feature like this, some may think that it's rather surprising that Disney never jumped to the opportunity to make more Roger Rabbit movies. Actually, they and many others tried, but several circumstances ultimately prevented the plan for a follow-up to happen. A year after the movie's release, Spielberg was planning a prequel called Roger Rabbit Toon Platoon, where Roger and a human named Richie Davenport joined the army during World War II, along with many other recognizable characters, so that they could stop the Nazis and save Jessica. The movie would have also established how Roger started in a Midwestern farm looking for his mother and how he met his wife along the way. However, a few years later, Spielberg quit the project because he no longer felt like Nazis were a laughing matter after he directed Schindler's List. It wasn't until in 1997 when Disney wanted to try another shot at a Roger Rabbit prequel, this time called Who Discovered Roger Rabbit, where the World War II setting was switched to a musical about Roger's rise to fame from Broadway to Hollywood. Some of Disney Animation's top talents at the time were even hired to be in charge of the project, including Eric Goldberg being the animation director, and Alan Menken signed on to be the executive producer and to write five songs for the picture. The only song that was known to be made for this was This Only Happened in the Movies, which was later made public on Carrie Butler's debut album in 2008. Another significant difference from before was the use of CGI to bring the tunes to life along with a complete redesign for Roger. 
However, considering that the use of computers would come with an extremely high cost that would put the budget over $100 million, Eisner ultimately decided to just pull the plug. The only other attempt to make a prequel was much later in 2013. After writing the third book of the series, Who Whacked Roger Rabbit, Gary K. Wolf and Eric Von Wattica created a proposal for a buddy comedy called The Stooge, which was also an animated remake of the 1952 film of the same name that would have starred Roger and Mickey Mouse, and had its own interpretation of how the rabbit met Jessica. But ultimately, nothing ever came out of it. Throughout the 2000s to the present day, Disney still attempted to make several lesser-known ideas for a Roger Rabbit follow-up, including a sequel set in the 1950s that would have featured the ghost of Eddie Valiant. But as the years went by, the chances of Roger's comeback were gradually diminishing, not only because of the death of Bob Hoskins in 2014, but also because Disney didn't find Roger to be as profitable as he used to be, not to mention how Jessica's presence in recent years might cause some trouble for the company. But regardless of how people view Roger or Jessica, or even if a follow-up would ever happen, there will always be the original that will be remembered as one of Disney's most groundbreaking cinematic achievements. With the combination of the greatest talents of the industry at the time, they were able to place cartoon characters in live action in ways that the world had never seen before taking the medium of animation and visual effects to a whole new level, combined with taking the best of film noir and classic cartoons and create a wonderfully unique experience that no other movie ever replicated since, on top of delivering possibly the most unbelievable crossover ever put on film, which resulted in a newfound interest in animation from the public that later started a renaissance for both the medium and especially for Disney. It truly is a movie like none other, and that's what makes Who Framed Roger Rabbit possibly the greatest tribute to the cartoons of Hollywood's golden era. <laughs> Care for an encore? After all, we do have to make the most out of the plus of this show. For the final honorable mention, it is time that we take a look at the Forbidden One. The one that Disney is trying ever so hard to lock up deep in the Disney vault in the hopes that it would end up long forgotten by the sands of time. However, not even a multi-billion dollar corporation is capable of making the public forget. What began as Walt Disney turning the stories of his childhood into his first feature film that's mainly live action, gradually became one of the company's most iconic features, and also their most problematic. Of course, as society evolves to become more progressive and diverse, the discussions about this movie were becoming more and more problematic. And as they adapt to the modern times, Disney's solution is to continuously distance themselves from the film altogether. But regardless of which side people take on this topic, I think we can all unanimously agree that the feature's history and legacy is a truly fascinating story that must be told. It is often referred to as Disney's most controversial movie, but many just simply call it Song of the South. It's the story of Johnny, who moved to his grandmother's plantation in Georgia due to his parents momentarily splitting up because of his dad's newspaper job in Atlanta. Upset that it wasn't the vacation with his parents he thought it would be, he tried to sneak out, but suddenly met an old wise man named Uncle Remus, who grew a bond with the kid and tells him the animated stories of Br'er Rabbit, where in each tale, he always finds a way to cleverly escape from the hungry hands of Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. Now with the help of Uncle Remus, Johnny makes the most out of his time in the plantation and learning the lessons from the Br'er Rabbit stories as he meets new friends and confronts his own troubles. After the success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Walt Disney went on a property shopping spree in the hopes of turning those stories into his next feature film. One of them that he purchased in 1939 for $10,000 was a series of books known as the Uncle Remus Stories by Joel Chandler Harris, where each book contains a collection of tales and songs featuring Br'er Rabbit narrated
narrated by a fictional old African-American storyteller from a plantation in the late 1800s. Disney's first plan with the feature was to make it an entirely animated feature, where the stories could also serve as their own animated shorts, similarly to the package films of the 1940s. As the movie ultimately contained three of the original Uncle Remus stories like Br'er Rabbit Earns a Dollar a Minute, The Tar Baby, and The Laughing Place, there were several other story ideas that never made the cut. These include Br'er Rabbit's gambling addiction being the cause of all his problems, a plot where he convinces Br'er Fox to ride him like a horse to a party, another where the rabbit disguises himself as a ghost to scare off Br'er Bear, and Uncle Remus himself telling the animals to build a church so that Predator and Prey can be at peace with one another. Alrighty, that looks pretty good. Now just put in the final touches, make some minor edits. I need to stop talking to myself while editing. And, oh wait, no, no, okay. And, oh, oh wait, no, not yet. Okay, and done. Well, my work here is done. Thank you for having me on board, Matt. However, after going through the 1941 Union strike and received a major blow from World War II, causing the movie from the early 1940s to flop and leaving the company financially damaged, Walt and his brother Roy agreed to start making live-action films as a way to make additional profits for the company, using the Uncle Remus movies as their first experiment where the feature is mostly live-action but have a third of the picture be animated with the Br'er Rabbit stories to still have it be recognized as a feature from the man behind Snow White and Mickey Mouse. Plus, it seemed like a good story to cash in on the massive success of 1940's Gone with the Wind. When production began in 1944, the first writer Walt hired was Delton Raymond, which was his first and only screenplay he had ever written. A risky move, but that was because Disney wanted a professional Southern writer to make the script instead of the usual team he had at the animation studio. However, that was when Walt discovered that even during his time, he couldn't be like Joel Chandler Harris and just get away with letting a white man, especially from the South, write a story about black people like if it was narrated by a black man. While Raymond did do his job in making a script, he did so in the typical way of how black people were represented during that time, less as actual people and more like caricatured southern stereotypes, complete with white characters calling them darkies and using the same deep south dialect for the dialogue of characters like Uncle Remus that was used in the Harris book that even back then was considered to be highly controversial. The script was so bad in terms of black representation that the Hayes office, who was in charge of the motion picture production code, demanded a revision to take out those black nicknames, and even the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, and the American Council of Race Relations didn't even get a chance to look at it. Also, Clarence Muse, who was hired to be a writing consultant and wanted to play the role of Uncle Remus, ended up quitting the project because Raymond didn't care to consider any of his suggestions of portraying African Americans more respectfully. If Walt ever hoped to save the movie from turning Uncle Remus to Uncle Tom, then he needed another screenwriter who was capable of presenting black people as, well, people. When first asked, writer Maurice Rapp wasn't sure about the idea of working on an Uncle Remus movie. On top of being a writer for several live-action films, he was known for being an outspoken Jewish communist and completely resented the Uncle Tom imagery. However, that was exactly why Walt wanted to hire him. He would most likely be against Disney making this movie, so by bringing him on board as a writer, he could give the update the script needed to make the film more acceptable to create. The biggest change Rep made to the writing was removing all the racist and outdated terminologies and replace them with clarification that the film is set during the Reconstruction era after slavery was abolished, including dialogue that emphasized that Uncle Remus is a free man. Unfortunately, Maurice's time with the feature did not last long. After working on the movie for seven weeks, a major argument with Raymond resulted Raff to be out of the project and later worked to help write Cinderella. Ultimately, 
Morton Grant came on board to have the script settle in the middle of Raymond and Rapp's vision, where the stereotypes and terminologies were thrown out, but so were the clear indications of its Reconstruction era setting, leaving the final film with almost unnoticeable hints of its period, including the late Victorian style clothing and in the lyrics of Let the Rain Pour Down where they state that the black workers can leave whenever they want, but they choose to stay. Let the rain pour down, let the cold wind blow, gonna stay right here in the home I'm trouble, trouble, trouble flying. Other than Clarence Muse, Paul Robeson, Rex Ingram, and Eddie Rochester Anderson were all once considered to play the part of Uncle Remus, but the plans with any of them were ultimately dropped. But then came James Basket who previously voiced one of the crows from Dumbo and auditioned for the role of a talking butterfly. For Walt, his audition stood out in a way that he could do much more than just be a butterfly. So after meeting him in person and had him do some tests, Basket not only got the part of the butterfly, but also the much bigger role of Uncle Remus and the additional part of the voice of Br'er Fox. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just in a minute now. Won't be long now. Didn't go out and be ready in a minute now. All you have to do is put a few more sticks on the fire. Get fire going good. <laughs> oh, excuse me. You just want to stay for dinner. You should be ready. We ain't want to take no excuses now. We just love to have you for dinner. <laughs> Other notable actors in the film include Bobby Driscoll's first Disney role, which also marked him as the first ever actor under contract with Disney, and legendary black actress Hattie McDaniel as Aunt Tempe. As the filming was done both in Hollywood at the Samuel Goldwyn studio and in Phoenix, Arizona, where the team built a whole plantation to shoot while the animators were at work creating the Br'er Rabbit stories, the final filming day turned out to be an emergency. The team discovered that the scene where Uncle Remus starts to sing zippity doo was badly shot and couldn't use it in the final film. With little budget to spare and desperate for an idea, Walt came up with a solution to start with a close-up of Uncle Remus during his monologue in the dark with cardboard covering the lights. Then, right when he starts singing, they remove the cardboard to reveal the background where he is now in the animated world, resulting in one of the most memorable scenes of the picture. And with all the shots, the animation, and the songs in place, Song of the South was ready to be moving along to theaters on November 20th, 1946. During the premiere eight days prior at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, a few key players did not watch the movie during that time. Walt Disney bailed out after making an introduction to avoid seeing what the audience's reaction could be, and James Basket was unable to be there in the first place due to the racial segregation laws in Atlanta at the time. But as it turned out, those reactions that Walt missed out on were... Eh, it certainly wasn't Disney's best. Even if the critics praised the animated segments and celebrated James Basket's wonderful performance, they felt like it contained little of that magic that made Walt's animated films a classic. In fact, the New York Times described it best by using the amount of live action and animation in the film to say that it's the approximate ratio of its mediocrity and its charm. However, the other results did go better for the feature. At the box office, Disney made a minor profit as it earned $3.3 million, and after several re-releases in 1956, 1972, 1973, 1980, and 1986, the movie gathered a lifetime total of $65 million. It also went on to be recognized at the Academy Awards, where it received a nomination for Best Score and a win for Best Original Song with Zippity Doo Dah, along with a special Oscar for James Basket for his role as Uncle Remus, making him the first ever Oscar-winning African-American man, and winning two juvenile Oscars for Bobby Driscoll and Luana Patton for their performances as Johnny and Ginny, respectively. So it turned out that Song of the South was initially a small win for Disney. Not their best work, but still gained something out of it. But even with that gain, even if the crew was a bit worried that this could happen, nobody ever expected for this film to be the cause of controversy of historical proportions. 
The backlash started as early as the feature's release, where the executive secretary of the NAACP, Walter Francis White, released a statement that says, The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People recognizes in Song of the South remarkable artistic merit in the music and in the combination of living actors and the cartoon technique. It regrets, however, that in an effort neither to offend audiences in the North or South, the production helps to perpetuate a dangerous glorified picture of slavery. Making use of the beautiful Uncle Remus folklore, Song of the South unfortunately gives the impression of an idyllic master-slave relationship, which is a distortion of the facts. But do you want to know something crazy about this quote? White never actually saw the movie when he said that. Believe it or not, this was the result of a complete misunderstanding. Instead of seeing it himself, he based his statement on memos written by two staffers who watched the film, Norma Jensen and Hope Springgarn. One said that it was completely cliched, but still very well made, while the other was a bit hesitant with the way that the black characters talked. However, they both agreed that they were confused about the picture setting, that nowhere in the film did it ever clearly state that it was from the Reconstruction era, and that it would be too easy for people to mistakenly assume that the story is set during the time of slavery. But regardless of the broken telephone scenario, the damage was already done, and as the words of Walter Francis White was published in many major newspapers, it ignited the black communities of America to fight against Song of the South. Across several big American cities, Protesters with signs gathered around movie theaters to discourage audiences from watching the film, accusing Disney of rewriting the history of slavery to make it look like black people were happy to be slaves. However, even with the backlash, Disney still moved on, and Song of the South went on to become a classic franchise, even becoming a star in the comic strips with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit where the comics were published every Sunday for nearly 30 years, starting a year before the movie's release in 1945 up to the end of 1972. But Br'er Rabbit and the gang wouldn't make a true comeback to the spotlight until 1989 when Disney opened a new attraction at Disneyland called Splash Mountain, a log flume ride that features the animated stories from the film with Jess Arnell being the new voice of Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox, while Nick Stewart reprised his role as Br'er Bear. James Avery would later take his place for the voice. Three years later, Tokyo Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World also got their own Splash Mountain, and with its approximate 50-foot drop and a simple concept of It's like a log ride, and you get inside the log ride and it goes up the hill, down the hill, makes a splash. Which is perfect for those hot days, it quickly became one of the most popular attractions at the Disney parks. For many years, the Brewers remained as classic members of the Disney animated family, with meet and greet characters walking around the parks, making appearances in the House of Mouse and the game Disneyland Adventures, and making cameos in movies like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and The Lion King One and a Half. Even the movie got some love during that time, where the Online Film Critics Society ranked it at number 67 in the top 100 greatest animated films, and the American Film Institute placed Zippity Doo Dah at number 47 in their top 100 movie songs. Not to mention that Disney frequently used that song across their divisions almost as much as When You Wish Upon a Star. However, there is one market that the movie didn't get a chance to get into, Yet its absence serves as a reminder of its troubling controversies. Home Media Throughout his time as CEO, Michael Eisner refused to distribute the feature on Home Media, where he felt that not even a disclaimer before the film could save them from the backlash. While it did come out on VHS and Laserdisc in places such as Japan and the UK, along with several other countries in Europe and Asia, the movie never received an official home media release or any kind in North America. Over the years, the company stuck with Eisner's plan and had since gradually tried to distance themselves from the feature altogether, and even with every new piece of media distribution, Disney still refused to give one for Song of the South, including DVDs, Blu-rays, digital, and even on Disney+. They tried to change the narrative by presenting the characters and the songs as if they originated from Splash Mountain, 
But that eventually did not last long, since in mid-2020, they announced that they were going to re-theme the attraction to the Princess and the Frog. And now that Disney ultimately decided to completely separate themselves from the feature, especially when the topic of black rights is becoming more of a major issue, we might never get a chance to see the stories of Uncle Remus and Br'er Rabbit on a piece of American home media ever again. Or can we? No, 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 no. There is no way. It's for sure that Disney will never put the entire movie on home media. But the key word to what I just said there was the entire movie. That doesn't mean Br'er Rabbit and Uncle Remus never appeared on a piece of American home media. Sure, Disney never released Song of the South on VHS or DVD in North America, but there have been certain scenes that did find their way on an American cassette or disc. The most common way it did so was through Disney's sing-along songs, where some of the songs from the feature, like Zippity Doo Dah, How Do You Do, and Everybody's Got a Laughing Place, get their own segments across the series. And back in 1950, the entire animated scene where Uncle Remus sings Zippity Doo Dah and tells the story of Br'er Rabbit Earns a Dollar a Minute was featured in Walt Disney's first television special, One Hour in Wonderland which in 2004, Disney included the entire program as a bonus feature on the DVD of Alice in Wonderland, and was also featured on its later home media releases, including Blu-ray, making Alice in Wonderland the only time that Song of the South ever made an appearance on an official Disney Blu-ray. There are many ways that people view how Disney adapted the Uncle Remus stories. Some say it's a Disney movie that's mostly boring with some really good cartoons in between. Some say that it's the most racist thing Disney has ever done that promotes slavery. Some say it's where beloved songs like Zippity Doo Dah come from. And some say it's an awesome attraction with a lot of charm and a thrilling drop. But ultimately, Song of the South can be best described as Disney's biggest cautionary tale. How the lack of context of his setting resulted in confusion and frustration regarding a serious issue like race. And as the world's culture evolved to become more inclusive and diverse, the movie and its source material quickly became more outdated, resulting in Disney to abandon the feature altogether in order for the company to stay current with the modern times viewpoints. But even to this day, fans have often discussed rather if Disney should ever release the movie in its entirety in one way or another, where even people like Whoopi Goldberg and Disney animator Floyd Norman advocate to show the movie to the public. There will be those that want it release and those that want it gone for good, but either way, these discussions are proof that no matter how hard Disney tries, they can never hide their history especially when it comes to the feature that has the title of the most controversial Disney film of all time. In conclusion, the greatest story from Walt Disney Animation Studios does not come from any of their feature films, but rather, it is their own. A story that dates back to 1923, where it all started with one man's dream and has since become responsible for some of the most groundbreaking innovations of the medium and for creating many of the greatest animated features of all time. There were some dark times and they had to face their own struggles, but there were also highlights that helped push the studio to place them among the best in the industry. It is a story of determination, hope, creativity, teamwork, trust, and passion that is filled with many unforgettable characters across the years, all united with the same dream that Walt had many decades ago. And as long as the studio is still doing what they do best since the beginning, this is a story that will continue to add new chapters that will still inspire millions for generations to come. As much as we will all remember characters from Snow White herself to Elsa from Frozen, the best Disney characters are the people that brought them to life, like the writers, directors, animators, artists, actors, songwriters, editors, and the creative team that contributed to the biggest and most important legacy in animation. 
If there is a lesson to be learned from this story, it's that dreams can come true and that the magic of Disney is certainly real. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see you later dudes. Thank you.